starting live stream and uh that's about all i can say <laughs> right now uh that's it jesus it is fucking freezing you have no idea all right uh so good that's working now let's get the call started just so i can uh get the uh security blanket here um there we hey. are so good man i'm um, so glad that you're here i did of course get that text from you on my phone apparently um you weren't feeling very well this morning uh do i'm glad uh you're here but of wait, course wait wait a minute uh i yeah. sent a text this morning no that was a text from all the way back when i was in the hospital it yeah. just reached you now holy shit well i told you i have a bad answering service uh, well you get what you pay for right <laughs> it's not it's, it's it's not only that you and i probably have the same service but yes. i think it's the fact that you know Okay, let me let me mute you, mute you in the background. It's the fact that for whatever reason, this has been an ongoing thing where whenever I try to contact or reach out to people, they won't get it until oh. later. The only person who receives my messages right away is probably my mother, oddly enough. And I think this is sort of like by, you know, as per their design of, you know, my association with you, your association with me, you know, all that jazz. That makes sense. I mean, uh, of course, you know, no matter yet who I contact, and I think it's just a really bad service. <laughs> a lot of times, yeah, it, it, it vote, is. Yeah. It, it, it's a horrible yeah, service. Yeah, uh, I mean, it, you, like you said, you get what you pay for, and the thing is, I'm not paying a thing. So. Yes, since both of us are getting it for free, this is what we get. Yeah, it, it delivers days late. Uh, well, love you dearly, and uh, do me a favor, oh, call Brandon Young, bring people him on, yes. and everybody uh, else. I, I've, yeah. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have to push, jack my mouse into this because I, I hate using that touchpad thing. And I have my other mouse batteries like charging since okay. I'm using uh, the uh, both computers today. So just give me one second and I shall start dropping people on here. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Um, Salmon Shake, of course, and uh, Brandon Young, uh, Sammy Romero. Uh, those are the three I can immediately think of. Uh, you know, anyone else you can think of, uh, and you know, our ladies always welcome. Uh, Mandy, <laughs> I had to think of her, yes. uh, but yes, I haven't, we haven't uh, spoken to her in a long, in a while. Um, well, I mean, she's out um, there. I mean, believe me, she, she, you know, she was, uh, uh, putting, uh, little responses to what you were saying the, the last time we were yeah. on. Yeah. Oh, yes, 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 that's true. I, dude, I am. Like my, okay, I have my head so far up my ass that it pops up above my neck, so everything looks like it's anatomically correct. That's cute. Yes, yes. That's pretty deep. Yes, yes. So no worries. Hey, I'm audible. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah, this is Brandon. Yes, or Sammy. Sammy. Right? Yeah, Sammy. Yes. So, oh. so good to have you with us. And uh, so, um, as always, uh, just uh, barely here, and uh, might have to take a break for about 10 or 15 minutes uh this hour we'll see what happens the um you know it's freezing and i don't know if my electric blankets are even pumping out uh, at the correct amount where they're keeping me warm so it's it's just uh one of those things at any rate there may be a new one sent by that dear lady clarice claudette so a shout out unto she if she's listening and um, if she does come on later welcome her on if they, i don't know if you do do you have her her ID, her Skype ID. Uh, if not, I I'll try might and get it to. You. Yeah, if not, yeah. I'll try and get it to. You. In the meantime, Sammy, by all means, since you're the, where? What about Salman? Is he with us? Assalamu alaikum, brother oh, Douglas. <laughs> I, I start my greetings of peace and love for you, brother Jamo, Sammy, Brandon, and all of our brothers and sisters of Team Dietrich. It's great to be here with you all tonight. Wonderful. Likewise. Bless you. And let me take a look at what Sammy said. He said something loud and clear, just like Brandon did. Did Brandon come on with us? I am here. Oh, Hello, Douglas. Wonderful. Yes. So glad to have you with us and hope everything oh. is going well with you. How is, uh, is is school still ongoing or are they preparing for a break still, or what's the deal with that? Uh, still, still, still ongoing. Mm -hmm. uh, we have Christmas break coming up soon. I've been, um, uh, somehow they convinced me to coach basketball, these middle school basketball kids, 
Yeah. And today we we suffered our first vis- um, uh, loss, oh. um, of course. Yes. And um, so, of course, um, I am going to assassinate the referee uh, and uh, everybody associated, every parent. Um, probably shouldn't be saying that on air. Um, but uh, <laughs> but uh, this is just a joke. Ladies and gentlemen, no, but re- everything's well. Everything's well. I feel healthy, and um, it is damn cold. I'll give you that. I, it is very cold. I want to give a shout out to one of the most beautiful people in the world who is who might be listening right now. I'm not sure. Uh, her name is uh, Kelsey, and um, she is um, a fantastic person and a wonderful person. So I'd like to say hi. Wonderful. And uh, that's it. Thank you for having me. Yeah, always, always wonderful. And uh, thank you for being with us. And I'll say that to all of you gentlemen. And of course, uh, our dear Salman Sheikh has introduced himself. I'll speak with him later privately about an experience he's had. And uh, aside from all of that, uh, you know, and he's welcome to bring that up on his own if he wishes. But uh, aside from that, Sammy, uh, tell us how your week is going. Oh, uh, my week is going uh, going fine. Um, right here in Southern California, we're in the in the low fifties to high forties, so we're freezing our asses off. We yeah. consider that freezing. Um, and I've noticed uh, a lot of the public is just they're panicking. Yeah, uh, I don't. We don't do good with bad weather here. Yeah. We get some rain. We think it's the end of the world. And um, you know, you go to a supermarket and uh, everything's ransacked. So you know, just typical. You know, when it comes to this type of weather, but it's I'm glad we have it. It's uh, it's been a desert here and uh, it's it's gone pretty bad. So any rain, you know, I welcome. So yes. other than that, it's it's been uh, it's been great. Well, I dropped my phone and cracked it, but that's oh, that's easy to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Uh, yeah. And uh, so a shout out right now to a wonderful individual. Let me make certain that they let me see. Uh, Okay, um, doesn't look like they want anonymity, so I'll give them a shout out again later. But Ryan Manning uh, sent a hundred United States dollars, which is certainly needed, and uh, he said, "Hi, Doug. I am a friend of Aaron Tice. I read your Roswell. I read your Roswell Deception book. Well done. Thanks for collaborating with Peter and putting that out. Good luck with a uh, lucky uh, Irish shamrock, green colored. So four leaf clover. There we are. And uh, bless him. Uh, hugs to unto he and." Uh, with that of course uh, every bit helps especially during the holidays and uh, of course all of these men around me have been extraordinarily helpful and none of uh, this this program would not be possible without them Uh, and certainly we have a wonderful round table with Salman and uh, Sammy and Brandon and Jameson Uh, now of course we've had some very strange things going down lately Uh, I will of course uh, give my opinion on them later Later. I've, I, everybody knows, of course, a couple of years ago, if anybody's a regular listener for that long, uh, then everybody knows that when um, Mr. Smollett first came out, um, I remember that I had, before I even heard of the case, somebody had asked about it on YouTube. They literally put it a public question out there. What do you think of the Jesse Smollett case? And it was just, you know, this kind of like... Uh, I didn't even know. First, the first thing I thought was like, "Who the fuck is Jesse Small?" <laughs> that was the first thing that I thought. Uh, yeah, that's exactly uh, what I. That, that was exactly what I thought. Too. Thank you, thank oh you. God. Yeah, and uh, then then when I looked into it, it struck me as as very very sketchy from the very beginning, and I was very vocal about that. Now, what was interesting was that many um, social critics who were part columnists for various uh, papers and whatnot, uh, they bought into it and they cannot be blamed for that because the police themselves were saying how seriously they took it. I I went into that before, but you know, he has been judged (laughs) since he's been, since judgment has been passed, uh, at least by the jury. uh, I will, you know, kind of put a 
a finalized punctuation on that. Uh, as for whether or not this is the end of his career, I'll go into that later. It, it's knowing what I know now. Uh, he's one of those people who could easily like Donald Trump. It's it's like it, he wouldn't care. It's it's like if he gets vic you know, in prison time, uh, any if he gets any jail time for this, he's just going to look himself at himself as further victimized. He's just going to rationalize it that way, and he'll come back again. Uh, acting or whatnot, and probably get some kind of job and 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 bounce back. Uh, yeah, because... yeah, yeah. He could work for Fox News. <laughs> yeah, there we are. There we are. That was. He could like... work for Fox News. That would that would that would just be so appropriate. It, it would be. It would be. I don't know if any of you gentlemen are aware of this, but when the you know, and this is shit we didn't find out till later. This didn't come out until this part of the trial. But yeah, this is like stuff that if they had released it. In the first place, then, of course, nobody would have taken his case seriously. But it was like when the police showed up at his apartment, he still had the noose around his neck. And he had the <laughs> Subway sandwich he was carrying that he had been carrying while attacked. And the sandwich was completely intact. It was uneaten and completely intact. I mean, two men attack you, they pour acid on you. and But that sandwich... Yes, that came through it all. That came through it all. That was like, so if they had released those details in the first place, nobody would have fallen for it. So it was like, it's just bizarre. It's it's just bizarre that they that the police went along with it. In, in other words, in, in, in that sense, they were, they're part of the hoax. They're, 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 they're really part of the collaborators of this, this bullshit. And so... Uh, you know what's funny? I I wouldn't be. It wouldn't surprise me if he were to some degree beholden to Trump and coming up with this so that people wouldn't take black claims of uh, you know hate uh, hateful attacks seriously. Absolutely, Ab absolutely. Mm. That's a that's a logical that's a logical speculation. It's uh it's not beyond reason. <laughs> it's uh, uh well when you have Oliver North as a commentator. Yes. Uh, you're kind of, uh, you know, yes. you're kind of on some kind of, you have a war criminal, a literal person who lied to Congress. Yes. And yes. pick up their right hands, who wore in the Bible, and yes. still lied to Congress, right? And yes. People of the United States. Well, Fox News is like, let's hire him. <laughs> yes. Oh, not only that, don't forget he was president of the NRA. They. Uh... Oh, that's right. Yes. Yeah, it was. Uh, we're 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 in a world of of insanity. It's the lunatics are running the asylum. But uh, yes, with with all of that in mind, uh, you know, you could go in that direction, or you can go anywhere you want. Just um, hold a round table. I will. Uh, myself says the fact that Sammy says the fact that you're eating Subway sandwich in Chicago, he should be thrown in prison. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, by the way, what, what's uh what, what um like uh. Just why? Because they, they, there's so, there's so many good sandwiches in Chicago, like delis. There, there is there is way better food in Subway, even at night. I mean, eat a damn bologna, a fried bologna sandwich would be better than, <laughs> than a Subway ah. sandwich. You know, it, it's just it's ridiculous. Like, come on, you know, Subway. I mean, come on, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Ah. I mean, Chicago's a great food town to begin with. I mean, there's nothing but fat people there, so <laughs> it's already ah. sketchy. Yes. I mean, all people, yeah. all people do during winter there is hibernate and eat. I mean, come on, yes. really? Yeah. In the dead of winter, you go want cold lettuce yes. and some some type of a processed meat. Come on, really? Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you. Oh my God, that's it's true. It's true. No, no, that is bizarre. That's that's it's it's just I I know I've eaten a, a few times at Subway because the franchise is owned by individuals, and um, my understanding is that they're 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 pretty fucked up in a number of ways. They're like dying because they were like. Um, uh, they were trying to sell their sandwiches for as cheap as possible, and that really fucked over the franchise owners. I mean, each one of those owners of a franchise is like a individual family or owner, and uh, they're, they're all stuck paying these kinds of uh, like high overhead in, especially in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So, so um, it was pretty sad, and uh, you know, there was a while there that it was just an easy place to go to. I would pick it up because it was cheap and uh, filler food. It's filler food, but it's uh, 
But um, yeah, it's there you go. And so he was like, uh, and that alone was caught on camera. He was hovering around the uh, uh, the subway for like he was he was making like three trips around it or something, waiting for the bully boys to show up so that they could beat him. It, it's just awful, you know. The, uh, so oh my gosh. It, yeah, it was in colder weather than what we got here in San Francisco. Of course, it was like sub zero or something like that when. They went through the whole process and um but you know he had to have that sandwich and of course that's why once he got it he protected that with his life yeah <laughs> and, yeah well, well by that point in those temperatures the thing would be hard as a rock so he i mean if he were really assaulted he'd be able to use that as a weapon yes to fend them off yes oh oh my god and and there are so many other aspects to this that i hate to bring up because it's the fact that you know, the big deal was it wasn't just that he was black of course it was that he was flamingly gay and that he had to make that part of the victimization and uh so you, you've got this like heavy blue district of chicago which is primarily black and primarily democrat and yet he's claiming that two white guys with maga hats are you know attacking him and screaming maga country you know it would be that would be like two black guys beating you up in the deep south and <laughs> saying i mean granted there are plenty of all black neighborhoods in the deep south but think of an all white area where two black guys are beating you up and saying this is yeah uh, yeah can i can i add an analogy yeah um it's like me prophesizing during pride week when i was in san francisco and saying this is god's country um <laughs> they would probably laugh at <laughs> yes Yes. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. It's just ridiculous. It's senseless, senseless. Yes, and then, um, and what, what was the other aspect of that? Of course, because I, I try my best to just forget it because it's so painful. But um, uh, so you, you've got this gay guy, and he's 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 like made it much more dangerous for gay people because of the nobody believing the attacks and uh um... yeah and 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 the problem is that people in the uh quilts bad badge plus community have a problem being believed on the onset yeah. so he exas he he exacerbates the problem by making it worse which is why i am fairly certain that he is hiding a maga hat somewhere yes no no that makes sense that makes sense and uh so so you had this guy who had um and by the way he was doing well at that point in his career it wasn't he had a good paying acting job uh on empire and all the rest of that i mean but it wasn't enough he was he was so psychotically in need of attention that he had to have the victim chic he had to have the victimhood and um so it, it was just there's, there's a true pathology there. It's it's awful, and it's painful to look at. Um, so I'm going to show these can, hyperlinks. He, yeah, go. he can uh, join the ranks of uh, he can join Chappelle, uh, Joe Rogan, Elon Musk, and uh, what do you call it? Oh gosh, who's that other person? Oh, all of yeah, them. He, he, <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 basically, he could join them in the uh, I'm, I, I want to be Trump's best friend card. Oh, Kanye West. There we go. The, the, uh, I, I want to be friends with Trump card. You know, that's right. That's right. Who was the gay guy who was, a, again, was uh, basically Trump's lover is uh, his bottom boy. I'm trying to remember that guy uh, had the Greek as hell name. Uh, gosh. My, Milo Yiannopoulos. Yes. Thank you. I could never oh, have gotten is, that out. Is, is that is that that ancient aliens guy? No, 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 no. It's it, they, he also has an unpronounceable Greek name, but uh, no, it was Milo. I believe he's setting the. I believe he said Trump's his daddy or something. Y yes, yes, that's right. Milo Yiannopoulos used to call Trump daddy, and he said that publicly. And Trump would would take it. It's like Trump never rejected it or or protested. And uh, like I said, the <laughs> the only person who calls me daddy is my son who uh, back when he was female was uh actually my physical intimate so i i think that milo and trump had it going uh but uh milo yiannopoulos uh, it, the name you don't hear anymore he's up there with jesse smollett so that would be an example of what jameson is alluding to a flamingly gay individual who is also extraordinarily right wing on the radicalized uh side and uh james forsyth says good evening douglas peter and all and james forsyth says his deceit was so transparent with uh smollett's pan stereotypic yelps <laughs> 
<laughs> yes. Uh, by the way, um, thank you everyone for gathering. Make certain, of course, to uh, press the upvote because, as always, when we start the program, we get assaulted by the bots, and uh, hopefully that doesn't become uh, a thing throughout the night like uh, it did uh, the last episode. They were really hitting us. The bots were like uh, in the chat room, and it was just uh, constant. But I do notice that I see them on um, other channels as well, like the channel I use for a bookmarker, which is like a screensaver channel. And I do want to bring this up so that everyone hears this because our man Jameson Reese, he entered a, uh, he entered a comment and it did not display. So YouTube has it out for Jameson Reese. And so here is what Jameson Reese said. And uh, Jameson Reese said, um, Unsurprisingly, the Democrats are utilizing nothing to stop insurrectionists from stalking and destroying the government. I believe you meant to say stalking weapons, I, I presume, or attacking. Maybe you meant to say attacking and destroying the government. Then he went on to say, I've no faith in the future of this hellhole. <laughs> The enabling of this was evident by how much they did not take the insurrectionists seriously enough by imprisoning them without bail. These are people who should be in Guantanamo Bay with the all to suppo suppose it Islamic extremists in quotes, yet due to privilege and racism, they are sure to end democracy as dysfunctional as it was as we knew it into totalitarian hell. The fact Trump is still a free man is baffling in and of itself. This never was a safe country to retreat to unless you are white, but now it will be far worse. Pitiful. Absolutely pitiful. So I did want to get that out there. This was entered by Jameson Reese, and uh, of course, you know, it's, it's, it's a very, how would I say it? He was in, uh, shall we say, he, I'll, I'll put it this way. I'm still optimistic because the one thing that will happen will be civil war. And um, I am optimistic that, uh, and I, I'm going to say this bluntly, it would be a civil war essentially between Republicans and Democrats. And I'm confident the Democrats will win. Uh, there's several reasons for my confidence in this regard. For one thing, I'm among them. <laughs> so, but aside from that, aside from the fact that they have myself as a resource, uh, there is the fact that... Uh, we are dealing with uh, the fact that the Republicans have, have just taken the route where they're ever more exclusive. They're, they're more exclusionary. And since they're more and more exclusive and exclusionary, there's less and less of them uh, on their side. Uh, the fact that each one of them harbors an arsenal, uh, well, they only have two arms each. So it's not like, uh, as for the military, even though the majority of it is reactionary, uh, the fact remains that once the thing, the whole operation starts disintegrating, uh, then they don't have the logistics behind them, the military, that is. And besides, it's not like they're a good military. They've lost every war they've ever fought. So there you have that. Uh, there's several factors here that are actually um, uh, cause for optimism. Uh, but uh, it wanted to make certain uh, uh, Daniel Arola, he's welcome to come on with us if he wants. And uh, Daniel Arola says, just he says, uh, Donald Trump is the Jesse Smollett of American politics, and yes, I agree. And uh, and and Daniel, um, you know, um, you're welcome to give him a call and see if he comes on. If he doesn't respond, that's fine. But uh, he he's been kicked off Facebook, but I noticed a lot of people have said that, and um, Facebook is going through a lot of problems, and um, um, you may well be kicked off, but I'm not quite sure how effective they are keeping you off. Um, this wonderful uh, lady down in Ecuador, uh, uh, Joyula Reinenbert, who I've, who's been in contact with me for years, um, she says that uh, Facebook blocked her for 90 days, and I believe this was because she was very concerned about vaccines and um was posting something that they may have responded to but she seems to be still accessible so um people seem to be under the impression that they're locked out of course with with daniel he's probably really locked out <laughs> but it, uh you can always start another fake uh, page just like uh you know daryl neely does with that um let me bring on all the other gentlemen to uh introduce a round table while i get the hyperlinks uh on all the posts up and uh please 
least by all means take it away um uh you know brandon young if you could start with uh maybe a little bit about uh what is it that you're comfortable with teaching kids aside from is that when they have you like um coaching the basketball is that all you do or do you also do some like academic courses as well in teaching i'm just curious yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I, I do um, uh, four different academic courses, um, essentially uh, math, wow. uh, what they call ELA, which is language arts, wow. um, and then social studies, which is, for me, the, the funniest, or not the funniest, but the saddest. <laughs> because, like, it's, it's both. Tragic comedy. Go yeah, on. It's a tragic comedy. Um, and, um, you know, like for today's lesson, you know, I just, I was talking to a colleague today about, um, if we only could teach our own things, you know, which is, of course we can't, we have textbooks made by the oil companies, yeah. um, that are promoting a thing called common core, which oh, essentially is still teaching the, this narrative of Columbus and the age of exploration, uh, which did exist, of course, but it's, um, you know, it, it doesn't get into any depth um, too much. It kind of glosses over the um, the uh, indigenous um, rights and the indigenous uh, uh, civilization, essentially. I mean, it's, it really is uh, intellectual colonialism in a weird way. So yeah. um, I try to drop little hints of um, uh, sort of knowledge or just to sparks at this age, at the age of fifth grade and middle school, you know, these kids are just coming from uh, like elementary school where they haven't had school essentially in like two years. And so they're in vastly underdeveloped in some ways. So all you can do is hope for the best and uh, do your best. And that's what I, I try to do uh, every day is because is, education, you know, that's how you change people really. Um, you know, um, you don't change it by violence, right. you know, you don't change someone's opinion with violence. It never works. It does in fact the opposite as we always see. Right. Yeah. So to change it through education, um, and through nonviolent means, uh, is a hard, uh, painstaking process, you know, and, um, and so, but uh, I mean, I don't see any other purpose in the world for myself and, um, uh, at this point. It is a vocation in a sense of uh, a calling. Yeah. Uh, some, as some people have a calling to be in various religious orders or something like this. Yeah. For me, it is it is that sort of calling. So, yeah, I do teach a number of different things. Um, but uh, I don't – the choices of which um, that are there to be, to be taught – uh, are very limited, uh, let's just say, because of the MCAS system and because of this common core public school system, unfortunately. Yeah. No, I, I really appreciate your courage in this. And uh, by the way, we have somebody who's rubbing against their microphone just so that they know that. Uh, and uh, so it's uh, there. <laughs> so that's not bad. Wait, or either there or they have a pet cat uh, that may be rubbing against the microphone. Uh, and uh, there's plenty of that going around. Uh, and uh, Sammy Romero just provided a terrible link about um, maybe you can tell us about this. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, oh, yeah. Yes, that, that was probably me. I'm sorry. Yeah, um, no worries. Uh, yeah, this this case in southern Georgia where uh, you know forced labor of uh, immigrants and mostly brown people, just to put it in a nutshell, somebody profited this from this forced labor uh, in the last, I'd say maybe half a decade, millions of dollars. Somebody profit off of this, um, and I saw a YouTube video about this, and and I'll skim through a little bit, but it's it's barely getting. Uh, uh, any traction now as far as just even being announced and it's it's just amazing um what um and this is what i'm trying to, and this is i think this is where you made a great point is that all these other distractions of uh, of cases of what they use as, stoo as stooges like the smollett case to try to 
just disregard what's really going on with this human trafficking that's been going on for ages. And uh, really nothing's being done. It's just being announced that, oh, there has been this human trafficking and people have made millions of dollars off of this and no one, no one's in handcuffs. It's just, it's almost like we caught you guys, but just don't do it again. That's so awful. Do you remember a case in Texas where there were half a hundred people in a single home in a case like that? And uh, most of them, of course, Latin American. And this was a human trafficking case. And uh, I'm, I'm certain nobody was arrested. Uh, maybe those people were brought out of that situation, discovered and uh, perhaps introduced to some social programs, hopefully. But uh, I don't believe anyone ever went to jail with that. Do you remember that case? Or There's so many cases like that. I'm, I'm, uh, I wouldn't blame you if you'd never heard of it. But uh, I thought I brought it up a long time ago, maybe two years ago, three years ago, something like that. But uh, that's what this reminds me of. And, of course, that would have been part of this kind of networking. Uh, so just uh, talk about your real terror network. Is this kind of human trafficking that is ongoing throughout the... We're still a slave-based economy. And um, that's something that uh, needs, to be, uh, needs to be dealt with. And uh, this is, of course, uh, ultimately going to be the real dividing line of politics in the, the future at some point. But um, in terms of uh, that, that's just horrible. Um, I think, of course, our man Brandon Young is doing his best to teach children about uh, how this was part of our history. And uh, in that sense, he has a noble struggle, as he said, a calling. He's helping to uh, put the future into a better light by introducing children to some of these tasks. And, of course, uh, we um, have uh, Salman Sheikh, who is... Uh, uh, oh my God, who did he, he interview just recently? It was um, someone else, aside from Andrew Bartzi's, I noticed uh, you put that up there. And then there was, um, was it the same gentleman again, the same gentleman you were interviewing before? You just got that out. Tell people about your latest interview and that it's up now and where they can find it, Salman. Oh, uh, yes, Brother Douglas. So I recently interviewed a, a gentleman who lives in Thailand and he's here from the West and he, he points out the aspects of dealing with such a more disciplined culture, respectable culture, and how he, he found that in Asia they were able to contain COVID-19 in a much better rate than the, uh, the Western Americans were in general. So he talks about like Vietnam, Thailand, like the different countries that he was visiting during his teaching position, teaching English to the kids. And that's what he said, that over here in the West that we're basically – the people here are spoiled and they're rebellious against the system and they're not trying to do the right thing. While in Asia, they got it under control because they're, you're dealing with a much disciplined culture, people who have a culture, a grounding, understanding the, the aspect of loving each other and trying to do the right thing. So that's the, some factors that he pointed out, how Asia was able to get the, the virus under control in much better rate than the West or America in general. And it's interesting uh, you all mentioned Subway earlier because majority of the Subways are owned by Asian Indians, just like the 7-Elevens and the Dunkin' Donuts. And uh, what, the other thing was, as time goes on, and it's very admirable what Brother Brandon Young is doing also. So what, as, t as time goes on, we're going to see that there's going to be a shift in the education system, like he pointed out, that there, all, all of these oil barons are writing all of the, the textbooks. So as time goes on, people will start to realize what is the truth, what are lies, and I believe we will see some kind of change in the education system within the next 10 to 20 years when people will just stop tolerating the lies being taught to their children. And especially now with the Roswell deception and demystification of World War II, this destroys majority of the World War II curriculums in all schools across America. So I think as time goes on, it's... It's wonderful the work you're, you're all doing, Brother Douglas, Brandon, and uh, it's just going to basically put the foundation for the next shape of humanity, for the next uh, 2020s, heading into the 2030s, and with the age of the internet and things being more connected, the world being more connected, who knows, you know, the sky's the limit for all of us. But at the same time, to handle crisis such as COVID and other things that are going on, we need to do the right thing and listen to brothers like Brother Douglas who have seen the world 
and this gentleman who has went to Asia and has seen the reality for himself too. So uh, I, I thank you all for what you're doing. Yes, yes, and uh, bless you. The, you. You're so kind. Tell us a bit about what uh, intrigued me the other day was when we were talking about uh, being afraid to go out or in certain areas of the city, uh, and you did allude to that in your city. So tell us a bit about your city and what aspects of it are the most dangerous. You know, it's interesting, Brother Douglas. If, if, if you're a Muslim and if you go to the most dangerous neighborhoods in Philadelphia, like if, if I'm wearing my, my prayer cap and I have my beard and I, I look the part, yeah. then in the most dangerous neighborhoods of America, like nobody will touch you. Nobody will say anything to you. And they will actually come up to you and give you salam and give you greetings. Because in the Philadelphia area, majority of the prison system is dominated by Islam and the Muslims. Yeah. So when they, see, when they see a Muslim walking around in certain neighborhoods, uh, they won't dare come and touch you. So you do have that kind of layer of protection around you if you resemble that appearance. So mm -hmm. I, I did notice that when I was walking around many of the uh, the no-go areas of Philly. Wow. That's, that's deeply appreciated. Uh, thank you for sharing that. And uh, so uh, aside from that, though, how, how how's the crime been? Shootings, etc. Is it just uh, escalating? Or when you go to the park, are you afraid that stray shots will <laughs> eventually? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it, it's funny because I actually live in the suburban area, but I'm only like five minutes away from Philadelphia. <laughs> but the, the thing going on in Philly and the suburban area is the crime is getting out of control. So... I mean, the city has already for 2021 has crossed 500 homicides. And recently there was a, a groom who was getting married and he was outside smoking a cigarette and somebody came up and robbed him of his Rolex watch. So uh, what's going on is what you pointed out in the monologue in a very beautiful manner with the Kyle Rittenhouse situation is that everyone's going to start like carrying weapons and they're going to lose their faith in the system and they're just going to try to protect themselves. And in the last uh, two weeks alone, I, I heard news stories where this pizza shop was getting robbed and the guy was cho uh, choking his mother. He was a 14-year-old kid, and he grabbed the gun and shot the thief in the face. While in the other situations, there was a uh, delivery driver delivering pizza. There were people coming trying to rob him, and he, he shot them both. I think he killed one of them, too. So a as time goes on, we're going to see a rise in vigilantism because people are losing faith in the police system. And they're losing faith in the DA and the mayor. Like, these people are not doing anything. Our kids are being killed out here. Violence and uh, the, the, the drug warfare is on the rise. And inflation's on the rise. People are getting desperate. So I, I think as time goes on, not just Philadelphia, but major cities across America, we might see this rise of vigil vigilantism that Brother Douglas alluded to in his monologue that people are just going to start losing their faith in the system and start taking things in their own hands. Thank you. No, a very frightening uh, scenario. And uh, so um, by all means, uh, all of you other gentlemen join in on this, uh, whether you're all going to join in on the vigilantism or you know, share with us. Uh, well, well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I'm looking for some old style of flechette guns <laughs> since I can't own a traditional firearm. <laughs> you know, you, you actually, you'd be surprised that some of these airsoft um, guns uh, are pretty fucking vicious, and I wouldn't yeah, want to be in I, front well, of them. Well, well the thing is, I found I was able to find a rifle that shot, fires flechettes that's used for hunting, and um, it's an air rifle. But the thing is, it's 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 able to kill very large game. So you know, without a doubt, something like that will fell a man. You you really just need to pierce flesh. You know, our tissue is soft. Yes. Literally the consistency of a watermelon. You know, yes. if it goes through a watermelon, you're good. Yeah. That's no, what you know, need. It's, it's interesting, Brother Jamo, you mentioned that because I was thinking of what Brother Douglas said, that as long as you look out the window and you don't see rioting and pillaging, then that means it's a good day. But I think with the way America is going, we're getting closer to that, the way the society is falling apart. Yeah. Yes. Well, well, yes. And again, this is because this is being enabled from the inside and this is why i've been very critical about the democratic party because 
I voted Democrat, so now I have every reason to bitch and complain. <laughs> Unlike, you know, I, I mean, contrary to the joke that, um, what's his name? Um, oh gosh, who was that famous comedian? Uh, Car- what was his name? Uh, oh, you know, the guy who was the conductor on, um, oh shit. Uh, oh, he's, he's a y- funny y- guy, too. Y- yeah, 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 you're talking about Jackie Gleason? No. <laughs> no, 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 no. He was the conductor on like that kid's show, but he's he's funny as hell. The guy who curses a lot. Conductor on a kid's show who curses a lot. Who yeah, the yeah, fuck was that? A white, a, white, a white guy with like the white beard. Uh, a white um, guy with a white beard? Who the fuck? I oh have my gosh. No... Uh, famous comedians. Oh, oh my gosh. He's one of the most famous joke, comedians. Well, well, I mean, so, but but obviously he had a shtick that was, that is applicable here. It's somehow relevant. Oh, George, George Carlin. George Carlin. George okay. Carlin. Yeah. He, 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 he said, yeah. if you didn't vote, you, then, then you have every reason to complain. Plain. Well, I, I I understand how that's funny, but in, to be honest, it's it's actually quite the opposite. If you didn't vote, you actually don't have reason to complain because you weren't complicit. Whereas if you did vote and you didn't get what you wanted, you have every reason to complain because, again, these are people you elected and these are people who you allowed to get into office. So you had best do some complaining and you best write to them. You best, you know, you best uh, send emails to them. You uh, do whatever you can to make these uh, politicians who you elected do their fucking jobs. Because as it stands, um, the the uh, transmission that uh, you gave uh, last week scared the shit out of me because I realized that, you know, if we have all these radicals going into the Republican Party as, you know, officials, these are some of the most corrupted individuals on the planet, and and they're actually going to have a degree of power and control. That's a big fucking problem. Yes. Yeah. No, definitely appreciate what you're saying. And uh, this is why Elizabeth Warren, who uh, Trump always uh, denigrated as Pocahontas because she tried to uh, commit some cultural appropriation herself by claiming she was of Native American extraction. Uh, when... She probably did think that she was because there's yeah. another actress who yeah. thought she was as well. Um, oh, that's that cute actress who I had a crush on for so long, too. Um, oh, my God. Gosh, the chick who was in Flipper. Oh, I, I oh. don't remember. You, 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 oh, you're talking Jessica about... Alba. What? Jessica Alba. Oh, okay. Jessica right. Alba. Right. Y- Jessica yeah, Alba, she... right. The Filipina with her brother. The one who was uh, apparently, this is what everybody, well, apparently she did have an incestuous relationship with her brother. The funniest thing I saw was some somebody had a photograph of her looking all sexy in bed, given the finger, you know, by that I mean the, 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 the come hither finger, not the fuck you finger, but the, like, come here, you know, the, that finger, and uh, then uh, in lingerie, and uh, obviously a publicity still, but somebody said, the photograph was taken by her brother. I <laughs> know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, I, I mean, she's fine, and she's, 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 she's cool and everything, but she, she, she's, she shouldn't have been the invisible woman in the Fantastic Four, okay? I mean, that's like, that's supposed to be, the invisible woman in Fantastic Four is supposed to be the old, white, classic, suburban mom uh, look. And they get this Filipino chick to play. It just didn't, it just didn't wash. It was not. She's, she's still, well, she's the only thing that makes, probably makes the movie watchable. Other than that, it's just unwatchable. <laughs> hey, yeah, Arguably. Got it. Uh, I'll go for that. I'm not going to argue with that. That's uh, yeah, it's, it's all right. Yeah, it's um, but uh, yeah, I, I just thought it was just you know um, that the, the role was you know I can understand with Aquaman they had to change that because it was just he was like blonde haired, blue eyed Nordic, and it was like the old kind of you know, and then they just said, well, let's make him more Polynesian looking, and that that had some sense to it. But with the fantastic, well, yeah, it, you know, it, it actually worked in his case. Um, yeah. Yes, it did. It did. It did. And I, I, I liked the woman who was the redheaded chick who was supposed to be the queen of Atlantis with him. And I understand they changed that because all the reactionaries got together and they, they got her kicked out because of her politics or something like that. Are you, are you serious? Yes. No, they, you have no idea what power these incels have. They, they spend all day at home online and they destroy the uh, acting careers of all these women you, you you should see how they were attacking the woman who was in miss marvel now granted that the 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 woman who was in miss marvel 
the film the film's a failure because it's just she's just too fucking overpowered <laughs> there's nowhere to go oh, with that but yeah but that's that, that that's pretty much what miss marvel was, was yeah the it, comics yes. though yeah in a sense i mean i guess i mean what could you do with that plot wise but you know that, that being said uh she basically expressed the fact that uh she was really alarmed at the fact that when she was introducing outing the film when she was doing the debutante part where they're announcing the film that all the journalists in front of her were all a bunch of white men and uh she said why don't we let some of the women in the room and it turned out all the women had been forced outside of the room uh to like the men had basically forced all the women outside of the room and so she said let's let the woman come to the front and the men got all pissed off about it, and then they start shitting all over her on the uh, internet and everything else they lied and uh said all things she never said uh claimed that she said oh i hate men and all this crap so uh oh shit yeah. i'll say it. i'll say it for her i hate men thank you i yes i've said that plenty of times too myself yeah and uh oh so my uh, oh my god just just what bullshit and um so and they they wrecked it for her and uh they were like doing all kinds of things like they would go on rotten tomatoes and rotten tomatoes had to change their whole system because this rotten tomatoes has you know the ability for people to give feedback on a film and uh before the film was released they were all given it zeros you know just like uh you know the people attacking me on amazon uh trying to give uh the zero star reviews uh so um this is why salman sheikh has always been adamant that when people get on amazon to amazon to report them but like maria gregorich said she reported them repeatedly and nothing is done so they're obviously uh you, they're obviously protected the, the the whole system is uh is uh jacked and uh many well this is this is the problem with the freedom of speech amendment is that the freedom of speech amendment only protects those who are destroying people thank you it thank doesn't you. attack it doesn't does nothing to defend the people who are being destroyed thank you Thank you. Yes. And uh, so I, I definitely appreciate uh, you're saying that it's 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 so offensive, so, so egregious and aggravating. And uh, and they're given all power and freedom. Uh, and uh, so our man Peter Moon indicates he will be joining us at the top of the hour. Uh, let's take advantage of the time that we have. <laughs> And uh, uh, everybody do get back into the round table. I'm going to withdraw. I'm not, I'm here, I'm here, but I'm going to withdraw from the conversation for just a few minutes. And, uh, and then when Peter gets on, then I can withdraw even further while he talks. And uh, just trying to get my head together because tonight there is really too fucking much to talk about. There is just too fucking much to talk about. And it's so overwhelming. I've got to kind of like get together a kind of note uh, pad and uh, just kind of get get into my head what I'll be speaking of. Uh, one of the things I do want to emphasize is it is yesterday was the birthday of uh, of Nostradamus. And uh, Nostradamus is, of course, uh, I'll go into a bit of that later, uh, a little bit of the history of him, etc. But uh, it, just so people understand, uh, he, obviously, one of the things I thought might be fun to do would be to go through his work and see what could be attributed to 2022. Uh, based on his astrological readings, what next year is going to be like? Um, the problem is the that question like, is was was he accurate or was he just like someone? <laughs> the beauty of Nostradamus or, is you can do whatever the fuck you want with him. But <laughs> I mean, it, it's like, just so open ended that it's impossible to really call them predictions more or less than cyclical patterns that can apply for any point in time. Yes. Yes. It, 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 I mean, what I can say is there is a sort of brilliance to it in that he's able to he was able to tap into the archetype while he was, you know, abusing the uh, oh, my gosh, what do you call those things? The, the, the delirience. Um, mm -hmm. What was it? Nightshade or something? He, uh, he was really big into one of those um, hallucinogenic uh, oh, I'm sure substances. He was. <laughs> I mean, yes. yeah. Well, that's the thing they're really good at getting you to tap into the sort of archetype of the human mind in general but you know as for specifics mm -hmm. he well, we, we, we really can't call it prophecy any more than we could call the tarot card you know the tarot cards prophecies yes. you know yes. they're patterns right 
Well, th- there's the there was this wonderful Italian film made in 1985 uh, called Demoni, and I prefer the Italian title infinitely to the English title, which is just demons. <laughs> but uh, uh, the uh, uh, the line that they attributed to Nostradamus, and they had a demon mask, which, by the way, was supposed to be the death mask of Nostradamus that had been like altered or um, shall we say um, uh, occulted in some fashion. And uh, that is like uh, the, the starting point of the horror story. And uh, it was uh, the, the quote from that film is, of course, uh, uh, never to be forgotten. And they attributed it to Nostradamus. And it was a fictitious quote, uh, but it was along the lines of uh, we shall Oh, God, I'll have to look the quote up. Uh, But uh, while I do that, and if I don't find it tonight, it's no big deal. Uh, We got a while yet because I figured that uh, in the few days we have remaining in the month of uh, December, uh, I'll turn back to this because, you know, between now and 2022, I figure um, each episode I might take on a different uh, prediction of his that is uh, applicable to our uh, to our situation um, to a hellscape <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, no no actually this is beneath hell i would call this the uh what do you call it the throne of mat which is act- which is actually supposed to be beneath sheol it's supposed to be like way way beneath this is of course this is going by the uh what do you call it the oh shit <laughs> Oh, this, this see this is what happens when you stop drinking and you stop doing alcohol hey, dude you i'm there I, you're talking you're preaching to forget the converted everything. yeah i mean I for, you know i i you know most people drink to forget i drink to remember and because i can't drink and because i don't drink anymore <laughs> now i can't remember anything no i i hear you i'm 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 right there with you except uh it has nothing to do with uh drinking it has to do with uh i i mean in, in not your type i mean i'm drinking yeah <laughs> but it's uh at any rate it has to do with other drugs uh, but uh, in in that case of course like i said i saw the video of uh solid shake the other day uh about are you ready to give up the uh you know the demon of drink <laughs> yeah and uh it, yeah of course you know i think i put you know like a thumbs up on it just to be supportive but you know it's obvious you know i i honestly reached the point where i am i i have to do it doesn't serve anymore well, good. I, I'm, sure, I'm sure the brain uh, will re- rewire itself using neuroplasticity of some degree, which these brains seem to be good at. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay, good. Good. That, that, there we are. And uh, with that, we, we turn back to the other gentleman in the room. Uh, obviously, uh, I don't think that uh, our man Salman has ever um, experimented with alcohol very much, but perhaps the other gentlemen have. Perhaps you can relate your experiences with it. Um, anything that comes up for Brandon and and Sammy here about um, you know drinking? Oh experience. yeah. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, you go first. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, I really don't drink rarely, and if I do, it's like you know just casually. But even then, I don't even finish a drink. The reason why I don't drink is everybody in my family uh, are they're sad drinkers, so all their problems come out. Yeah. Uh. And um, it's very off-putting and depressing, and it's just it, it totally a turnoff. So I I don't drink. You know, I have some of my cousins talking about how many miscarriages they had and their divorce and stuff. And and I understand that you know everybody takes it different, but my family they're just they're not good drinkers. It's, it's just not. So I I really, they kind of ruined it for me. So that's the reason why I don't drink. Thank you. (laughs) And Brandon? Yeah, well, I happen to, um, I mean, growing up Portuguese, uh, you're served wine at the table at like 10 years old. No, it's true. Yeah, go on. So it was just part of what life uh, growing up is just you have a sip of of wine here and there. But it was only moderation. It was only celebratory (laughs) special events and such. Um, but as I grew older, I did grow a accustomed to, and I did end up liking uh, different spirits. But everything in in moderation. I, and, but I do agree and uh, with us uh, in respect, uh, Solomon Path. 
mm-hmm. which is um, Islamic. And, uh, you know, as, you know, a friend told me, you know, in Saudi Arabia, they'll pour wine for you, but you shouldn't, you never drink it. Um, it, it would be impolite to drink so, drink it. They just have it for, for kind of for show. And alcohol is actually said in Islam uh, as sort of a demonic, sort of like a spit. It's like a spit out, you know, it's um, because you think about it, alcohol will kill you in the desert. Yes. Uh, so anyway, but um, I think moderation, I've never had a problem with it. I know many people who have, and I feel terrible that those people have had problems with it because um, in a celebratory fashion and in moderation, it's actually one of the most enjoyable things, uh, in my opinion. <laughs> I'll go for that. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, Salman, of course, you take it from there. I mean, uh, obviously, the Arabic culture is very different from the Pakistani culture. And uh, oh, of course, of course, brother Douglas. But first, I will say, like those those gang stalkers that Amazon is not doing anything about. I assure you, on the day of judgment, Allah will punish all of the cultists and gang stalkers including Stevie Rimjob and Dickie Cunt Cole with the punishment of the severest hellfire that there is. But in terms of the Pakistani culture, Brother Douglas, and the uh, Arabic culture, you'd be surprised. Like A lot of these uh, Arabs that come over here to America, especially the ones that have money, yeah. I saw a lot of them in the Philadelphia area, uh, the area that has like um, – a lot of money these these people are going to ivy league schools with paid scholarships getting salaries with a full-time job even though they're not doing anything and you see them the things that they can't do in saudi arabia they're doing it here like drinking and going to strip clubs and i i think a lot of these people just like what what you pointed out one time that they're just cultural muslims Mm -hmm. even though islam forbids you to stop drinking and it tells you that alcohol or alcohol al ghul the demon that basically you're opening yourself up uh, as a gateway for these different entities to kind of overtake your body and you see that many times those that have worked in law enforcement any situation that involved alcohol it was not a good situation so many stories you hear about girls uh, it was here in philadelphia area about a few years ago there was a girl who under the influence she walked walked off with a guy and the guy ended up killing her So it's just so many stories that you hear involving alcohol. And I imagine if there was no alcohol in this country, how many people, how how would this society be impacted and how would it change overnight? I always think about that factor that imagine if it all disappeared overnight, this demon that's been destroying lives, domestic violence, people fighting with each other, people not in control of themselves, uh, fathers abusing uh, mothers in, in front of their children, those kind of scenarios, uh, people ending up dead, car crashes, so many things, scenarios you could think of. And I imagine if this thing was not here, how better would this country be? But that's you know my, my opinion on that matter from a spiritual perspective, because I've seen alcohol bring the worst out in people in this area also. In terms of like relations and what what that drug can do to you in many ways. Yes. No. Thank you. It's so true. It it, it is very much. Uh, it's insidious. It's incredibly in, insidious. And uh, so uh, with that, um, I, I turn it back over to the other gentleman, of course. In the few minutes we have remaining before um, our man Jameson brings Peter on, uh, do uh, bring up anything else you want to bring about in this regard. Can you guys oh. hear me? Oh yes, we can hear you. Yes, speaking of alcohol, I'm just kidding. So, so go yeah. on, Daniel. Tell us about what's going on. I have not been drunk plastered in over a decade, so I'm very proud of that. So I own the bragging rights to that fact. Um, I man, I got a lot of stories when it comes to working around uh, establishments that sell alcohol as a bouncer. Uh, you know, I've I've <laughs> I've had to deal with a whole bunch of drunk patrons especially in military towns oh man those are the fun those are the most fun ones mm-hmm. yeah. man mm-hmm. and those guys man when they're drunk especially especially when they got off, especially after, after they got off deployment and they and they start telling all this shit that they gone through in the desert mm-hmm. stuff the stuff that you probably that you probably never read about on the internet you know yeah but these these guys are so plastered or they're, they're 
they're home, they're depressed, something is missing in their lives. That's probably why they're at that club, you know. So they they got to tell they got to tell their stories. Right, right. Yeah. And and thank you. No, uh, and uh, so uh, oh my God, they're gonna release Avatar. I noticed that they're gonna release a sequel to Avatar of all things. I mean, it's like decades. Oh, oh, wait, wait a minute. Which Avatar? Are we talking about the fail, the failure of uh, that Indian dude? Uh, no, no. You're talking about that that original film. I noticed. I, I don't want to detract from what Darman Daniel is saying. So go on. It was the original film from 20 years ago. That movie Avatar, if you might remember that. Uh, hey. So, so Daniel, go on. Okay. Uh, anyway, um, yeah. I, of course, there, there's all there's also there's also the guys that that get combative as well. Uh, that's that's also one of the other reasons I quit drinking because yeah, when when I knew I had a buzz, I I wanted to get into a fight. I found myself wanting. Well, not only did I want to fight, I liked to fight, and I and every time I catch myself. Uh, remembering that when I'm when uh, when I was buzzed, I'm thinking, "Holy shit, I better quit this shit," you know, mm-hmm. because uh, you know, because when when I know I want some, I'm usually likely to get it. But uh, something somehow, um, something somehow um, was able to stem that impulse for me to follow up on. Mm-hmm. You know, I, maybe it's maybe it's because of the years I've worked as a bouncer in clubs. Who knows? But all, all I knew was I, I did not want to be one of those guys that I used to kick out of the bar. No, very yeah. important point. And uh, thank you so much. And I hope you'll hang with us as long as you wish. And uh, uh, certainly uh, you, you, Peter Moon should be with us by now. And uh, hopefully he'll say hi to each and every one of you. Uh, Peter, are you there? Yeah, I just there. I, I heard Daniel talking. Yeah. And hello to Daniel. Hello to Salman. I think Good Sam Peter. is here, and hello to him, and, and Jameson. Yeah. Hey, what's up, Peter? Yes. yes, hi. I got your message. Thank you. Wonderful. And uh, so uh, did uh, Peter miss anybody? Um, don't forget, I'm going to be distracted for a little bit. Here. No. So uh, it says uh, Amanda's here, but she's probably kind of here. Oh, Amanda, are you here, honey? Uh, let me see. Uh, Mandy, I- I speak I'm out, here. would you? Would you? Let's hear her, her lovely voice if she's here. Yeah. She's, she's, she's kind of here. Yeah, she's not here. <laughs> and, and, and Brandon is here. Yes. Yes, Brandon. I am. Hello. Uh, hi, Brandon. And uh, Clarice. I, I don't know Clarice. Clarice is here? Clarice, are you here? It says Clarice is here, but I don't know Clarice. Oh, okay. Oh, she may have been called and she didn't respond. You know, some of these people are called and then they're, they they have the ability to jump on the call if they wish. But, um, you know, they're not really here on the call. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, hey, by the way, I, I can start us off with uh, bringing up the fact that, as I said, my idea was since yesterday was the birthday of Nostradamus, I was uh, going through his predictions to find out what might be applicable to 2022. And... Uh, Obviously, this can take one anywhere, but it at least is an excuse for a history lesson and a, um, a, a projection into current affairs and where they might trend more than anything else. But just so people understand, uh, when it comes to uh, Nostradamus, uh, at this point, where we are at now in the timeline, uh, when people take a look at what people do with his uh, with his quatrains and just kind of warp and woof them in every imaginable way, uh, obviously most people would not be impressed, or at least uh, people who are like um, uh, skeptical by nature. Uh, however, uh, when he was alive, the reason he had such incredible uh, repute that lasted through the centuries is when he was alive, his predictions were incredibly prescient. So when he was alive and he said that uh, this guy's going to be Pope or this king is going to die, uh, his predictions were quite specific and uh, they overwhelmingly came to pass. So this is why he has the reputation that he does. Uh, but uh, obviously, uh, now that he's no longer with us, he's no longer here to interpret his work for us. And uh, therefore, it's very Did dirty. I ever tell you my Nostradamus story? No, I want to hear it. That's why I introduced, I led with okay. it. Well, yes. I, will, I will tell the Nostradamus story. Yeah. Um, and this, this has to do with a, a woman who uh, 
I was friends with and colleagues with. Her name was Odette de la Torre, and she was Parisian. And she was uh, born in France, where she became a medical doctor. And uh, she was my editor. Uh, she was the one who edited, and she's credited in, in the Montauk Project book with me because I had known her in the computer business, and uh, she was she she had become she was a doctor in France. She never got her medical license here, but because she was uh, bilingual, she was the voice of whatever they called it, the voice of France or whatever mm -hmm. uh, radio. Yeah. So she would interview. Jacques Cousteau or anybody, um, and, and I think she knew Ayn Rand, who would also appear in the same studio with her, and Ayn Rand would talk about UFOs all the time, interesting. Uh, which was interesting. But uh, she um, worked as a science fiction editor for Bantam, I think it was Bantam Books, and, and she used to deal with all of these science fiction authors, all the classic golden era ones. This was more in the 1950s, though. And they would just come to her in grief because nobody was marketing their books. The guy, the guys, it's you know, they, they as they say, the printer, they they get a book, uh, churn it, sell it, make their money on it. That's done. Mm -hmm. They're not going to market their authors. Mm -hmm. So these guys have classic names and stuff. You think they'd be rich? Not necessarily the case. Uh, Ray Bradbury would be an exception because he had um, movies and he had. Uh, he, he was uh, he had some good contacts. I believe he's also a Freemason, which didn't hurt. He was yeah. also very close friends with Walt Disney. But um, anyway, Odette had you know taught me how to. She ed line edited the book with me. I mean, she read every sentence and all this sort of thing. Now, uh, she she spoke a language. That is very rare. In addition to speaking uh, French, she spoke Languedoc. Languedoc. Yeah. That's the language of the Oc. Yes. Languedoc. Languedoc. Yeah, so that people understand this has to do with the French conquest and colonization of Indochina. So go on. I don't know what it has to do with Indochina, but it's Languedoc is a language uh, of southern France. Oh, really? Uh, I thought yeah. it sounded like a Cambodian dialect. <laughs> there might be a Cambodian dialect. No, but no, no, no. See, originally the people in the southern south of France spoke Languedoc. Long now this is lingua, the, the tongue de oc, O C. Okay. And there was the French in the north that spoke Languedoc. And now we oui, O U I is yes, means yes in French. They used to have a a uh, soft porn magazine called We. Uh -huh. uh, the French did. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, when whoever it was, whether it's the Catholic Church or the Freemasons or both, decided to create a language for France, it became Languedoc. And Languedoc became a obscure language. Mm -hmm. But the Languedoc was the language of the, the Cathars. Mm -hmm. And the early people. Now, William Henry uh, did some writing in one of his books where he talked about long dock, meaning ock, meaning light, O-C. O-C is the same as A-U-K in Egypt. A-K or A-U-K, ock. That means light in Egyptian. So it's the language of light. Now, this is theoretical it's it's it 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 was written with on authenticity by him i can't say it's not authentic but he said that this was the language that christ spoke the language of light and it would have been a uh so long duck became a hebrew uh associated with hebrew it was probably closer to the aramaic and it might have had some subtleties. But I really can't say because I'm out of my league here. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, whatever William Henry's information or speculations are, uh, that is, it, it should not be ignored because Ock also refers to the occult. So when you have OC, it's hiding the light. 
So it means it also means eye, ak, like an ocular. So you have light, eye. So the language de ak, there's a lot of, I guess what you'd say, ammunition just in the etymology for his, his theory being right, which obviously he read from somewhere. It's not something he made up. Uh, but anyway, there is stories of the, the migration of uh, Sarah, uh, the daughter of Jesus, according to the Cathar tradition or these hidden traditions. And I'm not going to digress into that. <laughs> I don't know where they really take you. They, they give some neat esoteric correspondences. But being from uh, France and, and being multilingual, Odette knew this uh, language of Languedoc, and she was a rare person to know it. Now, because she was in the publishing indus in industry, publishers wanted to, uh, they were pushing Nostradamus. Mm -hmm. And they had found a manuscript mm -hmm. uh, of a long lost uh, manuscript of Nostradamus that had been, I guess, hidden. He wrote it, he hid it to hide it from the church. He was always under pressure from the church. It, it got its way up into Holland. And it was discovered in modern times. Now, I don't know if this is the same one that the Germans got their hands on, but there was interpretations of Nostradamus's work by, I think, Goring's wife right. that t t tilted it to, to you know, the, to their favor. But what she did is she was hired to translate this lost work because this is what she said about the work. She said it was written in Languedoc, which was basically a tongue, but it had been written down. And the translators never understood it. Mm -hmm. They never understood it. So this was going to be the original because they take it and it looked like it had some French. So there was a lot of guessing and guesswork in it. So, But she had the authentic manuscript. She translated it and it turned out to be a uh, translation of a Jewish Hebrew edition of the Holy Bible. And when she she did this and said, this is what his work is, it's really the Holy Bible, uh, they buried it because they had a whole industry of Nostradamus right. that was done on uh, mistranslations. And this is what she told me. She said, thank you very much. We're not going to publish this. Right because it, it makes us look like a bunch of fools and we can make money. Right. This is what she told me. Yeah. It wasn't even so much that made them look like a bunch of fools. It was simply that they had an industry going that they weren't going to, you yeah. know, <laughs> it, it stopped. Well, well, yeah. And, and I will say one thing Odette told me, and, and this is like, because she was a uh, artist and a, and a doctor, you know, she would draw uh, the human body. Yeah, uh, and she did it medically, in research stuff that was done in France with, with medical accuracy. Uh, in other words, she was a uh, like a medical illustrator. Yeah, go on. yeah, she was hired to do some, and, and she she but she got involved in this research of uh, collagen and how to re keep the body from aging. Now you see a lot of collagen products on the market, but what she took. And what she said worked was to replenish your collagen is Knox gelatin. Knox gelatin, that's K-N-O-X. And she taught us to go to the supermarket and buy Knox gelatin and in packages. And then you'd mix it with uh, something to, to sweeten it up a little bit because it's unpalatable as it is and it kind of like paste. So you'd, she'd say mix it with brown sugar or we mix it with honey and consume it. And it was the reason she said to use Knox gelatin because it was made with the pig. It was gelatin of the pig. You want the pig because the pig is the closest to the human anatomy. So she, she recommended, you know, chewing this daily. Uh, I used to do it. In fact, I got a doctor interested in it who introduced, introduced me to ozone. And he taught us to buy big vats of it, you know, cheaper. You could always find, you know, big, uh, like a whole keg of uh, Knox gelatin uh, rather than in the package. It was much less expensive. That was just one thing I learned. Now they have all sorts of collagen products on the market. 
that are more expensive than that internally, externally. In any case, collagen is good and, and Douglas for you because you're into the cosmetology. Yes. Uh, I, I, you know. My vanity, yes. Well, it's, it's you know, n nobody, you know, wants to have too many wrinkles. I also tell you from Qigong, uh, you know, breathing is excellent. But yes. one thing you do is every night before you go to bed, you wrinkle your face every direction it can go. <laughs> you just move the body, move the nose, move the lips, move the area above the lips, move the chin, move the cheeks, move the forehead, and you you just move it like you're giving it a massage, only you're not using your hands. You're just using uh, the muscles and you're moving them. The, the body, it's, it's kind of like exercising your facial muscles. This is very good for it. And, uh, you know, my teacher, you know, didn't have any wrinkles on his face to the, to the day he died. Right. Excellent. Um, so it's, it's just a, a technique I share with people. Um, it's, it's kind of, uh, requires some discipline to think about, but anyway, that, that's my, my Nostrad. Oh, there's a little, another story on Nostradamus. Mm -hmm. I had this, you know, real mm -hmm. son of a bitch. Mm -hmm. Uh, who, who, you know, he liked my work supposedly, and then he's always like trying to do something to, you know, throw a barb at me or something. So he set me up with this uh, semi-famous author mm -hmm. who I saw on the History Channel talking about Nostradamus. And he, he was setting me up, asking me all these questions and setting me up to confront this guy without telling me. Mm-hmm. And what, a, what a son of a bitch. <laughs> he was, he, but that wasn't the worst of his antics. He is obsessive compulsive about me. Uh, he wants me to go and, and talk about Billy Meyer and go nonstop, uh, be, become a Billy Meyer uh, hornblower. Mm -hmm. And I told him, I said, look at I helped Randy Winters publish the book that when he went to visit Billy Meyer. I didn't want to publish it myself. Uh, and, and what Randy did, he, I taught Randy how to do it, where to go. And he, he did a book. I think he sold 17,000 copies, which is remarkable by going on Art Bell. Art Bell had him on. Of course. He sold 17,000 copies, but he got out of the publishing industry real quick because that's not what he was there to do. Right. You know, he did the book, uh, whatever money he made on it was, you know, uh, he made some money on it, I'm sure, but he, he wasn't he wasn't going to be in the publishing industry. It's not what he did. Uh, but the this guy that wasn't enough. This guy wants me to go and tell you how great Billy Myers is, how he's the key to you know everything. And <laughs> he's here to save you know, us all. Yes, I just you know you know this is and then he's obsessive compulsive as if he's possessed. But uh, with this this author, and I don't even remember the guy's name. Uh, the guy clearly, well, he clearly didn't know what he was talking about. He was also, he got very, very, not, you know, verbally violent over, you know, and started talking about my work. Oh, that's, that's not documented. You know, it's like, what, what, what does that have to do? What does my work have to do with what I just said? Yeah. I'm relaying a story I learned from somebody who was inside the publishing industry. You know, yeah. do I know that it's true? Well, no, but it's a story. It's a story. I, I, she had no motivation to lie to me. Yeah. And, you know, she knew all sorts of things because she knew, you know, she was a bottleneck for uh, French culture. And, and I knew her because my boss uh, grew up in France and he spoke French. That's how the connection was made. <laughs> and um, so be it. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure you got uh, plenty of others. Believe me, uh, don't be afraid to share everything you have because uh, that's what we're here for. And uh, you know you have uh, free sway uh, on the stage. Uh, uh, aside from uh, Nostradamus, of course, what else has been going on? Uh, how's your week been going? Well, I was pur purchasing furniture the last 24 hours. Sounds cool to me. What do you want to share about that? I'm sure it's, it's really, it's it's... It, it's 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 sort of stupid to talk about purchasing furniture, except that I'll have to wait about six weeks for it, a month if I'm lucky. 
Oh my God. Uh, but that's okay. That's okay. I mean, I wanted to purchase it astrologically now. Mm -hmm. It's better now than later because it, because if, you know, if I bought it later, it would arrive later. Yes. And, and it, 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 I can accept it. You know, the living room's enough to, to accept this stuff. It, it was very, the most challenging thing in buying furniture is to, is the dimensions. Okay. I have the dimensions of the room, which are very particular. It's a big room, but the dimensions are particular. And then the rug is particular. I, I inherited a rug from my daughter, which I like very much. And I want to use that rug. Now I could always buy a new rug, but it, it actually, it's perfect. So I have to, to make, you know, so then as I'm, uh, bought the furniture, um, uh, I then looked at other furniture, you know, I was looking at, it and I said, well, you know, I said, I really like that piece over there when I want to do the upstairs, he says, well, it doesn't come in the color you want. And I said, then I realized, and he agreed with me, before you design a room, it might be good to pick out the furniture first, mm. rather than to design the room and then find the furniture. Because it's sometimes hard to find the right furniture after you've designed the room. So it might be better to start with with the furniture, meaning predominantly in when you're dealing with the living room is a couch. So that was something I realized. First step, can it get through the doorway? Because uh, I, <laughs> you know, I, I almost bought a, a couple of sofas. Uh, this is when my, after my divorce and I, I redid the upstairs and I, I, I realized, I said, you know, I, I went to buy them. I was there to buy them. I said, you know what? These are not gonna fit through the door. So I nixed the purchase, and then we went and found, you know, the, the most delightful couch in the world. Mm -hmm. And that was great. So, and it barely fit. It actually ripped when they brought it through, and they they repaired it. Okay. You know, because it was just not enough space. So all of these things are a factor. And so much for buying furniture. It, it is very, uh, I guess, consuming of your attention. But it's done. And on, on to, um, uh, and, and the stores are empty. Mm -hmm. They're so empty. And you now on Long Island, you, you have to wear a mask, whether okay. it be you know, Whole Foods. I walk in there and you need a mask. They, they provided this very nice mask. Oh, cool. So they give you one. Well, they did in that case because, yeah. you know, they're just laying it on. She had a whole stack of Whole Foods masks. Mm -hmm. And I was just going in there to get a sandwich because I'd been furniture shopping and I didn't get home. So I just. And, and the nicest Chinese lady, I couldn't believe, I assumed she was Chinese. She wasn't Japanese. Uh -huh. She was she was as small as a chichoa. <laughs> That's adorable. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't, I'm sure she wasn't. She was so tiny and, and she was not skinny. And she started talking to me and we were all trying to compare all these smoothie drinks because I wanted something to drink and they all had sugar in them. She was saying, oh, too much sugar, too much sugar. Oh, that one has got, you know, and we were, we were sitting there trying to read the backs. Everything had too much sugar in it. Mm -hmm. So I, I bought a, uh, you know, a drink, a, a water drink. Mm -hmm. But um, it was very nice to talk to her. We were really, really getting into it. But it was only about sugar. I, I didn't digress into uh, um, into anything having to do with you, uh, which would have been interesting in itself. Right. But um, so the... Um, that's we'll always go, tempting, of course, but go on. Yes. Well, well it, it, it always is. Uh, it, it always is. And I would also say, what I found out is I, I went shopping at the store, mm -hmm. and the guy was, um, you know, he says, well, you know, if you come back tomorrow, it's it's VIP day every Wednesday, and you get a discount. Mm -hmm. And I, I was looking at this and another one, and I, 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 then I went online and found out there were even better discounts online. And the chat room discount online was better than the online discounts. So I like, I was dealing with three sales funnels. Mm -hmm. One was the online price, one was the chat room price, and one was the salesman price. And the chat room guy says, I don't think he can beat me, but try him. And he did. He went back and, you know, got me the, the best price, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So that was good. So anyway, we move on to bigger and better things than furniture shopping. <laughs> the, the, by the way, mm -hmm. the ex or the Scientologists 
when they redid all their organizations, and this is long after my time, mm -hmm. long after my time, they went into building furniture. They started making their own furniture because they realized it was far cheaper to manufacture. And they created a, you know, wood shop down in the basement of the what's called the Cedars Complex, an old hospital on L. Ron Hubbard Way in, in uh, Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And how did they uh, manage to get an L. Ron Hubbard Way again? <laughs> well, there is an L. Ron Hubbard Way in, in Los Angeles. Yes, they, they named it after him. Uh, I've been on the street. I I only made one official visit there in my days because I had occasion to uh, do a job there and uh, interview various technical people for a specific purpose because nobody understood what the hell they were doing with regards to what they call the state of clear. And um, I had, um, and, and it was, uh, I think one of my favorite moments there, it was just amused the hell out of me, is I'm, I'm walking from building to building and then there's this guy across the street and he's got a band, he's got long hair and a band across his head, like, you know, like he's either an Indian or wants to be an Indian or look like an Indian. I don't know that he was an Indian at all. <laughs> it's just part of the and, shtick. Yeah. <laughs> and and he, he, well, he, was, he was he was drunk. And he was sitting there in front of a doorway across the street from the, the church buildings. And he's just sitting there on his back. And it, this goes on for a long time, yelling at the top of his lungs, Scientology! <laughs> and he's just like, Scientology! And I, I went to visit my fr a friend of mine and she was a very f dear friend I'd known in Clearwater and, and I had offered to take her out for you know for pizza because I was there on official business I, I wasn't there to mingle with anybody but I, I you know I went and visited her and you know she could spare the time you know for 45 minutes we went out to lunch and I remember mentioning that to her and I, how and, and she just like kind of ridged up like you know this isn't funny oh this is terrible and that's the kind of stuff that Scientology had to deal with and put up with because it would attract crazy people. And this guy was not a Scientologist, I'm sure, in any stretch of the imagination. Right, right. But they would just sit there and linger and mimic and I guess what you'd say, hassle, irritate. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite ones, and I say favorite because... I got amusement out of this. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't, I didn't, it didn't bother me. Did I like it? No. There was this guy named Frank Diamond and he owned a store in Clearwater on Fort Harrison street. That was, you know, it was, he was basically selling gold and selling gold, jewelry, gold. And I guess Scientologists would come into his shop from time to time, but some girl either came in or went by. And, you know, was she uh, an extraordinarily good looking girl? No. She would say, you know, just average, you know, not not particularly attractive. Mm -hmm. uh, and for some reason, this guy was just attracted to her. Mm -hmm. And he followed her all the way into the church. And began staring at her into wherever she was and he became a stalker of this woman Ugh. like he fell in love with this woman and it, before that he had a very you know i guess what you call a banter with the scientologist it was friendly banter and and then at the same time, I think the gold prices went down and his business just crashed. OK, mm -hmm. that had nothing to do with Scientology. It had to do with the misfortune of business. Right. And he just crashed. And then. Because he couldn't see her, he began to hate Scientology. Mm -hmm. And he began to become a stalker of Scientology, but he lost his business. So he became a homeless person that drove this yellow car around. Oh, Jesus. This is an object and he, lesson. And then his hair became very long and he became clearly menacing. Oh, God. And, and he, he would like, he'd come up to my, my friends. I'd be in there. He, he, 
I, I don't think he liked to talk to me because he knew he, you know, he'd get uh, nowhere. He, yeah, yeah, yeah. But he he uh, talked to my friends. He'd say, he says, who was Adolf Eichmann? Who was Adolf Eichmann? Meaning that the Scientologists were like Adolf Eichmann, you know, right. just following orders. And and then I remember one time, uh, one of my friends who was who was young and and really, I guess, a troublemaker. He had a long history of being a troublemaker. We were playing uh, catch in the parking lot during dinner. There was nobody around. It was a hot summer day. We're playing catch with a football, three of us. Mm -hmm. And this guy comes driving up, and he's menacing in his car. Like, he's, like, threatening to hit you with a car, you know? Yeah. And I think this this guy, you know, started to run after him with a boulder. Like, he was going to throw this huge rock and just crash it on his car. I stopped him because I said, you know, you're not, it's not going to be good for you. Right. You know, the hell with him. He's not going to be good for you. And But the, the most amazing thing with this guy, uh, I was walking down the street. It was dark. Frank was walking on the other side of the street and I saw him and I was like, there's this idea in Scientology that you can affect people's minds yes, or you can put intentions into their heads. And it's, you know, it's not impossible, but it's kind of overrated. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. But, uh, and sometimes you might experience it. And I, I saw him walking and I started putting direct intention into him because he was a potential problem yeah. and I didn't, you know, and he was just something like he had to deal with. And as soon as I put my attention on this son of a bitch, he turned around from about, you know, 70 yards and looked at me and, and said something to him. I forget what he said, but he totally felt my intention yeah. and he turned around and he spoke to me yeah. in response. Yeah. The only time that ever happened was in uh, when I was working in a restaurant as a uh, dishwasher and rarely would I come out to, I never bust dishes, but like, you know, once in a, every few months. And I was, I went out to bust the dishes because I think I wanted to get the dishes in. So I'd be ahead of the game. There weren't a lot of people in the restaurant and there was Reverend Cody, who we used to call commander Cody after the, yeah, Commando Cody, right? The old Commander uh, Cody. Yeah. Commander Cody. Right. Commander Cody was a musician okay. uh, that was very popular in the Bay Area, but particularly in Davis. Uh, Commander Cody. Um, but and, but he, the musician, must have taken his name from the old Commando Cody, you know, yes. serials. Yes, yes go. Sure. right. Yeah, and he's a really good musician. And anyway, so we I referred to this this bald headed, horn rim short guy wearing glasses as Commander Cody. I always wanted to refer, not, I didn't call him that to his face. He'd once spoken to our humanities class in high school. And he's sitting there talking to these three ladies who, it's obvious to me he's bilking them for money. That's what he is. And they're, you know, they're taking him out to lunch and he's just, you know, telling them what they want to hear. Uh, he was probably gay. I don't know, you know, <laughs> but I, I sit there and I, I see his game directly. I see his game. I'm like in Scientology now. I'm feeling my, you know, awareness. And I, I look through the back of his head and I just, you know, put this intention into him. You know, like, you're a, you're a fraud. <laughs> and he immediately felt it. Yeah, you remember that. You were, so, yes. uh, yeah, they wrote, yeah. And he, he turns around, stands up and says, bless your heart. He felt me. Oh my God! And and this guy was different from the the dude with Jesus is the pickle, right? This guy, but they're oh, somehow no. the same. No, that they're related. That yeah. that's a great story. That's yeah. that's good to tell again. Yeah. Uh, is that um, so? I I'd seen um, uh, you know, Reverend Cody because he came to our class in humanity. So I I mean knew, knew who he was. Because, you know, we, we'd have people from the Mormon church come. We'd have people from anywhere come. It was humanities. You know, it was, it was we had a really nice teacher. And uh, it was very open uh, and free. So, you know, we listened to him. He didn't impress anybody. Because these, these kids I went to school with were intellectuals. Mm -hmm. And bordered on atheism. Right. Or agnosticism. Right. So... Anyway, so we're we're sitting there at the um, uh, Toomey Field 
watching a football game. And, and, you know, we did not have our heart in watching football games. It was, and we're, we're looking across the way on this, this vacant lot and there's this big tent. We go, what the hell's going on over there? We, it's an evangel evangelical tent. And inside is, is Reverend Cody. Reverend Cody is, I guess, the host of, and he's got these people coming in. And there's this, uh, so I, I go in with my friend, Doug, who you met. And he does not remember this. He doesn't remember it. <laughs> but anyway, so we're sitting there and we're watching the, uh, the all these guys and, and they're, they're, you know, singing the songs and they, they, they're playing the guitars and they, they got the <laughs> long hair like the hippies did. And, and they would look like, you know, acceptable dress for, you know, hippie uh, lifestyle. And they're playing these songs and, uh, you know, singing about Jesus. And... Then it don't they, forget the cheerleading. Give me a no, no, J. No, no, I'll get to that. The cheerleading. <laughs> and then, then they go around and they get up and they say, Give me a J, J, give me an E, E, you know, give me an S. What's that spell? Jesus, Jesus. And they're just going wild. And they're and then they come up and you know, what's your name? Uh yeah, Peter. Uh, oh, shake point. You should shake your hand. It might be a, a girl, it might be a guy. Jesus loves you. I want you to know Doug. Must have been five or six people came out and Jesus loves you. And then they come up to Doug, you know, J Jesus loves you. And it's like, you know, he says, you know, he said, we got to get out of here. And I said, no, I want to stay. I said, let, 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 let's, just let, let's see what's here. You know, I wasn't afraid. Well, yeah, obviously, was you were not threatened by these people. But for some reason, it's interesting how vulnerable he felt as if he could somehow fall under the spell. I don't think he would have ever fallen under that spell. And, and he hasn't fallen under that spell the whole time I've known him. No. But it, it's kind of like it was just it was repulsive. It was yes. repelling him. Understood. I don't think he was worried okay, about that. Okay, I got it. I got it. And, and I like, you know, I, I will extend myself. Uh, not always. You know, I, I might, I, I know my, my daughter found herself in some weirdo uh, metaphysical place in, in L.A. somewhere, and she knew when to get up and walk out. She knew when to get up and walk out. She, she was brought there by, I just said, this is crap, you know, she, 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 she knew it. So I, I know when to walk out, but this, I was like, what the hell's going on here? What kind of impressed me when we went over to the tent in the beginning was this guy named Clay. Clay was, uh, he was a super smart kid. He said, what the hell's he doing? What are you doing here? He wasn't somebody I knew very well, but he was like super smart in math. Mm -hmm. He didn't get particularly good grades, but he was real smart. Mm -hmm. So he said, what the kid, what's he doing here? Right. He was, you know, hooked into Jesus. So they're doing all this Jesus stuff. And then I say, stay. And then with, with my mind at the time, uh, I looked and surveyed the area. Now, I was not like, say, somebody who was like into girls. I, that, you know, I would like a Capricorn, more slow to mature into that. Although I did get married uh, at age 20. I was not somebody who was like looking to score with the next chick or even the girls that would approach me. I wasn't, I wasn't into having, you know, that's not what I want, wanted to do at that particular time. I was much more interested in my, you know, esoteric interests. So, uh, but I did survey the area and I looked at all this and, and the, the minister, not Cody, but the, the, the minister who was the guest, who was old and looked like a used car salesman and wore a plaid sport coat, which was in very bad taste. And don't forget the white shoes. Yeah, yeah, the white shoes, and and the daughter, or, and the and the and the girl, his wife looked like she could have been his daughter. I mean, older, not a young daughter. She was beautiful, absolutely yes. beautiful. And I said, you know, the only thing that's sensible about being part of this group is, is, the girls must be so dumb you could easily take advantage of. Them. Yes, that's what my mind thought. You know, my teenage mind, yeah. older teenager. No, I get and it. I, thought, yeah. I, I normally didn't think like that though. Understood. I, didn't, Understood. I didn't think like a what, what do you what would you call that a uh, not a vulture. It's a, it's uh, almost it's 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 how would I say it? It's it's just a pragmatic predator, a sexual predator. Yeah. I didn't think like a sexual predator, but th th their vulnerability and stupidity yeah. brought out the idea of predatory behavior in me. Yes. You know, not Got that it. I 
accident. I said, well, this is a, a good way to uh, get a piece of ass, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. and because they're, they're, they must be so dumb, open and vulnerable. But that's that's the only thing I could say. That's the only logical reason I could think for being a part of this. I also assessed that they weren't hurting anybody. Right. It just seemed like they were all making themselves feel good. And, and there's something to be said for that. But then the, the guy gets up there with the plaid coat and he gets up there. He was, I guess, the guest speaker. And he says, and he says, OK, he says, there's a lot of good religions out here. A lot of good religions. You've got Hinduism. You've got Buddhism. You've got uh, Islam. And he says, they're all real good religions. But there's something missing from them. And let me tell you the story. It's about my wife here, whatever her name was. She makes this beautiful dish called Florida Delight. Florida Delight. Now, I, I can't imagine, personally, I can't imagine what Florida Delight is. It never sounded appetizing, even <laughs> though I had never been to Florida at that point, which later become my home for over seven years. And I never heard of Florida Delight when I was in Florida. Do, do you know what it reminds me of? It makes me think of Juk, which is the kind of uh, Cantonese or uh, Chinese kind of, uh, shall we say, uh, I forget what they call it, porridge. It's, it's, it's like a porridge is what I think of because I think of the pickled daikon that goes well with porridge. And that's what I would think of because of what he said. It would be something like that would strike my mind. It's probably what something. What I envisioned, and yeah. this is just my own instant imagery, yeah. was um, something that had ham and pineapple in it. And yeah, I, that's what I, that's what I envisioned. And, I, and maybe it had some citrus in it. But God, I don't know. It might have been something they only have in the South. And when I say the South, I'm talking about North Florida. Because <laughs> yeah. Northern Florida might as well be in Georgia or Alabama. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so, and, and, they, and they were probably from that area of, uh, of Florida, if they were. or they, they were definitely from the South. So, he says, okay, Florida Delight. He says, now, Florida Delight, he says, so we're she serves me Florida Delight, but for some reason, Florida Delight, is, it doesn't taste the same. And it, I, don't, I don't know what's wrong with this. I said, why doesn't this taste like Florida Delight? And then she says, well, I didn't put the pickle in it. It's missing the pickle. And he says, when you don't put the pickle in the Florida Delight, it just doesn't taste the same. It just doesn't work. And he says, this is what's wrong with those other religions. Jesus is like the pickle. Jesus is like the pickle. And this was like, you know, this was so outrageous and funny to me uh, that I, I, I remember going to uh, our friend Dave, and Dave was like another real smart guy. He got into Yale. And I, don't, I don't know if, I think he got a scholarship to Yale. Dave was just like, you know, really good brain. He was super fast runner. He was faster than me and Doug, and we were fast, but he was faster. And... I remember, and so I had a lot, I had more respect for Dave as a, as an intellectual than I did as an athlete, and he was a great athlete, but his, his smarts were really good. So I remember telling him this story about the pickle, and I just remember his face just, you know, just wincing, like, you know, <laughs> you know, because it, it was intimidating uh, at the beginning for me to be in that, in that town, because, you know, everybody's father was a professor so you're you're surrounded by academia and and this was the antithesis of intelligence yes yes and 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 it was like wow this is the, this is the story of uh of florida delight and and it's uh and in fact that preacher was the inspiration for uh the character in my book synchronicity in the seventh seal he was the inspiration for the entire book, actually, because it starts off with a with a preacher who's uh, I think he's half seal. He's got a flipper, <laughs> half human, and he's talking to a congregation of seals. I'm playing off the seal with the seventh seal. Yes. And I think I have Teddy Roosevelt as half walrus because he looked like a walrus. And he, <laughs> he forms the Navy seals. He forms the Navy seals for the Navy when he's secretary, assistant secretary of the Navy. And, and that's kind of, and it, it all, uh, it all generated from my daughter, uh, who had, I had to bring her to a, uh, 
lawyer when we were going through our divorce who was representing her. And I was, um, you know, she was hesitant to tell the um, her lawyer who she didn't like about some of the abuses she'd suffered at the hands of her mother. And finally, I said, well, if you don't tell them that, you know, they're not going to believe you. They're not going to believe me. And she runs back in there and she tells tells the lawyer and the lawyer says, well, how do I know you're she's not a trained seal and you're putting her up to this. Jesus. And when my daughter heard that, she, oh, she gets out. She goes, I'm not a trained seal. But good for her. And, and, and that inspired this whole uh, book, actually. Yeah. Uh, it, it had nothing to do with, you know, all that. Yeah. But it was just the, she says, I'm not a trained seal. And uh, and so I, I I made up all the, and that, that's the beginning of the book. And I, I had a couple of my friends read it and they said, you should continue this. And it evolved into a whole book, which turned into a an exorcism uh, of all the negative influences that I'd accrued while uh, studying the occult aspects of the Montauk Project. I had accrued a lot of negative occult energies in my energy field and this dispelled them because it was after my divorce and it introduced me to the moors as i exercised the um the demons of of montauk it, it introduced me to the moors the indigenous people who were part of the indigenous race of the montauk pharaohs and i think this is a good way for me to approach the presidio book the yes. L. Ron Hubbard book I did, the uh, one called The Tao of Insanity, yes. was very much like this because I was able to dispel or exercise all of the negative spirits around Scientology that were in my energy field. Mm -hmm. And it just all of a sudden, boom, it got rid of them. Mm -hmm. You know, the book, it doesn't sell too much. I gave it away. Uh, I gave away a lot of copies on Amazon mm -hmm. and um, I would tell you that doesn't help sell a book. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to, but it doesn't. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and anyway, it, uh, it did what it was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Exercise the demons right. of Scientology. I don't hear about Scientology rarely. And if I do, uh, I can just, you know, put it under the rug. The final, Scientology book that that may put it all to rest. The 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 last book I will do on L. Ron Hubbard if I when and if I ever do it is in, on the Babylon working, mm -hmm. and and that would be a very interesting book to do. But it's 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 not on the uh, agenda because the, the humanity is not ready for the Babylon working. Mm -hmm. no. uh, they're they're not ready for it. They're not ready for anything that is non Christian. Yes. Uh, or non-Muslim or non-Abrahamic. I'd say non-Abrahamic. It cannot be processed by all of your conspiracy people. They're they're stuck on uh, Abrahamic religions. So it, it's, it, it's not going to go there. Um, well, I, I see that the, the Babylon working, Jameson said, does, bleeds into the Presidio. It does, but it's the Babylon working is far greater than anything that happened at the Presidio. The Presidio is, is kind of like the abortion, the one of the abortions of the Babylon working, yes. uh, of, of everything the Babylon working could, would, and should be. The, the amazing thing about the Babylon working is you have Jack Parsons. It's, it's his brainchild. And Jack Parsons is an or, unorthodox chemist who gets results. He is a chemist who was never taught proper chemistry. In other words, the chemists come up and will give equations for what he's doing, more so than he's looking at equations to figure things out. He's like a magician, a magician experimenting and knows how things work, and he creates a solid fuel rocket. And he has a, a mechanic, Ed Foreman, to back him up, and a theoretician, Frank Molina, to uh, basically explain what he's doing. But he is the prime mover. And L. Ron Hubbard admired Jack Parsons greatly for this characteristics. And Hubbard, in, in his own right, was similar. He was creating alchemy with mental therapy. 
and creating his own philosophy and his own religion. And he was doing it on a results basis thing. He was not worried uh, so much about what the scientists said. He was getting results. And that's what Parsons did. He got results. When we parlay this into magic, he's saying, okay, we're doing all this stuff. I'm going to do the Babylon working. I'm going to incarnate the, bar, the goddess Babylon, and we're going to reverse all this patriarchal horseshit that's been going on for the last millennium and more. And so he engages, and he's looked upon with great uh, skepticism by anybody who's orthodox magic. And I'm talking about Aleister Crowley who does have his own version of Babylon working in one of his books and would have his own very specific uh, iteration of this must be done this way, this must be done this way. And Parsons is going for a result. And, you know, Parsons did get results. He got results and they might have been aborted results. Uh, yeah, um, well, the... Jameson references, uh, I get uh, Crowley writing uh, about the Babylon working. I get fairly frantic when I contemplate the idiocy of these louts. Now, that has been disputed as saying the idiocy of these goats, the idiocy of these goats, the idiocy of these louts. But whatever it is, it's, it's not a complimentary phrase. And there's two ways to look at this. Uh, at least two ways to look at it, is that when Parsons and Hubbard were engaging in this act, Crowley is saying, God knows, what are they doing? They're cre trying to create a moon channel. I get fairly frantic when I contemplate the ADC of these louts. In other words, you know, what what untold uh, damage and insanity are they going to unleash on the world? And when we know from Douglas's experiences that there was somebody who might have been born from that working, yes. uh, the moon child. Uh, that he was called the aborted fetus of Marjorie Cameron, yes. uh, as alleged by Aquino. And so this was certainly an abortion of the actual work and not the actual work itself. Yes. It is a result of the work, but it's, you know, kind of like the afterbirth of what the magical intent was. The other side of the coin is that Hubbard, he Crowley could have written everything he wrote about Hubbard being a con man was to distance himself if he was the ops of L. Ron Hubbard, which Douglas has been told Hubbard was. And there's every indication to believe that he was. And here is Crowley distancing himself from being the ops by, by uh, disassociating himself from Hubbard and spinning a, a tale of Hubbard being negative when in fact he could have been sent in to get rid of the Babylon working Mm -hmm. to get rid of Parsons yes. and to destroy him financially because he was antithetical to Parsons at that time. He had also sent Grady McMurtry in to spy on Parsons. So if he sends Grady McMurtry, who was in the Army, why wouldn't he spend, send in L. Ron Hubbard, who was in the Navy? Uh, so Crowley is not what he seems to be. Right. And uh, so we, we can't trust or believe uh, what people tend to believe about this. Uh, all we know is that Hubbard was involved at the highest levels of Navy intelligence, and so was Crowley. This is for sure. This is as factual as you can get, especially about such an obscure area as naval intelligence. And it's where the British meet the Americans. Yes. And I know I had had uh, Ingo Swan, after his death, appear to me in a dream and said, told me, you need to connect uh, L. Ron Hubbard and Ian Fleming. Ian Fleming, of course, worked for Naval Intelligence, and he wrote the charter for the OSS, uh, and he was given, a, I think, a, some sort of silver something by Donovan. So that that was, Ian Fleming was heavily involved with uh, setting up the OSS and uh, writing its charter, and heavily involved with most everything, and. Whether him and Hubbard knew each other, I don't know. Uh, there's every reason to believe they might have associated with each other because um, Hubbard uh, called, he referred to Smirsch, uh, which was from the James Bond novels. Smirsch 
as what Hubbard referred to as the psychiatric complex. Okay. That was uh, referred to sort of as a Russian Soviet, and Hubbard tied them to the Germans, right. William Wundt of Germany, and. Just so people know, the term Schmerz is, is an actual Soviet word, and um, it's just the first part of the phrase, which is Schmerz Spionum. And um, Schmerz Spionum was like a rally cry, uh, death to spies. And uh, so it was a counterintelligence agency of the communists in um, Soviet Russia. And so uh, what um, Hubbard did was he uh, basically uh, was, yeah, kind of. Go on. He coded the name, and it, when it was yeah. used uh, infrequently in Scientology to refer to Smirsch as the psychiatric, it was referred to as the, you know, more of the psychiatric block. That was yes, the the, the psychiatric, block. yeah, the the monopoly, the lobby, the the, the psychiatric the lobby, lobby, lobby and all that. Yeah. But the um, so anyway, but uh, the James Bond uh, movie franchise were very aware of Hubbard's use of Smirsch and changed the name to Spectre. Yes. yes. After Phil Spectre. No, I'm only joking. With <laughs> Phil but so, so that was um, the, um, you know, just, just to comment on the Babylon working, the Babylon working in its pure form would literally be to reverse the patriarchal insanity. And, and Jack was trying and Jack was, as Jack himself would say, you can't evaluate a man's work till 100 and 150 years after his life. You only begin to get an inkling after 50 years. So Jack Parsons died about, you know, 70 years ago this uh, coming June. It will be 70 year anniversary of his death. So at 50 years, we began to get an in inkling of Jack Parsons, or certainly I did. Uh, and it, and his legacy has now been uh, cinematized in in the the Riley Ridley Scott uh, series. It was it was bad. It was had bad historical accuracy. I wrote reviews on every episode. It's it's on my Montauk revisited Facebook timeline. But you can read all the reviews I did of of of, of those episodes. And while it was historically very poor in terms of its accuracy, it was very, uh, had the heart or the spirit of Thelema in it. He did, it did express the heart or the spirit of Thelema, which was, um, was embraced. So why they made it so bad, they said they wanted to give the writers creative license. They didn't want to inhibit the creative license of the writers, which is stupid. Uh, the program was creative and it was very watchable, but you're not watching history. Right. You're watching writers be creative. And there seems something very disingenuous about this. And it was based upon the book Strange Angel, which is a biographical account of Parsons. Yes. Uh, accurate as it, it, as it can be, as it tries to be. Yes. And why they distorted it is beyond me. They, they ruined it. I mean, it's it was it was creative, and I enjoyed watching it. But why why did they just butcher history? I could only think that there was some stupid reason that they were trying to avoid a lawsuit by telling the real story. But I, that doesn't that's what they do. But um, that book or that um, the, it ends the last episode which they never, it wasn't continued, was they have L. Ron Hubbard coming to the door of Jack Parsons. He goes, hi, I'm Ron, and, you know, I read your ad, and uh, so on and so forth. Right. And then, so they introduce Hubbard, as the, and they never do another episode. They end with L. Ron Hubbard because they can't, uh, they even butchered Marjorie Cameron's name, or, or they, so... Do you, do you think they were afraid of lawsuits uh, in terms of, you know, altering her name? Or... It wouldn't have been hard to go to her estate or to go to her uh, daughter, granddaughter. It wouldn't have been hard. Mm -hmm. And that's what I intend to do okay. because I know these people, right. even though I haven't talked to them in years. Oh. And I, I would go and uh, I mean, I, I would not be 
you know, the final word, but I would engage them and give credit where credit is due. Uh, and, you know, to honor her memory and, uh, and, and even then you're portraying, uh, you know, if you're portraying a movie on Napoleon, you don't have to go to his ancestors. And, and so this is a, uh, you know, it's very weird. I mean, Hollywood just distorts the hell out of things. And the writers definitely understood Thelema. They understood the general idea of it. And they did some really creative things with Jack Parsons and his father and with even Crowley himself. It was creative and was somewhat illustrative of what might happen on the astral plane or did happen on the astral plane. But that's all speculation. And they could have done it and still been closer to the history than in in inventing characters uh, that didn't exist. I think one of the things, though, that, that give uh, did give some credence to, they had Sarah Northrup, Sarah Northrup Parsons Hubbard. Uh, Sarah was the, the wife of Jack Parsons, or I think more of a concubine who served as a wife. She's called Sarah Parsons. Jack was married to her older sister. And then he took on the younger sister as a girlfriend when Helen Parsons went off to be with Wilfred Talbot Smith. And then, and we cannot escape Wilfred Talbot Smith's middle name, Talbot. You know, it's it's like like Larry Talbot from the movie The Wolfman. There is a, a strange Talbot family in a Talbot castle from Ireland. But uh, so Jack Parsons, Sarah Parsons, uh, this movie or this video series shows that Helen and Jack had a very abusive father. And I don't remember if they had him, her being sexually abusive in this, but in actual history, I have read that the father was sexually abusive to both of them. So uh, Jack and, and, and she was very young when she came to the Thelema Lodge, the Agape Lodge, uh, they called the Parsonage in Pasadena. And so when uh, she ran off with Ron, she was very young. And she, um, that might have been the claim that the marriage wasn't uh, legal, but he did get a divorce from her. And she was a wild card. She was an absolute wild card. Um, Cameron recognized her as a wild card. She used to keep in touch with her, you know, because, she, and you know, you just hear how bad and evil Ron was <laughs> from Sarah. Uh, Sarah was a, a classic Mata Hari type, potentially Mata Hari type. I don't know that she was there as a spy, but you could never dismiss that. And Cameron herself said, I can't dismiss the fact that I was, I was that way too. She says, do you, I said, do you have any memory? She says, no, the bait does not have the memory. If I'm being used as a bait, I don't have the memory of being the bait. Yeah. That's what she said to me in so many words. So uh, this was a lot of uh, loose and fast characters running around there. And and you, you they're, they're meeting under this. This was wild. This is like Wild West occult. Jack Parsons is fostering and festering magic, the occult, and unbridled sexual energy. And this is in a time of great restriction in uh, parochial Pasadena, right. which was very straight-laced, as was most everything. And San Francisco ha always had a reputation, going back to the Barbary Coast days, uh, of being footloose and fancy free. Right. This was not. This was not Southern California. It yeah. wasn't Southern California. You got a bit of that with Hollywood, but even they had their restrictions. You had a lot of activity. You have Jack Parsons is uh, unplugging the floodgates, and and he attracted uh, the most sinister aspects of the military industrial complex who came to spy on him 
because he was a loose cannon. He was making the solid fuel rocket. He was on the cutting edge of rocket technology. This is why the book, not Strange Angel, but the other book published by Adam, it's Adam's last name. Uh, he's passed away now. Can't even remember Adam's last name. He's kind of famous in the occult world. But um, I'm trying to remember myself, of course. But... Sex and Rockets. He published Sex and Rockets. Right, 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 right. Oh, Parfrey. Adam Parfrey. That's right. Thank you. Yeah. And the. Um, and by the way, Adam the... Parfrey was publishing all kinds of shit. I don't know what your impression was of that son of a bitch, but he like had the uh, um, what was the press? It was uh, Steam Shovel Press or something. No, wasn't that. It was oh, no, no, no. a Amok? No, it wasn't Amok. What was it? It was he. But anyhow, he was publishing like uh, just everything you could imagine that was edgy. But he was just this side of a promoter of of pedo porn. Pedo porn. He's, uh, he's churning uh, books. I mean, yeah. not all of it. I don't know what he did that was pedo. Yeah. But but he he published. He's churning books. This is what a publisher does. He churns books. Well, he, he definitely had his agenda. He definitely had his agenda. He, oh, he, he was on the he was on the edge. But yeah. but Joe Matheny once described him to me. He said, this was perfect. Adam Parfrey. He said that there was this uh, event mm -hmm. that he was, I guess, watching. I wouldn't say attending. He was watching, and it was it was like for the Process Church. Yes, and they were like they were like. They win the process church and they have this event and they're basically initiating you into the process church when you're at the event. You don't know it. Yeah. It's kind of like the Mormons baptizing you after you're dead. Yes, yes. They just, you know, it's kind of a, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, ha ha. We're putting one of the over. They've all been, we're putting one over on the audience. They've been initiated into the process church. And uh, he said that, you know, Adam was right there with all the, you know, what do you call it? Uh, sidelines selling the you know the the process church buttons or whatever and, mm -hmm. and he says this is you know he's it was very you know sort of carny mm -hmm. you know he had, he had all the stuff there to sell all the all the sidelines for the whatever the hell they were doing right. it was he thought it was very gauche and carny yes yeah. adam was mm -hmm. you know i had met adam at the book fair and i even had a conversation or two with him and in, in just getting books, certain books. I think certain books he published were of uh, scholarship, scholastic interest. Uh, some would have had an agenda. It's like, you know, you you hit and you miss. The Sex and Rocket books is okay. Is okay. Mm -hmm. You know, it's... Uh, what was the name of his, his company again? I, I just... It's been so long. <laughs> <laughs> He's passed away. I'll look it up. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'll look it up. But, but the the book, of course, that he went through several revisions of was Apocalypse Culture, and uh, that was one of his uh, big mainstays. Feral House Press. What was it? Feral House Press. Feral House. That was it. And uh, so Adam Parfrey with his Feral House Press, he um, there were a number of uh, books that he published uh, that were. I think important and uh they were books that i could uh, appreciate and um you know go back to your stream of thought though i don't want to interrupt it so we'll get back that, to that, that later that was that was uh yeah. what does it say here it says adam parfrey biography jew age jew age dot org yeah he must... yeah he was he was into this kind of also very judeophobic there was that element of him as well. Judea but I, I remember guys, I think he published it was these guys were like really uh, they were on Carl. They wrote a book on Carl Winnegut. Uh -huh. I met yes. these guys. Yes, they were very. I remember them like yes. I, I think I saw them on YouTube mm -hmm. or on the radio once. I forget the guy's name. Michael Moriarty, his name was. Mm -hmm. These guys were really tied into Aryan consciousness. Yes. And yes. they would rip apart mm -hmm. people that would go up and attack Hitler or Aryanism mm -hmm. without a foundation. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's and important. Rip them apart. Yes. And, and they knew what they were talking about. Yes. Carl Vinnegut was the rune master for Heinrich Himmler. Yes. I have yes. the book. Yes. Uh, and Carl Vinnegut was a, a Vinnegut, uh, was a real... Uh, unusual character and it, it was really good. 
Yeah, really good. And that, Hard yeah. to digest yeah. and put this into correlate it with anything else. And these guys are out on the deep end because the what they talk about, they will tend to back up and be able to back up what they talk about, but they're so up on a limb <laughs> that they're, you know, they're they're polarized. They're going to polarize most people. Right. They were very pleasant to talk to. Mm -hmm. uh, they they you know they were respectful and and vice versa. Mm -hmm. But I and I, I don't say what they talked to me. I saw them talking to you know other people and whatnot, and or on on YouTube. I I never forgot the guy. Mm -hmm. I want to see what happened to Michael Moriarty. Uh, so just so people guy. know, Carl Maria Willigut was the man who convinced Adolf Hitler of the evil of Aleister Crowley. Uh, both uh, Benito Mussolini and Adolf Hitler uh, tolerated Aleister Crowley's uh, appearing in their nation because he was making a big deal as if he were persecuted in England, that they had basically uh, forced him to give up much of his fortune, that he was uh, seeking a kind of asylum. And so they tolerated his presence, but uh, uh, beyond that, uh, he, he was obviously sabotaging uh, various things in uh, those those nations. And uh, of course, I could go into that in depth some other time. Uh, there is a book about Aleister Crowley on his espionage that is easily and openly accessible to the public, uh, known as Secret Agent 666, I believe is the title. Um, might be a different title, but uh, you know, it was definitely something like Agent 666 six something like that and uh they go more in depth into it that would be the book to read uh but in terms of uh carl maria willigut he uh, definitely saw uh the evil in alistair crowley and uh, uh presented that to adolf hitler as uh, oh this one you like now I, i'm looking up michael moriarty yeah and yeah he's done quite a bit of uh research but i think this one it's he's got a volume one and a volume two it's called the return of hunter hunter s thompson an untold story of Nazi hunting uh, by J. Michael Moriarty. Uh, it's fairly recent, 2020, 2020, last year. Uh, let me see here. Very simply, it was a time to bring back Hunter Thompson. The question was, what would he do? I thought he would enjoy coming back as a Nazi hunter, something he would be good at, a commitment he would gladly make. So I have given that oppor an opportunity. Uh, and guess what? He does not disappoint. He is 100% on board, along with his childhood friend, Jordan. Uh, the book is a memorial to the real Nazi hunters who dedicated their lives to finding the war criminals of the Third Reich who escaped justice at the end of World War II. The efforts have been Herculean. Thank God they have shown the world the level of commitment needed to bring war criminals to justice. If, if, if this is the same Michael Moriarty I remember, I think this is in jest. Yeah, I was about to say, that doesn't sound I, like... I all, but I'm thinking is... Is this in jest? I mean, Hunter Thompson hunting Nazis? This is uh, this is weird. No, I mean, no, sounds this like, sounds like oh, somebody impersonating him, like they hacked his web or something. <laughs> they hacked his site or something like that. Uh, but uh, just so uh, I can complete the thought of what I was saying about uh, uh, Hitler and Crowley, um, somebody is writing me in the email already about uh, uh, how is it that uh, you know Mussolini or, Mussolini or Hitler wouldn't see that Crowley was dark from the beginning. <laughs> it's not that they didn't see that he was dark. It was that they took him basically basically the way that I would have taken him basically as the pioneer of the heavy metal rock star uh, mystique. That's basically, they didn't take him seriously. They, they didn't really think that this guy was uh, more than uh, a kind of an entertainer, that he was kind of like uh, uh, his own, uh, shall we say, his own band and uh, with all his groupies and everything like that. Uh, they, it, it's, well. It's hard not to be impressed by somebody uh, who, who, shall we say, uh, always presents the potential for uh, some chick drop off. Let's put it that way. So they just kind of tolerated him. And then uh, uh, but basically both of them expelled him from uh, their countries. Uh, so um, take it from there, of course, and uh, and take it back to the direction you were going. The book yeah. of. Uh, can you spell Carl Winnegut for me? Uh, Carl Maria Willigut would be like W I L L I G U T. Willigut, 
and uh, Carl Maria, Carl with a K, uh, dash uh, with a hyphen. A hyphen I, in I have, I hyphen. have his name. I have his name, and then uh, I'm looking for books about him, and it's uh, SS General. It says yes of the occult. Uh, yes, yeah. Um, let me see. Worked with like um, the. Yeah. Uh, um, the, the, well, it says the and then the Albert and then the Albert uh, was the. Well, this is actually by him. Yeah. Uh, yes, he wrote a book. Yes, that is that. Well, bears... it, it, it's called you know Hitler's. It's right about the runes. Yeah. I thought it was written by Moriarty, yeah. but uh, I'm. Oh no, Willigo wrote the book. Moriarty just published it in English. Um, if it's a book I'm oh, thinking no. of. Michael Moynihan, his name is. I'm sorry. Okay, Moynihan. Michael Moynihan. There we are, Moynihan. Uh, it's, I, I think he might have helped translate it. There we are. Um, yes. And let me see. Michael, let me look up Michael. He was the guy. Um, uh, okay. I'll get a uh, Wikipedia on him. Yes. Born in 74, American journalist, national correspondent for Vice News and co-host of the Fifth Column podcast. Interesting. Uh, previously, the cultural news editor for the Daily Beast Newsweek, the managing editor of Vice Magazine, and a senior editor of the Libertarian Magazine Reason. Moynihan was also a resident fellow of the free market think tank Timbro in Sweden, where he lived and wrote articles about politics in the country, contributing to Swedish language publications, including Expression, Aften Bladet, Sveriges Television, Neo, and Gotborg Tinigen. According to Media Bistro, Moynihan is perhaps best known for breaking the story of John Lehrer's fabrications. Uh, I'm not sure who John Lehrer is. You probably do know. Uh, it, not, not offhand, but uh, I probably could remember him if I just looked him up. Massachusetts Amherst yeah. with a Bachelor of Arts degree in history. Um, if you go to Amherst, you're connected to something. Um, he, I, I didn't know he had such an association with Sweden. I'm surprised. But there's also the Swedish right. Uh, the, there's so much Freemasonry in, in hidden or lurking in Sweden. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I didn't know there was this huge Swedish connection. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, now we do, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, and, and he's doing all of these, I, I would assume there, uh, well, it's even hard to say that there's a Freemasonic connection with him. Because he seems so Aryan bent. Right, right. So uh, that, that is bizarre. That That is bizarre. He, Something's, he, he might be, you know, who knows? He's either one or the other. He's either somebody who is uh, trying I to present. I wonder if this is another Michael. Yeah, Moynihan. I was about to say. I was about to say. It sounds like, that's why I said it sounds, seems like somebody hacked his website. <laughs> but I will tell you, this Michael Monahan I'm reading about is one active person. Yes. Who's had... But fifth column fits him. Yeah. Uh, Probably sponsored. He's sponsored, no doubt. Yeah. And he didn't seem like he had. Uh, and then there's another Michael Monahan, who was born in New uh, in New England, lived in Belgium. No, it's Sweden. It's the same guy. Uh, says he was on real time with Bill Maher, mm -hmm. and he could be the same guy. He just struck me as much more low profile um, and apparently uh, let me see this anyhow oh uh, let's provide uh, this this looks this is this is different yes okay now it, because it has a description of Michael Moynihan. So it looks like, uh, let me see. I'm going to look this up. Yes. It, it, yeah. 
in the interim, of course, we can burn bandwidth uh, while you do that. And uh, obviously, it seems that Jameson is the best equipped to speak to some of oh, these. Here it is. Here it is. Michael Moynihan studied languages and history at the University of Colorado in Portland State University, received his BA in German in 2000. Uh, he is the co-author with Didrik Sutherland of Lords of Chaos, Feral House 1998, mm -hmm. and has edited two books by the Italian traditionalist philosopher Julius Evola, Introduction to Magic from Inner Traditions and Men Among Other Ruins, Inner Traditions 2002. He is the North American editor of the journal Runa, uh, London, UK, and contributes regularly to other periodicals. This is the, a different Michael Moynihan, mm -hmm. although this one went to Colorado, and um, and I don't know, uh, so that, that was a disambiguation. Although they, they sound like they uh, kind of complement each other in a weird way, mm -hmm. but the other one sounds much more mainstream oriented in terms of getting coverage. Mm -hmm. This guy's not going to be getting uh, too much coverage mm -hmm. uh, because of the subject he, he writes about. So uh, this was a digression from uh, we were talking about the Babylon working, right? You know, right. all of this uh, stuff, and you were mentioning, you know, Hitler <laughs> and Mus kicking out Crowley. Yes. Uh, and of course, there was uh, Carl um, Germer, who was put into a concentration camp yes. because of his connection to Crowley and was actually able to get out of the concentration camp with his connections. Yes. Uh, and, and I wouldn't call it his free Masonic connections. I would call it his connection with what was called the Saturn Society. Mm -hmm. Um so so much for that but i i was um in, in fact the babylon working itself was a digression mm -hmm. from whatever i was talking about the uh you know the guy with the pickle the, yes you know, yes the minister. mr pickle yeah and and uh the christianity the seventh seal and all the stuff which which is what i wanted to talk about tonight yes was um uh i had gotten news from, well, first off, my Romanian publisher wrote to me yesterday, and you know, I lucky to hear from him once a year mm -hmm. because he he talks when he wants to talk, uh, and he asked me for all the PDF files of all the books. You know, okay, I was glad to give them to him mm -hmm. uh, because you know I, I assume he wants them for translations. So he can just churn them out if somebody wants to translate these books into another language. They're going to translate it from English. They're not going to translate it from Romanian. Mm -hmm. So, and from what I'm told, the English books read much more clearly than the Romanian books mm -hmm. due to my, uh, you know, editing mm -hmm. and clarity of speech. So the, uh, anyway, I asked him, I said, when's Radu's book coming out? And he says, um, if things go well, it will be February or April. So that it suggests to me that he might have the book. He didn't tell me whether he has the book. But if he's going to release it in February or April, I would pretty much think he's got it in-house, unless he's expecting to get it in any day. Is it's it's not you know he's got to read the book he's got to typeset it he's got to edit it he's got to put it all together and and then release it so that that was news uh, for for Radu's book but in in the same uh, process of all this I have recently I'm putting together my newsletter and what I have to say here is is sort of a preview of my next newsletter, mm -hmm. which is, is, um, due out at the end of this month. And it, I, I had, because of my dreams with David Anderson, yeah. I had dreams to reduce everything to the, um, 
I guess, lowest common denominator. Why do certain things come in bunches? Reviewing all the dreams, it all comes down to what I, I've talked about in the past, the 24th gene pair. The 24th gene pair is, um, in its most exalted interpretation, is that one could access a state where the body can transform into imaginal cells, like a caterpillar. See, a caterpillar, when it changes into a butterfly, its cell structure actually changes. So DNA has the capacity to change. Uh, this is the, that's literally shape-shifting. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's not done overnight. It's done in larva form and, you know, sort of a hibernated form where the, where the cells change. And then out of the larva comes a, a butterfly to literally fly. Now, in the exalted interpretation of a of, of what I call the 24th gene pair and the um, somebody being able to uh, have a more what's mutable form of DNA that can transform. Um, it's and I say that this idea of a 24th gene pair, although it's very exotic in its most exalted state, I describe it as being associated with a phenomena like when a moon child is created, such as, like with the Babylon working. A moon child is a idea to create a messiah. It's a perfect being. But you can look at all attempts throughout humanity, at least for the last 2,000 years, AD, post-AD, Christ would be the arguable exception. Mm -hmm. They're abortions. And you're not creating these great, great things. They act like, you know, now there are actual people who have 24 gene pairs biologically, but they are a far cry from what's being alluded to here. They are not par for the course for, in terms of being messianic. And is my, based upon all of my experience, research, et cetera, it is my contention that L. Ron Hubbard is of a messianic lineage of this and his whole Celtic genetics, his genetics that are related to the Wilson clan and it would apply to the Cameron clan, the Cameron clan etymology coming from Amran without the C, like where we, it's like in Hanukkah, mm -hmm. the word CH, is, Hanukkah is spelled with a CH, but the, the CH is silent, the Ka, Ka, Kanaka, Chanaka, when it's mispronounced, the C is silent. So is in Cameron. If Cameron is silent, it's Amran or Aman or Amran or Aman. And in, in the Quran, uh, Mary, the virgin, her name is Mary. Her last name is Aman. She's from the Aman family. But she's also from the tribe of Benjamin, if you read other sources. Benjamin is Ben Aman. Ben Bene means from or the son of or from that lineage. Bene Aman is Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin. I learned this from a guy named Douglas Benjamin, who was of that lineage. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he might have written a book. He's from Michigan. Uh, and I, I think I had dinner with him at that wonderful Mexican restaurant I talked about one time in, mm -hmm. in Michigan. But um, the um, so so anyway, the, Aman Cameron is is this lineage comes from a messianic lineage, the Hubbard lineage, or it's not Hubbard, but the Wilson lineage, because the Hubbard was an adopted name. So it's like, but I would say it's kind of a misfire. Uh, you could take uh, a great athlete like Mickey Mantle, and how many of his family are even representable athletes? <laughs> They they inherited his drinking. I've heard. That, <laughs> yeah, that passes on. Yeah, and so anyway, the but I also read one time that you know his kid would go to little league, and I don't know how good of a player was, but he'd get ridiculed to hell because you know he's Mickey Mantle's son. Why aren't you hitting the home runs? You know, and it was very tough. So it, it just kind of I guess turned them off to athletics. Um, I, I'm sure they had talent, but you know, Mickey Mantle's talents were off the charts. Yeah. And 
so my point is, and he, I'm just picking him at random, it's like a well-known name from yesteryear. But in other words, so if you've got one great athlete out of a, a family of, you know, so many, it, it shouldn't be unusual that you would have one amplified, if not great, messianic fever, uh, person from a family. Now, Hubbard's relatives have described him as being a very deep, dark secret in their family. But many of them have, one of them has described the family as being very weird. It's his own family, and he's saying, God, we have weird genetics. And Hubbard's like the deepest, darkest secret of, of them all. And you'll see this. So in other words, there's there's something askew. Now, Cameron told me, Marjorie Cameron, and I, and I consider them to be uh, from the same batch, because if you see them, they look so damn much alike. Mm -hmm. You can get pictures. Marjorie Cameron, red hair, Celtic, same with Hubbard. They look alike. And they both, uh, Hubbard's father came from Iowa. He was adopted, but he was born in Iowa. Marjorie Cameron was born in Iowa. And how, and she was uh, fostered off to her uncle, who was named Cameron. That's how she got the name from Uncle Cameron, but her real name was Wilson. So all of my synchronicities with Wilson and Cameron led to her with the further revelation that Hubbard was, was a Wilson too. Mm -hmm. So, and, and of course, they look so much alike, it's, it's, it's just not funny. And so, and then they both end up together in this Babylon working business. So not to say that they were perfect or delivered the whole punch, but they delivered enough punch to where they created an impact on the world, unlike most other people do. And this impact was being driven by Jack Parsons. He was like the driver. And when I was in the Pasadena library, I was looking up the lineage of the Parsons in, in the library and it and I, it went to um, a woman who was doing the research. Uh, she was writing. It was more like in a, more than a book. It was more like a, and it might have been a book, but it was something that was very privately published. And it said that the, uh, I think her name was Wilson. And she was tracing the Wilsons back to the Parsons. It said it all came back to Catherine Parr, the, uh, one of the wives of Henry VIII. That's where the name Parsons came from. It all traced back to Catherine Parr. And there was Wilsons and Greens in the lineage. The lineage, the name Green comes up as well, as does the name Kelly. Um, Kelly Green. It's not an accident. Kelly Green being the color of Ireland. Ah, but okay. so th this, this is, uh, so when I'm talking about a, a Messiah, it's like, this is how evolution runs. It goes, it just spins an infinity or a virtual infinity of permutations until you get something that works. And I think that this applies to uh, very easily to DNA, because if you compare the great secret of the book of the law is that the tree of life, as we know it, the Kabbalistic tree of life is an iteration, a way to explain DNA. So if you take that Sephiroth of Tipareth or Tipareth, and it's it's the messianic component is right within DNA. So of course it's an expression of DNA. So you have the DNA within the template of the tree of life, the Messiah, who's going to deliver the full bundle. So it would stand to reason that you're going to have, you know, rockets that don't quite take off, or rockets that explode or rockets that are going to Jupiter and end up on the moon. But they still got out of the orbit of the Earth. And I'm not trying to be critical here of Hubbard or anybody else who, who's a messiah. But we're all living in a realm of failed messiahship because we're all waiting here in an anticipation of delivery from the current condition that we're in. The whole religions of Hinduism and Buddhism are based upon a idea of deliverance 
the ability to deliver oneself from the wheel of samsara, the suffering of life. And, and it's this, it's all about delivery, which is what the word Messiah means, in a sense. It can, it can be, it's de defined as that, the, the delivery. So, we're, we're ta I, I'm originally talking about imaginal cells, the, fourth, the 24th gene pair, and this idea of jump-starting the consciousness, because David Anderson has appeared in my dreams, and also in the dreams of another friend of mine. Uh, but in, in the case of, of me, he appeared, the, the clock was on his, the watch, I don't remember, I think it was his watch or my watch, was going from uh, uh, 46, was stuck on 46, which is uh, 46 chromosomes, 23 going from 46 to 47 or something like that. So it was like right on the time. And it, it's like emphasizing this. Now, so in the case of David Anderson, who presents a paradigm where we can look into time, very interesting. But David is, is like, the way I look at this is a crude analogy, but it's a very good analogy that helps you understand. He's like, if you can imagine, he's like a projectionist in a theater. And the projectionist has a loop. The film is a loop in, in you know, the old, uh, what do they call those? 36 millimeter film reels. Right. Except the loop is one big loop going through a projector. It doesn't have an ending. It's the endless loop of time. And David is like a projectionist who can stop the film. He can stop the film and he can edit the film. You can change it. But what I have to wonder in in a situation such as as he's involved with, uh, let, let me I have a note here. Yeah. Um, okay. <sighs> yes. uh, okay. Now he talks about Indian scientists sending drones into the past or future. Right. And he doesn't like this. So I'm saying, if this is happening, we have a complicated metaphor taking shape when we consider that other projectionists are coming in and changing the loop as well. It's not just David. He's, he's like, knows what he's doing. He's a projectionist, but you have the stuff going there going on. And so we have multiple editors with different agendas, all trying to control not only time itself, but the narrative that is the big time loop. We're controlling the narrative, trying to change it. And what... What the hell is this? This is the wheel of suffering, the wheel of life, but everybody's trying to change it. And I suppose you could argue that somebody could come along. Yeah, he's right. We're in the wild west of time travel. And somebody comes in and says, well, I want to make it good. I want to make a paradise. So you have this whole paradigm of, it goes back, it reverts back to Hinduism itself, uh, a very old religion and this release of suffering from, you know, the karmic bondage one has. So it's like all of this modern technology can only take us backwards in, in it, from this perspective. So David can pr review it at numerous interval in, intervals. Uh, but where things get different with Radu Sinemar and his work. Now, D Radu has... Uh, belongs to Department Zero, which has access to these stations within the inner Earth that have remarkable technology. They it's, also a, have... it's an intelligence department of Romania. Explain that to our listeners. Yes, yes Department Zero is the most secretive department of Romanian intelligence. And the only reason we know, it, know of it is because of the works of Radu Sinemar, beginning with Transylvanian Sunrise, as it's published in English. And uh, they... They now, but see, it's about this chamber beneath the Romanian Sphinx, which is a real location. And it has this technology that you can go back into time. It reads out your DNA. It reads out DNA from different civilizations and whatnot. And they have a, a, a chamber in there called the Projection Hall, which will show you the history of time uh, in 3D holographic form. But it, it cuts off around 400 A.D., now, that's only the first book. Within the projection hall, there's three tunnels that go into the inner earth. 
all of those tunnels have been explored in the subsequent books. At the end of the first book, they were just quite a mystery. And even if you don't believe the book, it's a it's a great plot. You know, three tunnels. <laughs> it's a hell of a great plot. Uh, but but uh, so the uh, the technology of Department Zero in, enables one in certain stations to go in and look at the past, uh, and and with technology, and one is getting biofeedback, and it's all biofeedback according to your mind. It's playing off of your mind, much as LSD would. If you take a, a tab of pure LSD that's real LSD, it's going to be playing off of your mind and creating psychedelic patterns beyond your wildest imaginations, but it's going to be contoured to who you are, what you are, and what is in your so-called un un subconscious. This operates the same way, except it's not going to be as uh, have as much violent psychological upheaval as does LSD. Um, and there are other hallucinogenics or which are not as intense as LSD. I'm not advocating people to do this. I'm just trying to give a description because it's a, it's a biofeedback. And so, but see here with, uh, what's interesting, it's, it's giving you a bioenergetic feedback between you and the reality of, of reality, you know, where David, I'm projecting him as going through a projector. This is the loop of reality. Whereas with the department, zero or the technology they're able to access is a feedback loop between you and the wheel of samsara or whoever's looking at it it educates you but also affects a bioenergetic uplifting of your soul and in radu's story the ultimate attainment being access to shambhala itself a paradise of the soul that exists but can only be accessed by tuning into and exuding the higher vibrational frequency from which it emanates. Now, this is a daunting task, but it, if you look at the way this book series develops, it's as if it all springs out of Department Zero and the, the facilities that are accessible by Department Zero are all being uh, promulgated out of Shambhala itself. They are all an extension of Shambhala, which is coming to the surface world in its own way and saying, hi, here I am. You know, where's your messiahs now? You don't need no messiahs. Just tune into the vibrational frequency. Be your own messiah and we will guide you. Now, Radu's books talk about a numerous amount of people from the inner earth who exist in concert with the inner earth or of the inner earth itself. In other words, there's commerce between here and the inner earth. And it's not small. The problem is they can't interface with normal humans because normal humans, uh, and I, I will give a, a quote here from Mentia. Um, Mentia is a character from the inner earth who meets Radu. Her name is called, in full, it's called Mentikla. Mentikla means ray of joy, phonetically similar to Montauk. Okay, she says, uh, when she talks about all of these phenomena that, that come from these civilizations, she says, such issues would be overwhelming today's humanity who for the most part are not capable of understanding the nature of such, such actions or the causes that govern them. Due to the opacity of their conscience, people would stand in the way of such important spiritual missions, which are in fact aimed exclusively towards the good of society. That is why for some of these higher beings who are involved in complicated projects at different levels of humanity, the essential conclusion is one of perfect, con the essential condition it's one of perfect concealment. They live in society and seem to be integrated into it, but nevertheless never stand out, taking great precautions and being careful to cross whole epochs, hundreds or even thousands of years, almost without notice. So what she's telling this, and with other information, there are a multitude of beings that are walking in concert with higher energies, higher frequently frequencies, heaven itself, if you want to use that analogy, and they're, they're not going to engage normal people because normal people will 
take it down a notch or more. Now, the perfect analogy for this is the story of the New Testament, whereas you have, if you accept it at face value, you have God's greatest gift to humanity, the Redeemer, the salver, sal salvation. And what does mankind do? Snuffs them out. Creates a snuff film that runs in perpetuity. Every show you watch Whoa. about Christianity is a snuff film. It really is. It's a snuff film. And it's not pleasant. And this this is what we're dealing with with human beings. So you can say, uh, yeah, it, it's it, this is the state of humanity. So anyway, when we get into this aspect of humanity, where if you're trying to uplift them, they will fight you. Now, microcosmically, I encounter this all the time with Qigong. I can tell somebody, I said, wait, this is going to heal you. If you do this, it'll clear out your lymphatic system. And if you clear out your lymphatic system, it'll clear you of cancer. And the person uh, is likely to respond, aha, but no, I watch TV. And I know if there was a cancer cure, it would be on TV. And the medical profession would provide <laughs> it to me. Aha, because I know, because I'm a smart guy. And this is how people think. So if, like, say, uh, I, I talked to my friend Stan the other day, and I'm, I'm telling him about, I never talked to him since my teacher died, and he said, oh, yeah, you got it, you got it, you got it. It's like something, you know, you don't go to a class and say, oh, I learned this, and think you know what you're talking about. You might know one thing, but you have to practice it every day, and it has to become you. You have to become it. And he clearly saw that I had got it. And, you know, he had, you know, great wisdom to share with me. Uh, you can always learn it in, in, in this aspect. But so in a way, you try to teach somebody something that's for their benefit. And they're working overtime to reject what you have to offer. That's clearly going to help them. And the biggest opponent they you have is them. So you don't engage them. You do not engage them. Because you're not going to waste your energy. Why fight? Why fight somebody? And you leave them to their destiny. Because clearly, they're not open, not only to your help, they're not open to their own help. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work. I tried it. Oh, you tried it. You didn't try it. You said you tried it. So this is okay. This is not upsetting, but I'm just trying to give a perspective. If I was so, um, I guess what you would say, uh, gifted or so lucky as to be a personal representative of Shambhala, I might feel much more psychologically alienated than I do over the subject of Qigong. And I don't really feel psychologically, well, I do feel psychologically alienated from other people if, if when they're not accepting of, of something. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the same thing I experienced with Scientology. It's like you can't offer somebody to somebody who it's either they're not going to accept it or it's not suitable for them. Right. So you don't even try. Yes. And it's like, okay, you're at peace with it. Uh, and, and people who are over aggressive in sharing their knowledge are simply obnoxious and and usually it's it's not it's not good and I would also see uh, my teachers students target him target him it's like you know to to expose him not as a fraud but as somebody less than who he is and, and that's just stupid because that says more about them than it does about him. So this is the nonsense of humanity. So here we get, it gets very interesting. Now, Radu, instead of going into Department Zero, I mean, and going into the inner earth and availing himself of all this technology, like it seems like he'd have 
almost an endless opportunity. His forays into the inner earth are somewhat few and far between, although very frequent in some regards, but he goes and it's like a whole experience that he has to digest. On the one in the book, The Etheric Crystal, he goes and in, into a one of these areas beneath the city of Iraq, uh, not Iraq, uh, Baghdad in Iraq, and he retrieves this crystal, which he refers to as an etheric crystal because it doesn't exist in this dimension. But he retrieves it and he's got a holder that he holds it in and he brings it back with his uh, mentor and boss in Department Zero, Caesar, and they basically decide that they're going to build a device which is going to enable Radu to jumpstart his consciousness. It's sort of like the Montauk chair, only it's positive. And it's like a remote viewing chair. But I want to, I'm not going to call it remote viewing in, in the sense we normally think of remote viewing. But it, they end up picking it astrologically as to when they're going to build it. They hire astrologers. It's extensive research goes into it. They've got the crystal and they have some success with it. And it keeps becoming uh, so, and they don't want to do it as part of Department Zero because they want to keep it out of the budget of Department Zero because they have to go through an official budget or it's semi-official because I once met a former finance minister of Romania. He says, this this couldn't possibly exist because if it existed, it, it would, you know, I was the finance minister. I would have approved it. Uh. And then my friend next to him said, well, you see, it's, or I think well, maybe I said it to him. I said, it even explains in the book that this money was not raised through the government. It was raised through an investment company in Uruguay um, by this general. So, it, you know, that was covered, you know, because he had the uh, audacity to believe that anything that happened in the government would go through his pen. Jesus. Uh, uh, that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty presuming. <laughs> well, that's a natural assumption. He was actually very open to what I had to say, and uh, and and I was, you know, I, I had been, you know, with his wife. That's how, you know, it kind of came to be. I was with his wife. We, you know, kind of discovered this cave we were looking for together, and you know, I, I kind of figured out in the process of talking to her that she was kind of famous, and she says, "Yeah," and then she, you know, and then so she brought the senator to the to the dinner that we had mm -hmm. uh, he was a senator now and he was a very nice man uh and he was also the head of a reading club and he couldn't believe that he'd never heard of these books you know because he's a president oh, interesting <laughs> and, and she, she says well i found out about these books in peru so yeah they're pretty well known uh but anyway so the um th this whole chair that radu was building with the help of Caesar, they're building it with their own personal funds, and then it gets too much. And Department Zero, or they, they find out that he's doing this, and then it becomes a, a flap that they have to deal with, because what are you doing? And they explain why they were doing it in secret, but they still didn't have the money. So they're doing it in the basement of Eleanor's house. Eleanor has a has a very modern, nice house in, in Bucharest. Uh, and the, the, um, they're using the basement to do it in because Radu was the keeper of the house because Eleanor is often gone and he's been gone for a long period of time. He has to keep himself away from forces that are always trying to get his alchemy. But he shows up unannounced and he just sees these guys in his house. He know, he doesn't know Caesar. They know of each other. They meet each other, have not nice discussions. And I, I'm reading this book, and I'm saying, well, they need money. If this son of a bitch doesn't give them the, the money for this project, there's something really wrong with him. And the next paragraph or two tells me, yes, he offers, he volunteers, because he's very wealthy. He offers to fund the project for them. So that takes care of their problem. Eleanor shows up and funds it and participates. 
And eventually, they all meet with this woman from the inner earth, who they go to for technical problems, because she was tutoring Radu when he was in the inner earth on a certain vision screen. And she is amazed at the progress Radu has made by reason of this, this chair that he's, that he's using. He's making all sorts of progress. And she sees that the chair, and uh, she wants to jumpstart humanity's consciousness uh, with an elixir. And she wants to meet Eleanor because he is the, the alchemist. And he says, you can't be doing this mass production. It doesn't work. It's not like you're going to give a bunch of Splenda, which is an artificial sugar, <laughs> and, and jumpstart consciousness. Well, of course, I'm being facetious there. Yeah. She is very down on sugar, and she says, humans, she's in, her expertise is in medical, uh, not, not alchemy. She's understudied alchemy, but she's very advanced when it comes to uh, natural healing methods and, and, and I guess what she would call quantum healing. But alchemy is not her uh, thing, and she she wants to jumpstart humanity. And he's saying, no, it's got to be by individual progress. And they have a debate, and it's, you know, they're trying to reach a happy medium between his viewpoint of, look, at, the person's got to really earn his knowledge. You just can't, you know, give him something and make him all of a sudden uh, a wizard, of, of uh, a karmic wizard. So it, now... What's interesting is Radu calls the chair, or maybe Caesar helped him name it. They refer to it as Eden. Eden. Now, this is a perfect name for it in the context. At first, I didn't really get it. But they're tribing. It, this chair is basically the real purpose, as far as I see this, is this is a pathway to Shambhala, the paradisical reality that is just like the, the legends say. And this is stressed in the books, because they meet he meets a guardian who who is a guardian of Shambhala. Radu is not allowed to go there, but he's allowed to see it. Like looking at the San Francisco skyline from Oakland. It's about how close <laughs> it gets. It's a, or or from Angel Island or Alcatraz, you see the beautiful San Francisco skyline. But you can't go there uh, because he's not ready to go there. He finds out that Eleanor has been there, many telling Eleanor about this, and Eleanor just kind of is nonplussed. And he says, "Well, yeah, well, I've been there many times, as has Caesar." Um, and Radu is not ready to go to Shambhala. He's been to the next, the closest town. Uh, so the it's very inspiring. And this is a pathway, and Shambhala is like a frequency of consciousness. So Eden, and he calls this, and we can compare Eden to Shambhala. It's just an analogy. Now, Shambhala, or Eden, I'll use the Eden uh, track, because Eden is symbolic of, of course, Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve is all about original sin. Uh, it is, in Adam and Eve, they eat the forbidden tree, eat from the forbidden tree of knowledge. This is the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which is different than the tree of life. And when they eat from the, the apple, from the forbidden tree of knowledge, they become conscious of sin, word which means division. Now, I'm going to take this further, uh, and, and this is for Jameson and what he wrote to me today in, in light of that, right. is that they eat the apple. Now, when you cut an apple transversely, which means to cut it down the middle, like it's right side up, you're not cutting it from top to bottom, you're cutting it from east to west. And you cut that apple, and you look at that apple with where the core is, you will see a five-pointed star a pentagram. This is why the apple in, in that pentagram is symbolic of Shin, or the, the fifth element, yod Shinbao shin bao he, meaning yod Shinbao shin bao he, which is the Hebrew letters for the name of which is Jesus, Yeshua. And Shin is the, the middle, 
the secret word of Freemasonry. So you have the, for, this is the tree of knowledge of evil. Now, when they become, when they eat that tree, they eat that apple, they have opened up the pentagram. They have opened up the shin. Now, if you turn the pentagram upside down, it represents the top point of the star. The Christmas star going down means the spirit going into matter. Matter is supreme. If you put the pentagram right side up, you have spirit over matter. Spirit is supreme. So you have here in sin, you have division. You've got the pentagram going up and you have the pentagram going down. And you, when you have that divided apple, the apple that's been eaten and opened up, you have, you've been cut off from the original vibrational frequency of paradise. You have to look at it in terms of frequency, which I'm sure if Preston Nichols would hear, he'd have some very interesting things to say. He would not only agree with what I say, he'd pontificate on it, <laughs> and, he would, and he would be accurate. He would be accurate. He would be abstract, but he would be accurate. Because if he tried to get any more precise, it's it's going to become a little unwieldy. But he would. That's who he was. Um, so evil. You know, one could go on and on about it, but it's it's sufficient to say that it's a it's like a divorce from paradise. And if you think of evil being related to a frequency, it is a frequency that is oppositional, degrading, frustrating and suitable for anything that you might imagine is recognizable as negative. So ultimate negativity is evil. And people who are wrapped up in persistent negativity are indeed beset with evil. And this is not to say that people who are negative, you know, we're never going to win another game. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, th this is like what happens with sports fans that are conditioned to negativity, especially New York teams like the Jets and the Mets, and they, they just never winning, and they, they become conditioned to negativity. Of course, that's that's sports. You have people who are negative like this. I can't get better. The doctor said this. All right, 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 right. I'm not getting better. I can't get better. And it's like, and, and just, and if I run this trying to help people. I have friends who I've tried to help. And there, you know, I've got my fibromyalgia. And I said, well, if you do this every day, it's going to get better if you do this. But you have to do it so much in minutes per day. And you've got to do it. And you've got to drink some water with lemon juice. And you've got to do this. And you've got to breathe. They're not going to do it. Because they're, they're, they're married to their negativity. They're not evil. They're not evil at all. But they're negative. So they're consumed by negativity. Therefore, they're consumed by evil. Yeah. They're not projecting evil to other people. This one particular well, they are person. in a sense because that's very it wears everybody down around you <laughs> but i gotta say I, I got i got some good stuff out of this 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 particular woman she gave me some real good help so you, you know it was uh but it, it's it's okay what happens though is they become preoccupied and consumed by their own negativity and so they're they're contorted into an evil mindset and not always but mostly it's directed at themselves. And yeah, it, it will bring other people down. But it, most of it's to their own uh, their own self-abasement. Yes. So now where this gets further interesting to all of our listening audience, particularly Douglas Dietrich fans, is all of this brings us to this battle that Radu Sinemar and his colleagues and mentors from the inner earth are facing in their, what you would call their altruistic attempt to jumpstart the consciousness of mankind. <clears throat> and why wouldn't? I think everybody uh, who listens to this, except for the trolls, uh, want, want, you know, would like to see everybody do better. Just not themselves better. They'd like to see humanity yes get better and sometimes there's this understood agreement or understanding that you know when's this big event going to happen that everybody's going to get it and it's all going to be great and i say well it's not going to happen that way it has to happen on an individual basis it's not like 
you know, when, 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 when the Berlin Wall fell, it seemed like humanity was going to wake up and be happy with itself. Yeah, for about three days. And then, and then, then as soon as the Berlin Wall fell and the evil empire, as it was called by Reagan, of the Soviet Union fell and became Russia again, then the United States showed up as the evil empire. It, you know, it's because it's all of a sudden the conspiracy wasn't coming from Russia, it was coming from the U.S. government. And it showed its its own evil empire. So what is stopping all this? It is evil. Evil is a frequency. It is a barrier. Now, if we want to be more graceful and Taoist and sophisticated, we don't want to be battling evil. We want to be avoiding it, sidestepping it, or maneuvering around it. We want to be more graceful, more like a, a ballerina that it dances around the evil. But nevertheless, it's the average human being with their minds and their life experiences are being subjected to many negative means from the media, the educational system, and the culture itself. So it becomes a considerable challenge for any person who is subject to mandates of any kind not just COVID mandates, but any kind, economic mandates, economic repression, all the stuff you're being, all the stuff they do to the kids in school and, and all this sort of thing, people are being indoctrinated into a life uh, experience that is antithetical to the paradisical, paradisical realm of Shambhala. So you're going up against this frequency, and what are you going to do? You're going to sit there and stick. Uh, 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 uh. So now <laughs> my work, my work, has gone. I published this book, The Etheric Crystal, with the L. Ron Hubbard book. They came out together last year, but. 13 months ago, 14 months ago. And then I did Douglas's book, The Roswell Deception. And the next book that I'm working on is the Presidio uh, book and all the evil adventures. But this is a total uh, facing of the evil. Now, uh, the quote from L. Ron Hubbard, the lowest confront there is, is the confront of evil. Um, this is what he says, and he's not wrong. Uh, it, it's, and, and so the work I'm doing with Douglas is confronting evil. And in the book, The Roswell Deception, we have, we show the evil that, uh, Commodore Perry represents representing the railroad barons trying to take over Japan, trying to take over the world in essence, but go on. <laughs> yeah, with, well, we're dealing with Japan in this book. Yes. Yeah, take over the world, but Japan. And then you have eventually, you know, you have Jack London who's who's working as a reporter in, in Asia in the Japanese Russo War, and he wants to exterminate the the entire yellow race. And then you have Emperor Hirohito, who is, from a pure viewpoint of survival, is saying, God, look at the evil. I have to meet these people on their own level. I have to develop biological weapons if if my country is going, my empire is going to survive. Yes. So this is the evil that Emperor Hirohito had to deal with. And he had to be as sinister or more sinister than they were just to deal with them. It's it's like going into a bar full of hoodlums and you're going there to collect the money because you own the bar and you have all these guys with knives and guns and worse. 
And do you expect to happily walk in, go to the bartender, get the money out of the cash register, and walk out undisturbed? No. It, it, it's not going to happen. This is what Emperor Hirohito was dealing with. So he learned how to negotiate uh, dealing with the survival of his empire, and that meant biological weapons. And biological weapons is all secret. It's all dirty business. The, the governments of the world do it, particularly the United States. And, But you also have uh, presidents who were dedicated to evil, like Woodrow Wilson, who unleashed biological warfare on his own people, yes. on his own army, and helped win World War I by doing that, if you could call it win. <laughs> right, ended World War I would be. <laughs> yeah, and, and so, so you have this horrible, horrible evil, and then you have uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was, people just don't understand how evil he was. The book does explain this. It's very clear to see. We don't need to go off on it right now. But then as we get deeper into the experiences of Douglas Dietrich and, and what he was dealing with was the, uh, you know, satanic priest, the temple who founded the Temple of Set, Michael Aquino, who went beyond Satanism. You know, he, he left Satanism behind because he could do more evil than just in a satanic context. Yes. But he knew. Yes. Oh, yeah. please continue. Yeah. Oh, yeah. See, this, this is the, this is what we're talking about. Now, why is this important? As they say, I'm processing this as I'm writing the story and I'm just writing the journalistic story. I'm not getting into anything particularly esoteric in, in the book thus far. I, it's like, I'm just, just doing the journalist stories and whatever information I've gotten from Douglas, I'm trying to put it together and it, it just, churns up so much negativity that it's, you know, it's disturbing. Yes. It disturbs, uh, it disturbs the soul. And how much evil can you put in a book? You don't want to overwhelm your audience. You just want them to get the idea so that they can see. And you see that the whole history of the United States is based upon so much Satanism. And this is, so when we think of what's blocking paradise, it's like, okay, why do we have to study Douglas Dietrich? Why am I, quote unquote, diverging from the work of Radu? Radu represents people who offer a, a great hope and help to humanity. And it's a very altruistic, very beautiful gesture. And people can sit here. Now, if you look at the average human being on Earth right now, they're more preoccupied with COVID than they are with being uh, receiving the benefits of, of agents from Shambhala or Christian heaven or anywhere, or Islam heaven or, or the happy hunting ground, Native Americans. They're, 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 people are preoccupied with COVID. And they're preoccupied with COVID <laughs> because they have to deal with it. And if they're not overly concerned about COVID, they're preoccupied with the social circumstances. Uh, you know, where you have to wear masks now in stores in New York as of a few days, as of yesterday, two days ago. Yeah. Everybody has to wear a mask because of the uh, variant. <laughs> so uh, the restrictions are coming back and they're less popular than they were, but nevertheless. So this is the evil that we're dealing with in terms of we want to get back to the frequency of what Preston Nichols would call the original timeline, um, what the inner earth people or the Tibetans would refer to as Shambhala, what the Christians would refer to as heaven, or even equated to Eden. So this is the, as L. Ron Hubbard said, the lowest confront of man is his ability to confront evil. So man is man because he can't confront evil. He cannot face evil. 
And many people will polarize into evil when they read it and say, God sucks. <laughs> this happens all the time. Because the Christian God, as portrayed by so many ministers, leaves so much to be, to be desired. And it, it's about subjugation and control. So this is, uh, this is the justification, the reason that uh, that why Douglas's work must be understood and appreciated because people will not they're not going to face this stuff and they get lost in Space Brothers they get lost in UFOs now Douglas I don't know if you noticed to any extent but I asked a question on Facebook mm -hmm. and for those of you who uh, aren't that familiar with Facebook. Facebook teaches you to ask questions. Yes. If you yes. want to engage the audience. Yes. And I noticed and it, believe me, he was asking about UFOs, who about people's personal experiences. I did leave marks on that. Go on. Yes. I wasn't asking about personal experience. I said, what was the most compelling UFO story you've ever oh, okay. heard? Okay, yes, that's correct. Now, people misanswered that by saying, well, I saw this. That's well, right, they not... answered it with their personal experiences. Yeah, yes. That's not understandable, but that doesn't answer the question. That's not what I was going for. Right. And initially what came up was Roswell. Yes. Uh, Roswell came, and I wasn't even thinking of Roswell. When I, would, I, did, I, want, I wanted them to answer with Bob Lazar, mm -hmm. and a few people did. And, uh, you know, people forget about Bob Lazar, but basically... Uh, it's like Roswell is is the quintessential UFO story. It really is. And it's all such misdirection. Yes. And I, I wasn't looking for Roswell when I wrote it. I was looking for Bob Lazar because I have, uh, as I discussed in the other transmission, I have an idea of potentially interviewing Bob Lazar. Uh, and, and that's been received positively, not by Bob Lazar, but by the people who would facilitate it, there's much to be discussed. And of course, better than me interviewing Bob Lazar, who I feel he's a compelling UFO story because he's been around long enough. His story's never fallen apart, but um, he uh, was assigned to investigate technology that he was told was alien technology. And Douglas has pointed out that it's advanced technology from the Third Reich. He wasn't told that. And he's also been through a brain scanner. So better than for me to interview Bob Lazar would me, me to uh, interview Bob Lazar with Diedrich, D, Douglas Dietrich on hand mm. to have a uh, positive discussion. Yes. Not an attack on Bob Lazar, but to respect his experience. Yes. And, <clears throat> and to uh, bring the audience to focus it off of invisible aliens, but to perhaps, perhaps focus it on more relevant activities and more relevant truths that, that Douglas understands. He understands these things better than I do because he's lived them and experienced them, uh, at least if only in the files that he's read. So I would like to engage Douglas in this if, if this is, uh, you know, if, if, if circumstances will allow it. Yeah. Because it's, it's, and then most people in the UFO field are very sold on their own experiences. And that's fine. But sometimes they're sold on other people's experiences or what they believe to be true, which may not be true at all. There was one, uh, I forget her name, but she was uh, uh, one of my Facebook friends who I know personally was mentioning this one woman who has a whole uh, experience. You have what you, what you call experiencers that experience whole downloads of energy from different types of beings. And these cannot and should, be, should not be ignored or dismissed. But uh, these are in a context that are not the same context we're dealing with when we're talking about Roswell. We're, we're talking about hard facts that have been skewed away so that these other realities come in that just <coughs> are uh, skirt the issue. 
right. skirt the issue. So we we've been under a satanic spell mm -hmm. since the inception of the inception of the United States, which has been genocidal. Yes, it's been anti-human, and this is something as a collective we suffer from. It has uh, hurt our climate. It has hurt our rivers. It has hurt everything that's economical. And I say econ economical, I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about, I should say, ecological. Mm -hmm. So so this is what we're living under. And we're suffering greatly from it right now as a people. And people are feeling pain. And it's nothing more. And if we can confront the evil, uh, and, and of course, these books serve a, and, and there have been many books, even da David Icke's books uh, alert people to evil. And that there's evil going on in the governments. There's no question that he, he exposes this. And it's, and, and there's um, people respond. People who read know that there's evil in the government. There's no question of it. And this approach we're doing takes it a little bit deeper. Michael Aquino has been mentioned in his books. Yes. And of course, and even writing it in our book doesn't necessarily erase the evil. It helps people understand. But we have right now the, the Ghislaine Maxwell trial, which looks, you know, they're now one we can't look in her black book. It's, it's going to sensationalize everything. They're limiting the information that's going to come out in this trial. And they will likely convict her, throw away the key at least for a while, and, you know, slap her hands. Maybe she'll have a crummy life. Maybe she won't in jail. I mean, it won't be a good life. <laughs> well, it, that depends. I mean, it may not be the life she's used to, but there are people who would hack their soul to get that life of three hots and a cot and uh, a warm cell to sleep in and plenty of company. <laughs> so... I don't know how warm the cell is. <laughs> Good point, too. I'm serious. You look at some of these jails and you see the toilet and it doesn't have a thing place to sit. You're going to have to crouch over it. And... You know, it's it's kind of barren, and sometimes those cells are kept cool. Yes. I mean, why heat them? Yes. You know, and you kind of uh, adjust, and it's not pleasant. So, and even, I think I was reading where her sleep is. She's sleeping with the light on all the time. That's a form of torture. It's a form of cruel and unusual punishment. The and, and how how cruel is it? Well, it's it's not good. You can sleep with the light on, but it's like, you know, it becomes to the point with somebody like her that to have the light turned off would be a luxury and to have a blanket would be a luxury. You, you I sound can't almost say, sympathetic, but go on. <laughs> I'm not, I'm talking about, but you know, it's not like it, you're making it sound better than it is. I'm Understood. Saying, Understood. I'm not, I'm not being sympathetic. I'm saying this is what uh, I have read that she's had to endure. I'm not being simple. I mean, I'm saying is it's not pleasant. It's not. Uh, and I think uh, jail is supposed to be that way. It's uh, supposed to be yes. unpleasant. Uh, I think you see these jail cells in a Western movie and they're, they're kind of cozy. You know, they look like they got a bed, even in the old West, they usually have a bed. The guy can lay down. It's not a hard bench. Um, so, uh, and I, and I know there are prisons that are not bad, right? They call them country club prisons. Yes. They're more like hotels. It's incredible. Yeah. Yes. Like, you know, going away to a camp yeah. and I would venture to say, you know, they didn't put Jeffrey Epstein in a very nice place. They're not going to put her in a very nice place, I would imagine. And there could be multiple reasons for that. But anyway, the point of it is. Uh, just like Bill Barr, what was he not investigating? Uh, the Jeffrey Epstein thing, you know. Right. It's like these people look and act like enablers. They don't look like prosecutors. So even if you're going to be uh, an enabler, 
it would be in your best interest to not make it look like you're an enabler and not to act like you're an enabler, which is exactly what he did. Right. And I believe he was with the Jeffrey Epstein investigation of his death. So, um, it, so if we're going to uh, achieve these uh, increases in consciousness, it behooves us to face the evil, recognize it without polarizing into it. And, you know, aha, I'm going to become an agent of, of the dark force. <laughs> these Christians are so bad, we got to go in and, you know, upset their, their donut gatherings after church. We're going to go spill their donuts, you know, just to teach them a lesson for being so stupid. And, uh, uh, give them something to rant about. Um, I, I could easily understand the motivation for that, for people trying to upset the apple cart of Christians. It, it ties you to the karma of them, so I don't advise it. But I could understand the sympathy for that. Because <coughs> um, not all the time, but Christians can be the first to turn on you. <laughs> but they can also be sympathetic and helpful if you approach them on the right frequency. Churches do do a lot of good work. Um, but not all of the work they do is good. And I think that follows. Uh, you could even say that about the, the mob. They do a lot of bad things, but not everything they do is bad. And there will be instances where they will save people. For example, uh, when I was bartending, I met this uh, this guy who was an artist. He's a nice guy. Talking to him, and he told me that uh, I guess he used to go to this bar I, in in Manhattan. I don't know if it was every Friday or often after work, and he. Uh, it was a mob bar, and, and the bartender knew him. He'd been going there for years. Now, this guy wasn't a mobster. He was just an artist. He used to go. And he, he was like a regular customer. And something had happened. And some I, I forget what the circumstances were, but somebody just got really negative and violent with him. And the bartender stepped in and basically saved his life. He was a mafia bartender. And the guy went over and thanked him. You know, he went over, God, thank you, God. You know, what can I do? And he says, he says, look it. He says, look, give me your give me your name and your phone number. And um probably took his address too. He says, uh, you know, we'll we'll ask you to do something sometime, just if you can help us out. And then you know, probably a year later or something, maybe it was six months later, I don't know, it was quite a considerable amount of time after, they called him up and said, look, at, uh, we got one of our friends, you need us to, uh, he needs to spend the night at your house. And this guy comes in, uh, he's obviously Sicilian, doesn't speak a word of English, and he, you know, spends the night in the living room, very nice, very polite, Guys come, get him the next morning, take him to the airport, he's gone. Right. He figured this guy was a hitman. They flew in from Sicily to do a murder. Yeah. Did the murder, came in, did that, boom, boom, out. All very gentlemanly. And they had uh, he had returned the favor by letting this guy stay in his house. He knew nothing. So I say the mob did him a good turn by saving him his clock from being cleaned. All over some stupid misunderstanding by somebody in a bar who was misbehaving. So it's like, uh, you know, not everybody's bad. Not everybody's good. Yes. There's, there's so many shades of gray. So, uh, but by the way, United Germany has just, uh, expelled, uh, the Russian diplomats, uh, because, uh, they were affiliated with, uh, a, uh, assassin operating under state orders that just killed a Chechen, uh, in Germany. 
So it was an incredible abuse of their diplomatic uh, privilege to uh, coordinate with this assassin while on uh, German soil. Uh, so uh, it's uh, uh, an example. It just came to mind uh, that. Uh, uh, well, wait, wait, wait. You said on German soil. Yeah. I thought it was on Russian soil. Oh, no, no. The, the Russian diplomats, uh, the Russian embassy on German soil was uh, basically uh, housing and coordinating a, a Russian assassin who is now in German prison. Uh, after killing a Chechen on German soil under state orders. Oh, okay. So the Russians withdrew their ambassadors. Oh, the Germans ordered them withdrawn. The, the Germans called them uh, to the fore uh, and, uh, and uh, told them they were persona non grata. Uh, so they haven't severed diplomatic relations with Russia, but they've certainly uh, evicted two of their diplomats who were involved in the assassination. Uh, so this is like uh, it, it, what, what blew my mind was what kind of stupid Russian agent would like assassinate someone in Germany and expect to get away with it it was just bizarre to me that did he think that Putin would uh, go to bat and like have him withdrawn from uh, you know pull his ass out of the theater of uh, assassination so to speak uh, and uh, save him from uh, spending the rest of his life in country uh, it, it's uh, it was just such a bizarre thing to me why would he be motivated it, it, you know he's not like your Muslim or or Japanese suicide assassin. It would be like, what would motivate a Russian to do that? <laughs> it was bizarre to me. Well, this is the problem with people who get into that line of work. Their their head's not on straight, and Thank you. you know, uh, and and you don't know what he what motivated him to do it. Maybe it was some extra money or something. Uh, oh, who perhaps. The hell yeah, perhaps money for who, his who the hell knows? Yeah, but but it's it's sort of like, and not to to minimize the importance or relevance of this. It's like, you know, German uh, and Russian politics is, you know, it's it's almost like, uh, you know, I mean, in terms of its remoteness, it's like hearing about a story where, you know, one Eskimo tribe, and we're not supposed to call them Eskimos, but I don't know what else to call them. You know, <laughs> uh, yeah, Inuits, but, et cetera, go on. Yeah, Inuits, you know, was one tribe is you know, having a fight over fish with another fish, you know, with another tribe. And it's like fishing hole, a fishing yeah. stream. And it's it's like, God, it's so far away. I know nothing about German-Russian politics. I mean, in, in, in current days, it's like, it's so, it's so remote. I mean, but yeah, they have their own history together. Um, but thank you, it, you just had to get that out there because I, I wanted your opinion on that. And, that's, uh, that's my opinion. It's so yeah. it's so far remote. It's it's yeah. like you know talking about Manchurian soccer. Yes. You know, it, it's it's obscure. It's, it's not that it's unimportant or irrelevant. And I'm I'm somebody who who might show a greater interest in such than than ordinary people. But even then, it, even to me, it's like it's so damn obscure. I, um, it, it's just. Wow, what's what's going on? And, and Russians always come off as such. Look at they come off as such sinister. <laughs> you know, it, such sinister. And the U.S. for all of its misadventures, and I don't mean to mis mis uh, represent their their ill adventures. They often the U.S. often comes off. In many instances, humanitarian. They they tend to stand for humanitarianism in in their public relations, and sometimes in their overtures. Uh, there is also a negative side to Americans, but you will seldom see Russians coming out and portraying themselves in a human way. Or humanitarian. <laughs> the Germans uh, did show humanitarian. In World War II, uh, overtures to certain uh, Asian groups, Tibetan groups, and other people that were, you know, castoffs. Yes, they they did show humanitarian uh, generosity towards certain groups that they allied themselves with. I think that include the Ukraine, if I'm not mistaken. But the Germans have showed themselves to be humane. I mean, they had other issues going on with the Jews, but. Um, not wholesale with it with the Russians. 
I, I don't even remember them befriending anybody. Yes. Uh, it's more like takeover. Yes. Yes. That's quite true. It's just yeah. not the Russian way. I think they've shown probably some of the greatest overtures towards America in their past. Yeah. And, and they, they, in, but, but even then it's problematic. So, uh, yeah, it's just like the head of China, you know, does not like to portray China as a humanitarian uh, power. It's kind of like, it's just a show of strength. It's, I think they both, what communist China and communi and, and Russia do, is they, they try to show strength and no weakness. Yes. By admitting any nicety is weakness. No, definitely. You're absolutely right. And uh, you, you say that very well. And you, you know of what you speak. Uh, very important. And uh, even though the communist Chinese have tried to uh, show some kind of, um, shall we say, um, <laughs> humanitarian uh, uh, bullshit, it, nobody buys it. <laughs> nobody believes well, it. They're completely disingenuous. Yes, thank you. Yeah, outrage. They act outraged when, you know, they're called on their stuff. Yes. When yes. they're called on their misbehavior, they, they act outraged. I, I saw some show that took, it showed how they took Jack Ma. Yes. And Jack Ma, for those of you who do not know, is the head of Alibaba, uh, a very successful entrepreneur in China that is the equivalent of Amazon in China. Yes. Of Alibaba. Yes. And he was uh, voicing... Uh, the government's problems with not supporting um, business. And they just took him out. They, he disappeared for months. Yes. <laughs> and then he comes back, basically. I think they fine him $54 billion or something. And yes. and then, just, you know, or, 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 you know, and he's, he's basically saying government good. You yes. Know? Oh, fuck yeah. Yeah, he has to, right? I mean, he's like uh, a poor bastard. <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, you know, he, he should be glad and lucky he's alive and, you know, probably living in luxury. Uh, he can be happy. Yeah. But he's not, he can't be an Elon Musk. Yeah. He can't do that. No, Elon no. Musk speaks he, out. But you know what's funny? He was there. He was there. He was all over the world. He was spouting his philosophy. He was, you know, getting into uh, the multi-billionaire celebrity game where he was promoting himself. And uh, I, I guess this was the closest he could get to popularity because he's such an ugly, repulsive looking creature. <laughs> uh, but the Communist Chinese Party took that away. <laughs> well, you know, it's like what I would wonder if, if why didn't he transfer or shift his wealth uh, outside of the Chinese, maybe he couldn't, but, you know, like, so, and, and just operate out of China. I, I'm sure every Chinese person of some level of means attempts to do that, but the surveillance in communist China is so extreme that the communist Chinese are taking advantage of that for this, this, this persecution of the wealthy. Um, just so people understand this in context without going into it deeply at all, uh, because the population is so enormous and the economy was going growing so quickly with all of the, not just the industry and exportation, but also China's own internal um, incestuous economy of real estate. Uh, you have more billionaires in China than anywhere else on earth proportionate to the population. Of, of course, they're just a fly speck on the rest of the population, but they're an uh, enormous number of them compared to other baseline populations of the world. And so the Communist Chinese Party is now basically fleecing them. Uh, they're uh, persecuting them and fleecing them, but they just waited till the right moment to do that, which was now because the, the, the world is now, you know, they're a pariah now. And so who are it, they? It seems to me that Jack Ma, if he could have just sequestered away a billion dollars, uh, yeah. gone to Oklahoma City and, and married some American, somebody with American citizenship and, yeah, yeah. and then bought a McDonald's restaurant and lived the rest of his life and, uh, you know, I, I, selling Big Macs. I, these people don't have any fucking sense. They, they're just, he probably thought he was immune. That, that, uh, he you know. was bigger than he was. And, yeah. and this is a big problem yeah. that, uh, is routine. 
with people, even Ghislaine Maxwell. She she was so arrogant that she was living in America, uh, trying to hide her identity, thinking she wasn't going to get caught. <laughs> and, and why on earth would she not go to some other country where she wasn't wanted? She had multiple citizenship. She could have gone to France um, and she could have gone elsewhere, but she didn't do it because she was arrogant and confident that she was untouchable. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, uh, believe me, it's, you know, one of the reasons for that that's coming out on trial is that they forced all these young girls to sign uh, contracts that they would never be able to sue her. So that's why she wasn't sued. She's never been sued by any of these young girls because there are actual contracts they were forced to sign where they would... Going for her, for her now is much worse than being sued. Yeah, there we have that! <laughs> yes! There I'm sure she'd trade those lawsuits now. She'd trade them back <laughs> for, ah, for, for no criminal ah. no prosecution. In fact... I just got called to a grand jury, uh, and I have to see what the hell I'm going to do because, uh, you know, it's uh, – I they can only try every four years, and maybe it was four years ago I went. They want me to go to the grand jury in Brooklyn. Holy shit. And uh, it could be some very interesting cases yeah. if I if I do it try to get out of it It'll be <laughs> i don't know if i can it'll be the last jury duty i ever do because you know once you get 70 you're immune oh one would hope oh my god it's you like are immune by current law you don't have to do it once you're 70 year olds you can just say you can claim you're too old i understand but you know my parents when i was caring for my parents they kept calling them into jury duty it was crazy and, you uh, can do it you yeah. can do it but you don't have to this is new york yeah. new york and california might have different rules well, well i i would get them out of it the i'd have i'd bring them down there and protest uh jameson reese says what happens if you just don't go yeah i shouldn't say this publicly you didn't hear it from me <laughs> <laughs> but honest to God, I get the jury sons. I just throw them away. <laughs> I don't understand. Uh, the people, they're afraid. People, you know, you know, the difference between Prob me, probably nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, theoretically, all kinds of horrible things can happen. They can remove your right to vote. It's a terror. Um, the uh, in, in my case, honestly, I've had so much experience with government. I'm not intimidated by government. So I can do what I do. Don't anybody else do that. Be good citizens. But, you know, uh, our man, uh, Peter Moon, is a good guy. He's going to go through the motions. Well, yeah. I, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I just don't know. I said go I, through the what, motions. You'll go through what's, the motions. What's, what's the trade-off? Uh, <laughs> but um, Theoretically, it, you can be fine. The problem with the grand jury is yeah. when I went on it, yeah. it was, um, I think I started in – maybe October, but they've been going on since like April. They've been going on April earlier in the year. And I came on late to fill in because they have about 24 people there. Not everybody shows up. You have to have a quorum of so many people. And then, you know, you can sit there and eat your lunch and talk. I know you don't talk, but you, you know, you can just sit there. It's very relaxed. It's not like a formal jury. And and then you just sit there and say, OK, uh, you know, and you just have to have a quorum. Or you have a quorum and then you have to have so many people say, yeah, uh, indict. And the decisions are pretty easy. It doesn't require there's like no they don't put any case before you say no. <laughs> no, no, because the, the indictments is just like, is is there, you know, reasonable cause to indict the person? And, you know, there was pretty flagrant cause because they do such a thorough job before they even bring it to you. Yes. And so, but then these things can go on. A grand jury will, will convene for be as long as nine months. And it's not just one case. They take on a whole bunch of cases yeah. until they're done. And you don't go in every day. You might go in twice a week or once a week. 
And then sometimes they'll say, no, we don't got anything for you, so you don't got to go in. And they, they in New York, in they pay you $40 a day, and then um, and they pay for your transportation. Yeah, uh, it's just shit. Yeah, I know. It's, 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 it's almost... You know, this is why people don't enjoy it. I'm surprised everybody does it, comparatively speaking, honestly. I have to go all the way into Brooklyn, which is like a a 40 minute train ride. Uh, it, and you got to, you know, and then it's not just a train ride. It's it maybe a less than that, but then you got to take the subway. Yeah. And uh, it. Uh, yeah, yeah, Jameson. Jameson's saying at least they pay, but it, good, good God, they may as well not be paying you, Jameson. Fuck, I mean, it's pays like, what, a dollar a day? Come on. <laughs> $40 is high. Okay. It's high payment for a jury. Traditionally, like in L.A., you, uh, last I heard, you might get seven bucks. Yeah, well, well, from what I understand, back in, it was about a dollar a day when I was, you know, dealing with it. But, but your, your employer yeah. should also pay you. Right, theoretically. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, but I, I, I wouldn't, uh, it was, it was actually kind of, it's kind of always kind of interesting to interact with other people. I didn't like it because it, it takes attention off of my work. I don't like it. Um, but, um, if like, say if Paula got called to it, which she could now that she's a citizen, yeah. um, you know, well, she'd probably have fun with it. It would probably be a fun experience. She should get paid for not going to work. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. You know, and her employers would have to pay her. Yeah. Uh, they couldn't get away from it. Uh, so it, it would be lucrative for her. Uh, it's not going to help me because I have to pay myself and <laughs> not to work. So, uh, yeah. So, so uh, I, w- I would have, it'd be interesting, you know. Might get to indict Donald Trump. <laughs> the thing is, you can't talk about the case. You can't talk about the case. Uh, you know, it's it's it, you just you're not supposed to do that. Yeah. So, uh, well, you're free to talk yeah, about I, it after it's over, right? I don't think you're supposed to, but I don't think it matters so much then. Yeah, nobody cares. Nobody gives a shit. Yeah, honestly, they allow you to. <laughs> but see, the reason is. It's because I know we indicted this one. It was the big case that we did. It was a uh, uh, famous. I heard Jim Cramer talk about it. You know, when it went down, it was a it was a hedge fund. And what happened is the guys they they kept borrowing or stealing money from other accounts to cover the oil market had crashed. And they kept waiting for it to go back up, but they kept, you know, stealing money from other accounts and it never recovered. So the whole thing came tumbling down. They thought they were going to be able to uh, bail themselves out, you know, by stealing money from this account to put money on oil futures and <laughs> then it would go up and they'd get out of the thing. But it just went down, down, down. Robbing they, Peter to pay Paul. Yes. Yeah. And then they couldn't get out of the illegalities. And then at that point. When when we signed the, you know, voted to indict, they had warrants out. You know, I even thought about what if somebody talked that they they arrested those guys so fast. Oh God! I mean, I'm sitting there, we're indicting, and I think the next thing I know, I was looking at a newspaper talking about the indictment. You know, I mean, it was like bam, 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 because you know they they were obviously as guilty as hell. You know, they went on and on and on about the indictment. You know, I mean, it was obvious these people had uh, misbehaved. Yes. So, uh, you know, and it wasn't wasn't that interesting. It was just outrageous behavior, which you could understand, and people being trying to cover their ass. Yes. I mean, you know, it was stupid. It was stupid. But. Uh, yeah, no, yeah. definitely. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, in, in terms of, I got you off track. So you were talking about um, the good that evil can uh, can do, and you were talking about the, the you know the, the, even the mob could could, yeah. could help somebody. Uh, and, and your churches are just not they're not all bad, but you know certainly 
uh, they leave a lot to be desired. Uh, and, 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 you know, life is weird. Yeah. <laughs> yes, indeed. But life, life is weird. We're all, you know, we're all sitting here in this uh, wheel of samsara trying to get to the next uh, wheel. Trying to trying to uh, you know resolve our difficulties or, or whatever whatever our, our game is, it's um, you know it, so it, be it. it is. And uh, well, thank you. And that was uh, brilliant and beautiful. And uh, it's just so exciting, of course, that uh, there will be some uh, translating work for uh, Peter to work with soon enough. And uh, with that, uh, bringing on the other gentlemen and, of course, checking into our chat room with all the wonderful people that we have. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, there we are. There goes another uh, idiot. We have a few of these uh, these bots. But other than that, of course, uh, overall, everyone is uh, is is behaving themselves. And uh yeah, Jaybird is in there. Says, "Hey, Doug. Hey, Pete. Sorry, I'm late. Trying to uh, integrate currently. <laughs> Hopefully, you're having a wonderful conversation. Uh, thank you." And KRD says, uh, um, "Oh, yes. Uh, she's referring to Gillian, and that is the pronunciation of uh, Maxwell's name is Gillian in the English. Of course, I prefer the French infinitely more, which is uh, Gillian. Uh, but uh, you know, the um, and would actually." Actually include the S, more like a Gigelaine, uh, but uh, here in America. The last thing she's worried about is the pronunciation of her name. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, KRD is referring to her saying she threatens the judge sitting uh, her trial, didn't she? Uh, uh, during her trial, she may have threatened the judge. Um, probably, I'll look more into that. Uh, there's a lot going on with these. And uh, so, um, as Sarah says, Sarah Thomas, God bless her. So glad you're in there, honey. Uh, she was saying, uh, wouldn't a good assassin make it look like an accident or look like natural causes? And of, uh, of course, I mean, uh, it, honestly, unless, of course, you know that you can get out of there and it just doesn't matter if the person is obviously killed. <laughs> uh, there's, there's environments where you can do that. Believe me, uh, places like Mexico, uh, other places where I've been involved, uh, believe me. You can leave a trail of bodies. Uh, in terms of Clarice Claudette, uh, she says, donuts, plastic Jesus with machine guns. The world has gone crazy. She was, of course, inspired uh, to say that by what we were relating about Jesus is the pickle. And uh, Clarice Claudette, love you, honey. And uh, thank you so much again for these. I have yet to even begin to probe these uh, wonderful care packages. God bless you. Uh, they're the gifts that keep on giving. There's so much in them. Uh, really uh, too much to, uh, to go through at once. A lot going on with that. And I'll uh, speak to her privately sometime in the near future as soon as I can. Uh, Ballistic Bupa's in there. And of course, we've got another bot here that I'm going to uh, deal with. I know that our man Jameson's dealing with this at his end. I'm just dealing with it at mine. Uh, and that way we double report these bastards. And uh, that hopefully will Will ultimately lead to uh, an end of them. I'm happy to report I do see these same types of bots attacking, as I said, other um, uh, channels, so to speak. And uh, primarily, there's a channel that I use as a bookmark, and I see these same type of types of bots showing up there and attacking, and um, even the porn ones. So uh, at I least I got to ask you a question. Sure. Before I go, and it's, it's getting time for me to go, but one of my longtime um, fans of, of, of sky books yeah I, I sent out you know um a notice yeah. the time travel education center said i was going to be on with you yeah and he's gotten these before but he's never said this uh -huh. and i assume it's genuine he's he's always been a respectful guy and i don't know when he says he says i'm sorry i lost you <laughs> Lost me. I lost you when Doug was talking about sucking his own transgendered child's blood. What the fuck? Do you know what he's talking about? Uh, this is someone who obviously hasn't been listening for a long time and gets shocked at uh, what he hears. Uh, in terms of, uh, yeah, my son's blood, uh, what of it? I've, I've, I've been public about partaking of it 
before. And so uh, uh, I talked about the Blood Boys. I don't know. You talk about that. Yeah. You know, I mean. Uh, oh, I've talked about it in the past. Yeah, yeah I've never hidden it. And uh, of course, uh, if people oh, are shocked, it's not. It shouldn't. It shouldn't stop you or us that people yeah. would be turned off. By <laughs> I mean, I, I don't remember you talking about your your. You know. Well, in, in terms of uh, technically not your child, he's not my uh, child. But, yeah, he, he, biologically, so that's why I can partake of his blood. But sex anybody's blood is enough to turn people off, and they don't understand uh, the you, predicament. But well, don't, this, I don't judge it. You know, it's like it's not something I'd want to watch <laughs> or, or ah. contemplate too much. I'm it's sorry, just, say that again. I, I said I wouldn't want to watch or contemplate too much. It's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a different lifestyle. Well, I, uh, uh, look, I can relate to this uh, to a degree. I mean, say, for instance, um, you know, I, I am probably going to, uh, if I can, switch my primary care provider at uh, Kaiser Hospital uh, because my doctor, who I've worked with for a long time, for a decade, um, is very antithetical uh, to chiropractic and, uh, and Kaiser to a degree will ensure chiropractic. And, uh, therefore, you know, he, his refusing my, his just, uh, prohibiting my ability to take advantage of that is I've, I've had enough of it. So, um, I'm going to try and switch to a, um, Asian woman doctor. If she's, if she's getting more patients who's called me the, just recently because, he is on, this is where the connection comes in here. He's on paternity leave. Now, basically, the doctor that I got assigned at Kaiser, and I've been fine with him, he's much younger than I am. He's gay. Uh, he, uh, he He's on paternity leave. So that means, of course, he's got a husband, and that his husband, well, they've adopted a child. Now, of course, here's where I have to admit that... Uh, Say, for instance, when I was when my mother was still alive and I was caring for my mother and I would, uh, of course, take her everywhere to exercise that we could shopping, etc. And uh, there was one time when we were at Lucky Store or the what was the market, the market that replaced Lucky in San Francisco. But there was this market that um, is now Whole Foods, I think, not Whole Foods, but uh uh, one of those organic, more, you know, like Trader Joe's. It's Trader Joe's in San Francisco now, I think. And uh, that was back when it was lucky, and I was taking my mother there to, um, to shop. Then I saw two men, a uh, gay couple, and uh, one of them was holding an infant. And uh, every just reflexive reactionary revulsion uh all the revulsion that i felt just i really had to swallow it all because i just felt violently repelled i i had to just the fact that you had a, a gay person with a young baby yes a just couple. just a guy yeah a couple of gay well, well, well i i i mean i can understand that and i think we're living in times when people have to be more open we're to forced diversity. to be yeah we're forced or, to be or or even aberrated lifestyles because it's uh you have to find what life is there to acknowledge and and foster it's it's tough it's it's from a perspective of years ago it's it's very challenging. It is. And just to the old, yeah. what, what one of my friends said to me, she said, you know, she said this to me about a long time ago. It seems like about 20 years ago. She says, she says the old rules for dating don't apply anymore. Relationships. It's all new rules. Well, she's talking about boy girl relationships. Um, she's kind of talking about midlife too, but, uh, this applies what you're saying to families, to circumstances. Everything is is in sort of dystopian. We're we're living in a dystopia. Yeah. And in in some ways, when I first read science fiction, 
and you're projected into a world that all these worlds were different. They were drastically different than the world you knew. And there was some cachet to being projected into a world and vicariously experiencing it. It was kind of fun. And you're, you're reading the protagonist and what's the adventure? And sometimes there was technology involved and it was neat. You could vicariously live another life. But when faced with the actual prospect of it in today's world, it's like a, a, a bad Ray Bradbury story. And I don't mean that it was written badly. Some of them were. But I mean, it's like a, a dystopian situation, like Fahrenheit 451. <laughs> yes. No, great book, exciting adventure. But there's, there's nothing really good about the book because he's living in a dystopian relationship with this with this woman who wants to do nothing but watch TV. And he's trying to read books and he can't read books. And he's a fireman assigned to burn books. And he's living a hellish life. And they finally, they finally track him down. And when I, I turned my friend on to this book, you know, and he, I think he saw the movie and he read the book, uh, you know, one of my uh, schoolhood school friends. And years later, here it is, years later when we get back together, uh, we're talking about the O.J. Simpson uh, Bronco chase. And he says, you know, it reminds me of Fahrenheit 451, chasing down O.J., you know. Mm -hmm. They chase down Montag, the fireman. You know, he's, you know, they chase him down. It's public TV and they kill him. But it's not Montag. He's escaped. He's escaped to, you know, the world of books. And, and <laughs> out the woods. He's out in the woods. And the guy they kill is just they just kill this guy. He's just a poor sucker because they want to show the public that they've killed Montag, the, the hero. Yes. Uh, and uh, of the story. But they they have to show they kill him. And here here they had. You know, he, but he thought the O.J. hunt down was like very much like Fahrenheit 451. You've got the whole police state going against, uh, you know, the alleged killer. Yes. Uh, it was. Uh, th th this is, and you know, now they don't chase him down. They 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 put him in jail for a day and let him go. <laughs> Apologize, to O.J. We had you in there too long. Sorry. <laughs> we had you in jail too long we should have let you go oh my god uh, yes it's, 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 it's very very dystopian uh the, the world that we're living in yes and, uh, and, and, and this and, is go ahead yeah and so my point was that so here i was with my mom and i see these two gay guys and an infant child and i had to repress a desire to lunge at them and kill them, especially the man directly in front of me holding the child in his hands, the infant. And it was, uh, this is based, of course, on the abuses that I've seen in my life and uh, what I saw with Michael Aquino. By the way, I'm not going to name the individual, but uh, an individual we both know uh, dreamed of Michael Aquino, or rather Michael Aquino entered his dreams. And this is very common for everyone around me. At some point, Michael Aquino enters their dreams. It's very common for anyone not around me, but anybody, anybody who listens to Douglas Dietrich in the past, I get uh, letter, you know, communications from complete strangers who tell me that they've uh, had Michael Aquino appear before them or in their dreams, you know, in the past. Been a long time since I've heard that. Uh, but this happened uh, just recently with someone among us. And so if they if they want to bring that up, they're welcome to do so. But my point is, Michael Aquino never appears in my dreams, of course, because of the peacock angel and my possession by that. Yeah, in my dreams either. And I certainly wouldn't want him there. <laughs> Sorry that this person experienced that. I hope the suggestion doesn't doesn't stir him up in my in my dreams. Um, not at all. Well, he's been in he's been in mine twice, but you know the second time it wasn't as friendly. We can say he seemed to be really pissed, <laughs> which I found amusing. Well, that that means the first time he might have been friendly because you were reading his stuff and he was thought you were on his side, and it seems like uh, yeah, that's right. If he got pissed, that's good. Yes. No, that make that makes perfect sense, and uh, and and so uh, at any rate, when it comes to uh, the situation that I'm trying to describe about these two gay guys, and that came up again, that feeling of revulsion, 
where uh, when I was calling my nurse case manager uh, because I got a call from the Asian female doctor who I'm hoping to have as my primary care provider. Uh, but basically when, um, the nurse case manager called me back when I was calling her about this, uh, doctor who had called me, then, uh, I brought up, uh, she, she, she brought up why the Asian woman doctor called me in the first place where she said, um, oh, because your refills of course are painkillers and we want to make sure, of course, it's always the bugaboo about addiction. Uh, we want to make certain that these aren't being abused. You know, they're, they're not saying that, but they're saying that. And, uh, so the doctor was calling me about it and she said, she's, she's taking the place of uh, my normal doctor because he's on paternity leave and I you know again that wave of revulsion that almost like sudden like murderous rage uh, I really shouldn't even express this uh, but uh, in in terms of that I uh, of course just made the snide comment I, I said uh, <laughs> very uh, uh, smarmily, snidely. I, I, I said, uh, "Nice to know that his, uh, you know, his male husband got pregnant." You know, she didn't get the 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 the, <laughs> the cynical. Well, well, what this the, is, she, what the, what this all is, this is is it. Uh, without casting judgment on it, it's a mockery of the culture that we've known. It's it's mocking the old culture that that we grew up with and know where, you know, women have babies, men are the protector of the husband. So the culture is that culture is now being, uh, you know, mocked. usurped. Yeah, usurped and in a sense yeah. desecrated. In a sense desecrated. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, for what it was. This yeah. is not casting judgment yeah. on either culture. Of course, it's it's easy. If not tempting to cast to cast judgment, but I'm, I'm just trying to contextualize it. Yeah. It's it's yeah. So it's like saying that culture sucked, and and you know you can make an argument that the culture did suck. <laughs> yes, uh, you can make you definitely make that argument. But is the new culture they're replacing it with better? That becomes the question, uh, and I think that's the real issue people have with it, um, and so much of. Uh, Gayness is is a symptom of something else. Uh, but as they say, uh, I think the most important thing to do with people who are different, whether it's transgender or gay, is to just um, grant them their individuality of who they are and accept them for who they are and what they say they are, the only time they can become a problem is if they they're having some agenda. And and I, I can't say that all of them do. I can you know gay people uh, are much less complex to deal with than a transgender person, generally speaking. Yes. And you know they many of them you can get along with fine <laughs> yes and yes and, and then there can be a stubborn streak in some of them like gore vidal in particular and i've known others that insist that you're really gay too and you're all really gay you just won't admit it <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> and, uh it, having dealt with what i dealt with all my life i could almost see where he's coming from i i can see where he's coming from to a large degree in the sense that many american men are are many toxically over masculine men are just that uh something's going on there so there's validity well, yeah. So there uh, yeah but but he he basically thought everybody yeah i get it i get it yeah when he universal so it. Yeah. in his own mind so but uh, by, by the way without diverging too deep on that tangent i've dealt with pedo predators and child molesters all my life and one of the uh most prominent aspects or or, or uh outstanding and i mean this in the most negative sense one of the most outstanding traits amongst them is they truly believe everyone is fucking kids but everyone else is dishonest about it. And they're just the unlucky ones who get caught or the only ones who are uh, honest about it, uh, quote unquote. Uh, so uh, the, um, but seeing what I saw at the Presidio, I could understand why they would come to that conclusion. And certainly while I was growing up, 
uh, certainly one of the first experiences, the first experience of my memory, it was just like with Christine Joanna Hart, who showed up in our chat room just the other day. And again, without allowing this to go into too far of a tangent, Christine Joanna Hart showed up in our chat room the other day, and our man Jameson Reese can testify to all of this. Um, oh yeah, yeah, that was that was a fun combo. <laughs> yeah, she comes in, and um, the first thing that she does is um, she talks about something fairly innocuous like COVID. Like um, you should concentrate a bit on COVID and then uh, talk about um, this as a distraction from real issues or something. And then and then later on started attacking me, saying that, oh, Sarah Rachel Adams reported you as a pedophile. By the way, she and Sarah Rachel Adams and um, Haley Mayer, who, you know, I was friendly with all these ladies and basically to a degree intimate with all of them. And uh, so they're all like a trio now. They're all like, um, you know, the the mean girls at the, <laughs> at the uh, at the at the school who hang out at a certain part of the yard and uh, and basically are consider themselves the the elite. And uh, so uh, basically now they're all like um, brainwashed by Sarah Rachel Adams against me, which, you know, poisoned by her against me, which is OK, whatever, which means, of course, that uh, they're poisoned against everyone around it's me. It's a such. shitty life. It's a pretty shitty life. To, yeah. Yeah. So, to, so then uh, she, she attacks, you know, uh, this is, uh, um, you know, uh, Christy Joe here. She hated that name. Christine Joanna Hart. She attacks by starting to the, the whole pedo trip and then attacking me like, yeah, yeah, Sir Rachel Adams reported you as a pedophile. And, um, you know, and then uh, so when Justin um, started uh, saying that's that's not the case at all, I told him, you know, don't even bother that. Don't even dignify it with uh, with a defense. It's no it's no threat to me. Uh, the truth is. I've, I've always been open about this. I've said I've had sex with girls who were obviously underage when I was overseas and uh, here in the United States, such as my son, who I purchased off the streets, who was not of legal age when I purchased him back when he was a girl. And uh, so again, this is something that probably throws people way off. And uh, just remember, I'm living in a totally different world with you where most people don't expect to live to the age of 20. Uh, and when you go to different places in the world, uh, the idea of somebody not having sex until the age of 18 is preposterous. People are lucky if they live to the age of 18. So that's just crazy. Uh, but that's different from, say, for instance, what I see with guys who are fucking infants or people who are 12 or nine. So that's a holy. Okay, so you're, you're, you're of the mind that these, these guys are going to abuse the kid as he. Well, it's, it's hard not to. It's hard not to draw that conclusion. And I try to uh, try to program so myself I, out of it. But... I, see, I see what you're saying. Yeah. He and... wasn't going to be normal raised. Well, I. Uh, I mean, well... I made the joke before. I made the joke that, uh, it, well, you know, Anakin Skywalker was raised by two men. And look how he turned out. <laughs> <laughs> he became Darth Vader. Right now, that's a joke, but it's based on the, the film. He's raised by two guys. Two Jedi men adopt him, and Anakin Skywalker is raised to become Darth Vader. But um, it, when I take a look at um, these uh, gay couples, like especially two men, and they're raising some young child, uh, it, how is that child going to come into any awareness of sexuality when he goes to school? What is he going to, if he comes home and says, hey, dad, there's a girl I'm interested in at school. How, what kind of pointers is he going to get? Uh, you know, he's going to get the same, uh, Douglas, he'll get the same pointers I get. Got none. <laughs> it's either that. No, that's if he's lucky. <laughs> Either that well, or the dad's going to say, her, tell, her, tell her where, tell her where she can go for a sex change. Yeah, there you go. Something like that. Or, or the guy's going to say, Oh, why don't you talk to Bob? He's the pillow biter. You know, he's the bottom guy. And, uh, it's just basically well, it, it, it's, it, it sounds pretty, pretty messed up. And, and, um, it, it's just hard to imagine something functional coming out well, of well, the dog. Uh, Douglas, if I may, I, I, I tend to think that some of your revulsion also is a product of post-traumatic stress. Yes, that of very what much you so. Experience. I'd be the so, first to uh, say that. I, yeah. yeah, I can see it as so. So, so when you uh, say something like that, it's it's by no means taken as you know 
anyone, you know, having something against gay people raping Thank you. kids. You know, it, no, it, it's, it's, it's more obviously, like, yeah, yeah, obviously all the blood I just boys. To, I, I just want to yeah. qualify that for like, you know, our Thank listeners. You. Thank you. All the blood boys that I deal with uh, are, are, are gay. Obviously, this is how they wound up in the situation that they're in, which uh, is far better than what they had which was the streets that their parents evicted them onto when they disowned them. Uh, but when it comes to uh, the, um, say, for instance, like uh, Christine that, Joanna Hart. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to. I'm going to have to. Understood. Go. Uh, oh, well, love but, you dearly. Before Shall I go, yeah. before I go, you, you said something. You didn't want me to uh, yeah. hang up. Oh, yes, that's right. Uh, you're well, well, we've got Jameson, so you can hang up. But before you go, I did want to make this point so that you do hear it. Um, just as Christine Joanna Hart was uh, her first memory when she came to the chat room and uh, her first introduction to me was, of course, as a victim of Michael Aquino and her earliest memory in life is sexual assault by Michael Aquino. That's her first sense of awareness. My first sense of awareness, of course, was being assaulted by my grandfather whom I killed. That was my, that was my first kill in life was when I was three years old. So we're talking about, uh, I do not have any, you know, this is where the post-traumatic stress disorder is sourced from in another sense, in terms of the primal trauma. So, but, uh, Peter Moon can make more observations about that when he returns with us on Sunday. And, uh, we love you dearly. Share that love with Paula. And, um, and of course, say goodnight to our audience and where they can get the Roswell deception and the demystification of World War II before you go. You can go to skybooksusa.com and get it on a discount if you like. Roswell deception and the demystification of World War II. With yeah. that, I'll say goodnight to everybody. Yes. Good night. Bless you. Thank sure. you so much. Yeah. Good night, Peter. Uh, and and so uh the rest of you gentlemen who are still with us um salman shank i know you have to go soon uh do say good night to our listeners but provide us with whatever observations or insights you have in terms of what we've been discussing oh yes brother douglas um i'm really enjoying the uh, the transmission tonight and it, it was me that had the uh, the dream about aquino it was about the day before yesterday and it was kind of strange to me because i always stood against the things that he does and uh, basically my Sufi path. So it was uh, kind of strange for me to see him in a dream. And how I saw him in the dream was I was walking in this suburban town and on the opposite side of the street, it was him and another man walking who I couldn't make out his face. And they were walking a dog together. And as, as I was walking past them, he looked at me and he smiled at me. And I know as soon as I woke up, I did my Sufi prayers of protection because I, I didn't know, like, what was the reason why that entity or that being after his death showed up in my uh, in my dream state. So I did my Sufi prayers of protection. I sent prayers of protection towards Brother Douglas because uh, we're in this struggle together against the enemy. And that's exactly what uh, Brother Douglas is pointing out tonight, the aspect of his transmission, which I would like for him to dissect what I saw and uh, what it exactly means. But uh, I'm, I'm glad that I shared that with him and also doing the prayers of protection, which reminds me like what the Sufi Sheikhs tells us that we're in an occult war. So this war that we're in, it's not just an information war. It's also an occult war. And you must be persistent with your spiritual practices for the, not for the enemy, not to find any opening in your mind or in your dream realm or wherever they can come in do what they need to do so the aspect of keeping yourself spiritually protected is very important and i know while i was listening to this transmission i was while i was on mute i was doing my prayers of protection not just for myself but for brother douglas because of uh the type of life that he's led and the price that he's paid with his parents and uh just everything that he has seen and witnessed so far that he has described and i encourage everyone please donate to him support him and just even to the very minimum sharing his transmissions, whatever it is that you can do, do it. Put a thumbs up on his videos, report the gang stalkers, get his book from Skybooks USA and whatever capacity you can help him because he is our Vulcan interventionist against these agents of chaos and these cultists of the kings of Edom, who I know Allah will destroy on the day of judgment with the punishment of the hellfire and I mean, I'm just I'm always in awe, Brother Douglas, just listening to your transmissions and just know that I'm always with you. And this this just reiterates 
the bond that you and I have built together and myself with Team D, that any any opening that the enemy tries to find, we destroy them with our spiritual practices and by us keep doing what we're doing. And with that, I give my greetings of farewell. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be with you and yours for Daniel, Douglas, Jamo. I love all of you dearly and may Allah bless all of you. And I bid you all farewell. And Bef for Brother Daniel, hey, where the white women at? <laughs> and before you go, <laughs> dear brother, um, uh, believe me, I uh, love you dearly. And I, uh, in my selfishness, I'll ask you one more service before you go. We have, sure. of course, Peter Moon talking about this reactionary individual who feels reflexive revulsion. At my supping, the term is supping, by the way, not sucking, just so people understand, not that any of uh, any person out there would have any reason to know about vampire etiquette. Well, a good way but... to remember it would be supping as in supply. Yes, so thank that, you. That, that, that oh, no, I, I, don't, I don't find that disgusting at all, thank because you. I come from a Sufi community, a Sufi occult Islamic community, so... They tell us that in order for you to become one with Allah, you have to become one with all of his beings that are placed on this earth. That includes human, vampire, ghoul, angels, jinns, and every single being that was placed on this earth was placed because it has a purpose. Otherwise, Allah would not place them here. So that's why the, the Sufi, when you go to these different places, like I went to Pakistan, your uh, normal human can't live there because... A lot of those Sufis have transcended themselves so much in the Arabic word it's called fana, yes. the annihilation of the self, where you lose yourself completely in the love for Allah and the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that even if you do encounter any of these non-human entities, they actually respect you and walk away from you because they know you're not you're not basically an average human. And that's why the Sufi path is so tough that you really have to be about it. And also... Besides Hinduism and Buddhism, the Sufi Islamic occult path also tells you uh, it, it has the aspects of the wheel of samsara because it tells you that it takes you it takes your soul 50,000 years to get back to Allah, the original source of where you come from. So you do go through various realities and lifetimes and different avatars. But in reality, it's, it's all the same exact thing that we're all one. We're all here with a purpose. So with Brother Douglas's lifestyle, I from my Sufi community and understanding know that Allah has placed Brother Douglas on this earth for a reason and he does what he does and I support him completely. I love him dearly and I stand with him against the agents of chaos who will be destroyed. And these beings that we're dealing with, they're outside of the cosmology of Allah and Iblis. They're, that's that, This is an enemy that wants total annihilation. Not just of humans, but every being on this earth. So that's why I encourage everyone, please support Brother Douglas, and I cannot stress that enough. God bless you. Thank you so much. And as always, very beautiful hugs, and uh, you have a blessed night. Okay. Assalamu alaikum, Brother Douglas. My love to you, uh, JMO, Daniel, and to all the white women in Texas. Yes. Good night. Yes, and blessed be thy dreams. Oh, yeah. Peaceful be yes. thy slumber. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, before you go, I do want you to know that um, I, I find your dream actually reassuring. It's one of those things where I would not uh, dwell on it in any worrisome sense. I'll uh, dissect it further uh, when we uh, regroup again. Or um, we might speak before Sunday, but um, uh, certainly when we, if if we don't speak until next Sunday, I'll bring it up again and uh, in the opening hour, and um, speak about that since I now know I'm free to do so. Okay, and hope that's coherent. <laughs> I guess he left, uh, and uh, so uh, with, with that, uh, brother Douglas, do you hear me? Oh yes, I do now. Yes, bless you. Yes, yeah, I, I heard you, and uh, I thank you for that, and I give you my love and wish you all good night. Thank you. Good night. You. Much love, JMO. Good night. Bye. Yes. And uh, with that, I turn towards Sammy Romero and uh, Jameson Reese. Uh, both of you gentlemen strike up a conversation while I uh, still get my head together. Uh, I'll probably take a short break to refresh myself. 
and then uh, come back and begin to suck all the oxygen out of the room. Uh, I personally uh, find it rather pathetic that somebody would, uh, uh, shall I say, uh, uh, take what I do with uh, my son uh, without understanding the context uh, and uh, then uh, react to it so reflexively. It also surprises me how uh, this never entered consciously into uh, uh, Peter Moon's uh, awareness before. He, certainly he's heard me speak of it, but uh, a lot of times, you know, I understand that people just consciously don't even absorb what I say when I say something like that. <laughs> they just kind of blank out. Uh, they check out at that point. That's uh, one thing I can't understand about certain people because it's it's the things you say are, are uh, especially you and Peter Moon, the things you guys say, there's always something relevant to be drawn from it, something of extreme importance. So it's very hard to blank out when you say anything. But, I mean, that's just me. Uh, other people, it might be like, okay, that's just a thing. I don't care. <laughs> yeah. that, that might be, you know, how they react to it. Uh, there you have it. Uh, it the, best, the best reaction would be to try and understand the context. And yeah. uh, in, in that sense, I've explained the context before on any number of things that would otherwise be uh, completely illegal or uh, completely, shall we say, just uh, unacceptable in, in terms of things that I have done. And uh, they um, uh, and, and hopefully just by understanding context, which is everything, then people uh, have a uh, enhanced sense of awareness about the world that they live in. Uh, what is so repulsive about the majority of these people who reflexively react like that is that they are seeking uh, the macabre. They're seeking the bizarre or they wouldn't be reading what Peter Moon puts out. That's what you're seeking when you're reading those books. You're reading books on the paranormal. You're, you're reading books on uh, essentially the supernatural. Uh, you're reading books on that which is uh, not the norm. That's why you're reading. <laughs> so when you suddenly say, oh, uh, I draw this line here. Uh, what madness are you, you, you? What kind of pathology must you be coming from? Uh, that's, you, that's, you're not in an environment where you can draw the lines on what is the norm uh, when you enter the environment of the supernatural or the paranormal. Uh, so... Um, is that coherent, uh, Sammy? I hope you can add to this. Oh, that's... Well, I, I don't know if Sammy's still here. Oh, yes, he may have. Oh, that's right. He may have taken off. Hopefully he'll return. But uh, but, but that is that is indeed coherent. I mean, if you, you, you come expecting all manner of strange, once it hits you smack in the face, you're like, oh my God, I can't take it. I don't believe this. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's just like, you know, well, what the hell were you looking for in the first place? <laughs> You know, it, you. It, it, it doesn't make any sense. It's it's that American double mind uh, where where things can, you know, openly contradict each other and still be accepted yeah. as coexisting. Yes. Yes. And uh, and by the way, didn't express this while Peter was here, but uh, uh, basically one of the things that strikes me, the images. Yo, here's what to say about that before I forget it. Remind me to bring this up or make a note of this and we'll bring this up in the opening hour on Sunday. Uh, where I'll go over it while everyone is here. But Billie Eilish came out and basically expressed... I don't know if you know who Billie Eilish is. Otherwise. Nope. Okay, Billie Eilish is this uh, wonderful young lady who's a singer and entertainer. She's very popular these days. So her name, Billie, is spelled uh, with an I-E. Uh, so Billie uh, Eilish is spelled E-I-L-I-S-H. For those of anyone out there listening who doesn't know her, they can look her up. So Billie Eilish is a, she quote unquote suffers. Um, many people would consider this a gift. So I don't know if that's even the correct term. I don't feel, she, I don't think she sees it as a debility or some kind of disability, but um, she experiences synesthesia. So as a synesthesiac, um, oh, she can, that. yes, she, well, I know, you know <laughs> what that is. And I know you seek the experience of synesthesia with, uh, the drugs you take. So, uh, you, this isn't for your benefit. I'm explaining this <laughs> to the listeners. All right. Uh, so, 
uh, for those, the rest of you out there, other than Jameson, uh, the uh, synesthesia is where you can your 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 sensorial experience of the world is 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 blended. Uh, you taste colors. Uh, you see sound. Uh, you are, it is rumored, and I believe there is compelling evidence that Nikola Tesla was a synesthesiac. Uh, so you, you perceive and process the world quite differently. Now, uh, with Billie Eilish, she just came out today and said, I saw pornography. You know, I shouldn't make fun of her like this, but this was, I I can't get it. it. To me, this was like, to me, this was rather pathetic. She came out and said, I saw pornography when I was 11 and it destroyed my mind. It just basically she said, fucked her all up and she never recovered. And I'm like, oh, no, that's, that's not what fucked her up. Yeah, <laughs> she was <laughs> fucked up from the beginning, if that's the case. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I started jacking off to pornography when I was eight or nine. Of course, I was hypersexualized by being witnessing my sister getting raped by my grandfather and then his attempting to rape me, but I killed him there, then and there. And uh, as for <laughs> pornography, uh, you know, I can make a joke of this and say, yeah, you know, I started appreciating pornography and consuming pornography when I was between the ages of eight and nine, uh, rather addictively, and look how I turned out. Now, of course, anybody can take that and run with it and go in the most negative direction, kind of like the joke I was making about two men raised Anakin Skywalker, and look how he turned out. But uh, nevertheless, I... It's, it's like... interesting about uh, Billie oh. Eilish, um, oh, her you. brother... Uh, her brother has a girlfriend supposed to resemble his sister. There you go. There you go. That's not uh, surprising. How, how do you spell the name? I, I, I don't even know what this person is. E-I-L-I-S-H. E-I-L-I-S-H. And, um, of course, uh, Daniel Arola, who I keep forgetting is here with us. You know, every time I hear his, his voice in the background, I kept thinking, what is that? But that's Daniel. That's right. <laughs> so, Daniel. Well, uh, maybe, well, it could have been the fact that her first experience was probably with her brother. That's probably what fucked her up. It, it, you know. I'm just going to I'm just gonna go right out and say it because you, I'm the kind of guy who has to do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah you know what? Nobody you else is. If you didn't say it, if you didn't say it, I would have. Uh, this is like, uh, that's, that's the first thing that crossed my mind. That's, that's, that, that's what made sense to me that her brother showed her the pornography because he was getting her in the mood. Does that, that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it was under that context that they did what they did and that ruined her. Yeah. And that, that's uh, what now she quote, can't look at her brother and, and, again. And, and so and... she blames the porn. Yeah. Instead of her brother. <laughs> That's, yeah. You, they, you see, well, 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 this is this is typical of that. Well, this is see. You, now you see, this is what sort of separates white folks from black folks. Because <laughs> black folks would just come right out and say, yeah, my brother did this and that. And that's what fucked it up for me. Whereas white folks, they'll sort of deal with the symbol of it and not address the actual thing. Thank you. The very the the uh, culture as is uh, inherited this sort of European culture that we have inherited is so indirect that you know you could it it'll dance around shit and you'll know what it means but you know nobody's gonna say it right because that's and 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 that's one of the things that sickens me about this culture yes and as someone who consumes porn obviously I run across and you know beyond that. Come on, look, I deal with the Blood Boys in the harem, and of course, they watch a lot of gay porn. A lot of that is in the background. Uh, hell, I see them going at each other uh, all the time, and I, you know, just, just kind of block it out. Uh, it's not because I'm repulsed by it so much as it's just I'm not into it, and uh, I don't want them to drag me into it. <laughs> I mean, there's, uh, so it's just, uh, but when the case management nurse told me, yeah, you know, he's on paternity leave. And I made that snide remark about nice to see how his husband got pregnant. And uh, she just said, yeah, it's so wonderful. You know, like I, as if I had said something normal, <laughs> like it was, you know, a biological female. Uh, she just went with it. And uh, the only thing I could think of 
was that gay porn when I see two guys going after a twink. For those of you who are unfamiliar with this kind of terminology in the gay community, the twinks are essentially what all of the blood boys would be considered to be. These are the very smooth, uh, shaven, uh, very effete uh, gay uh, males that are typically the bottom uh, man of the relationship. And uh, you'll see that in uh, their porn a lot, where the two big muscle-bound dudes, which uh, are just another hallmark of gayness. Uh, honestly, that's, that's, there's a bit of advice for James and Reese right there, is uh, you got to be careful now, of being I'm, so, so I'm... cut and buff and so sculpted, because, you know, a lot of times gay guys are, and maybe, maybe a lot of women just think you're gay when they see how well-developed. Yo, uh, the only reason why I do that is for women. Honestly understood. Speaking, I, understood. It's, 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 I, all right, I I'm going to send you a picture and tell me if this doesn't. This is this is supposedly her with her, you know, brother, who's her half brother, uh -huh. which qualifies things even more. Um, and by the way, I get where you're about... coming from. I know what you mean, and, and it's pride, <laughs> and it's you know, you're hoping woman will appreciate that. But your average straight guy looks like shit. They're pop bellied. They don't take care of themselves. I know, I know you don't want to be I, like I, them. I, I just can't do that I for don't some reason. Yeah, I get it. And some of this it has to do with other reasons. You know, the fact that you know it's it's a sort of pride I take with you know. Understood. Understood. I, and I appreciate that. But you know, understand with your average woman, it, it's just let's just put it this way. It's it's like uh, well, here's a you know an example. Your average straight guy goes into a gay neighborhood, maybe, you know, and you're in a major city where they have gay neighborhoods, just like San Francisco. And uh, your average straight guy is going to be an idiot and say, God, I hope nobody thinks I'm gay. You know, whenever I've been in a situation like that with some straight guy who's concerned about that, I'll tell him straight up, nobody's going to think you're gay, you idiot, because first off, you look in too poor shape. <laughs> You're too out of shape to look fucking gay. Uh, because most gays, they pride themselves on their sculpt and, and their cut, and they uh, maintain themselves. Of course, there's plenty that don't uh, understand. So this is her and her brother, and yeah, they do look... Uh, how do I say it? Uh, that's definitely her. Uh, they, um, they, they... Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah let me put this in the let me put this in the like chat so Daniel could see it but you know that it's just that 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 uh the facial expression suggests something more honestly speaking yeah I, I mean and and Daniel's good at reading that Daniel practices the the face reading and everything else and I want Daniel to also tell us uh, to tell us about what's been going on with him and Facebook what exactly happened how did he get banned I mean you know I realize that that's kind of a stupid question. It seems like Daniel does everything he can to get banned. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, tell us what's been going on this time, Daniel. Come on, let's hear the whole story. Well, let's see, um, actually, uh, I, I I was I've actually been doing pretty good at uh, avoiding repeating the mistakes that got me uh, Facebook jailed. Mm -hmm. And then finally, there was one um, there was one GIF that I've always been using, and then they finally started uh, reporting that. As a um, as a uh, hate crime symbol, which um, w which is a meme, which is a meme of um, Adolf Hitler laughing, uh -huh. and the definition of Godwin's law, talking about how a conversation on the internet would eventually end up leading to something being compared to Hitler and the Third Reich, uh -huh. and I put some other caption on it, basically just kind of uh, being a smartass about the about the this kind of a habit. And uh, so I got Facebook jailed for that, you know, and th that was that was supposed to be a, um, a a hate crime symbol or something. And I, of course, I actually disputed it and uh, they disagreed. So I'm thinking, OK, yeah, well, I might as well go ahead and just let it go. It's so interesting because I disputed the same thing and they and they, they they were able to let me off the hook with that. So that's kind of weird. Well, like I I'll said, them up. go on. No, please go on. Daniel. Daniel. I'll, I'll see you know, I'll month whether i still stay on or not i'm sorry what i'll see in another month whether i'm still on there or not oh okay yes hmm. but but go on beyond that there was something else you were going to say you were going to go further oh well, i mean that, that was that was pretty much it i mean I, I was i was deliberately behaving i mean i was you know remembering all the, my past mistakes that got me into facebook jail 
thinking, okay, wh- what what else could uh, they get me for this time? Mm-hmm. And uh, that was uh, the one they got me for this time. And, uh, and of course, you know, I I don't know. I I didn't understand how that how that could be used against me. But of course, I could see how some people would keep uh, pressing that. Uh huh. And uh, and so Jameson Reese is asking. When was oh, I yeah. mean a sister? I mean a sister piggybacks his her brother. I mean, and and they're that old. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's not the well, image I'll, that I'll, I got in the message box. Is this a different different image? I, I sent you two. Oh, there we are. But, but 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 this one was actually attached to a YouTube video where other people find her relationship with her brother pretty strange as okay. well. Okay. So since since it's pretty much out there. There we lot... are. Okay. I thought that was her boyfriend. Okay. No, that's her brother. That's there we go. There we that's go. That's her got brother. It. Okay. And that's that's her half brother, uh, Phineas O'Connell. Okay, so, there we are. There Phineas. you go. Yeah, there we are. That's so so now we have a reason why she doesn't like porn. Yeah. But you know, secretly <laughs> when she says she doesn't like porn, she actually well, she probably doesn't does like her like brother. It. <laughs> that's what she's really saying. Well, 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 maybe she doesn't like that she likes her brother. There we are. There we are. That's that better. That's way. a better way of saying it. Yes. Yeah. Because that, that seems to be like she doesn't seem to be pulling back with yeah. her, you know, gestures of uh, her sort of uh, these, these sort of uh, expressions that make it seem like there's more to the story. Okay, excellent. Okay, and uh, Daniel Arola, if you have any insight into this, please uh, uh, go ahead with it. And insights into anything else, cut loose with what's been going on with you. And uh... oh. the other thing, goes, I, I'm really not a fan. I mean, I just I would hear her, her like in passing now and then, but uh, I, I'd, I'd hear the same stuff that Jamal was talking about about rumors about her and her brother. Uh, you know. Maybe uh, you know, getting it on on the side or whatever, and I just okay, yeah, whatever. Right. Well, I have no yeah. moral judgments on that. It's it's not moral judgment. It's more of just a uh, shall we say, if she's expressing something like she did about porn, uh, I'm interested in pursuing why she would say that because one of the things that I've pointed out is there's obvious, shall we say, there's negative aspects to porn, but in general, I'm a defender of porn in the sense that uh, most people look at this as some source of violence. In other words, what people feel is that somehow uh, this objectifies women to the point where uh, men then become rapists. Uh, you know, all that bullshit, which is, it's all bullshit. <laughs> it's not porn that well, does well, yeah, it. Because the minute they ban porn, you're going to have more people Raping, Thank which you. Is, which is pretty much what they want anyway, because Thank they're 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 entirely anti-women. Yes, that's right. Whereas <laughs> I I would argue. I'm sorry. Were you going to say something, Daniel? She was thinking about her brother when she uh, was in that mood about about porn, because she was watching it with him. There we are. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And um, I uh, so my point uh, about porn is that I would argue that it can empower women and often does because uh, they're allowed to sell sex without having to prostitute themselves uh, and um, they are might be participating in the sexual act in the porn but uh, definitely uh, they're usually getting paid As a matter of fact you can tell when they're getting paid is because you can tell when a woman is involuntarily participating in porn very easily, uh, as opposed to, yes, disambiguate it from someone who is. Uh, but uh, in, in terms of, uh, and if somebody asked me why, that would take a whole nother transmission. I'd be happy to go into the details. Uh, most people, of course, would then start turning out and saying, oh, I can't hear this. It's too visceral. Uh, but, uh, you know, to those people, all I can say is fuck you. I'm sorry, go on. You know, Nina Hartley, she's still in the business. Yeah, there you go. Nina Hartley. What do I remember about her? I certainly remember the name, but I've, I've, I'm, uh, yeah, a porno actress. I'm forgetting forgetting exactly who, but I, I know the name. And uh, I can look era. it up later. I'm sorry? She, she, she was the 80s era of porn, yeah. along with Ginger Lynn, Lynn uh, Randy West, and those cats. Right, right. Nina Hartley, yeah. I might have even, I'm sure I met her. I might have known her personally, now that I think of it. Uh, white hair, actually. 
Did she? Does she often have red hair that's dyed? Because I saw her. You know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But I'm sure back then, back then she might have bleached her hair a little lighter. No, no, no. It wasn't a bleach. There was one woman who I'm thinking of who her natural hair color was as white as mine, and uh, but she dyed it red for. Uh, okay, let me see. Hartley, American pornographic actress Mary Louise Hartman. Um, so let's take a look. I'm trying to see if I. Okay, Nina Hartley. There we are. Um, lovely woman. And uh, I don't believe she's the one that I knew personally. So there we are. And uh, there you have that. Okay, um, moving right along. I noticed that, uh, bizarrely enough, when I turned to the images, to as soon as I had Nina Hartley, which I misspelled as Hatley, <laughs> and, but she came up. Then, of course, uh, I'm getting the grave of Nina Hatley, who's a completely different person. Uh, there's, there's Nina Hartley, who's uh, modeling some lingerie. And then they got children's clothes, which come up in Pinterest. This is what always disturbs me, is how on something like this, then something like children's clothes modeling comes up, you know, along the side. It's almost like the aggregating engines throw that out there uh, just so that you like what? so that they can say your searches involve searching for children or something. It's almost like that's intentional. You get what I'm saying? Uh, then, of course, it's right next to the picture of the old granny that uh, that died named Hatley. Uh, but uh, there you have that. So um, putting that aside, uh, both of you guys uh, take over for a few minutes while I refresh myself. When I come back, I'll be talking nonstop. Of course, I'm hoping... Oh, uh, both of you will hang out as long as you want. Uh, certainly, Jameson, I'm hoping, will hang out the rest of the night. I'm glad that... Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I can do it. I might slip off in, in between at intervals because I do have an appointment tomorrow. Oh, God, um, what, what time is your appointment? 2.30, so uh, 8 a.m. I, I, I should have enough time to get a few hours. Oh, my God. Well, don't do that to yourself. Uh um you can uh speak with daniel now of course and uh help me out to the top of the hour but uh for god's sakes after that go to sleep and i'll just uh handle it as best as i can uh you know myself and uh it, you know hopefully well, i'll, I'll, I'll still keep the call and I'll, okay. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll blink in every once in a while yeah yeah okay there you go and uh so uh aside from all of that let me take a 10 to 15 minute break. Daniel and yourself can handle it, I'm quite sure. Uh, and uh, I, I want Daniel to, uh, you know, take the stage and uh, you know, help him along with <laughs> keeping him occupied with different uh, uh, subjects of conversation. Uh, Daniel, you take the lead. Uh, keep Jameson occupied. Uh, I'll be back soon enough. Anyway, um, I, I, was actually, I was actually kind of thinking about just the. Uh, uh, retiring for a little while from Facebook, you know, until after a month. If I if I'm not back on for for uh, for, for good this time, because hell, I still got Twitter. I've been I've been on that. Ah, I see, I see. Yeah, I haven't I haven't even touched Twitter. Uh, it's, it's it seems like you can. Well, I don't know. It's it's a different beast altogether. But uh, last time, last time you were on, I noticed you, you know you were doing a lot. You were you were you were making some uh, what was it some brownies? Oh yeah, yeah. You, you could really probably start a good business for yourself if 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 uh, is marijuana legal in Texas? No, uh, I mean I I guess you could say I, I could just be practicing until by the time it's finally all. Um, prohibition free then you know I'll be ready to <laughs> jump somewhere doing that, well, that, yeah yeah well uh, I, I don't know if Texas is ever going to be prohibition free <laughs> oh man I mean that's the state where they're where they're trying to ban abortion I mean it's uh, I mean what are your thoughts on that um, uh, I'm pretty patient about it I actually see it turning blue I should hope so. Um, I, I really should hope so. The term blue. I mean, they, they got Ted Nugent. We have Willie Nelson. We win. <laughs> <laughs> ah, ah, I see. That's a good, that, I mean, that's a good point. You know, he's, what is he? Uh, he's a prominent, uh, what is it? A, a country singer, I think. And, and, um, 
and the a, a, a singer and a songwriter. He started as a, song, as a songwriter first. He sang, uh, well, he, he wrote classic songs like Crazy for Patsy Cline and uh, those old country legends. He wrote Always on My Mind. Uh, he did a cameo appearance in that movie Half Baked. Ah, yes, yes. I remember now. Yeah. I mean, I sort of remember. I, I, I think I was baked when I was watching Half Baked. So, yeah, exactly. the memory escapes me. Martial arts on the side. He was like a fifth degree black belt in some kind of Korean martial art. And he, he practices in Austin. Ah, ah. Well, yeah, I'm I'm definitely hoping that uh Texas gets rid of the red invasion. That that's that that in and of itself is is it's destroying progress for your for, for uh that state. Completely destroying progress. Um hey, it, there there's still going to be remnants of that remaining in Texas, but no there's there's actually there's actually progress blooming. I mean, because I see it myself. I mean, I, I travel from here, from Houston to San Antonio, every now and then Austin, Dallas. Shit, that, that that place never changes. But anyway, but I, I do see I do see differences developing, and uh, and and also the, the progressive differences in the way some people treat each other. I mean, that's Texas. So we're, we're we may be in the South, but we're not as South as. Uh, People getting caught, you know, banging each other's relatives or anything like that, you know. So we're, we're not, we're not. Yeah, yeah. Whoa, they do that down there? Hell, no, not really. Now, now actually, see, when um, when I was uh, working, when I was working in North Carolina for a couple of years, um, the, <laughs> the the stories that I've got from that I um listened to from the police that I made friends with. They said that the most most of their arrests that they uh, <laughs> most of the arrests that they make are from people um, getting busted for repeat offenses of incest. Being oh. damn. Yeah. Well. well the, the, see, this this folks explains the red states in a nutshell, and you know, well that 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 probably explains why anyone would vote red to begin with. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> is, 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 is for that exact reason. I mean, that's the product of uh, in, of uh, in, incest. Geesh, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm assuming that whatever it is that these uh, people are uh, getting busted for, it's not consensual. I'm no kidding. <laughs> oh man, that's just yeah, that's that's messed up on so many levels. All right. Am I, am I audible? Yes, yes. Oh, okay. Sorry, guys. Um, I was doing chores, and I had to get off. Um, how's everybody doing? I was just chilling. Yeah, just, just chilling, hanging in there. Um, you know, just... Is that, uh, is that Daniel? Yep. Oh, hi, Daniel. Hi, man. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, what are you guys talking about? Oh, uh, we... Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, we were talking about some of the uh, some of the crazy things he heard, you know, in in in, in Carolina with, from like some of the police officers who worked there, you know. Oh, okay. When he was working at bars and stuff, and now like the most common offense would be like um, incest. What? Oh, a lot of arrested for incest there and most of them are repeat offenses oh my god i, I was <laughs> amazed thinking of shit i'm from tech never hear about that shit there so i i asked the cop i go how can people be that stupid to get caught doing that in the first place they just they just uh raised both hands to the side just shrugged and just laughed <laughs> didn't know really how to answer that wow that's uh that is a. Uh... That's crazy, um, and uh, as far as myself, oh, yeah. with, when it comes to that uh, quote unquote insults, you know, you I think everybody has um, in their family of cases of abuse. Um, during yeah. I, I, the only thing I really encountered was um, we my I used to have, well I have an uncle I don't even know if he's alive but I don't I can really care less. Um, 
he was kind of a of a a drifter type of uncle. He had a various miscellaneous uh, occupations, um, and I don't know if you guys have this ever happened to you, to you, uh, James or Daniel, where you asked the your brother sister about a memory or or something during your childhood, and it leads to something completely a wall. Um, well, we had these neighbors when I was small, and they used to make really good Mexican sweetbread, and. Um, I asked my sister, hey, um, you remember our neighbors used to make really good Mexican sweetbread? Um, who, who taught them how to make that? Well, where are they, where did they go to school? And she's like, no, um, our molester uncle actually taught them how to bake. Um, yeah. So I guess he, he, he used to do that as a side job. But I guess um, what happened was is he would do that to get close and you know do whatever he he could do and then i guess leave but right before he left i remember my mom told me that he actually tried to sell my sister to this um i guess this guy from of all things church um, and they were from oaxaca and you know, you know, those certain certain states in in Mexico, they're they're just very different. I mean, just a different different type of uh, ethnic group. And he actually bought my older sister, I think, for at that time, I don't know, I would say around five thousand dollars, which which was a lot, you know, for. I mean, you know, you're talking about, you know, late eighties, early nineties. So I'm sure that was probably a lot of money. And he actually bought my older sister, and when he came to collect his. I guess his uh, teenager bride, which was my older sister, my mom chased him out with a Louisville slugger bat that my brother used. So she chased him out with the bat and he left. Hello? Yeah, wow. Uh-oh. I mean, yeah. yeah. She she left. Um, she actually sw- swung at him a couple of times and he ended up leaving. But my uncle actually sold, well, he sold. The transaction was not complete, but he actually sold my older sister to that particular man from my church. And I guess my, I think my sister was around mm, about 17, 16, which I'm sure from there, they're, they're, that was probably a full grown, you know, was quite older, but still, you know, this, this is not Oaxaca. This is, you know, America. Yeah. And uh, yeah, he chased, she chased her. She chased that man out with the, uh, with the bat. And um, I guess he never came back, but um my uncle did that behind my parents' back, and um, I guess he, I mean, he he was no longer there when he did it. He just pretty much conned the man out of some money, and uh, yeah, we never we never heard him from then. But um, you know, it was one of those conversations where uh, it, I guess it led to that, where you know I was thinking about that sweet bread, and lo and behold, it was this it was my uh, my child molester uncle, I guess. He never molested me, thank God. But, um, you know, uh, a lot of my cousins, um, well, my cousins, which happen to be his children and stepchildren, fortunately, they uh, they had to go through that. But, yeah. Damn. Damn. That's, that's yeah, that's that's pretty dark. Um, I'm I'm actually blessed to not have any anything like that you know, lingering in the family that, uh, that okay. I know about. And and it's and it's one of those things where and you know I I talked to you about it Jameson about you know um, trying to um, well trying to break out of the religion aspect of certain denominations of Christianity yeah um, I have a uh, I have a cousin who actually has, that was a stepdad I, I believe it's his biological or stepdad one of those but um, he I mean he's in I mean. I love my cousin, but I, you know, obviously, he's a, he's pretty much around. I would say in his early fifties. Okay, keep him keep in mind, my dad was like fifty years old when my brother and I were born. But he's he's in the closet, like he's he's a photographer and he's never been married. And um, it's one of those things where it's like everybody knows. He just doesn't want to admit it, but it's at at this point I'm like whatever. You know, you just roll your eyes and you like ignore it. But it's one of those things was because 
he does still go to church and, and all that. It's more of, I think, uh, sometimes it's hard because I'm sure he went through that abuse. And then he actually witnessed my other cousin going through that abuse with my uncle. So she, he was there to witness it being done to her sibling, to his sister, which was happening to be my cousin. Um, so it, it was one of those things where, you know, uh, abuse on top of abuse, and then you add, you know, your your um, your sexual preference. You imagine the layers that someone has yeah. to fight through. So um, I don't know where we, why we get in this subject, but it, it, it pretty much all stemmed from that sweet bread I was thinking about. And then that's what my sister kind of brought up the whole thing about my uncle who who was kind of like a, a drifter wanderer did miscellaneous jobs and uh, he was actually a good baker it's just you know unfortunately now now that um i think about that sweet bread it kind of ruined it but you know i mean that's the world right there's always yeah. something dark behind it well well i mean the thing is you you bring up something interesting because usually with people who um you know, sometimes I'm not going to say this is always the case, but sometimes in, in many instances where um, someone witnesses abuse, it does cause uh, issues where they, you know, struggle with their sexual preference or might, you know, switch over to the other one. Because when I was in um, when I was in substance abuse therapy in this like in what was like an intensive day program, there was this one guy who was gay and he was like flaming and he said that, you know, basically he was, you know, he was raped when he was young. And, you know, ever since then, for some reason, like he just couldn't get turned on when trying to have sex with women. So it's like he could only do, he could only like enjoy having sex with men. And, and, and this stemmed from him being like sexually abused. Now, and uh, I don't know if this isn't always the case. Uh, sometimes there are other factors such as chemical imbalances. Uh, you know, there could be things happening with the, um, of course, we know that, you know, there's the sexual dimorphic nucleus in the brain, which which uh, determines, you know, how you, well, it basically determines like how you, how you grow and how you mature. But um, they find that in men who are like, uh, homosexual and women who are lesbians that they have like a sexual dimorphic nucleus of the opposite gender and uh, I, I assume that it would be even more complex when you're dealing with someone who's trans because then you know I I mean it's a, it's it's a very complicated world it's not black Absolutely. and white Absolutely. and you know, I think this is one of the problems that this is one of the reasons why I, I tend to always see that red insurgency as being extraordinarily evil, because they tend to make everything into black and white when it's not. Absolutely. They, right. And and so with them, like trying to cancel abortion, with them trying to, you know, get rid of rights that people who are, you know, quote, splash plus have, you know, they're literally trying to make a world where everything is just either or and and, and it doesn't work. Human beings are too sophisticated for that. Um, no, you're right. Um, if, you, if, I know, if you don't mind it, I wonder what Daniel thinks. Um, is he still there? Yeah. Um, well, I, I was uh, reminded of a, I was reminded of an experience of uh, back in the uh, late eighties, early nineties, um, when I was in my teenage years, and uh, I had noticed I noticed that the, every time when I'm hanging out with my white friends, you know, we could just be bored or hanging out talking about bullshit. It's usually about music because we're a bunch of metalheads, you know, into Metallica, Slayer, and all those that kind of scene. And, uh, you know, we were also into the same into those groups, but um, there would be a there would be um, the moment when one guy brings up confessing that he had maybe uh, ha- had sex with his cousin or his sister, and then it would steal out the rest of the guys. You know, it, it, that would uh, that would perk up and and follow along with it, and they would start confessing too. And they're like one by one. These guys are like, yeah, man, I did that to my cousin too, man. And I'm over here in the corner, just hanging on, just you know. <laughs> Damn, these right. guys, these guys are really this shit. And, and that, that's the only time I've ever hung out with my white friends. You know that where that conversation always ended up like that. 
it was almost every time in even different <laughs> crowds. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, you know, this explains a lot about uh, I, I I don't want to sound you know I I I, I don't I'm not trying to sound racist or anything, but that explains a lot. <laughs> and this is before we started. This is, we discovered alcohol. You know, I mean, bam. And well, you know, when we all started getting drunk, it got even worse. Wow. Yeah. Damn, man. That's 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 well. That yeah, that that sort of explains a lot about. I you know you would kind of think they would be pro-abortion if that's the case. Um, <laughs> I'm, now, just, I'm just saying. I, I, I grew up around a whole, you know I grew up around Southern conservatives and um, no matter no matter how much sense you knock into them, they they're, they're a, they'll always be reflexively steadfast with what. Um, with what they've been told to believe their whole lives, <laughs> you know, just because that's that's how they're raised. <laughs> oh, and that's um, that's very interesting you say that, uh, Daniel, because um, I'll give it a, I'll give you an example. Okay, um, I have I have many friends in the ministry. Uh, some are pastors, some are ministers. They're very dear friends to me. Um, you know, I consider them very good friends. But um, like we're humans, you know, like. When James says, well, you know, it's not black and white. And you see that. You see the human aspect of things where you can't always be on. Um, what I mean by that is, um, you, uh, you know, with me, um, I'm a Christian, but at the same time, I'm not, um, I'm, I'm not a robot. And I hate to put it that way, but I'm not a, I can't be quoting by uh, scripture and then expect to connect with Jameson because Jameson is going to be like, "Go away, you're annoying." Um, there has to be more. There has to be more of foundation of. If you want me to understand you, then you got to give me something to understand you, and not just scripture because um, scripture is is interpreted to the reader. It, it can be interpreted in many ways. And, you know, Jameson's, I've learned a lot from Jameson, just a few conversations I have with them about, you know, certain um, biblical aspects and that I may know. He probably knows more Bible than I do. And that's, that's not something to hear there, but um, my friends that are in the ministry have a hard time disconnecting themselves from their position in the church and just being regular human beings. For example, I asked one of them, hey, uh, I've, we're talking about our parents, and I've talked to them about my dad and the conversations I had with my dad before he passed, and just just regular um, regular conversations. And they can't. My friend could not really conjure up a good memory because once he started his ministry, he pretty much ostracized his dad because his dad wasn't. It he wasn't in in the ministry as well, and he didn't want it to. Need, by being, I guess, being vulnerable with them, it would affect his persona. He couldn't kind of detach himself and just be a regular human being and maybe connect with your father. And granted, his father was a raging alcoholic, but at least try and be vulnerable. No, no that reminds me of, um, that reminds me of uh, David Miscavige in, in the Scientology and his father. You know, they don't, do not click at all. Right, and, right, and it was his father that got him into Scientology, and that climbing the ranks and got to the top. Right, and, and some of these uh, Christian organizations are they're very um, powerful. They're very um, these denominations have prestige and, and they have positions, but um, a lot of people understand that it's well, many people in terms of understand or they ignore is that it's very lonely because people start believing the persona they think people they start believing the persona people try to I guess project on them when it's not reality because nobody cares nobody cares and it's all about to me it's all about if you're going to portray the Christian perspective then you, you need to have relationships with your loved ones as well as not just 
you know, your congregation and church, but, you know, your family, because it's not a cult. You, you can't, you can't, um, you have to also, I guess, have balance because if you're trying to bring or you're trying to reach out to somebody, then you need to develop those interpersonal skills so you can do it, not just when, you know, the lights are on you and you're in a big congregation and you're preaching, but, you know, it's more than that. And I think um, when talking to him, he kind of felt like, okay, yeah, um, I probably should have done that. And he's all I missed that. I, I never had a conversation with my dad because I didn't let myself. And that was a moment of kind of kind of vulnerability that he felt, but it was almost like, oh, uh, you can't believe, or, or, or you kind of have that balance in between both worlds, you know? Yeah, that's that's very sad, man. I mean, to to you know, to cut off your own family, you know, because of the and and I can only come to think that it has to do with the power and the sort of addiction to the power of people seeing you a certain way, and that sort of prestige and respect that they would have for you. And it's, and it's hollow. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead um, Daniel. I don't know. But yeah, it, it it definitely smells cultish, and uh, and uh, and it's obvious, you know, the guy is definitely after some kind of uh, some level of power, you know, and even if uh, even if he has to step over his father for it, you know, he's he, he's he's made up his mind for it. Um, and you're right. It's just I think sometimes what's I guess to and see, and this is only just a window, of, and, and you start thinking about well. This is your this is your version of the truth, but I'm sure your dad probably gave you choice. Cho- your dad had a couple of choice words for you, and uh, <laughs> you know, or, you know, you, I mean, you know how family is. Um, I'm I'm sure both of you know, but and yeah. and as a as adults, it's it's almost you can say without saying it. But that moment there was him telling me, "Look, I'm learning to detach myself from that persona because it's hollow." It has no validity because if you're reaching out to people, if you're supposed to be a servant to to the people that need help, then you can't be that way because it's it's first of all, nobody's Joel Osteen. Joel Osteen is not Joel Osteen, okay? Um, Pat Robinson is not Pat Robinson. These people are just that. Pat Robinson was involved in television he was involved in television programming he had a whole different other thing where it didn't involve religion but what i'm what i mean to say is is these people well these people i guess believe that and they want people to look at them that way and it's not it's hollow and it's sad really because you start to realize what it's kind of selfish and it's it's almost not different than going to another de- and going to the left hand path. At least the left hand path, they're going to tell you, "Yeah, I'm for this," and "Yeah, um, I'm not for that." And to a certain extent, you know, it's some, you know, it can get the lines can get really blurry real quick. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, these these things are not. It's it's like it's not real. It's 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 all TV. It's all a show. You know, and and that that kind of comes back to what Peter Moon was talking about earlier, where, you know, at some point, you know, some of these people out there aren't believing their own bullshit. It's just they want to see how far they could push the show. True. That is that is quite true. And, uh, you know, um, uh, to just change the topic a little bit. (laughs) Um, And for 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 Daniel, Daniel, um, isn't is Dana White? Is he just a prop or something? What the hell is he still doing in the UFC? He's the CEO of it. <laughs> what does he do? Is he like he said? Is he a moron or something? And the reason I'm saying this is because UFC's gone down bad. Like, like I don't even watch it no more. <laughs> and I, 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 I remember I was around when the first UFCs came around, and yeah, I, I remember them too. Watching. I stopped watching them before the nineties for the nineteen nineties was over, uh, and I just I just waited until after the fights were done so I can watch it on <laughs> tape. Okay, so. then, then then you woke up a long time ago. Um, 
No, I mean, well, I understand back in the day, it was Gracie and Dan Shamrock and all them, but now it was just a circus. Yeah, well, of course. Hey, it's, uh, it, well, it, here in America, I mean, it's, it's, it's that, it's that bread and, it's that bread and circus approach. They, they got to <laughs> sell their rights and, and that's how they're doing it now. You know, I mean, especially since the, uh, pandemic took over. I mean, yeah, they did get a little creative and started selling a pay-per-view fight <laughs> where there was no audience, but you know, as long as there was pay-per-views. While at the same time, they were also, they also had teams of people, um, catching people live streaming, you know, bootlegging their stuff. Yeah. And, and they, the... they... I, I, it's been a long time since I watched an actual live UFC event. Actually, wait a minute. The last one I actually remember seeing was, uh, was a little later, like 2006, I believe. Yeah, it was when, um, it was when George St. Pierre got knocked out by uh, Matt Serra. That was like a large, that was like a big fluke in UFC history. A that huge was upset. Yeah. yeah that was no, and the reason why I tie this is because they, and I think it's him because he's in a, I don't know if you know that Trumpster martial arts guy, what was his name? That got Covington. embarrassed. Covington. Yeah, Covington. And when they, when they started doing mm-hmm. gimmicks like that, I'm like, well, then why just make it pro wrestling? You know, it's, it's pretty much that's what it is now. It's it pretty much all has a script now. It's pretty much well, storyline. That, that, that's how that's how they sell fights. I mean, UFC they they definitely pick the fighters that um, that can go accordingly with how how they're going to sell these uh, their views. You yeah, know, I mean, it's, it's, it. They don't always go. They don't always go by the merit of the fighters. There no, no, and that's 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 go, go on. That's kind of sad, you know. That that's pretty kind of sad that, that the art form is. I mean, it's because you know, America. In fact, in fact uh, Kobe Covington. That's why he went heel because he had heard through the grapevine that that the UFC was going to release uh, release his contract until he gets <laughs> until he uh, becomes um, exciting somewhat because he was boring. You know, they oh, don't know what was. So he went full heel and went full manga. Well, yeah, that explains it. Okay. And I really want to thank our man, Jesse M. Balk. He's in the chat room. And um, he sent me some uh, wonderful private messages. Very supportive. God bless him. Uh, I'm better now, Jesse. Thank you. Um, very sensitive uh, he was to uh, my stress. So uh, I appreciate that profoundly. And I appreciate everyone in the chat room. And I certainly appreciate these three young gentlemen who have been able to maintain the round table. God bless them all. Uh, honestly, uh, I want to thank everyone who has stayed here through their conversation. Uh, and uh, let me refresh the page and uh, see how many uh, uh, people that we have left <laughs> since these gentlemen started talking and taking the stage. Age. And uh, there we are, a, a good number of people. And uh, with that, I uh, want to just go through a little bit of the chat room, see what people are saying, and uh, bring that to these uh, men's attention. And uh, a little hint there for Jameson, though I think all of you were holding well, and uh, you were all talking about a subject that uh, is enjoyable, and I think most people derive interest from. Uh, but uh, I see uh, we got another bot, so I'm going to take care of that. Bless you. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, Sarah Thomas was referring to Billy Eilish as Billy Eyelash, and uh, uh, KRD says her brother looks exactly like her. And uh, Jay Bird was saying her butt. Uh, so Entertainment Hub was saying Nancy a hero remains awake. Um, and um, so okay, Entertainment Hub is on their own trip, and that's fine. They're otherwise behaving. Uh, the uh, let me see now. Uh, I'm going to check on what some other people were saying. We had uh, Ballistic Boopa was uh, on a roll for a while. By the way, I'm glad Sammy returned to us. Uh, and uh, just out of curiosity, Sammy, you don't need to answer, of course. Uh, where did you go? Was it just curious? I had a big tourist. Uh, some tours had to be done, and I had to abruptly go. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Pretty much. Okay, that's that's fine. Now let me take a look here, scrolling up, seeing if I can get further back up. So we earlier had 
Uh, many people here. Kathy Bennett, who I wish I had said hello to while she was here earlier. And uh, hopefully she's still with us. She was talking about, hello, hello, whoa, scary and true. I'm not quite sure what she was talking about, but we were probably talking about something that was scary at the time. And uh, so James Forth Forsyth was talking about, uh, oh, yeah, so he said that earlier. We, we'd spoken of that. And then um, so she, Clarice Claudette was talking about the morning glory which was probably something we were covering as something. Oh, uh, yes, 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 yes. Nostradamus, he was he was getting high off of the morning glory, He was, which is a delirium, which is a delirium class drug, which at high doses is fatal. Uh, it's, it's, it's one of those uh, acetylcholine, uh, one of those acetylcholine releasing uh, mm -hmm. agents. Incredible. Thank you. Very good. You know your chemistry. Um, and I guess it's good to know what's uh, disintegrating you. Or so. <laughs> and um, then uh, <laughs> Sickman Duane, of course, was speaking to you, I believe. He said you need to start supplementing iodine and it improves your situation. So did you see him say that? Do respond to it if you would. And um, oh, uh, thank him well, for what it. Is this? Sickman oh, yes, Duane. Yes, much thanks. Uh, what was that in regards to, though, the iodine? Uh, Fuck uh, your general situation, dude. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I, well, well, that's actually good. I that that reminds me, I gotta buy some watercress, which is actually a good way to get iodine naturally, since you know any plants that grow near ponds and lakes, they seem to be rich in iodine. Right. So Sarah Thomas was saying, uh, uh, she says nothing like pharmaceutical highs, and uh, uh, what she said was, used to love drinking and getting high, living on antipsychotics now. Go lithium, yeah, and go coffee, yeah. Love you, Jay Moore and Douglas. Uh, after which, uh, Shane Bridges says, "Good evening, everyone." Uh, Ignacio Legui says, "Dude, please don't laugh so near the mic." <laughs> yes. Oh shit! Yeah, I said sorry, but I'm too sociopathic to be sorry. Uh, Shane Bridges says, "Big fan of Nostradamus." <laughs> And uh, then, of course, I don't know if you saw this Paulina Stevens in there, but uh, Fox Hour Reporter uh, now. And uh, OK, uh, let's see now for her. I'll just say uh, pornography. Yeah, yeah, I think I took care of that one. OK, yeah, I, I just saw it on this end because I'm in the studio. So, yeah, I'm sure you I did. Gotcha. Yeah. And then uh, then um, uh, Ballistic Bupo was was going on. He says, "Ooh, I'll ship you some of my collagen elixir, Douglas. <laughs> That's so cute. Is that, uh does that mean the house is done now, Peter? Yes. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, Brzozostek, uh, he said, uh, uh, yeah, Schmerch. And he was using that uh, term of Schmerch Spionum. Uh, and then uh, Sarah was asking, is there anything on TV or movies that is actually historically accurate? And she says, oh, that's right. I'll watch the History Channel. She's being quite sarcastic, of course. And then Travis Moss says, Parfrey was an interesting character. He was so, sort of part of that COS crowd. Okay, now help me out here. Um, yeah, Church of Satan. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, the first thing don't I came ask to my why mind, I know these acronyms. Yeah, the... Um, you know, I knew, I knew, it just, it slipped my fucking mind. I mean, uh, <laughs> but believe me, just so people get, get, get the hang of this so they understand church of satan is like old it's like old yeah, like temple of set if i had seen tos i would have recognized it but uh it was like remember what the guy i was working with was aquino not anton Levey. so when i see cos the first thing I start thinking of is like video games, like Call of Duty, COD and shit like that. <laughs> and so I was like thinking, <laughs> is it that? Like, uh, anyhow, uh, then Travis Moss was bringing up, yes, Carl Maria Willigut wrote The Secret King. And then James Forsyth brought up Robert Anton Wilson had planned to write a biography on Aleister Crowley, but time didn't permit it. And uh, then Travis Moss said The Secret King, I believe, was published by Feral House. Yes, Adam Parfrey again. Uh, and then Moynihan was like another Boyd Rice, Travis Moss. So Travis Moss is very familiar with this. I'm impressed. Uh, and, uh, of course, you know, Boyd Rice would argue that nobody's like him. <laughs> and, uh, you know, for what it's worth, Boyd Rice, I, as I said before, I knew him. And I can't say I knew him like, you know, we were the best of buddies. But I met him plenty of times. And... He was always the best to me, 
So um, I I can only speak well of them, um, and uh, certainly. Uh, I'll, I'm sorry. I'll, yeah. um, I was introduced to Bob West music back in the mid '90s, mm -hmm. and I I enjoyed it while you know while I was uh, driving on the road. Mm -hmm. The guy, and the person that um, introduced him to me was a he he was a um he he was a satanic not neo Nazi. Yeah, that's that's what Boyd Rice was, by the way. He that's how the other guy knew about him. the guy who introduced his music to you was a satanic neo Nazi as well, is what you're saying, right? Yep. Yes. There we are. And um, and it's wonderful how um, our man Daniel gets along with so many people. By the way, Sammy, um, so, oh, yeah, like you said, you went and did some chores. And so when you came back and sure. Daniel and Jameson were speaking, um, could you uh, summarize for me what um, what the subject matter was? I mean, just besides the fighting. <laughs> uh, how did we get to that point? Oh. And who's then... says? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you weren't drinking yeah, your right tea. up my nose. It's fucking coke too. <laughs> Fuck, it's carbonated. God, you're oh, that burns. Dude. Oh, you asshole. Yeah. Dude, <laughs> your lungs are, dude. They're gonna need to restaple your lungs after that shit. Oh, <laughs> oh you idiot. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. Uh, it's, okay, that's so that well, was funny. Then, then we segued it to. Um, I was telling them that uh, uh, I had a, 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 me a child memory mm -hmm. about <laughs> this is Mexican sweetbread. Yeah, well, is... Mexican sweetbread, mm -hmm. and I asked my older sister, "Hey, I missed that Mexican sweetbread. Uh, do you think our neighbors still cook it, or they still make it?" And she's like, "You know who taught them how to bake that Mexican sweetbread?" I'm like, "No, it's our child molesting uncle. It was pretty much." <laughs> He, no, he was a pretty much sorry. like a uh, a wanderer, kind of like a guy that has many miscellaneous jobs. Right. I well, mean, he used to just wander from family to family and fucking the I kids. Guess, yeah. <laughs> Go on. You know, you know how it is. It's just that yeah. old story. And yeah. um, he taught our neighbors how to make really good Mexican sweetbread. Oh shit. And then uh, I'm like, you know, and one of once I start talking about this, then other memories started, and I, I, I told them how he actually sold my older sister to a a man in our church oh, God. for like five five grand and he came to collect his child's bride or which was a teenage bride which was my older sister oh. and my and my mom ran out with a baseball bat and uh chased him out he never came back oh my god yeah you know just thank you it, no, it, we went on to that yeah. tangent yeah no 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 it's it's it, you're you're very brave to share that and of course um uh, a lot of people would be afraid to share something like that for any number of reasons, mostly because they would be afraid that people would think that they inherited some kind of gene. By the way, we've got another bot just just showed up. So uh, at any rate, I appreciate your, your sharing that. Um, Jay Bird said in the chat room, I feel your pain, Sarah and Jameson. I barely saw my mother as a child. I'm from an arty womb, artificial womb. I re remember most of my times crying on my friend's mother's couch after school till she arrived. Dad left at four. Uh, and so Sarah was saying, fuck that. It's harsh. It's sorry, Jaybird. And then he said, part of life, not everyone, just not everyone's life. Thanks, Sarah. And uh, then KRD said, because they like you. <laughs> and Gray Fenn said, DD, yes, nice. Uh, and... Um, I'm not quite sure what he was referring to, but that would be interesting to find out what, if he's still there, do tell me what you were referring to, because I'd be interested in, but I appreciate the positive. And uh, aside from that, so Sammy, were you able to hear what, uh, you know, our man Peter did, which was kind of like a weird ambush in its own way. Uh, not that um, I'm complaining, I can handle that shit. I, but about you, the, about yeah. your, about you um, supping on, uh, he said you're, your your um uh, your son yeah yeah but, and and this is in this look in my background like i said it, it's very christian evangelical i'm, I'm up a start okay but and this is one of the reasons that um because i always ask my brother and you know you bounce things off with with the person close to you which is my twin yeah. um i said do you think uh and this is just me just i want to hear what my brother says yeah do you think Doug? Uh, you think Doug's a liar? <laughs> and my brother looks at me and says, "Look, man, 
No, he's not. The reason why I tell you he's not because it's brutal. Yeah. And it's hard to hear. That they know there's truth. The truth hurts. Yes. And a lot of you said a lot a lot of what he says hurts. And I, I mean we're not involved directly, but just hearing it hurts. And truth hurts. And no one's gonna it's very hard to hear lies and they hurt. The truth hurts. History hurts. Yes. So no, he's not. Yes. And um as far as that concerned, I just think I think that person is just not he hasn't been he's he's not debriefed to the point where there's a whole other world outside. And this is what I was talking about when you were talking about anti gods a couple of weeks ago and old ones, the old ones, and, and even magic. Even to Jameson, he talks about magic. Um, I'm dumbfounded because I'm like, that's not my paradigm. Yeah. But at the same time, too, there's many nuances to that because manipulation is magic. And prayer, the like prayer is, is a form of magic. It's just not called magic. It's called prayer. Yeah. There's emotion in prayer. There's there's You think of somebody and, you know, you want to manifest good things to them. It's some no it's magic. But like I said, it's not they don't it's not named that way. Now as far as that person, I think it it was a little weird because and if it was, I love Peter, okay? But I sometimes I'm very leery of Peter in a sense of his background where you told when you know his background with um Scientology, uh, yeah. Spur, Scientology <laughs> and, and Spurlo and Spurlo being close to a keynote like that. Um and like I said, and I'm sure you're used to working with people to that extension. And unfortunately, this this is what you got to work with. Um, resources are a big de- deal, and relationships come from resor- resources come from relationships. Yeah. That being said, um, I think he goes in and out sometimes. Yeah. And you know, with the whole f- with like I noticed him talking about um, um, Tucker Carlson. I don't want to hear about Tucker Carlson. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. No offense. I want to punch Tucker, Tucker Carlson. And I don't even know Tucker Carlson, but I just want to punch his persona. Because in, in my belief, I think Tucker Carlson is a gay guy from San Francisco. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And, and Tucker Carlson, he's just a piece of shit. And uh, I, I think that uh, Pete's getting over him. Yeah, but, you know, he was, <laughs> but he was like uh, he was like watching him for the longest time. And um, it's just uh, it, it, it's you know, what can I say? It, it's, it's one of these things where Peter's of that generation where he watches Fox News. It's like almost genetic. Honestly, it's it's like, you know, an older white male kind of thing and, it's, it's kind of like you know salmon migrate <laughs> you know right, right and and i i can appreciate his his points he, he makes very good points but i always say this when it, especially when he brings up the insurrection how you know it fizzled out but i always go back, back to this if if this was an insurrection or this was um patriots trying to retake their country then why were the republicans hiding too why was McCarthy calling Trump? Oh, I think it's going to come out now. Get, I, I think this stuff is your, going. Yeah, this is going yeah, to come out now. Your, yeah, go on. Get your people. Get your people out of here. And yeah. Trump says, "Well, you're not supporting me, Mr. McCarthy. Yeah. Why should I let?" Him? It, it's almost like a mafia. It, it, it's yeah. it's so stupid. And it's. It, it, I put it to this way, okay? When the Kino pretty much orchestrated this in a sense of. Maybe he did it directly, but he kind of had a hand in it. It's like it's the perfect, it's the perfect inversion of the of inversion the quote unquote right yes. to do your dirty work because yes. you it's it's almost incestuous where you you add in the perverse uh, idea of self righteous and we gotta defend this country and, and we gotta save this country and you don't understand that's not how it works. Yes. Thank that's you. not how it works. There's there's people right now working. I, I work nights. I, I work, you know, I work a job that um, work. I work odd hours, but there's a reason we have to work these odd hours for the mach- this this machine can work. Yeah. Um, you know, and vice versa. You know, there's just odd jobs that people of color have to do for 
this machine to work. And the reason why I kind of put you in this, Doug, because the house, the perspective of the news coming from you, it's like I'm getting a lecture from Harvard, but even better because it's almost like you, you are a, a public informant. It's not even the fact that um, you're knowledgeable. It's you're looking at it from outside. Yeah. Because really, you know, you're going to be fine. It's us that are in the system that have to kind of start um, lying our decks in order. Thank you. Or at least be knowledgeable. Yes. Thank you. It's so, so yeah. true. It's so true. It really, what I'm saying is... Is really impacting others, and uh, at this point, it's kind of as you said. It's as you said. I'm kind of beyond harm <laughs> in many ways. Uh, it was actually comforting to me uh, because of the uh, the two things that provided comfort in their own weird way uh, was uh, Christine Joanna Hart the other day in the chat room attacking me, and uh, it just felt like an echo of Aquino was still out there. Um, the reality, of course, is since Aquino's death, there's been a kind of, how would I say it, just kind of a, a kind of depression that has set in with myself in a, in a background sense, where there's a kind of game has gone out of the world. And uh, so just to hear that kind of can echo. I, I'm sorry? Can I add something? Sure. Do you mind if I add something? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, the very few things that I met that the, the few times I actually heard that man talk, which, yeah. which is Dr. Aquino, yeah. and I have to name from moniker. He, he, he was a very intelligent man. Yeah. Um, we wouldn't have you if it wasn't for him too. That's true. It, yes. just, it is what it is. Like, he, you know, like my, I told you, my, my sister got her education the wrong way. Yeah. When it comes to that business, it, yeah. you said it exactly the same way. It's, we wouldn't have you. And um, for that, we, we got to thank him because, you know, I go back to Salman. Um, as much as he thinks he was in control, he wasn't because I think the reason why he picked you because you could have been far worse than him yes. because of your new, your lineage, your knowledge, not only just of, of what he taught you, but your mom. Yes. And you add on top of that culture, that's a very deadly combination, far worse than him. In my opinion, yes. But you know, I'll, well, he I'll thought that you, himself. He thought that that was his conclusion as well. And uh, uh, so, you're definitely what you're saying is exactly what he himself would have said to a degree. He would have been uh, far too prideful to have admitted his, uh, shall we say, his lack of total control. Uh, but other than that. Uh, this essentially why he picked me was for all the reasons that you said so that I could uh, stand upon his shoulders and be far greater than him in the negative sense, far worse than he would be. Uh, and, and now that we're talking about dreams, um, yeah. I, I might as well tell you my dream. And, and it's, this was very interesting. Salman talked about, yeah. I, I've had dreams with, with him, even dating back to maybe like three, four years when I was talking to you, when I was listening to you, yeah. um, and especially with the whole um, Bukaki Beret thing was yes. going on. Yes. Um, I remember that. I remember that summer. I remember that day. It was it was the end of I believe either July or June, if I'm not mistaken. I had a dream. I had a dream that. Um, and it's hard to describe dreams, but pretty much it was your face. And it was like an x-ray. Mm -hmm. And it was an eye on your face. Yeah. And I, it was almost like an attack, but it was it was an x-ray. It's yeah. almost like seeing your skeleton, but it, it was, I rem clearly remember it. Yeah. And I was like, why am I dreaming this? And I woke up, and, you know, maybe that Sunday you talked about it, how, you know, that happened, yes. that ritual. Yes. But I think it was the peacock angel. Yes. It was kind of that, but and then I told Isaac this. I'm like, look, um, it seemed it it just something I don't dream about because, like I said, even your paradigm is different from mine, Doug. But at the same time, it's the same. Um, and then the second one was, I dreamed that they, you, it was a home invasion in your house, and they were holding you down, mm -hmm. and he was there, and he was said, keep them down. Now this, this happened to be more of like a attack, I think. Mm -hmm. 
And it was almost like, it was almost like, like I already knew what side I was going to choose. Because, like I said, a lot of information I connect with because, in a sense, I've been looking for it. But the reason why I know I've been looking for it, because it, it it's very, um, it's very painful to hear sometimes. Yes. In a sense that if you want knowledge, it's not going to be pretty. Yes. And there's a reason why you have to kind of detox yourself a little bit and move on to the subjects because then it consumes you. And that's what I've been, I've been trying to relate that to my brother. And not that he has a problem with it, but you can't stay in that mode. You can't stay in those moments because it's not healthy and it's not normal. Like I said, you have to go with your stepson and you know, talks and decompress and just be done. Yeah. And, you know, eventually you come back and you, I mean, there's a reason, like, that's what I'm saying. You're, you're not, you're human, but you're not human. Like, you can't be in the sense that you can relay all this narrative and still be sane. And it's a miracle to me. No, thank you. I appreciate that profoundly. And part of that miracle is the non-humanity. I won't use the term inhumanity because no, that's no, no, no. that's too confusing to most people. But right. the non-humanity <laughs> is one reason I can maintain the sanity through what I've been through. Uh, by the way, just to put this into some perspective, we um, I got a number of uh, questions. I use the term we because we're all part of Team Dietrich here. And I got a number of questions inside of uh, my emails where people can could speak to myself the most privately. And so they usually send these anonymously. Uh, and of course, I presume the email addresses could be traced or something if I hired, uh, you know, uh, Oppenheimer. What's his name? Uh, the, the sleazy detective? Uh, Opperman. <laughs> that was it. He used to trace email addresses. As a matter of fact, ironically, he was the man, to his credit, who for free, when I uh, was receiving emails from Michael Aquino, because he uh, was a professional witness who would serve in court to trace emails as a private detective, he did prove that those emails were sourcing from Michael Aquino when I came out as a public informant. So, uh, yeah, to Opperman's credit, he's got that going for him. Uh, but uh, anyhow, the people were asking me in the email about uh, the latest promotional banner on Facebook. And, uh, of course, uh, our dear friend uh, Jay Bird in the chat room uh, was asking myself, uh, uh, who's the chick? And uh, it, that, of course, I'll, I'll maintain in privacy for now. Uh, maybe at some point I'll release her story. Uh, but uh, he, he kind of one of my escorts. But, uh, but it, excuse me. Yeah, I'm sorry, Doug. I don't yeah. mean to interrupt you. Um, by the way, yeah. those redditions, yeah. are, are those from your graphics modeler or those are yours? Oh, they're photographs. You do know they're photographs, right? Of myself. Mm. Yeah. And, no, but and, yeah. I, 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 do, I do remember you saying, though, Facebook would, does not like your image, like your actual photo. Oh, that's right. Well, what the way we get around that's it is a lot of makeup. And I dye my hair. There's oh, other things oh, we okay. do. So wow. uh, we've managed to to get through that. Um, it, it takes work with the, the Facebook, uh, by the way. Uh, one time I put out a video about just how much we can alter the structure of my face using some facial prosthetics that uh, wow. my mother was using. And uh, we also have, there were videos uh, training uh, for that. One time, of all people, Ramona Halitha Henry uh, took up one of the prosthetic uh, videos. She just found it online about what the Chinese do with modeling. Uh, and uh, the prosthetics are to kind of change the alteration of the jawline in particular. And it's easier for me because, of course, my lower jawbone, uh, the lower mandible, was actually uh, unhinged at one point, which changed the structure of my face. And uh, so my face is a little more malleable than people might think. And uh, obviously, there, for anyone who has any concept of how my appearance has radically changed, if you take a look at that History Channel or whatever the hell it was, I think it was History Channel, or it was uh, some other network that interviewed me one time at the point that I was on a lot of antidepressants, and I was all just bloated up with antidepressants, and I look like Mao Zedong. I'm literally just bloated. You would not recognize that compared to other photographs that were taken of me at different times. And then uh, it just basically, there's enough radically altered uh, facial characteristics 
uh, from different photographs where people would not believe it was the same individual, but it is. So I do have, uh, I guess I can say, kind of a fortune or misfortune where my appearance has radically changed. But um, believe it or not, the uh, algorithms that, uh, you know, which is all it really is, is like an algorithmic uh, expert system that uh, is used for facial recognition that uh, Facebook is using is so fucking primitive that uh, getting my photographs through has proven it was no real big deal. When they, uh, what they have uh, locked on to is a few what I would call classic photographs. And these were photographs that were repeatedly published. And so these repeatedly published pho photographs that were used for a, a while to kind of come to uh, be my identifier is what Facebook used. And, uh, it, you know, it was easy to get around that, really. Uh, the, the good news is that there's, there's really, how would I say it? When it comes to, I think it really has to do also with some of the Asian background. I really don't think Facebook's expert system is really that good at discerning the difference between Asians. <laughs> because Asians probably, t and you know why this is? For those of you who don't get this, good example here. Uh, there was this one uh, contest kind of program held for beauty where they tried to uh, create like a universal standard of beauty and what identified beauty. And they hired a bunch of cheap programmers, comparatively speaking, and these were overwhelmingly Russian. And so these Russian white guys uh, put in all these qualifiers for what beauty was. And so the end result was that what uh, the expert system decided was beautiful was just a bunch of white blondes. And everybody else was just filtered out of the system uh, that black women were all considered ugly. Uh, everybody else was just not even tabulated. So it was just like if you weren't white and blonde uh, and uh, basically fitting Slavic standards of beauty, you were considered ugly. And uh, so th when you got this kind of shit going down, expert systems are only as good as their programmers. So when they're doing this facial recognition bullshit, whoever was programming it, could not really discern Asian faces. And uh, for that reason, I'm pretty much getting through all the time with the Facebook uh, just blotting out uh, what was supposedly my face based on a, a few photographs. It was my face, but they're taking that as a supposition and they're not adding on all kinds of other possible factors that could go in there. And uh, this is probably what you can get away with with most uh, Caucasian people that they're using, whoever programmed it, would be aiming for like Caucasian parameters. And so probably because it's programmed by a white guy, I'm coming through just because I dye my hair uh, add a few prosthetics on, uh, the eye color changes as well, uh, in my case, for reasons I've gone into genetically. And therefore, the facial recognition program doesn't even fucking work for me. So uh, even though they put it in there and we couldn't use the classic photographs that were my identifiers or my uh, Facebook uh, icon photographs that were used on the original pages, everything else is getting through. So there you go. I mean, uh, so I'm happy to report that. The problem is trying to get a new page going just based on my own energy. Uh, if I had like uh, fucking, how would I say it? The energy, uh, I would just uh, use the new page we made uh, for Douglas Dietrich and it's left empty. I can't even remember the password. <laughs> I we'll have to go in there. I never bothered to get that started up where I could get a Douglas Dietrich page going again, because I've just haven't had the energy to really fucking care enough. Uh, this is, you know, to my detriment. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it's like I said, Elena Shea, who I'll never forgive for uh, destroying my other page, which was at the same time, uh, you know, had something you can never get back, which was all the hits I got from Coast to Coast AM. So it was up to 4,400 likes on that page. So you had 4,400 likes on it. You could never even build up something like that now because uh, Facebook doesn't allow that kind of hit rating uh, anymore. Um, so she destroyed something that was irreplaceable. But at the same time, there was so much work that was going into that 
it, you know, it's like these days I just go in and I do what I do twice a week with the Facebook. Essentially, I don't put up posts like I did before back in the old days, which people have probably noticed. I used to put up a lot of illustrations. I don't even put the energy into that except rarely these days uh, because, you know, that was kind of my coinage with a lot of uh, ladies who I was involved with, like Judith Ager and the rest. And it was just you know, it takes time and energy. Very, right? very beautiful, by the way. Oh, bless you. Very beautiful, you. by the way. Thank you. Thank you. And it was just, it was just too much work. Uh, but, uh, y you know, I mean, I'm happy to do it. It was therapeutic. And, uh, you know, I, I'll do it again if I feel the energy for it. But at least I don't need to put that kind of energy or investment into it like I did before. So in that sense, you know, Lena Shea did me a favor by her, what she did. But uh, in terms of uh, otherwise, though, it's, it's just uh, less ability to promote. And, uh, and most people are very confused by the whole Sora AOI thing. And um, so, but then again, you know, it's like when you hear somebody um, speaking with Peter Moon about that. Oh, oh, he lost me when he was talking about drinking uh, the, the blood of his own son. Uh, you know, it, then uh, it, it's like... Uh, uh, there's always going to be people who just respond to something that strikes them as strange. I mean, uh, what can I say about that? Except that they're, they're a lost well, cause anyway. But go on. Yeah. Well, you know, it's Doug, very strange Doug, about that comment. Yeah. And the is way Peter brought never, it up, it was like... Is, yeah. that, is, that, is that you never said you drunk blood from your own son. You couldn't drink blood from your own son. <laughs> because, yeah. because biologically, your son is a female yes that's right and he's not my son yeah, he's not my son uh, biologically right. it's a but you know when when the, they were asking the questions about the promotional banner for tonight and then i'll say a little bit more about uh uh the strange way in which peter brought that up it was almost like uh you know he could easily have brought that up privately uh the, the strange <laughs> thing and then of course he could have agreed to oh let me bring this up with doug privately and then uh then we could bring this up publicly but no, he wanted to do it almost like an ambush. So there's that a aspect to him, which is always, you know, uh, just odd. And uh, and it comes out at... Well, uh, you know, you know and, and this is my perspective. This is not yours, yeah. you know. But he's very informal. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, too, like, like you said, even with the comment talking about, you know, my family, as far as... The dysfunction that everybody has dysfunction in the family, um, and I think when it comes to Peter, he's he's very informal. Like I love hearing about Margie Kramer and 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 and, and um, Oliver and Harvard and all these things. I just think sometimes um, maybe it's a glitch. I don't know. Maybe it's a glitch. It's a good way to look at it. Yeah. He's he's um he's very involved with you, and it shouldn't be. A surprise, but it, it's like it's when I guess that person relays that to him. Mm -hmm. He should already know it's it's a little bit more complicated than that, and yeah. it's not it's not just it, when you start putting in certain terms. It's like, I'll give you an example. Okay, when I go see your detractors, a few times I've gone, I've seen my name pop up, up. Oh, look, Sam and Isaac, the two ass lickers of Douglas Dietrich, all those two new ass lickers, the two right. twins. Etc. Right. Yeah. And the reason why I roll my eyes because, um, one, I like I'm a deep thinker. I like to think. Certain, I, I just like I'm a deep thinker. And what I thought when listening to you, and the things that you relate to me, it's almost like it's enough for me to learn, but I don't get lost in it. It just confirms what I've always thought is just certain things you confirm especially with the cultural stuff and that's the thing about when I, when I emphasize culture especially white America that doesn't understand culture yes. when you don't have culture you can't relate you can't it's one thing that's one thing Peter Moon you know God bless him even his wife and his wife I'm sure she has culture but I'm talking about in white America white America has no culture yeah. so I have to we have to break out of this anti-culture and find culture where we can find it and through the year because you're a very well-traveled man and you've been around the world not that i i, I don't want to do that it's just 
the perspective, I can't do CNN, I can't do Fox, especially. And um, and that culture aspect is very important to me because the majority of this country, the inner cities, all it is is culture. Midwest and the South, besides some pockets like Atlanta and all these metropolises, besides that, there's no culture. It's all this good old U.S. of A., and it's not. Yes. It's just it's just denial. Yes. You're in denial. You're just prolonging the denial, and you're embarrassing yourself. Yes. You know. Oh, no, abs- there, abs- there you go. Yeah. I, and and please excuse these rants. It's just I need to relay that to you because, and not that I need to. It's just even though people like that don't matter, they're very minuscule to me. It's just because I know there's listeners out there that are probably they're hesitant to really engage with you at least right now because of your background yes. and what you're involved. But you might also, I, I'm, if people dedicate themselves to this other nonsense that is, you know, Fox news and even some of the liberal, then no, I'm not going to give my energy to that. I'm also give my energy to something I can relate to and something that's very knowledgeable, something that's very, um, there's substance to it. It's very sub- There's a lot of substance to what you you say because it's it's just you can't find it nowhere. Yes. And just to put it that way. Yeah. No, thank you. That's beautiful. And, and unfortunately, yeah. the words words like some words I just can't really think of right now. But yeah. Well, we don't have some words in English for some of the concepts we try to express. <laughs> I've often said that, that English is an incredibly limited language. It's a retarded language. Um, it is uh, it dumbs people down. And uh, the way I keep it working for me is to make it as difficult as possible. So people see me use all of the uh, all of the medieval English before it disintegrated, the Shakespearean English or English at its highest point. Um, so when it comes to, um, by the way, so Sigmund Duane has also said, oh, I want to thank, of course, uh, Bizarre HD, who is, uh, of course, George Knight, who says, much love, Douglas. I hope you're all good. He's asking that, of course, because of what he heard earlier. Thank you. Yes, uh, I love you. Thank you for asking. He says, Douglas has never lied, been uh, by his side for over four years now, and I have verified everything he says to be fact. Yes, thank you so much. And of course, he too has visited those detractors and, uh, uh, you know, and I uh, often wonder why people do that. But then again, uh, I know that both you and he have uh, obviously strong minds and certainly don't fall into their sewer of shit, which is just, uh, uh, it's as, as I said about the negative uh, kind of people who were behind the Texas law uh, concerning suing women for abortions. Uh, basically, I, I've talked about how they're just sadists who find no joy in their own lives and their only joy is uh, assaulting other people and ruining other people's lives. This is the kinds of people that you find uh, attacking myself. So um, that, that's the, if anyone ever went to visit them, anyone with a strong enough mind would see that, uh, or anyone with any grounding in reality, it would be self-evident. But uh, in terms of uh, the, um, anything else in that direction, I think that's, that's all that needs to be said for now. And I thank uh, George Knight, of course, for his concern. And uh, so um, Sickman Duane was following up for Jameson. So when he returns, uh, remind me to remind, you know, remind him to respond to Sickman Duane. And uh, so because Jameson just took off for the moment and he'll be back soon enough, no doubt. Um, when it comes to, of course, what some people were asking about the promotional banner, just to uh, get that out of the way, because there is a story behind that to a degree. What we were uh, basically trying to orchestrate uh, was uh, first off, the building that's in the background. You have no idea how easy it is to find rubbled buildings like that in California now with all the fires. Well, you know, our man Sammy Romero knows because he's a Californian, so he knows how it's uh, just driving to these areas that are in the burn zones. 
Uh, buildings like this are readily available for such photography. Uh, as for the running joke that is part of that photograph, aside from the fact that it is referencing the Battle of the Bulge by the Germanic uniforms we're wearing, obviously the, uh, the firearms are not historically accurate. They're not meant to be. Uh, this is more of a joke on the man I've had so much fun shitting all over uh, the last uh, few episodes, Alec Baldwin. Uh, of course, uh, the, that's the reason I brought the woman with us or why she volunteered to come with us is because um, she's standing in for the uh, dear lady who Alec Baldwin murdered. And uh, she is uh, basically what we're showing, of course, is firearm safety here. If anyone looks at it, they'll notice that the machine gun that I'm holding does not have a clip in it. So there's no clip in the machine gun and uh, therefore no one's going to get hurt. That's the point we're making. And the woman is behind me. I'm not pointing the gun at her like Alec Baldwin did. So there's an ongoing running joke there. At the same time, it's a social commentary that is no joke whatsoever. Uh, showing that firearm safety needs to be taken seriously. And uh, so hopefully people appreciate that now that I put that into some context and remind me on Sunday to bring that up in uh, the opening hour when everybody is with us. And uh, aside from that, uh, no, no. yeah. Oh, heard, Daniel, by all means, go on. Yeah. The first time I heard about the accident, well, that, that incident with Alec Baldwin, yeah. the top gun, yeah. the first thought about was brandon lee because that shit happened to him oh but it was it, that's true at the same time it was so different with uh the horror of brandon lee um i i'm convinced of course as you know even my medical cosmetologist uh we we know just just intuitively you know there was a conspiracy behind it that someone that that uh, that that someone obviously does not like the lee family and uh has uh both of their deaths were suspect, but especially uh, Brandon's. And uh, so there's the vendetta, an ongoing uh, blood feud that has claimed both of those lives. Um, and uh, of course, I feel terrible for the wife of Bruce Lee and the mother of Brandon. At the same time, she's handled it so well. You, if anyone has ever seen her interviewed on the subject, she handles it incredibly well um she said that she's felt blessed just to have these people in her lives at all so her attitude is more along the lines of uh uh don't be sad that it's over be happy that it happened um and uh it's the healthiest way to handle it um so at any rate i will uh be back in just a moment i've finished drinking the um the drink that I was drinking, which is diesel, uh, just so people understand this, I'm in the habit of mixing Coke and the PBR. This is what they do in Germany. They drink Coke and beer uh, together, and uh, they call the brew diesel. So I, uh, I, yeah, I've got to rinse that taste out of my mouth at this point <laughs> now that I've finished the drink. And uh, so I'll be back in just moments. Uh, going to suck all the oxygen out of the room after that. Um, I'll count on uh, these wonderful gentlemen to uh, help hold the, uh, the, the, the stage. Uh, and uh, one of these days, I'll uh, go more into um, some of the story of uh, these detractors and whatnot, not in terms of any of their backgrounds, but just the kind of uh, impact they've had on other people who have gone uh, in there. You know, Lena Shea said it best. Uh, Lena Shea, of course, who... Um, if, for those of you who don't know her or remember her, I'm not going to go into the background story now. Suffice to say that she is an asset, and uh, but um, she was groomed from childhood. Uh, but uh, it's for that reason she knew she knew the score better than anybody in any number of ways. Uh, she's not stupid. Uh, she's just a product of programming, and when they flip the switch, she just automatically responds she's not a free will in that regard but at the same time uh she knew uh, all about the enemy and uh she knew that the people uh, who were the detractors in their own little chat room uh, whose entire life is uh is just focused on nothing other than douglas dietrich in the most negative sense because of their insane uh level of envy and uh even their greatest uh convert my medical cosmetologist understood that uh but when it comes to uh lena shea she said that 
you know, stupid white trash people would go in there and then convert to just as if they steep themselves in that sewer of shit, they'd wind up converting because there's something genetic that's terribly wrong, some kind of genetic defect. And uh, they just, uh, you just keep exposing yourself to that shit with them. It would just get in their brain and it's like, uh, it just, uh, it, their brain would rot with it. Um, it's like this, when I did security for raves, back when they had true block parties that would take up a fucking city block or a construct like a enormous warehouse, the hangar south of market in San Francisco, for instance, that would literally be large enough to hold a block party because it was larger than a city block. Uh, then uh, you'd get people who were taking ecstasy, as I said, in eyedroppers. They'd take liquid ecstasy in an eyedropper and put it in their eyes directly because it went straight from the uh, optic nerve to the brain. So that shit you look at online, when you go around cruising online and you get into these hate group chats, uh, these uh, uh, sites that are dedicated to just toxicity that shit's going directly into your brain as if you were putting it in an eyedropper and shooting it through your eye because it's going directly through the optic nerve into your brain there's no barrier so yep. it's it's like you're eating shit directly and of course if you eat enough shit you're going to contract all kinds of diseases you're going to get infected in one way or another if you eat enough of it and uh, there's only so much the body can process. And within a short time, uh, all of these people who went into that, you know, chat room, they convert. They just say, oh, this is it. But the unbelievable thing to me is, like, how empty must your life be that you wind up? So that's your life now. It's like with uh, Pavel Edward and uh, uh, Amber Rose Dio. Uh, they're all of that ilk where they were working with these people from the beginning anyway. We all knew that. Derek Talley was the same way. And that was the most insane part was Derek Talley's a black man, but he kept saying, oh, I go in there and uh, Richard K. Cole, he talks to me directly. Yeah. And I'm like saying, first off, as a black man, why would you go in there when all they do is shit all over niggers? But then, of course, Derek Talley's just... He's just a piece of shit nigger. That's all he is. So since that's what he is, and the thing, they, the, thing yeah. the, 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 the thing with Richard K. Cole is when when when, um, when he talks to you, he's he's baiting you. He yeah. he wants to engage, and yeah. it doesn't matter what you tell him as long as he's got you engaging. Yeah. He's beating you that way. That's right. That's 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 right. That's his whole purpose in life, and. Yep. Uh, so it, it, these crazy people who don't see that, um, then they they fall into that, and then they then they convert. But this is what puzzles me: is that okay? So then you convert. Now you're with him, and this is your life from now on. So just shitting all over Douglas Dietrich. What is that? <laughs> what the fuck uh, is I, that? I, I always grew. I've always grown up um, suspecting people that talk about how. Jesus is their um is their Lord and Savior, and they and you hear them say it more than once, you know, for, from here and there, and he and he did it consistently, yeah. you know, and this that, that that's pretty damn shady, you know. I'm a preacher's kid, so you know, I, I see all this shit. Yes, thank you, yeah. thank you. Yes, well, let me try and get my voice back. I'll be back in just a few minutes. I'll I'll leave you two gentlemen to talk. Thank you so much, and uh, bless you. I'll be right back. Thank you. Oh yeah. Anyway, you there, Sam? Hey, so so Daniel, uh, this is a completely different subject, but um, what kind of grill do you have? I know you grill a lot. I remember you uh, say you, you barbecue. What what kind of grill do you have right now? Oh, uh, right now I got a propane grill that I've been oh, using okay. the last uh, six years, so it's been pretty durable. I I don't remember the name of it. I okay. never asked attention, but uh. It's it, it's a, it's it's lasted me for a good long and good long time and, and I go through and I, and I've gone through quite a few of them. Oh okay, cool. I know I I just have Weber kettle. That's that's usually what my go to is. But the reason why I ask you too is um, I remember the whole um, the frost that happened uh, last spring over in Texas. How did how did you handle that? Oh well, we were we were we were pretty well prepared. I mean, um, you know. 
me and uh, people in the household, we, uh, you know, we, we, we camp a lot. So we had, uh, camping gear. We, um, you know, we're familiar with, uh, a few survival routes of just in cases. So yeah, we had a few, uh, heat lamps that, uh, oh. lasted for a while. Oh, okay. Um, no, cause I mean, uh, I remember, um, I guess it was Crystal River that was kind of in trouble that she was not, I guess she was struggling out there. Well, I don't know what part of Texas she's from, but um, yeah, she was, uh, I guess she got it pretty rough. Yeah, well, Houston is a huge city. So yeah, she, she had to be somewhere around the, uh, I don't know. I, I, forgot, uh, I, I had assumed that she was in one particular part of um, until I got corrected. But yeah, she was definitely around. And uh, yeah, when that when that, uh, when that Arctic blast hit, I still remember it quite vividly. I mean, that was uh, that was uh, as cold as uh, the winter you saw in uh, Game of Thrones. It was that that, that freaky freezing. You know, the power was out. Fortunately, yeah, yeah. we had a lot of our batteries. We had a lot of our batteries charged, you know, for phones and for other our other electronic devices for when we need to get online for other things. So fortunately we were able to um, have enough uh, battery power on us. Did they, re- they remind you of the Philippines a little bit as far as being a little bit more um, reliant on them? Um... I, I, still, I, still, I still remember, I still remember the, my years of growing up there. So yeah. Oh, okay. I kind of, I kind of figured like that. It probably wouldn't be too bad because you know, you grow up in the island and stuff. Um, uh, I remember a cousin of mine. They were, they were kind of shaken. They, you know, you, they they live. Um, I think they live. They live in Houston. I just don't know what part. But they were. Um, yeah, they were um, feeling it. They were feeling it, and um, uh, you know, that when they got out of it, they're all like, "Man, I." After that, I I really do appreciate uh, <laughs> gas and power um, because uh, it, it was getting pretty rough. <laughs> Mm-hmm. It was getting pretty rough, um, but that but that that frost was interesting. Do you do you think it's going to happen again? Um, I don't know. Well, when it does, I I will make sure to be prepared for it. Oh, okay. Because, because I mean, I've I've made note of what to prepare for next time in case I didn't have it. Right. No, and over here in Southern California, we, it's it's pretty cold. It's it's this this weekend we got rain and. Um, it's in the in the lower fifties and, and the high in the high forties and uh, you know to us that's that's Arctic chill right there and um, I've been noticing people um, I've been um, more um, um, panicking not panicking in a sense but like hoarding yeah. a little bit and, and certain things are gone and um, you know it's it's interesting how just a simple weather change can um completely uh, change everything you know i could imagine you know something worse but just weather really it's it's could be it's just enough to swing the pendulum into you know panic but you know this to me sometimes these things need to happen because people need to kind of appreciate the basic things in life not just um you know luxury in talking about luxury i don't know if you heard that beverly hills and Really, the west side of, of um, L.A., it's been it's been chaos. It's been robberies after robberies each day. Wow. And, is this uh, like when the people are breaking into the boutiques and uh, kind of... Yes, okay. yes. Rodeo, Rodeo Drive is... It's not that, too. People get mugged. People yeah. get assaulted. Yeah. And um, South Central, I live close to them. South Central has been pretty quiet. I mean, yeah, usually, you know, you get your... Uh, you know, sirens up and down, but the west side, especially Beverly Hills, yeah. it's a jungle. People getting mugged uh, downtown as well, too, especially a lot of tourists. Tourism um, has taken a hit because of these assaults. And a lot of the time, um, it's uh, younger kids, young kids, you know, going there and not caring. And I think part of it is the poverty. It's people get tired of poverty. People get tired of people showing off their wealth and People become a target, and people don't care. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, are the residents there are in an outrage? But it's almost you know, one of those... when when they're when they're young, 
I suspect those young kids are kids that live in a house mm-hmm. you know, that, uh, that that are far more fortunate than homeless that need it. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. Thank you, uh, both of you. Also, um, Travis Moss says in the chat room, did you know the Chicago Führer, Frank Collin, of the infamous Skokie March, now writes under Frank Joseph for Inner Traditions books. He was on some podcast and said he liked your World War II research. That's incredible. I mean, that was a long time ago, the Skokie March, for those of you. Most of our listeners, or certainly many of them, would not have been born yet at the time of the March on Skokie. Holy shit. Uh, And... uh, he says, uh, IT, or it also published that Herbach book that Aquino would frequently uh, promote. Uh, so Travis Moss is very expert at this. Then he says, of course, being any sort of personality on the internet can result in harassment campaigns like this. Well, mine is qualitatively different, and anybody who's moderately familiar with the Douglas Dietrich situation knows that. Okay, your average um, person who has a harassment campaign does not have multimillionaires who are funding uh, psychotics who then have a whole network behind them as well. And they don't have intelligence networks that have assets that are repeatedly assigned to the individual to constantly sabotage them as much as they can, which I couldn't say no to because I needed someone to produce it at all times until I finally learned how to do that thing myself, the act of production, which, uh, of course, uh, anyone who's grown up with computers, this may seem easy to you, but understand I'm a product of the 20th century. Uh, for those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about or thinks that think that this is goes into the indulgent or the paranoid, let me give you an example of this. Uh, that uh, Amber Rose Dio uh, creature, when uh, she was quote unquote promoting for me, and everyone knew um, she was the enemy because uh, she had her own channel called Mystic Warrior, quote unquote, only it was spelled the exact way that Stephen Outrim would pronounce it. My stick, it was spelled M-Y-S-T-I-C-K. And Stephen Outrim would call it My Stick Warrior. And uh, so this crazy cunt, uh, aside from myself, everything she had was Thalema and uh, Peter Lavinda. So she was a Lavinda cultist who was operating based on his uh, Simon Necronomicon, uh, obviously the enemy. Uh, nothing I could do about it. And uh, she would demand the most uh, satanic. Uh, then he says, Travis Moss says, well, yeah, in your case, that's an understatement given the intel on your back. Thank you. So this cunt, the reason I bring her up was whatever I sent someone via email, she could read it. And that she had no password to my account, but she knew everything I sent in email. Everything. So it, the obviously she was an asset and this was fed to her by intelligence. Now, I never confronted her about it hostilely, uh, but because it was so obvious, because she was apt to ask me questions, she would ask me questions about things I privately sent to other people on email. I said, um, how do you, how are you able to access this? And she said, I'm not going to give away my sources, which meant her source was Aquino. It was basically his network. So I'm stuck with this Aquino cultist from the very beginning. And who took her place? Pavel Edward. And uh, George Knight will testify that Pavel Edward was in direct contact with Richard K. Cole Jr. the whole time he was working with me because, uh, you know, George Knight's one of those guys who goes in there and takes a look at these guys talking on their private little chat room, and there you have it. He could see that Pavel Edward was talking with Richard K. Cole Jr. the whole time. And, of course, Pavel later on was taking the image of my son, in this case, my son's image, which was the image I used as the Facebook icon for a period of time, uh, he was using that to befriend young men in Europe. Uh, and obviously, you could argue, well, that he's only doing that so he could frame you and later on say that it was you because it was my name with my son's face. Or was it his? It was, it was that, that my son's face was the icon I used on Pavel Edwards' timeline, the time I had to take his timeline. And I guess that was after Lena Shea fucked it up, or was it before? How, why did I wind up using his time? It had to be because... Lena Shea uh, had fucked up the timeline at that point. 
Yeah. So um, and when I was using his timeline with my son's face, then uh, he was using that under his name to befriend all the kids. Uh, so at that point, maybe he thought that his name was affiliated with mine. But I don't think that that's giving him too much credit, really. I think that when you think back on the fact that he was arrested and he spent time in jail and they had to put him in isolate to protect him from the other prisoners, it's because he couldn't stop himself. He's friending kids because he's a fucking child molester. That's what it comes down to. And, uh, yeah, and uh, so there you go with that. And um, so, yeah, this is literally intelligence network level crap. And uh, these people are all part of, uh, you know, human trafficking, essentially. Uh, so um, in the time we have remaining, I'll uh, take over. I think I've got most of my voice back. Let me make certain I've got enough bubbles of water with me. And uh, I do want to thank Daniel Arola for coming on. And I hope he comes on more in the future. And uh, uh, like I said, like Daryl Neely, I'm sure you have the capability of, do you think it's your IP address is identified and you can't set up another page if you had to? Could you create a false page, Daniel, for Facebook if you were permanently banned, like Daryl Neely does all the time? I probably could, but I, I, I'm, I'm seriously just considering just taking a break for a loss from it because I... I got a lot of other shit around the house that, you know... Oh, yes, tell us about the the rapist was let loose. Tell us about this son of a bitch, uh, at least as a public warning. Tell us about this guy. Why did they let him loose? Um, oh, that piece of shit. Yes. Uh, Tell people now, who we're talking about, the story behind that, please. Okay, this guy, this piece of shit rapist, the uh, accused rapist... <laughs> Just say what he is. We know what he did. But... Uh, the, the DJ threw out the charges because of the due to the lack of evidence from the victim. And uh, after that, I did I don't know anything else anymore. He did try to message me, and I just didn't bother um, responding. <laughs> okay. Oh, my God. Uh, I'm surprised you didn't, like, lure him into a trap where you could, like, kick his ass. <laughs> but, um... Oh... He so uh it, but, but there's more to share other than that tell people what he did there was this, you know the family oh. of the girl who's the victim okay now this young girl that he had groomed from time to time i believe he was visiting the family and being nice and cordial you know having showing proper manners you know and whatever um an impressionable nice christian boy would do around the family would that would uh, trust them with their daughter and uh anyway long story short um the situation ended up where he had this young girl at point threatened to uh i don't know threaten to kill um threaten to kill her sister or other siblings if she didn't go along with him and uh held her kind of held her as sexual hostage for four or five days in a um, storage uh, in a storage unit, and uh, <laughs> anyway, yeah, there there was a uh, yeah. Well, actually, yeah. yeah when, by the time uh, by the time the police uh, showed up, they're at that site because of the, the when the after the victim escaped and uh, pointed went pointed back where the uh, where she was stuck at, they had found. They had found the uh, condoms tied up, filled with urine. Um, a can, for, a can to use the restroom in, to either pee shit in. Um, even, even water bottles filled with urine because these guys are just nasty. Wouldn't go get out the building the OP or whatever. Well, but then again, it's a storage unit, so can't uh, find a restroom there. Right. Anyway, um, but yeah, that that was the that was pretty much the story. You know, and then he ended up locked up. But, uh, you know, after that, the DA lost the charges. So shit happened, and uh, I guess he lucked out. Jeez, that's just awful. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked and I'm appalled and outraged all at once. And uh, uh, by the way, um, when you were homeless and essentially living in a warehouse for a number of years, how did, how did you handle that when you had to piss or shit? <laughs> How did you? What What did you do? Oh, 
Yeah. I wasn't totally I wasn't totally without a place to crash. Okay. I had a building to store my shit at, you know, which was the uh, which was the MMA gym that I taught at. <laughs> so I still had a job. I still work. Um, I knew I had a lot of female friends with cars, you know, that I spent time with according to one night of the week or another, depending on the event. And so I... It's not that I was ever really with that um, much company, you know, especially you know, when I wanted it. And I also was volunteering um, with the um, with the with the um, women's roller derby league for six seasons straight. That was used, that that was around the duration of my homelessness. Mm-hmm. So um, hanging out with those women was was kind of like going to church i was on my best behavior i was doing as they ordered you know with whatever i was volunteering for usually i was uh i was training them doing stretching and strength training and uh on the events i would get dressed up in this outfit that they had made for me with this pinstripe boss looking outfit i kind of looked like a pimp in with the with the hat you know uh and, uh, you know, I spent six seasons with them. You know, they were all cool. They were nice friends. Sure, yeah, I did get some pussy from a few of them. But, you know, we always kept that one on the cool. But for the most part, you know, they they kept me humble. They um, they refreshed my whole ego, you know, kind of torn it in and out because I was learning how to skate from them as well. So I had to keep my cup empty, you know, when I'm listening to them. Thank you. So, no, that's incredible. I, I'm sorry. Go on. I had a lot of I had a lot of um, divine femininity going on in my life there. Yeah. No, it really is, and uh, you're uh, you, you're definitely uh, very fortunate. Uh, and, uh, you know, your life is to be envied by many people, but at the same time, you've had a lot of challenges and certainly you've managed to deal with these challenges profoundly well. So, uh, in terms of, uh, some of the bigger challenges in your life, like, uh, recovering from the coma, uh, share with people a little bit about that. Oh, that was another whole event. That was like in the uh, early 1997, I believe it was in February. Uh, I was riding in the car with this guy that I was, that I almost was going to be in a band with. He finally got him. He finally got himself a CD recorded. Um, I was kind of friends with him, but at the same time, he was also one of these guys that I just didn't care much about. But I was. So I was hanging out with him this one time and we went to go visit with some friend of his that he knew. And uh, um, about, about a handful of nights previous to that, uh, when we were in the car and he was driving, uh, he he never puts a seatbelt on, but I buckled up. So he teased me about that because there were some other girls in the car that you know he thought he could try to impress. And I told him, well, I'm not the one that's going to be dying next week, you know, when the yes. accident happens. So, you know, that happened. We got hit head on by a, by a car racing against another car from the opposite end of the traffic. Mm-hmm. Crushed us in both like a Coke can. Um, by the time the Jaws of Life machine pried us out, I was found um, like in total fetal position, like as if I was tied up in an egg, you know. Um, and so I uh, think... I, the only one external injury I had was like a scratch on the side of the forehead near the hairline, but that hardly even made a scar. But I did suffer a huge concussion. I got knocked the fuck out, basically. And my friend that was driving, every bone in his body shattered upon impact. I mean, you know, his dumbass didn't have his seatbelt on. He died, right? Yeah. Yes, he did. Yes, he died. Oh, my God. What's it like when somebody just dies next to you like that? I mean, I've experienced that, of course, but I want you to share that with with. Well, uh... the story gets interesting because um, because uh, the, a car a, a car that was um, following the uh, two cars that were racing, mm-hmm. uh, one of the guys happened to be one of my students in this Muay Thai class that I was teaching in the area. And, you know, it, it, he didn't know it was me until he saw me in the car because he went ahead and parked because he witnessed the whole thing. 
<laughs> so he he got to explain a lot of the details from his from his own um, view as well. Mm-hmm. So yeah. yeah, it got pretty interesting. Um, the he the the description he made about my friend, oh, it it, it was pretty nasty. It, it belongs in a gore movie that would win some kind of award, you know. Um, it, it's uh, so uh, it, 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 there. There we are. Um, uh, so um, aside from that, Sammy, could you relate something similar that happened to you or someone you know? Yeah, you know what? Um, not not to the degree of someone dying, mm-hmm. but. It's very interesting. I had a coworker of mine, and he had a uh, he had a sports car, and um, he's a young kid. And you know, when you have a sports car, you just want to floor it anytime you can. If it's two feet, he wants he wanted to floor it. And he had these loud exhaust pipes, and it was loud. And you know, it was. I went to grab a bite to eat with him. Um, we went out for lunch during work, and we went out to get a burger. And uh, you know. This is, um, I live near, I work near the airport and, you know, there's a lot of traffic. There's a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of tourism, you know, just different people from anywhere. It's, you know, that, that area is a, a thick in the, an entire city in itself. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, we were supposed to, we were making a, we're, we're you know, we're going into the restaurant and drive through and, um, he floored it and this car is loud and it's it's a sports car and um he ended up running over he looked like a a rocker type i wouldn't say rocker but he was wearing these uh leather pants he he didn't look a rocker type um he was british i could tell um and um when he ran him over um the man flew up in the air and literally I can see the bottom of his boot. He's wearing Stenson boots, so I know they're Stenson because I saw the the the, 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 yeah, the, the, the label. Yeah, yeah the I can stamp. Read, I yeah. can yes, I can see the stamp on his boot, and I saw the bottom of his boot, and he ran him over. The the guy flew and uh, landed on the pavement, and obviously my friend was shaken up. And I think the thing is he didn't see him because. One, he had he has all black tinted windows. In the front was tinted too. So, you know how smart is that? And I saw him, but he didn't see him. And I and you kind of think people. And this is I don't know if if you guys can relate, but sometimes maybe your view is not the same as theirs. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know, but I saw him. But this guy was wearing all black. And uh, I hear what you're saying. It's amazing that you can see something that someone else does not. It's that we all process differently. Uh, Please go on. Yeah. And and right when he was going to, when right before he nailed them, you know, I'm thinking, nah, he's going to stop. I know he's, he's right. You're giving him too much credit. Yes. Go. (laughs) Yeah. You know, come like he's, this guy's right in front of you. So when uh, he, he nails him. He flies. I see his boots, and he he kind of skids over the 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 hood of the car, and he lands on the on the sidewalk. And the reason why I know he's he's British because he said this. Ah, crikey! Mm-hmm. I don't know if this Australian mm-hmm. or British, but one of those. Mm-hmm. Oh, your your fucking oh, bonnet. No, that's not his tea. Okay, so at least it's not carbonated. That <laughs> oh my fucking god. Um. There you go. I mean, so you're good with um, yeah. knowing other cultural, shall we say, uh, traits. So that's that's very yes. astute. Um, and so that and this person, like, it's surprising that they weren't crippled. I mean, like, so like what what happened after that? Was there did this guy? What the fuck? I mean, ambulance well, called was, or, or what? This guy didn't just I get mean, up and ambul- walk away, did he? The ambulance came, and he, I mean, he was shaking up a little bit. I mean, he might have cracked a rib a little bit. He was bleeding from the mouth a little bit, mm-hmm. and um, he, you know, he's, I mean, the best way I can. And this, I've never really met British people to that. You know, I don't know. I don't really been around them, but to me, British people look like they can take a couple of hits. Like they're they they're used to it. You know. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, he's kind of scraggly. You know, kind of. 
I don't know. He, he looked like he can take a couple of hits. I hear what and, you're saying. I mean, he was wiry, but he looks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and yeah, he got up and started smoking on a cigarette. So, you know, oh my God. Um, and, uh, you know, he was like, oh, crikey. <laughs> I just landed on your fucking bonnet. I guess the bonnet was a hood. I didn't, and we asked him, what the heck is a bonnet? <laughs> your hood, your hood, you damn Yankee. <laughs> I'm like, oh, then say hood, please. We don't, we don't know what bonnet means. Yeah. You know, oh a bonnet, we need a hat. You're talking to Chicanos. Like you, it's like, you might <laughs> be talking to a Martian. <laughs> and this, this is my coworker. Okay. So, you know, he's like, what the heck is a bonnet? He, I told me he said that means your hood. Yes. I'm like, oh okay. Oh Why didn't you just say hood? I'm like, because he's British. <laughs> so, you, know, you might as well be talking. You know, this you might as well be a Klingon and a uh, Ferengi for all you for all matters. You know. Yes, it's true. Um, Is it true? Go on. Yes. And um, yeah, he was smoking a cigarette, and the cops came, and we did a uh, accident report. And um, yeah, I mean, he called. Uh, I guess he called a. Uh, yeah, I've been chasing lawyer and my friend's insurance had to pay him out 15 grand and you know that was pretty much settled okay but it, it was um it was interesting because I've, I've never seen I mean it's interesting it's funny because I saw the bomber's boot when we hit him it, 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 I, it, that's I, impre- impressive I mean to just see that flying in front of you like that it, that's the quite the visual and um it's uh, that fucker's lucky he he could walk and uh and by the way people have this habit where especially men of course something like that happens there's this desire to show you can take it and that you're all right and you know you get up and you light a cigarette like this guy did um but my advice to our listeners don't do that <laughs> hey just first off if that happens and you get knocked down on your ass Stay on your ass unless, you know, the car is still coming towards you. Then you roll. <laughs> but other than that, uh, trying to get out of the way, just, uh, you know, stay there until the ambulance comes. Uh, because you can do serious damage to yourself by getting up. Uh, when you're knocked down like that and you get up, you have no idea how, how, how you can fuck yourself. Just by, just by getting up when you're, when you're thrashed like that. Uh, so for your average human being... Uh, there we are. And, and then, uh, let's see now, uh, the, um, uh, Travis was going on in the chat room before I start really getting into this. Uh, he, he was saying, uh, just give away a clue to the Freddy nightmare dream. Oh, this is entertainment hub said that, uh, I just give away a clue to the Freddy nightmare dream. I hope it helps someone. It works. I think. Uh, and then Travis said, did you ever read Herbach? Aquino would mention that as an entry level for T Temple of Set. And then uh, Entertainment Hub says, Douglas must suffer from dyslexia. <laughs> and, uh, uh, as for Herbach, you know, I'll be honest with you. Uh, I remember Aquino recommending that. And uh, whenever I heard that, I always thought of like uh, it reminded me of like uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs. Uh, yeah, Jameson is saying I tried to get through her back. Uh, he spells it, you know. I, it's almost like he's making a joke, a sexual innuendo here. You know, I tried to get through her back. This is he spells it with B A C K. Our man Jameson. Uh, you know, take the C out, Jameson. It's uh, it's it's a B A K. Okay. <laughs> Uh, it always reminded me of an Edgar Rice Burroughs novel, or she, or, or um, uh, the man who wrote um, she, which was uh, uh, it wasn't Burroughs. It was uh, who was the, who was the guy who wrote she? It was Haggard. It was Haggard who wrote she. Th- these various pulp authors who wrote these adventures, and that of course was part of the cheesiness that attracted Aquino. I mean, bear in mind that you know the way I look at it is different from the way you look at it because I knew the guy. And uh, a lot of this was just show. He's just putting people through the hoops. And he had a reading list. He had a reading, reading list that was a mile long and just kept growing. Uh, if you became part of the Temple of Set, he had a required reading list he would put out monthly. So you'd be involved half your life reading books. And uh, so, uh, you know, and Jameson's talking about other books he would, you know, put out or recommend. So there, there you have that. I mean, it's just like, uh, Aquino was just, uh, as a matter of fact, you know what? 
this is when my gang brother Beaver uh, lost all sense of fear of Aquino when he found out about these uh, reading lists. Like James and Reese says, back was too spiritual for my taste. Uh, yeah, I mean, it sounds like it's porn, but, you know, James had found out it wasn't porn and he was disappointed. Yeah, <laughs> nothing about her back, uh, referring to some lady's rear end, which reminded me, of course, when I was talking about, you know, just uh, being among the blood boys in the harem at the various estates and, you know, in their bungalows, the parties, etc. Uh, like Jameson says, it's Aquino's mind porn, not my jizz. I like that. That's a good way of referring to it. Speaking of which, along this same theme, uh, when I was, uh, you know, with these young men, they're, you know, they're gay. And uh, so uh, to them, they have a certain talk about the guy who was, you know, bitching about my drink in my son's blood. Uh, if this motherfucker heard this now, he'd really freak out. So hopefully he's listening just so, you know, I can drive him to the point where he commits suicide or something. But, uh, he, you know, among these guys, they're, they're gay. So it's their etiquette and their hygiene where they, uh, perform anal douching. So you would, yeah, I, I hear these guys get into conversations about this sort of thing. Like, uh, obviously, believe it or not. There are people out there, not these kids, because, of course, they know better and they, they give each other advice on this sort of thing, which I overhear when I'm in the environment. Uh, but there are people out there who douche with a touch of bleach when they're cleaning out their anus because they go through such a workout down there and they get shit up there. I mean, our man Daniel Arola used to work in the sex industry. He'd be familiar with this sort of thing, or at least the concept. Uh, yeah. But yeah, yeah, there you go. And if you want to put in some input here, like uh, like any stories this reminds you of, or this reminds you of anything you remember, go ahead. But I heard about that from uh, from future dancer girls that would show up at the clubs I worked at. Yeah. And, uh, Cool. Some of them were, it was, they were just strangely comfortable enough to yeah. tell me all this shit. It was just random. Yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> and were these young ladies anally douching or, or what? Or they were telling you about what some of the gay dancers were doing or what? They, 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 weren't, they, they, they weren't showing it to me. They weren't doing it. But, they, but they've brought it up in conversation before that they had done it themselves. Okay. So, and and they, I, they, they mentioned do... the bleach bit? Like that some of them were using a touch of bleach or what? Yeah, yes. It had to do with the shoot, yeah. you know, for shoots and stuff, you know, just, just to, you know, keep their assholes looking clean for the camera and stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, it, they have a medical, what do they call it? It's a medical uh, procedure called anal bleaching, where some people are removing like the little birthmarks around their anus so that their anus doesn't look like it has particulate fecal matter around the rim or um, something. They're, they're not putting it up their rectum, though, right? I mean, it, 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 in, in a small that, amount. That, they're probably that, putting a small amount oh up. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah it, this is what a lot of the gay guys are doing because they get so much shit up their ass. Sh well, well, I, I, well I, I guess if you're... Uh, I, I, how do I say this without coming across as offensive? <laughs> But I, I, I suppose if if you're a, if you're a gay guy and you're taking it up the ass, I I, I guess just some level of masochism already involves. So. Uh, yeah, thank you, thank at you. At that point, I I, I I would think a little bit of torment is par for the course. Uh, yeah, thank you. At any rate, what I can tell you is it's not recommended. And of course, so these young men are around me in this environment, and they're talking about that. Like I said, the guy who freaks out at my drinking my son's blood. Hopefully, he's listening now, so he can fucking like I said, be driven to suicide. You know, and I. No, he's, 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 he's probably putting things up his. He's too. Probably too. Yeah. Big to <laughs> <his rectum. laughs> there you go. Uh, you know, when I. You know, don't, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised if somebody like that can be found at a neighborhood gay bar somewhere out in the middle of the city. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. These people are the worst. They're all hypocrites. The guys who come up with that <laughs> shit. Yeah. And, and, but the, the point was that. I, I said to them at one point, when I heard them talking like this in the background, I couldn't help myself. I said, you know, am I giving away too much information if I let everyone here know that I've never anally douched in my entire life, uh, that the concept has never entered my mind, 
uh, it, it's just, of course, this is why they think of myself as kind of like the alien among them, which is fine. It, it, it's, <laughs> in every way, I'm the alien among them. But, you know, and uh, every time I visit the estates, it's another episode of Queer Eye on the Straight Guy. But uh, you're talking about someone like myself who cross-dresses at the same time. I, I'm still like that to them. Uh, because So, so, so technically, they would be doubly unattracted to you because... <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Because 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 you're more like you're more feminine, and then they're like, oh, he's he's definitely not guy guy. Yeah, well, he's he's definitely not clean in the anus like they want it, right? I mean, they're they're talking about um, you know pristine anuses and shit. It's just like, oh my god, it's like, you know, and sometimes yeah, that... I I'm sorry, go was it? <laughs> I'm sorry. I I wouldn't even expect that from a woman. I mean, come on. No, no, no. Women wouldn't do, be doing that normally, um, it, unless they were professionals, like in the porn industry or something, uh, like Daniel was bringing up. I mean, sometimes I have to play the role of father still with my son to the degree, of course, that I do. You know, uh, just have to say something along the lines of uh, shock at his behavior. Uh, sometimes, uh, believe it or not, he does engage in some junk food, which is like uh, uh, Twinkies or or some of the the, the, the ding dongs and shit. And I just have to tell him, <laughs> you know, sometimes I can't believe the shit I see you putting inside of your mouth. And I don't mean just dick. It's this, you know, the the crap he eats sometimes. Uh, he just once in a while uh, he indulges, but um, uh, well, it's all right because if, if if anyone got killed, he could use the Twinkie excuse. There we are. Good point. Good point. <laughs> there's, there's there's always that the Twinkie defense. Yes, that's right. Well, um, I, I'd like all of you gentlemen to say good night. Um, Jameson, you can go to bed. Our man Sammy will uh, hopefully check in every once in a while. I don't know if he'll be up the rest of the night, but he's welcome to stay here throughout the night if he wishes. <laughs> and uh, certainly check in once in a while. And if I need some help, I'll try to contact him in the private messages. Is that okay, yeah, Sammy? Uh, uh, yeah. Well, you could also just see uh, if I'm awake too, because yeah, I okay. might be. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I'll do that with both uh, of yeah, you. Yeah, Doug, just. Uh... Yeah. yeah, no problem. Do, yeah. You can do that. Um, if I don't respond, then I'm probably knocked out. But yeah, uh, I'll, I'll see. I'll see if I can uh, check in. Don't okay. worry, I should be fine. And uh, so, what I'll do is uh, take over the rest of the night. I love you all, Daniel, and all of you. Say good night to our listeners, please. Daniel first. I, I gotta get me. Uh, I gotta get me a few hours of sleep in so I can get me some poontang in the morning. There we so, are. So, no, a good day. Hi guys. <laughs> I love you dearly. There we are. Uh, that 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 <laughs> that was unnecessary. So, uh, yes, the next uh, Sammy, say good night. Oh, good night, good night, everybody. Good night, Jason. Good yes. night, man. Love you dearly, Sammy, and share that with your All brother right. Isaac. And uh, so, and now you, Jameson, of course. Good night, folks. We will go into a deeper occult rant on another night. <laughs> that I have no doubt. Yes. Well, bless you. And I'm so glad that that message from you this morning wasn't from this morning. Thank God. Oh, God. That was... Uh... Uh, so, one among the creepiest true crime tours in America is the Tucson Murders as True Crime Tours. The Tucson Murders True Crime Tours provide us historic crime investigation into forgotten lost crimes in Tucson, Arizona. These small private tours are hosted by the Mr. Ben Baron Astanius, a true crime researcher and enthusiast. Uh, who himself may be guilty of some crimes not yet recorded, uh, <clears throat> who will personally take us the, to real historic crime locations related to these crimes in Tucson, relive these events, and hear the untold stories behind the stories. The Baron Ben specializes in the seemingly ever-developing case of the late serial rape killer, Charles Howard Schmidty Schmid Jr., alias the Pied Piper of Tucson, an aftermath tour See the unfinishedman.com for excerpts from his yet to be published work of that very title, The Unfinished Man, and review uh, scenes from his cinematic documentaries currently in production at theunfinishedman.com. But other cases, such as the strange case of Morris Brady, the Dr. George Marvin Tejardine case, and the Red Rapist are also within his repertoire, as in fact are all the crimes that shocked the Southwest throughout the 1960s, the very decade I myself entered this veil of tears. These devastating crimes stained a city so deeply they may never be removed. For tour information, contact the Tucson Murders Dot. 
gmail.com. Spell that as Tuxon, uh, T-U-C-S-O-N, um, and put the word the in front of it. The Tucson Murders dot com or telephone the Baron Ben privately to personally guide your tour at one dash five two zero three two three three four zero six. That's fifteen twenty three twenty three thirty four zero six. Okay, let me make certain that these uh, blankets are adjusted. And my dear Clarice Claudette provided myself with a new heating blanket that I will be checking out soon. God bless you, honey. If you're listening, I love you beyond expression. Mwah, mwah, mwah. And um, yesterday in history, uh, because it's not yet midnight here, uh, born on December 14th in 1503, the uh, François, the uh, French philoscientist, of a Yehudi or uh, Jewish extraction, uh, ethnicity, and Roman Catholic faith, uh, a true convert because he did indeed, indeed spontaneously kneel before a priest who he knew would become the Pope. This was part of his prescience, uh, his precognitive ability showing itself. He uh, proved himself uh, truly precognitive like my biological sire, Adolf Hitler. And uh, he knelt before the man who would be Pope and uh, kissed his hand, telling him someday he would be the Pope. And uh, so, uh, of course, he was an apothecary physician and famously reputed astrologer seer, Michael de Notre Dame. Uh, So understand that all you're familiar with is his Latinized popular name, which is kind of like a stage title, uh, Nostradamus. And, uh, of course, his real name was Mikkel, uh, just a first name, uh, M-I-C-H-E-L, uh, kind of like a rock star, like, like Prince. You know, all he's got is the single name. It, originally, it was Mikkel, M-I-C-H-E-L. And uh, the rest of his name was simply his, his place of birth, really, or rather the place he was identified with via via his education. Uh, Michael de Notre Dame, and uh, like the hunchback of Notre Dame. And, uh, but he became known by the place name, uh, Notre Dame. The, in the Latin, it was really Notre Dame. And uh, everybody now pronounces the goddamn S, so it sounds like shit, like nostrils. Uh, Notre Dame, which is a vulgarization, a bastardization. Uh, it's kind of like the um, ancient uh, uh, Latin term of the Romans for the Mediterranean Sea, uh, mer nostrum, as in nostrils, the, uh, the, the, the middle of the world to them. Uh, but uh, that then mispronunciates, <laughs> well, mispronounces when you d- try to impose that on this guy's name. So the real pronunciation with some degree of dignity, would be Notre Dame. So, or Notre Dame. But uh, you can pronounce the S. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Nostradamus. Yeah, I hate that. <laughs> the quote that I was looking for, I found, has so many variants. There's no point in quoting it now. The quote I was looking for earlier, I will put that in perspective again on the opening hours of Sunday. Because we will be going back to Nostradamus, he'll give us a different subject to talk about for each transmission until the end of this month. We have five more transmissions, and I'll go over a different prediction of his for 2022 with each one of those transmissions. And I will go in depth uh, and, of course, place it into uh, modern context. Uh, But uh, with Nostradamus, he was born in Provence in 1503, not Notre Dame where he got his education. But as a uh, renowned alchemist, and as Jameson says, almost by craft, he had to have a a grimoire or two. Yes, that's essentially what you're saying. You can come out and say it, by the way. Go ahead and say it verbally so our listeners can understand where you're coming from. Okay, Jameson, since you're still awake. Yeah, Yeah. undoubtedly, if he was uh, dealing with alchemy, he would have uh, he would have had to have been learned by many of the, you know, occult authors at the time. Mm hmm. He would have definitely had a few grimoires or some things that, you know, to talk to you, tell you how to speak to entities and whatnot. Absolutely. And everybody do remember this, okay? Books in that day and age were 
handwritten. This was before the printing press. You know, the printing press probably came into into being during his his time, because he lived at the time. Uh, as did Joan of Arc. They were all in the same range area. Uh, a dark renaissance, kind of like just proto-renaissance period, when uh, the printing press of Gutenberg was a large spark for the renaissance. That was a great part of the spark for that. There were many other sparks, but that was one of the primary sparks. And uh, so he, he did live to see the printing press, but uh, the majority of books during his lifetime were handwritten. So understand that a book was something that if a single person, um, usually a monk, sat down and wrote that book, like literally hand wrote that fucking book, the books you had were beyond value. They're literally priceless. They're, they're not something that can be reproduced. So understand that much. And as a renowned alchemist himself, he concocted a preparation to combat the plague. And uh, this consisted of rose leaves uh, with a lot of vitamin C in them uh, and many other elements. Uh, but his prophecies are his greatest feat. And divided into centuries, as they were called. Uh, these are like segments of writ. Uh, Nostradamus's work is composed of several hundred quatrains. It is stanzas of four lines each. Now, you can uh, discover on your own some of Nostradamus's prophecies on uh, any number of websites. But be warned, uh, some of them are quite pessimistic. Uh, now, the quatrains, which I shall quote over the next five days, uh, were taken from the original work of Notre Dame. Uh, published in uh, 1955 uh, in an accessible manner. Uh, by that I mean accessible as in availability. Uh, they're still inaccessible in terms of writ. <laughs> uh, they've been translated at that point in time. It took till 1955 to translate them from the old French. And as we are approaching a new year, we know what that means. Parties, a list of resolutions, and reading our horoscope, our prophecies for 2022, which will be a monumental year. 2022 will be huge. Midterm elections are in November, and the Russell collaborationist Red Republican Insurgency has already introduced hundreds of voting restriction bills in over 20 states. The Supreme Court will issue a ruling that will determine the fate of Roe v. Wade, the coronaviral crisis has surfaced inequities in work, caregiving, health care, housing, and more that demand creative policy solutions. My own unique explanatory analyses aim to bring clarity to chaos and empower people with the information they need to stay safe. If you want to know what the next year might have in the cards for humanity, you might be interested in what Nostradamus had to say about it. The French philoscientist, the philosopher scientist, uh, also known as Michel de Notre Dame, is widely known for his quite accurate prophecies during his lifetime, which were written in his book Les Prophéties. Uh, a collection of poetic quatrains published in 1555 originally in that book featuring 942 poetic quatrains uh, allegedly foretold the future. And the famed uh, astrologer has been credited with predicting everything from the rise of my biological father Adolf Hitler to the shooting of John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Whether you're a believer or a skeptic, there's no denying that there have been eerie correlations between the predictions of Nostradamus and major historical events. He supposedly predicted major historical events such as the atomic bomb and the September 11th terrorist attacks. And according to the website, Horoscope Annuel, yes, I went to the original French, of the 6,338 prophecies made by Nostradamus, most have come true. The predictions of the most popular prophet on the web extend to the year 3,797. 
And now with 2020 and 2021 having been rough years, I have to say that, according to Notre Dame, things for 2022 are not getting any better. So when it comes to Nostradamus' predictions for 2022, in order to be fair, there's something that needs to be said. Nostradamus' predictions are extremely vague. Also, he didn't exactly refer to exact dates for his predictions. They were based on astrological movements. So there's various places you can go to check out his prophecies for 2022. But what I'll bring to you here tonight is his prediction of war in Europe uh, and the invasion of France. Now, bear in mind again, it's very difficult to pin down exact dates with Nostradamus' predictions based as they are on astrological motions, which are can be quite long-lasting when you're thinking about things like uh, uh, entering the age of Aquarius uh, from the transitioning from out of the age of Pisces. However, one that can be narrowed down to perhaps being do in the 2022nd year of our Lord is the prediction of war reaching the European continent. The invasion of France by a threat from the East is a recurring theme throughout Nostradamus's predictions, but the prediction which I'll cite now is speculated to be referring to the spring of 2022. Bluehead shall whitehead Harm in such degree, as France is good to both, shall error amount. Much like all of Nostradamus's predictions, it is delightfully vague. Uh, could this prediction be alluding to the breakout of the Third World War or France's qualification into the 2022 Qatar World Cup? I mean, keep an eye out for the team that beats France to see if their kid is white. However, what I shall do instead is tell you a bit about war in France and uh, how this could very well happen uh, this next year. Uh, it brings us back to start with, uh, well, it brings us back to counterterrorism in early America. The United States waged war against the Barbary states to end international blackmail and terrorism. The events of September 11th, 2001 shocked the United States out of its complacency concerning its purported, or rather propagandized, invulnerability. Even though the U.S. has the most powerful military machine on earth, it proved to be of little avail. It was deemed that a new type of war would be fought, a war that would need resolve, years of effort, and new tactics. Yet this was not the first conflict in which America had faced such deprivations against life and property. There was another time when it was determined that diplomacy would not only be futile, but humiliating, and in the long run, disastrous. A time when ransom or tribute would not buy peace. A time when war was considered more effective and honorable and a time when war would be fought, not with large concentrations of military might, but by small bands peopled with individuals of indomitable spirit. The Barbary States were a collective name given to a string of North African seaports stretching from Tangiers to Tripoli. These ports were under the nominal control of the Ottoman Empire, but their real rulers were sea rovers, or corsairs, who sallied forth from the coast, the coastal cities, the Barbarcaderos, or Embarcaderos, to plunder Mediterranean shipping and capture slaves for labor or ransom. Among the famous prisoners ransomed from the shackles of Barbary were St. Vincent de Paul and Miguel de Cervantes, the author of Don Quixote. Over 220 years ago by now, our infant country attacked Tripoli under circumstances that are eerily similar to contemporary times. That conflict, immortalized in the Marine Corps hymn, From the halls of Montezuma, 
Puma to the shores of Tripoli, called the Tripolitan War, or the Barbary Pirate War. The original war on terror came shortly after we gained our independence from England. The United States chose to fight the pirates of Barbary rather than pay tribute, as did all the other nations who traded in the Mediterranean Sea. The decision was bold, but the eventual victory by the tiny United States Navy broke a pattern of international blackmail and terrorism dating back more than 150 years. Common piracy by the Barbary states blossomed into a sophisticated terrorist network racket in 1662. It would be as if ISIS or Al-Qaeda had won the war, had their own caliphate, and were demanding tribute. Well, that's exactly what it was when England revived the ancient custom of paying tribute. The Corsairs agreed to spare English ships for an annual bribe paid in gold, jewels, arms, and supplies. The custom spread to all countries trading in the Mediterranean. Today, the Islamic State continues to be a highly active and lethal insurgent force in the Middle East, particularly in rural Iraq and Syria. These are the so-called Iraq province and Al-Sham province, though despite what these names might suggest, they do not indicate territorial control. With minor exceptions, the group has not been able to hold territory in these areas since the fall of the border town of Baguz in March of the year before yesteryear. It is far less active in North Africa, with the exception of the Sinai Peninsula, where it operates under the name of the Sinai Province. In the Sinai, as in Iraq and Syria, the Islamic State does not administer territory, but rather prosecutes a low-level insurgency in hopes of wearing down the enemy and ultimately seizing control and reconstituting the state that it purports to be. Iraq, Syria, and the Sinai are the three main hotspots for the Islamic State in the M-E-N-A, the MENA region, all uppercase, kind of like MAGA, it's their version thereof, MENA, uh, Arabic uh, acronym, I'm not going to bother to dissect it for you. Uh, More sporadic attacks can be observed in Yemen, Somalia, and Libya. Of the three big areas, Iraq sees the most insurgent activity, which is not surprising given the group's Iraqi origins and the Iraqi complexion of its leadership. The attacks include small arms assaults, ambushes, roadside bombings, suicide bombings, assassinations, kidnappings, acts of sabotage. The smaller kinds of attacks are the most common today. Uh, The targets vary by area, but generally speaking, they are the different areas' security forces, their perceived supporters, collaborators, and the broader population of Shiite and other non-Sunni Muslims, all of whom are deemed unbelievers and apostates. The adopted strategy in these areas was detailed by the group in its official weekly newsletter, al Naba, which drew a distinction between the stage of state building, called Tamkin, and the stage of guerrilla warfare, Harb al-Izabat. The Well, a decision was made during the collapse of the territorial caliphate to revert to guerrilla warfare. In the present stage, then, the objective is to inflict the utmost harm on the enemy so that he does, well, so that he not only cedes ground, but is so badly defeated as to be unable to return to the battlefield. This is a rather lofty aspiration, and not one likely to be realized soon, given the current state of the group via V, its local enemies. That being said, the group's persistence and resilience are remarkable. In terms of attack numbers and casualties, the trend lines are somewhat down over the past year, but not to such a degree as to inspire confidence that the tide is turning. In the latest reports of the United Nations Security Council and the Department of Defense, namely the United Nations Sanctions Monitoring Team report and the lead Pentagon Inspector General report, no one is doing victory laps. The Islamic State insurgency is presented as entrenched and in some ways poised to grow worse. According to the United Nations, there are still some 10,000 Islamic State fighters between Iraq and Syria, 
albeit the real number is anyone's guess. I myself, I would assume a somewhat lower number. In Iraq, there is some impressive reconstruction taking place in cities like Ramadi. But in general, we are talking about insecure areas with half-ruined cities and millions of displaced residents. The sense of neglect and discrimination by the Shiite-dominated government in Baghdad persists. And this is compounded by the presence in these areas of Iran-linked Shiite militias that treat the Sunni population as natural Islamic State supporters. On the positive side of the ledger, Sunni Arab parties made impressive gains in the most recent parliamentary elections, suggesting that Sunnis might be looking to the political process to address their grievances. In Syria, the conflict is to a large extent frozen in a way that is not favorable to reconstruction or political inclusiveness. About two-thirds of the country is controlled by the Assad regime with the support of the Russian Empire and Iran-linked militias. The Idlib area in the northwest is controlled by Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, a former al-Qaeda affiliate, and parts of the north and northeast are under the authority of the Turkish-backed Syrian National Army, while much of the northeast and east is under the control of the U.S.-backed SDF, or Syrian Democratic Forces, a Kurdish-led force with ties to the PKK, the Kurdistan Workers' Party, a Kurdish opposition party that is banned in Turkey and the, on the United States' list of terrorist organizations, because it's communist. The Islamic State is most active in Syria, in the mostly regime-controlled central Syrian desert, and the SDF-controlled northeast. Um, this is a complex security and political environment where the economy is poor and grievances among Sunni Arabs are high. So long as the conflict is frozen, it will be rife for exploitation by the Islamic State. Judging by the data, reported in the Islamic State's Al-Naba newsletter, there have been fewer attacks in Iraq this year compared to last. In 2020, the group claimed an average of 110 attacks and 207 casualties per month in Iraq, while thus far in 2021, it has claimed an average of 87 attacks and 149 casualties per month. The decline is somewhat encouraging, but this is still a high number of frequently occurring attacks. As the DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, recently noted, the group seems to be focusing on higher profile attacks outside its safe havens, such as a January 21st double suicide bombing in central Baghdad and a July 19th suicide bombing in Sadr City, each of which killed more than 30 people. As in Iraq, attacks in Syria are also down, according to the reports in uh, the terrorist network's own newsletter, Al Naba, which I read in the original Arabic because they don't translate that shit to English. In 2020, the Islamic State claimed an average of 45 attacks and 95 casualties per month in Syria, while thus far in 2021, it has claimed an average of 31 attacks and 74 casualties. Complicating this data, however, is the fact that the Islamic State is known to under-report its attacks in the Syrian central desert. According to analysts Gregory Waters and Charlie Winter, the group claimed just 25% of attacks attributed to it by local actors in 2020, indicating a deliberate and anomalous pattern of undercounting, perhaps as part of a strategy to establish itself in the area without attracting too much attention. Mm. Now, recent comments by the DIA, which I know of because of my own past work in intelligence and military research on behalf of the DOD, the DIA being Defense Intelligence Agency and DOD being the Department of Defense, suggests that we might not want to read too much into the observed decline in reported attacks in 2021. In September, the DIA observed no notable changes to the group's internal cohesiveness in Syria that stated it is poised to increase activity in the coming quarter after a period of recuperation 
and recovery. Also discouraging in Syria is the continued presence of the Al-Hol detention facility in SDF-controlled territory. That camp holds, against their will, some 60,000 men, women, and children, many of them with links to the Islamic State. There has been some progress toward repatriating the detainees, but it has not been enough. The camp remains a site of recruitment and radicalization with no end in sight. By that I mean the women and children are raped until they volunteer to be suicide bombers, where death to them is welcome compared to a life of constant rape and exploitation. The attack data indicate a similar, if somewhat more pronounced, pattern of decline. In 2020, the Islamic State claimed an average of 16 attacks and 40 casualties per month in the Sinai, while thus far in 2021, it has claimed an average of 9 attacks and 17 casualties. For those of you who don't understand the importance of the Sinai, that's the fucking Egyptian canal, the Suez, okay? And it's right between that and Israel. This is one of the most important peninsulas on planet Earth. According to the United Nations, however, the Islamic State in Sinai is resilient and boasts between half a thousand and twelve hundred fighters. The Islamic State seems to have managed the transition from al-Baghdadi, their leader, to his successor, al Mola, also known as Abu Ibrahim al-Hashimi al-Qurashi. Fairly well. This is in part because the strategy of decentralizing the movement and returning to insurgency was set by al-Baghdadi prior his death, and thus al Mola has not had to reorient the group in any dramatic fashion. Another reason is that before his death in 2019, the Islamic State progressively de-emphasized the centrality of al-Baghdadi to the caliphate cause. In 2014, when the caliphate was announced, al-Baghdadi gave a televised sermon revealing his face for the first time and the group released a biography detailing his background and education. By contrast, al Mola has not shown his face, and the group has released almost no biographical details about him. al Mola has not even given an audio address in which Islamic State members might hear his voice, a sharp break in precedent. Some disaffected former members of the group have argued that it is contrary to the Sharia to pledge allegiance to a ghost, but that does not seem to have swayed opinion. If there was opposition to al Mola's ascension, it has not manifested on the battlefield. al Mola has been a member of the Islamic State and its predecessors since the mid-2000s, the decade of the aughts, or the zeros. He was hand-selected by al-Baghdadi to be his successor. al Mola was born in 1976. I know that much. He's only 10 years younger than I, in the Nineveh province, and uh, grew up in Mosul, where his father was the imam of a mosque. He obtained a master's degree in Islamic studies and abused his scholarly credentials to ascend the ranks of the terrorist network as a religious judge. He has been known as the professor. He is known as, well, at least in dissident literature, as a particularly ruthless and heavy-handed leader. The Treasury Department estimates that the Islamic State has tens of millions of United States dollars at its disposal, much of which is likely a legacy from the era before the return to insurgency. It is able to move money around through the Hawala system and cryptocurrencies via hubs in Turkey and elsewhere. It generates new revenue through smuggling, extortion, looting, and ransoms in the Barbary tradition. In Syria, for instance, Islamic State fighters are known to steal sheep in regime-controlled areas and smuggle them into SDF-controlled areas or across the border to Iraq, 
where they are sold in livestock markets. This sort of racket is not going to generate enormous cash flows for the militants, but their spending needs are far less today than they were when the group controlled vast swaths of territory. It is too soon to know whether the capture of the former finance chief will fundamentally affect Islamic State finances. Given the decentralized nature of the group now, the impact will likely be minimal. In terms of destroying Islamic State capabilities, the main American strategy is supporting partner forces in Iraq and Syria, namely the Iraqi Security Forces and the SDF, with intelligence, advice, training, and air operations. In the case of Syria, the United States also conducts joint operations against Islamic State targets with the SDF. Both the Iraqi security forces and the SDF remain dependent on these United States for ISR. That's an acronym for Intelligence, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance. And airstrikes! The rapid breakdown of security in Iraq following the complete withdrawal of U.S. forces in 2011 served as a warning not to repeat the same mistake again. But of course we did with Afghanistan, which led to the formation of ISIS-K, meaning isis Karbala, the city in Afghanistan, which they have conquered and rendered their own. Well, Thomas Jefferson would have handled ISIS-K, or ISIS in general. As a matter of fact, President Obama launched strikes on ISIS in Syria without a, even any congressional approval. Indeed, sans any congressional consultation. Thomas Jefferson launched war on the Barbary pirates without congressional approval. Again, sans even congressional knowing. The conflict over protecting shipping routes was America's first war on terror. The plot sounds like something plucked from today's headlines. Foreign hostages, terrorism, presidential power, and American diplomatic relations with the Middle East. But the nation's first war on terror was waged by Thomas Jefferson, who lived from 1743 to 1826, the Virginia-born third president of these United States of America, who drafted the Declaration of Independence and signed it on the 4th of July in 1776. Not George W. Bush or Barack Obama. In place of Al-Qaeda or ISIS, Jefferson was fighting the Barbary pirate states. In Jefferson's time, European powers conceded to terrorism by paying annual tribute and ransom to groups like the Barbary pirates. Once the American colonies gained independence from Great Britain, their ships were left without protection from piracy at sea. As American commerce began to increase, the Barbary states targeted American merchant vessels that traveled the seas without any strong naval defense. This is what led to ransom payments. Thomas Jefferson believed paying ransom to terrorist organizations was a sign of weakness as a nation. In effect, surrender. In 1801, pirates crossed the coast of Tripoli, continued to seize American ships, and use force to take Americans hostage. Even before his presidency, Jefferson, as Secretary of State, argued that his nation should not offer money to terrorists. It's a principle that persists in America's battle against ISIS. By time of Obama, 62% of Americans opposed paying ransom to ISIS, according to a contemporary Reuters Ipsos poll of 4,685 American adults. The U.S. government paid ransom to free Army Sergeant Bowie Bergdahl from the Taliban. But if those types of negotiations were being held with ISIS, it has never been made public yet. ISIS seems to be making a statement with its hostages. That's what brings us to the concept of congressional vote. In a 2014 address to the nation, Barack Obama told the American people that we will degrade and ultimately destroy ISIS. Even though he said he didn't need it, he asked for Congress's vote of approval. But Congress had left Washington to prepare for midterm elections, 
at the time he asked, so any special authority camest after the fact. In the meantime, Obama ordered military strikes against ISIS in Iraq and Syria. A survey released by CNN then indicated that more than 7 in 10 Americans think Obama should ask Congress for the ability to strike ISIS militarily, and 8 in 10 Americans supported Congress's approving military force against ISIS. According to United States naval documents, Thomas Jefferson ordered naval leaders to, in his words, protect our commerce and chastise their insolence by sinking, burning, or destroying their ships and vessels wherever ye shall find them. The first time Congress was even officially notified of Jefferson's plan, which deployed two-thirds of America's naval forces into battle with the enemy, was after the fact in his first annual message to Congress on December 8, 1801, what would be Pearl Harbor Day by the Japanese calendar come World War II. In Thomas Jefferson's address to Congress on deploying American naval forces into battle, he wrote that, unauthorized by the Constitution, without the sanction of Congress, to go out beyond the line of defense. Now that's boots on the ground, or certainly on the waves. With such a strong and pressing enemy threatening these United States, Jefferson eventually sent American naval forces into harm's way to fight. According to a chapter published in the Chicago Journal of International Law, as written by Robert F. Turner, the co-founder of the Center for National Security Law and professor of American foreign policy, Thomas Jefferson sent a small squadron of ships to the Mediterranean to battle the Barbary pirates sans congressional approval upon the pirates of Tripoli, declaring war on these United States in May of 1801, whereafter Jefferson sent a similar message to the American people. To quote his Turner at length and verbatim, I'm a believer. I think we ought to be looking for a way to be getting their ISIS's attention. It was a widely held opinion to send ships to the Mediterranean during Jefferson's presidency because everyone thought, wow, this is outrageous what they're doing to us. Jefferson's belief was that when war is declared against these United States, we don't need Congress's approval to fight back. Some leaders wanted to pay ransom to get hostages back or pay tribute so they, the Barbary pirates, wouldn't take further hostages. Jefferson was a lover of peace, but he was not one to believe that peace would be preserved by weakness. We had to show strength. Jefferson learned of how brutally Western prisoners were being held. They were kept in chains, dungeons. Their lifespan was not long, and a lot of them were dying in prison anyway. Seven years are gone by now. Obama faced the pressures of not putting American troops on the ground in Iraq and Syria. According to a poll released by CNN on the first day in October of 2014, while 76% favored American airstrikes against ISIS, 61% of Americans opposed putting U.S. soldiers on the ground in Iraq and Syria. The fight against terror is nothing new for these United States. With many similarities dating back to the early 1800s, the Obama administration had vital decisions to make. Although that president's strategy to defeat ISIS is only gradually re-emerging in light of the Islamic State's renaissance in Taliban Afghanistan, America's ability to grow as a nation emanates from the valuable lessons this country learned so early in its existence. Incepting that experience, it's no exaggeration to say that these United States owes its victory in the Revolutionary War to the Kingdom of France. The victory at Yorktown, as represented by that famous John Trumbull painting, what hangs in the rotunda of the United States Capitol in Washington, D.C., was the culmination of the Franco-American alliance. This alliance was ideological in nature, 
as much as it was strategic, and yet could not last for long per the American elite's sense of Anglo-exclusive superiority. What cripples and shrinks the Republican Party even today. Even before the combined victory at Yorktown, French armies and French fleets engaged their British adversaries across the globe on behalf of the Americans and to draw London's focus away from the, our rebelling colonies. In fact, French efforts to supply the patriots with proper military equipment and munitions saved our revolution well before the drafting of the official alliance. Unfortunately for France, these extraordinary efforts drove their country deep into debt, spending at least 1.3 billion livres, undoubtedly leading to the French Revolution. As France abolished its monarchy and executed King Louis, many in America wondered where that left their alliance, which surprisingly included no set endpoint in its terms of agreement. If it remained intact, that could drag America into France's new war with Britannia, which led to a fierce debate amongst politicians on who they made their treaty with. King Louis himself? The nation he ruled? Or the defunct institution he represented? <sighs> now, to gather my breath here, uh, in terms of, uh, oh, well, uh, King Louis's number, uh, he was Louis the Sixteenth. Uh, it took me a while to remember that consciously, uh, but he was the Sixteenth Louis in line and the last. However, the Bourbons survive, and they did come back to rule France again for a time, and, uh, may yet return to rule Brittany and the Vendée. At any rate, ultimately, President George Washington decided that the 1778 Treaty of Alliance with France did remain intact with the new republic, but stressed to Congress that he had adopted a policy of strict neutrality to any conflict in Europe. This position fell in line with his belief in cementing the independence of America's foreign policy, but it proved highly unpopular even to members of his own cabinet, who advocated either closer ties with Britannia or with France, depending on their party affiliation. One of them, and to my eternal shame and disgrace, I can't consciously remember which, the Republicans or the Democrats wanted Britain, and the other party wanted France. Red and blue. The French were blue. The Brits were red. France also considered the Treaty of Alliance to be still in effect and demanded that America either honor the treaty and align with them against Britannia or at least pay back some of the debt they owed France from the Revolutionary War. Washington's position of neutrality infuriated them, especially when the United States signed the 1794 Jay Treaty, J-A-Y, with Great Britain, encouraging trade between the two entities, Britain being an empire and America an emergent imperial state. This added to the friction between the two nominal allies of France and America, which heightened, well, which was highlighted by key events such as the Citizen Jeunier and XYZ affairs, as well as predation by French privateers or state-sponsored pirates on American shipping starting in 1796. So the Americans were under siege by the Muslims and the French. As for what I've been referencing historically, the citizen Genier affair was from 1793 through 1794. It lasted a year. Mm. Edmund Charles Genier served as French minister to these United States from 1793 to 1794. His activities in that capacity embroiled these United States and France 
In a diplomatic crisis, as the United States government attempted to remain neutral in the conflict between Great Britain and revolutionary France, the controversy was ultimately resolved by Genier's recall from his position. As a result of the Citizen Genier affair, the United States established a set of procedures governing neutrality. As for the term citizen, this was very important to the French. It's very significant because after dismantling the monarchy, all French were now citizens of a republic. So that term was an honorific it was as important to them as a honorific in Asia, uh, like Dietrich San or something of that nature. Uh, so this meant that it was similar to the kingfish interpretation of every man a king. Now, American foreign policy in the 1790s was dominated by the events surrounding the French Revolution. Following the overthrow of the monarchy in 1792, the revolutionary French government clashed with the monarchies of Spain and the greater British Empire. French policymakers needed these United States to help defend France's colonies in the Caribbean, either as a neutral supplier or as a military ally. And so they dispatched Edmund Charles Genier, an experienced diplomat as minister to these United States. The French assigned Genier several additional duties to obtain advance payments on debts that the United States owed to France for their very existence to negotiate a commercial treaty between these United States and France and to implement portions of the 1778 Franco-American Treaty, which allowed a tax on British merchant shipping using ships based in American ports. Genier's attempt to carry out his instructions would bring him into direct conflict with the United States government. The French Revolution had already reinforced political differences within President George Washington's cabinet. The Democratic Republicans, led by Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson, at that point they were a single party, believe it or fucking not. So it wasn't Democrats versus Republicans on red and blue, it was Democratic Republicans versus Federalist Whigs or some shit like that. <laughs> now, the Democratic Republicans led by Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson sympathized with the French revolutionaries. They were blue. The Federalists, led by Secretary of the Treasury Alexander Hamilton, believed that ties with Great Britain were more important. President Washington attempted to steer a neutral course between these trois opposing views. He believed that joining the greater British Empire or France in war would subject the comparatively weak United States to invasion by foreign armies and have disastrous economic consequences, and he would be proven right. President Washington issued a proclamation of neutrality on April 22, 1793. Genier arrived in Charleston, South Carolina, on April 8, 1793, calling himself Citizen Genier to emphasize his pro-revolutionary stance. Genier immediately began to issue privateering commissions. Upon his arrival in Charleston, contracts for international piracy to American terrorists so they could terrorize the Brits on the high seas. With the consent of South Carolina Governor William Moultrie, these commissions, letters of mock, spelled Marquis, but pronounced letters of mock, authorized the bearers, regardless of their country of origin, to seize British merchant ships and their cargo for personal profit, with the approval and protection of the French government. When Jeunier arrived in the United States capital of Philadelphia in May to present his credentials, Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson informed him that the United States cabinet considered the outfitting of French privateers in American ports to be a violation of the U.S. policy of neutrality. Not only that, but President George Washington personally decried him. Uh, what would you say? He rebuked him, said, I reject this man as a man employing mercenaries illegally, our citizens, to fight his war. 
Genier's mission ran into further difficulties when the U.S. government expressed no interest in a new commercial treaty, as it already enjoyed favorable trading privileges in French ports. The U.S. cabinet also refused to make advance payments on American debts to the French government for their very existence. Pretty fucking ungrateful if you ask me, but pretty fucking American, eh? Genier ignored American warnings and allowed the outfitting of another French privateer, a ship named the Little Democrat. You like that? Mm. Defying numerous warnings from U.S. officials to detain the new pirate ship in port, Genier continued to ready the ship to sail for high seas terrorism. (laughs) Genier also threatened to make his case to the American people, bypassing official government opposition because the American people knew they owed their national existence to the French. Genier failed to realize that George Washington himself and his neutrality policy were politically popular and that his pro-British enemies would depict such an attempt on his part as foreign meddling in American domestic affairs, kind of like the Russians hacking Trump into power. Washington's cabinet met to consider a response to Genier's defiant actions. All members agreed to request Genier's recall, but were divided as to how to go about doing so. Before the cabinet reached any decision, Genier allowed the little Democrat to sail and begin attacking British shipping. This direct violation of neutrality forced the U.S. government's hand to take more prompt action and request that the French government recall Genier immediately. However, Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson stopped short of expelling Genier from the United States physically, as Hamilton had wished. By the time Jefferson's request for recall reached France across the Atlantic by power of sail, by speed of sailing ship, Power had shifted from the more moderate Girondins, who had originally sent Janier on his mission, to the radical Jacobians. Uh, Now, French policy uh, began to emphasize friendlier relations with neutral countries who could provide crucially needed food supplies. (laughs) Because being communistic, Uh, they were collectivizing and thereby devastating their agriculture. I'm going to put a little of this into perspective for you about the Jacobins so that you understand uh, what they were about. A Jacobin was originally a Dominican friar until it redefined in common parlance as a member of the Jacobin Club a society of the most radical element of the French Revolution that was the most famous and powerful of the political groups of that upheaval, which became identified with extreme egalitarianism and violence from mid-1793 on, whilst promoting the revolutionary political movement that instituted the Reign of Terror. Founded in 1789 by the Breton deputies, to the National Assembly. The political cult itself derived its name from founding in the Dominican convent in Paris and thereafter meeting at the Dominican Rue Saint-Honneurre Monastery of the Jacobins. The Jacobins saw themselves as constitutionalists dedicated to the rights of man and the place they met in Most regularly, the Rue Saint-Honneur would mean the Red Honorary Monastery, the Red Monastery in honor of the saints. And uh, that's how Red became associated with communism. Maximilien Robespierre and his Jacobin Committee of Public Safety hijacked the late 18th century French Revolution. Today, the terms Jacobin and Jacobinism, also known as Robespierreism, are used in a variety of senses. In France itself, Jacobin now generally indicates a supporter of a centralized Republican state and a strong central government or strong central government powers and or, well, supporters of extensive governmental intervention to transform society, like Roosevelt Socialism. 
the modern equation of Jacobinism with Marxism extend it to their historical trajectories so that Robespierre, not inappropriately, equals Lenin, equals Stalin, has been welded by critics to discredit not just communism as a continuation of the revolutionary terror, but beyond that, any project of radical social transformation. Now, in terms of uh, what I was speaking of with uh, the French uh, in Washington's time, French policy began to emphasize, as I said, friendlier relations with neutral states because they needed food. French officials were already dissatisfied with Genier's failure to fulfill his diplomatic mission, and the Jacobins suspected him of continued loyalty to the Girondins, the moderates. The French government recalled Genier on their own and demanded that the United States hand him over to the commissioners sent to replace him. President Washington and Attorney General Edmund Randolph Aware that Genier's return to France would almost certainly result in his execution, allowed Genet to remain in these United States. U.S. and French diplomatic goals favored friendly neutrality, and the Genier affair came to an end. Genet himself continued to reside in these United States until his death in 1834. The Genet affair forced these United States to formulate a consistent policy on the issue of neutrality. Washington's cabinet signed a set of rules regarding policies of neutrality on August 3rd, 1793, and these rules were formalized when Congress passed a neutrality bill on the 4th of June in 1794. This legislation formed the basis for neutrality policy throughout the 19th century. England had always paid tribute to the Barbary, for the vessels of her American colonies, and France guaranteed it for them throughout the War of Independence. The new United States awoke abruptly to an ugly responsibility of independence when, in 1785, the day, that's spelled D-E-Y, the day of Algiers, seized an American ship and jailed its crew for non-payment of tribute. The day was in no hurry to ring tribute from this new source of revenue. The capture of American ships would be more profitable and in view of the naval weakness of these United States, a rather safe venture. 11 of the first unfortunate Americans to fall into his hands died before their country ransomed the rest 10 years later. To the Seahawks of Barbary, the American ships in the Mediterranean were fat ducks, prime for the plucking. In this view, they were encouraged by both England and France, whose trade was being hurt by the upstart Yankees. Turkey, the overlord of Barbary, was an ally of Britannia. The North Africans depended on free trade with France for supplies. Hence, the pirates were forbidden to attack British shipping, and in plain self-interest, they could not raid the French. With targets so limited, The American fat ducks were a godsend. By 1794, the day of Algiers had plundered 11 American ships and held 119 of their survivors for ransom. President George Washington tried to reach an agreement with the Barbary states, but with little success. His agents, one of whom was the father of the American Navy, John Paul Jones, a man who had once, of course, been wanted for murder, had diplomatic doors slammed in their faces. Washington's ambassadors in Europe worked to free Americans enslaved in Barbary dungeons, but John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, and Thomas Jefferson were all ridiculed. And in 1785, the exasperated Thomas Jefferson suggested that war was the only solution. His mind was absolutely suspended between indignation and impotence. Those were the words of the day to describe him, not my own. Jefferson declared that tribute was money thrown away and that the most convincing argument that these outlaws, these terrorists, would understand was gunpowder and shot. 
The future president proposed a multinational effort, America's first attempt at coalition building between European powers and America that would, in effect, economically blockade North Africa and ultimately provide for a multinational military force to combat pirate terrorism, a prevision of NATO. The European powers chose to continue paying tribute to the Barbary states. Then another diplomatic incident between these United States and France in 1797 outraged Americans and led to an undeclared state of war, the XYZ Affair. Now that might sound like something out of Sesame Street, but the XYZ Affair was, in fact, a diplomatic incident between France and America in the late 18th century that led to an undeclared war at sea. In 1793, France went to war with Great Britain while America remained neutral. Late that following year, or the f- 1794, the United States and Britain signed the Jays Treaty, which resolved several long-standing issues between those two nations, those entities, the empire and the incipient imperial state. The French were infuriated by Jays Treaty, believing it violated earlier treaties between these United States and France. As a result, they went on to seize a substantial number of American merchant ships. And U.S. diplomats, trying to clear the situation up in a hopeless case, they had no leg to stand on, were all shunned in France. When President George Washington sent Charles Coatsworth Pinckney as the U.S. minister to France in 1796, the government there refused to receive him. After John Adams became president in March of 1797, he dispatched a three-member delegation to Paris later that same year in an effort to restore peace between the two countries. Once the diplomats, Pinckney, along with John Marshall and Elbridge Gerry, arrived overseas, they tried to meet with France's foreign minister, Charles de Talleyrand. Instead, he put them off and eventually had three agents inform the U.S. commissioners that in order to see him, they first would have to pay him a hefty bribe and provide France with a large loan, among other conditions. Pinckney's supposed response You know, this is like the Americans who were surrounded by the Germans at the Battle of the Bulge, which, believe it or not, I'll get through in this arc of narrative. Like the American high officer who, when the Germans told him to surrender, said, Balls! Of course, in the papers, believe it or not, they felt they couldn't print that for the public, so the American papers said he said, Nuts! Which would be another word for testicles. Of course, the German officer who received that statement said, What's this? This balls. And, of course, somebody had to tell him, He said, Testicles. And uh, that didn't sit well, and the Germans put the Americans under siege. Well, in the four hours we have remaining, uh, to get to that point, uh, let's keep where we're going. At any rate, uh, Pickney's response to the French demand for some tribute was, no, no, not a sixpence. In other words, not six pennies, which in those days was their version of a nickel. Now, this was the instigation of what was called the Quasi-War. When word of the French demands reached these United States, it caused an uproar and prompted calls for war. After some members of Congress asked to see the diplomats' reports regarding what had transpired in France, Adams handed them over with the names of the French agents replaced with the letters X, Y, and Z, thus the name XYZ Affair. Congress subsequently authorized various defense measures, including the creation of the Department of the Navy and the construction of warships. Then in July of 1798, it authorized American ships to attack French vessels, launching an undeclared naval war that came to be referred to as the Quasi-War. As John Adams assumed the presidency in 1797, he too remained adamant on keeping the United States neutral in European affairs since he was key in convincing Washington to adopt the position in the first. 
His firm stance caused a great deal of friction with his own Federalist Party. However, he was, well, that whole party was favoring the Brits in the first. If you might remember what I said, they were the red team. They increasingly favored war with France to stop the privateering on behalf of their British sponsors. War, of course, was not universally popular any more than it was during Obama's day. And Adams feared that acting rashly could allow Thomas Jefferson's Democratic Republicans to sweep the next election. But he did start making real efforts to ensure the protection of America's commercial interests. Under Washington, both the Army and the Navy fell under the responsibility of the War Department, but Adams thought it wise to give the Navy a degree of independence to pursue its own operations during peacetime by founding the Department of the Navy and the Marine Corps in 1798. He also convinced Congress to complete the construction of the six heavy frigates authorized four years prior, giving the Navy 25 warships at its disposal when Congress authorized it to target French privateers on the 7th of July, the beginning of the Quasi-War. Benjamin Stoddard, the new Secretary of the Navy, understood that the nascent fleet could not hope to patrol the entire Atlantic effectively, instead feeling that it should target the waters where the majority of French privateers made base. Writing to President Adams thusly, I feel the whole force of the importance of deciding all things in the West Indies. His strategy also had the bonus of threatening France's lucrative plantation colonies across the Caribbean. The undeclared war lasted for well over a year, with a majority of the action at sea, and even then, only two major engagements occurred, both of which involved the 36-gun frigate, the USS Constellation, of Captain Thomas Truxton, a former privateer himself from the Revolutionary War. Truxton's piratical reputation had more to do with his strict attitude towards discipline and training than his military endeavors. But the Navy possessed few seamen more experienced than he. And with a 36 fucking gun frigate. Well, that's why they called it the Constellation. It was like uh, a cluster of stars when it fired. It's broadsides. On February 9th of 1779, Truxton managed to catch the 40-gun French frigate La Insurgente, or the Insurgency, or the Insurgent, in the middle of a tropical storm off the island of Nevis. Busy fighting the weather with a cracked topmast, the French frigate became easy prey for Tuxton, well, Truxton, with his piratical instincts, who literally sailed circles round her till the French captain surrendered his ruined ship. The next year, Truxton and the Constellation fought off another French frigate named La Vengeance near St. Kitts, the Vengeance. Both ships took heavy damage in the fighting, and even as La Vengeance struck her colors and surrendered, the Constellation's main mast collapsed and forced Truxton to make repairs in Jamaica. The Quasi-War also saw the Adams administration provide material support for the ongoing Black African slave rebellion in the French colony of saint Domingue, or saint Domingue, located on the island of Hispaniola in the Caribbean. In the late 18th century, Toussaint Louverture, who lived from 1743 to 1803, led a slave uprising that came as to be known as the Haitian Revolution, what liberated the former French colony and created the Republic of Haiti, where we've just today, or yesterday by now, had a terrible tanker explosion that killed well nigh a hundred people and left thousands devastated, their lives destroyed, all their property or personal belongings up in flames. Largely through the efforts of the one man I've already referenced, Toussaint Louverture, that slave revolt in Haiti saved the United States. No longer a slave himself, Toussaint nonetheless trained and led the half million African slaves on Haiti to victory after victory over England and France for more than a decade. In the process, he kept all America free from European domination. In 1791, the new country of these United States of America was just getting on its feet. George Washington would run for re-election that year, and the two great political parties, Federalist versus Democratic-Republican, 
were angling to get their men into top positions in government yet again. The western borders of this country were ever-expanding, as was the number of states admitted into Union, said Union being but another name for these United States, deleterious for this fledgling white empire, however, was the surrounding occupational presence of European troops in region. English troops were still in Canada, stirring up trouble. French troops were in saint Domingue or Haiti, and in Mexico. Spanish troops were in South America and Central America, and throughout the West, for that matter, The American empire was effectively contained, like we would later contain the Soviet Union. And the ongoing potential for European involvement in American affairs was high. President Washington and other government officials met with European officials time and again, affecting to keep the peace and keep Americans out of European wars. But the more America refused to fight, the more both sides in a war came to hate America. Europeans had been bringing black African slaves to America and the Western Hemisphere since 1619. By 1791, the slavery system was so ingrained in the lifestyles of both Europeans and Africans that it seemed like it could go on indefinitely. At least that's what the Europeans thought. The Africans saw it differently. And in 1791, they rose up in defiance of their captors. The place was St. Domingue, future Haiti, a small Caribbean island then owned by France. This was France's wealthiest colony, and that wealth came almost exclusively from the plantations that were worked by black African slaves. As much influenced by the ideals of liberté and brotherhood announced by the French Revolution as the Anglo-descended whites to the north of them were, The slaves of the colony, comprising the majority of the population, took up arms to secure their freedom in what became known as the Haitian Revolution. But the U.S. relationship with Haiti was antagonistic from the beginning. Shortly after the outbreak of the Haitian Revolution, George Washington's administration contributed significant funds to assist French planters in their fight against the black rebels, And from that time, an unwillingness to accept the reality of a free black nation marred the American government's policy toward Haiti ever since. Yet despite a trade embargo with these United States, the black rebels managed to gain control over the colony under the leadership of that former slave, General Toussaint Louverture. Notwithstanding years of constant fighting, however, Haiti remained a colony. John Adams, the next president, went along with the Europeans and paid for peace in the Mediterranean. Congress, in 1795, authorized payment of tribute, which is why the postmodern Muslim terrorists consider us Americans a tributary population. Algiers was granted the equivalent of 642,000 500 U.S. dollars in cash, munitions, and even a 36-gun frigate of their own to conduct more terrorism on the high seas with. That amount of money that I named in today's amount of cash would be billions of dollars, like what we pay Israel every year. Besides that, a yearly tribute of $21,600 worth of naval supplies to further shall we say, uh, enable their terrorism. Ransom rates were officially set for those Americans already in Barbary prisons. $4,000 for each passenger and $1,400 for each cabin boy. Sunday after Sunday, a sad roll of names was read out in the churches of Salem. Newport, and Boston, listing the American men in irons. Congress would only pay $200 for their freedom. The rest of the money had to be raised privately. Eventually, at long last, the American captives, still alive, under the 
incredibly barbarous. It's where we get the term barbarism from. Treatment of the day of Algiers. Walked out of their abuse into the light, except for the 37 dead, whose ransoms had to be paid nonetheless, or the bodies would never be returned for burial. John Adams's acquiescence to Algiers prompted Tunis and Tripoli to demand and be promised their own blood money. Surrender and appeasement begets only more terror. Tripoli especially was piqued at the day of Algiers' good fortune. There was a brief period in which John Adams's administration offered some support to Toussaint Louverture in hopes that the Black Napoleon would contain French military operations in the rest of the Atlantic world. Knowing that St. Domingue was France's wealthiest colony, John Adams saw an opportunity to destroy their investment by lifting the embargo against the blacks, thus empowering Toussaint to declare full independence. While the action made diplomatic and military sense, the thought of the president aiding the New World's first successful slave revolt terrified and enraged the residents of the southern slave states. And despite the wishes of many Federalist Party members this side of the Atlantic, the quasi-war did not escalate into a full-fledged conflict between America and France. Fears that it would, along with support for the black Haitian rebels, ultimately contributed to Adams's defeat in the 1800 election against Thomas Jefferson. Even as Jefferson and Adams each campaigned against one another, American diplomats in Europe worked to end hostilities with France and managed a breakthrough with a brand new government when, as unto Caesar crossing the Rubicon, the Corsican, the Italian, Napoleon Bonaparte, returned from Egypt on the ninth day in August of 1799. In the dark of night, on the 9th through the 10th days in November of the 1799th Annus on the Christian calendar, the year 1799, the French Directory government was overthrown by the formidable and popular General Napoleon Bonaparte, who installed himself as First Consul of the Republic. The coup d'état of 18 the night of the 18th into the dawn of the 19th, Brumaire on the year of the Republican calendar is generally taken to mark the end of the French Revolution and the beginning of Napoleon Bonaparte's dictatorship. Now, in terms of that number on the Republican calendar, that was the year 8th. It was the 8th year on their new calendar the new republic had established a brand new calendar actually based on the old egyptian calendar and um, during this time u.s and french negotiators were concluding negotiations to end america's quasi-war with france later simply called the coup of 18 brumaire as popularly referenced for the date on the French Republican calendar in which it took place, Brumaire being the month of that particular calendar, which had something like 13 months, if I remember correctly, the event largely established Bonaparte's near control over the French revolutionary government. But to Adams's, President John Adams's surprise in his now lame duck administration, the last few months thereof, the new dictator was largely responsive to his overtures of peace. Adams hoped that the new navy had impressed the French, but Napoleon was mostly driven by his own agenda. The hostilities were settled with the Convention of 1800, also known as the Treaty of Mortefontaine, which was ratified in 1801. As Bonaparte's ministers negotiated the peace deal, he and his foreign minister, the ex-bishop Talleyrand, secretly plotted to restore France's colonial empire by annexing the Louisiana Territory from their Spanish allies. Bonaparte abused the negotiations with these United States to hide his actual intentions, which, if known, would probably have been viewed as a direct threat to American independence. 
America had a dream of stretching from sea to shining sea. If Napoleon owned all the land in the heartland, that was never going to happen. So France signed the Treaty of Montefontaine on November 9th of 1800, ending both the quasi-war and officially terminating the 1778 alliance. The very next day, Napoleon signed the secret Treaty of San Ildefonso with Spain, giving France total control of Louisiana once again. And Napoleon Bonaparte effectively ruled America's heartland. From the European perspective, it has always been seen that Bonaparte played the Americans for fools by ending the quasi-war. But in fact, President John Adams had accomplished much of what he had set out to do, keeping these United States out of the war and establishing the centrality of the Navy in American foreign policy. Despite the limited action, many of America's important early naval heroes also took part in that conflict uh, George Washington himself was forced out of retirement to serve as commander-in-chief. Uh, the other heroes of America, or at least white America, included Isaac Hull, Stephen Dacatur, David Porter, and William Bainbridge. Some of those names will come up again very soon. The Quasi-War, in addition to the latter Barbary Wars, which emerged as the United States' first war on terror, integral America's alignment into continental axis with Imperur Napoleon in what would be occulted as the War of 1812, established the United States as a strong naval power to be reckoned with on the world stage. The payment of blackmail did not end with, well, it certainly didn't end the indignities perpetrated by Barbary. An absurd episode in 1800 pointed up the futility of giving in to the piratical terrorists. When the frigate George Washington docked in Algiers with a consignment of tribute the day to impress his master, the Sultan of Turkey, shanghaied the American ship to run an errand for him. The captain of the luckless ship, William Bainbridge, was forced to haul down the American flag and to run up the colors of the Islamic State. The George Washington, named after our own president and commander-in-chief, was commandeered by the terrorists to take a shipment of treasure, livestock, and even some live lions to the Sultan in Istanbul for his zoo. Yusuf, the Pasha of Tripoli, seeing the weakness of the Americans, decided to increase demands on the United States. Among the trifles he ordered as part of the American tribute were several diamond-studded guns. On the occasion of the death of George Washington himself, the man, the Pasha informed President Adams that it was customary when a great man passed away from a tributary state to make a gift in his name to the crown of Tripoli. And he reminded the Americans that all Americans now were but slaves to Islam. Yusuf estimated Washington to be worth about $10,000. In today's money, that would be like the terrorists demanding a billion. By the spring of 1801, Yusuf had heard nothing about his $10,000, and his impatience with America had grown into a fine rage. The Pasha summoned the American representative to his court, made him kneel and kiss his hand, and decreed that, as a penalty, tribute would be raised to $225,000 plus $25,000 annually in the goods of his choice. If refused, the alternative was war. To make his point, Yusuf had his soldiers chop down the flagpole in front of the American consulate, a significant gesture in a land of no tall trees, and one that meant declaration of war. This would be as if we were paying a trillion dollars, something equivalent 
to our latest budget for Build Back Better, the incentive to help us rebound from COVID being given to the terrorists of the Islamic State. The reason for Yusuf's lack of tribute was that the United States had a new president, the former frustrated ambassador Thomas Jefferson. Upon entering office, Jefferson had been appalled to discover that tribute and ransoms paid to Barbary had exceeded two million United States dollars, the equivalent of trillions of dollars today, or about, at that time, one-fifth of the entire annual income of the United States government. Jefferson decided that a little showing of the flesh in the Mediterranean was more appropriate than tribute. He ordered the frigates that were named the President, the Essex, and the Philadelphia, and the Sloop Enterprise. Yes, that was the first enterprise of the United States, not even a ship so much as a sloop, which is a very sleek little combat craft. He ordered these vessels to blockade Tripoli and convoy American shipping. This squadron, under Commodore Richard Dale, had to patrol and control a coastline over 1,200 miles in distance, which resulted in a most desultory blockade. The lone success of the force was the defeat of a larger Tripolitan ship by the Enterprise. This is why we know the name so well and named a starship after it, along all the other ships before the Starship Enterprise. Since there had been no declaration of war by these United States, the Barbary cruiser could not be taken as a prize. You see, the Americans were still operating under rule of law against a terrorist network. However, the captain of the Enterprise did have all the Corsair's guns thrown overboard, before allowing the ship to continue on its way, with 60 casualties to his none. He lost not a single man, but he killed 60 of the enemy and threw all their guns overboard. Yusuf was so furious at his captain's defeat at the hand of the American fat ducks that he had him bastinadoed. That means beaten on the soles of his feet. By the way, this is nothing funny. Um... The soles of his feet were flayed, meaning skinned, by the whips. And then they would put salt on them. So they'd have goats lick that salt off thereafter. And the agony is, of course, just unbelievable. Uh, Anyhow, after that, this man was paraded backward on a donkey. His neck festooned with sheep's entrails. Everyone then knew him as a jackass and forbade him to pass under their doors frames. No one would allow him in their homes. At this time, U.S. naval enlistments were for only a year. So in March of 1802, Commodore Dale sailed home. Congress still refused to declare war against Tripoli, but did levy a light war tax and proclaimed protection of commerce by the Navy. Commodore Preble's successor, Captain Samuel Barron led the largest flotilla assembled under the American flag up to that time. Six frigates, seven brigs, and ten gunboats. Barron had another weapon on his flagship, a certain man named William Eaton, the former consul of Tunis. Eaton knew that Tripoli could be taken if ground troops were committed or if the political climate of the city could be altered. Eaton planned to do both. His scheme called for fomenting rebellion to supplant Yusuf with his brother Hamet. To achieve his design, Eaton had at his his disposal $20,000 in cash, the little brig called Argus, and a cadre of nine men. In other words, a little combat speedboat, so to speak, and a commando team. One of the latter was a midshipman man, by the name of Pascal Poali Peck. 
three P's instead of my three D's. And the other eight were United States Marines led by Lieutenant Presley O'Bannon, an Irishman. This handful of men would share in an incredible adventure, little recalled today except in the Marine Corps hymn. Eaton and the puppet Hamet met at Alexandria in Egypt and agreed to attack Yusuf's port of Derna. In that city, Hamet had some support. To avoid an exhausting half a thousand mile march, Eaton wanted to transport the American force by sea, but Hamet insisted that his flighty followers might disappear if the Americans did not march with him. By promising riches and plunder after victory, General, he gave himself a battlefield promotion, General Eaton, as Hamet dubbed him, recruited probably the strangest army to march under the Stars and Stripes. The men were mostly Arabs and Levantine brigands. It, just like when Aquino's co-religionist, Paul Valeli, emptied all the prisons of Arabia to create ISIS. This man visited the prisons and paid bail to get his army. And with all of these miscreants and some Greeks and other European soldiers of fortune, some white mercenaries, there were about 600 criminals in all, an army of the disaffected, illegitimate, and just plain psychotic. Uh, you can imagine what a control problem that created. The expedition would be supplied by sea, and the Argus would pace the marchers just offshore. The Argus's cannon would provide Eaton with minimal naval support, and her eight marines were added to the rabble army. The motley force of criminals, emptied out of prisons, moved out of Alexandria on the 8th of March of 1805, along a route now made famous during World War II. Two of Eaton's rest stops were at Tobruk, and Al Alamein. Eaton's army, like those of the future, would suffer from the stand, well, the sandstorms for one, and the calm seen wind, the hum seen wind which brings darkness at midday. On the march, Eaton's Arab cavalry threatened a mutiny, but of course, Eaton outfaced the horde with a show of bayonets from his squad of eight marines. Eventually, Eaton's twenty thousand dollars were drained. And at times, he had to borrow money from his marines and Greek mercenaries to keep the expedition going. The Argus lost contact with the march about 90 miles from Derna, just as the land force's food gave out. Some of the mercenaries vowed to quit, but Eaton coaxed them to eat a pack camel, basically a pack camel, and wait a day or so. Fortunately, the Argus reappeared on April 16th, followed by the Hornet with food and munitions. After a few days' rest, Eaton resumed his advance and arrived outside of Derna on April 25th. To Eaton's demand for surrender, the captain of Derna's defenses replied, My head are yours! And after two days of maneuvering, Eaton's lone cannon opened up on Derna's stone walls and houses. The noise was impressive, dust flew, and in their excitement the Greek artillerymen burst the cannon by firing it with a rammer still in the tube like idiots. In other words, they put the explosive ammo in the cannon and blew it up in their own faces. At four in the afternoon, Eaton ordered a frontal attack, and with his tiny force of eight Marines and 50 Greeks, charged the walls. The town was won, but at a high cost of 14 dead, two of them Marines. Eaton took a musket ball through the wrist in the assault, which captured the first city in the old world by Americans. The victors were besieged in Derna throughout the month of May, but Hammett's cavalry repulsed these attacks. Eaton begged Commodore Barron to proclaim Hammett the new ruler of Tripoli and to reinforce his troops for the 700-mile march on the Pasha's capital. Barron refused both requests because Yusuf had reopened negotiations with the American consul for the release of the Philadelphia's crew. An agreement was reached. Eaton and Hammett fled from the shores of Tripoli with the Marines and Christian mercenaries to escape certain death at the hands of their angry followers, for whom peace would end all prospects of loot. 
What the fearless Eaton might have accomplished with the 100 or more Marines who were idling aboard Baron Squadron is tantalizing to imagine. The negotiated treaty with Yusuf called for the release of all prisoners, an end to slave-taking and ship seizure, and a final ransom of $60,000. Yusuf was more than eager to sign. American naval presence had destroyed his normal source of revenue, and he had been alarmed at the success of Eaton's ragtag army. The day of Tunis, seeing what had happened to Tripoli, sent a blooded horse to President Jefferson as a sign of peace and the end of tribute. Jefferson, himself a horseman, refused the gift. The Americans now thought that the Mediterranean was safe for the United States' shipping and brought Baron Squadron home to the Western Hemisphere, where the slaves of St. Domingue had earlier set fire to the plantations they worked in and demanded their freedom. With crops burning to the root as a backdrop, the slaves had offered not just their lives, but their very humanity to fight for the right to freedom to be bequeathed upon their own. Leading them was Toussaint Louverture, himself a former slave, as I have said. He was so successful at training and leading the half million slaves under his command, ten times the number of plantation owners, that even though it took a long time, they eventually conquered all of Haiti and all of Santo Domingo, the other half of the island of Hispaniola. In 1801, Louverture proclaimed himself governor general of the entire island. Now acknowledged as the Black Napoleon, he also outlawed slavery upon the Isle of Mountains, which is all that Haiti means. Haiti transliterates from the Creole, the black language, as Isle of Mountains. This didn't sit well with the white Napoleon Bonaparte, first consul of France, the French didn't like losing Haiti, their wealthiest colony, and they certainly didn't like losing their colony to a rebel leader and a bunch of black slaves. On the other side of the Atlantic, Napoleon had ended 10 years of warfare with Great Britain under the Peace of Amiens circa 1802. So Napoleon set a trap for Louverture. Sadly, like an idiot, the Haitian hero fell for it and was thrown into a dungeon where he died in 1803. Bonaparte exploited this opportunity to attempt to crush the Haitian Revolution, but the army he dispatched met with defeat. In that same year, French armies sailed to Haiti and tried to reinstate slavery with French masters in charge as before. But Jean-Jacques de Salines, one of Toussaint's generals and himself another former slave, led the Haitian forces to victory. It was a great day for Haiti, and a great day for black Africans everywhere. Napoleon had, of course, already reobtained the North American province of Louisiana, which at that point was the entire American heartland, from Spain in 1800, but the loss of Haiti obviated Louisiana's strategic relevance, and with war again on the horizon with the greater British Empire, Napoleon was willing to agree to the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. So the Haitian legacy incalculably impacted these United States in its expansion. Reconsider the fact that 1803 is the very year that these United States and France agreed on the Louisiana Purchase due to black victory in the Western Hemisphere. While all of the Haitian struggles were taking place, France was also fighting against England and other European powers in World War Zero, the Napoleonic Wars, which lasted from 1803 to 1815 and took place all over Europe and across the globe as led by Napoleon I, who was attempting to expand his French empire over much of the surface world. Napoleon dreamed of a world-spanning French empire. This included Haiti and other territories in North America, including Louisiana. Originally, he had even at one time considered attacking the United States itself. But by 1803, with the European powers, well, the European wars not going the way he had hoped, he needed money. So when American representatives came calling, he agreed to give up Louisiana, all of it for an emergently contingent amount of money, in other words, at a bargain price. 
The United States paid a total of 68 million francs, 15 million United States dollars at the time, which averages to less than three cents per acre. The modern equivalent would be approximately 237 million United States dollars, or less than 42 cents an acre. The loss of Haiti contributed to the protection of America in three ways. Primarily, it convinced Napoleon himself to abandon his dream of an American empire. Secondarily, it made him desperate for money, making him sell the Louisiana Territory, basically all of what we consider the United States today, and abandon all claims thereunto, along any future plans of invading America, the original 13 states. Tertiarily, it gave hope to enemies of France everywhere. For a certain time, at the beginning of the Napoleonic Wars, France's Grand Armée of the Republic seemed unbeatable. But England and other countries, seeing the victory of the blacks over the French, were motivated to slowly turn the tide. The seemingly small victory of a half million slaves over the feared French soldiers in Haiti was an example of just how vulnerable French power really was to a determined, spirited, freedom-fighting force. Without either Louisiana or Haiti as a jumping-off point, a launch point for invasion, France would never again have the opportunity to attack the United States. And for this, America has to thank Toussaint Louverture and his determined fellow rebels of black Jacobinism, all too many of whom gave their very lives and their humanity in transformation into zombies in the name of freedom. For humanity everywhere. Put simply, committed as it was to exporting its blackified brand of radical egalitarianism, the African-American Republic of Haiti in the Western Hemisphere was perceived as the paracommunist Cuba of its day. Regardless, many former slaves lived to see their dream come true, even if many of them were no longer functionally human. Inexorably, by their efforts, many Americans of all colors live to see their dreams as well. Despite all this, once Haiti gained full independence, the U.S. government's policy towards Haiti cooled significantly. Thomas Jefferson, for example, believed that Haiti should be under French control and openly encouraged Napoleon to reconquer the island. Greater Britain had inevitably declared war on France that same 1,803rd year in the annals of human history, and would remain at war for over a decade. During this period of war, Napoleon and British leaders concentrated on European affairs, but the conflict spilled over into the Atlantic. The Napoleonic Wars continued the wars of the French Revolution. Great Britain and France fought for European supremacy and treated weaker powers heavy-handedly. The United States attempted to remain neutral during the Napoleonic conflict, but eventually became embroiled in the European conflicts, leading to the so-called War of 1812 against Great Britain, which be naught but the American front of what must eventually be renominated World War Zero. Direct operational command of the American war effort evolved in September of 1803 to a Captain Edward Preble, who immediately set about on the offensive. He scored a bloodless victory at Tangier by convincing the Sultan of Morocco that it would be to his benefit not to molest American shipping in the future. Preble accomplished this feat by sailing the Constitution, a name of a sh ship, into Tangier Harbor, opening up the gun ports, running out the cannon, and pointing them directly at the Sultan's palace. The Sultan hastened to agree, and to seal the bargain, supplied the crew of the ship with provisions. The glow of success was soon tarnished when news reached Preble of the capture of the frigate Philadelphia, 
The Philadelphia arrived on station in the Mediterranean ahead of the rest of the squadron. Its captain, William Bainbridge, unwisely set about trying to blockade Tripoli alone. On October 31st, Halloween, whilst pursuing a Corsair under full sail, Philadelphia grounded on a sandbar about two miles offshore. Despite five hours of desperate work by her crew, she stuck fast. With her broadsides tilted at crazy angles, her firing was harmless to the pirates' small craft that quickly swarmed about her. Bainbridge, after jettisoning his useless cannon and thinking the ship's carpenter had scuttled the ship, surrendered to prevent a massacre. 307 Americans were taken prisoner, put in chains, and forced into slavery in the building of Tripoli's fortifications to prevent the Americans from attacking them. Preble's hands were tied. Any action by the Americans might result in the Pasha mass-murdering Philadelphia's crewmen in reprisal. So Preble first offered 50000 U.S. dollars and then $100,000 for the release, but was scornfully refused. Whereupon Preble released his own Seahawk, Stephen Dacator. In December, young Lieutenant Dacator, captain of the Enterprise, had apprehended an enemy catch, a four-gun vessel of shallow draft, which could be rowed. Dacator planned to... Well, Dacator planned a raid to destroy the unlucky Philadelphia, whom the pirates had refloated and were rigging for action against the Americans. Dacator's plan called for the use of a native vessel, and the captured catch filled the bill. Decatur and his small crew, disguised as North Africans, sailed the Barbary catch into Tripoli Harbor on the night of February 15, 1804. This tiny craft bumped into the Philadelphia, and Decatur's boarding party flung grappling hooks to lash the rails together. Then, yelling and screaming, they leaped onto the deck of the frigate, as a pirate reported later, the Americans sent Dacator on a dark night with a band of Christian dogs, fierce and cruel as the tiger who killed our brothers and burnt our ships before our very eyes. Dacator's men welded American Indian tomahawks and killed 20 pirates in as many minutes, chasing the rest over the side where they leapt into the sea. Only one raider was injured before the Philadelphia was set afire in four places. Then the Americans withdrew. Dacator's luck held in the even more perilous escape from the harbor. The Pasha's artillery thundered wildly after the brazen Americans, but the little catch, scarcely scratched, was rowed through the storm of cannonade to rejoin the American squadron. When the British Admiral, Lord Nelson, who had defeated Napoleon at sea, heard of that raid, he called it the most bold and daring act of the age. Decatur, just 25 years old, won promotion to captain, then the highest rank in the Navy, mind you, and remains the youngest man ever to be so honored. Dacator's act, no matter how bold and daring, did not radically alter the situation strategically in the Mediterranean. Tripoli was defended by 25,000 soldiers and 115 cannon ashore, and 24 warships guarded their harbor. Against them, Preble could only pit 1,060 men aboard seven ships, of which only the Constitution was heavy-gunned. Without troops to storm the port, all that Preble and his men could do was to disrupt the Pasha's economy by not allowing the pirates to practice their trade and to keep the Pasha on the defensive. On August 3rd, Preble's squadron sailed into Tripoli Harbor to open bombardment of the city itself. The pirates were sheltered safe behind thick-walled defenses, some of which had been constructed by the Philadelphia's American crew under the whip of the lash. The bombardment caused little damage, but Preble was pleased by the, the behavior of his crews, 
who had taken on the pirates at their own game. The Corsairs were supposed to be invincible at hand-to-hand -hand fighting, but never again would they attempt this, their favorite method of attacking and boarding on any American ship. The fat ducks had turned into fierce seahawks. The American sailors, led by men like John Tripp, outnumbered three to one, still killed 21 of the pirates, and captured 15 of them in one engagement alone. Tripp himself took 11 injuries from a Turkish captain before ending the combat with a pike thrust. Three Triplaten gunboats were captured and one was sunk, and only one American had died. Decatur's younger brother, James, had been treacherously murdered by the captain of a pirate ship after its surrender. Stephen Decatur avenged his brother by killing the murderer in a savage man-to-man -man encounter, a hand-to-hand -hand combat before witnesses, and he killed him with his bare hands. Preble returned five times to harass and bombard Tripoli, but without troops to effect a landing, they were basically ineffectual. His tour of duty over, Preble returned home in modest triumph to be commanded by the president, commended by him, in the reception of a gold medal from Congress, only to die of tuberculosis the year thereafter. Pope Pius said that under Preble's orders, Americans had done more for the cause of Christianity than the most powerful nations of Christendom had done for ages. Now, of course, in terms of uh, Pope um, Pius, he was the seventh by that name. That was Pope Pius the seventh. Now, back in the hemisphere of the Americas, Toussaint Louverture's successor general, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, Dessalines, had declared the creation of the Republic of Haiti on the first day in January, New Year's Day of 1804. This was the first black republic. It is a state in which supreme power is held by the people and their elected representatives, and which has an elected or nominated president rather than a monarch. The first black republic anywhere in the world. The key word here being republic, because independent black majority states already existed in Africa long before Haiti, but these states were largely unrecognized by the white European and American worlds. After Haiti declared its independence that year, President Jefferson was deeply troubled and suspended all diplomatic and commercial relations with the former colony. By such a conspicuous showing of solidarity with universal white supremacy, the United States succeeded in remaining neutral between the warring European world powers from 1803 to 1806, but still suffered itself from impressment. It is British seizure of British-born naturalized U.S. citizens into the British Navy. President Thomas Jefferson sent William Pinckney and James Monroe to negotiate a treaty that would halt the impressment of American sailors, but when the signed treaty came back without any British concessions on the impressment issue, Jefferson did not pass it on to the Senate for ratification. After seizing power, Napoleon Bonaparte went on to win a string of military victories in his position as French dictator that gave him control over most of Europe. He annexed present-day Belgium and Holland, along with large chunks of present-day Italy, Croatia, and Germany, and he set up dependencies in Switzerland, Poland, and various German states. Spain was largely under his hegemony, despite continuing guerrilla warfare there, and Austria, Prussia, and Russia had been browbeaten into becoming allies. Only Great Britain remained completely out of his grasp. Outside his dictatorial regime. In 1806, Napoleon maneuvered to subdue the British with an embargo that became as known as the Continental System. Napoleon issued the Berlin Decree, which forbade trade with Britannia, and the British government responded the next year with orders in consul, 
which instituted a blockade of French-controlled Europe and authorized the British Navy to seize ships violating the blockade. Napoleon responded with further trade restrictions in the Milan Decree of 1807. U.S. relations with Great Britain became increasingly rocky during this period. On June 22, 1807, the HMS, or His Majesty's Ship Leopard, bombarded and forcibly boarded the USS, or the United States ship, Chesapeake, off Norfolk, Virginia, in search of British Navy deserters. President Jefferson responded with an embargo on all foreign trade in an effort to weaken the British economy. The embargo was extremely unpopular in New England, where the economy was heavily dependent on trade with Britannia. Moreover, the British economy, being global, was not strongly affected by the embargo from the former colonies, which proved difficult to enforce at any rate. Come 1807, ongoing tensions between the French and Russian empires were exacerbated by Napoleon's formation of the Duchy of Warsaw, Down to the present day, the love affair between the French and Polish peoples had been pretty permanent. Well, it's been pretty permanent ever after. However, even though Napoleon created that state from Prussian, not Russian lands, Tsar Alexander I of Russia was concerned that it would incite a hostile Polish nationalism, thereafter rebuffing Napoleon's attempt to marry one of his sisters. In early 1809, in one of his final acts as president, Jefferson replaced the Gallic anti-Anglian embargo with the Non-Intercourse Act, which allowed trade with other nations except Britain and France. But this act proved, well, it proved as virtually impossible to enforce as its French-imposed precursor. Jefferson's successor, President James Madison, confronted a dilemma. To continue with the ineffective Non-Intercourse Act, which was effectively to submit to British terms of trade since the British Navy controlled the Atlantic, Madison was assisted by the passage in 1810 of Nathaniel Macon's Bill No. 2, which offered Britain and France the option of ceasing their seizure of U.S. merchant ships in return for U.S. participation in their trade bloc. Napoleon was the first to offer concessions, which Madison publicly accepted at face value, despite his private skepticism, In doing so, Madison pushed these United States closer to war with Britannia by his entering French Axis. By the end of 1810, Tsar Alexander of all the Russias had ceased complying with the continental system of sanctions against Britannia due to its deleterious effect on Russian trade and the value of the ruble, going so far in his economic redress as to impose a heavy tax on French luxury products like lace. Napoleon, who had considered Russia a natural ally since it had no territorial conflicts with France, now inexorably mobilized to ultimately subordinate Alexander. During this period, Madison confronted America's own challenges in addressing a problem created by Secretary of State Robert Smith, who had personally stated to the British minister his pro-British sympathies. When Madison confronted Smith and offered him a graceful departure as U.S. minister to Russia, Smith appeared to accept his offer and then leaked cabinet papers as part of a smear campaign against his own president, President Madison. U.S. diplomat Joel Barlow published a reply and swung public opinion against Smith, who resigned on All Fool's Day, as dated the 1st of April, in the 1811th year of our Lord. Moreover, in the fall of 1807, Algiers detained three American vessels. Freedom was bought for the ships and crew for a mere $18,000, but it signaled the resumption of two bad habits, pirate terrorism and tribute. The renewal of these would last for many years and cause the American Navy to once again sail against Barbary. This while relations with the greater British Empire continued to deteriorate. A U.S. Navy ship mistook a much smaller British ship, the HMS Little Belt, for a British Navy ship that had impressed American sailors, and fired upon it. Consequently, Thomas Foster, British minister to these United States, stated that Britain 
would not offer any compensation for the 1807 Chesapeake incident. Hmm. Foster also informed Madison that the British government would not revoke the orders in consul. By the spring of 1812, Madison had decided upon war with Great Britain, although he had also considered declaring war on France as well. Congress passed a declaration of war on June 17th, which Madison signed the next day. With the Americans now securing his Atlantic front by their attacking the greater British Empire in North America, the French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte advantageously raised a massive army of troops from all over Europe, the first of which entered Russia on the 24th day in June. My father Hitler's invasion of Russia would be modeled upon this, with a multinational coalition invasion of the Soviet Union, because Napoleon Bonaparte's was the most diverse European army since the Crusades. Estimates vary, but experts believe that at least 450,000 Grand Armée soldiers, and perhaps as many as 650,000, ended up crossing the Niemen River to fight approximately 200,000 soldiers on the Russian side. By comparison, George Washington's army during the American Revolution rarely numbered more than 10,000 or 15,000 men. Napoleon's objective was to win quick victory that forced Tsar Alexander to the negotiating table. The Russians pulled back, however, and let the Grand Armée capture the city of Vilna on June 27th with barely a fight. In an ominous sign of things to come, an electrical storm pouring down freezing rain, hail, and sleet killed a number of troops and horses that very night. To make matters worse, Grand Armée soldiers were already deserting in search of food and plunder. Nonetheless, Napoleon remained confident, purportedly declaring unto his top military advisers that, I have come once and for all to finish off these barbarians of the north. The sword is now drawn. They must be pushed back into their ice, so that for the next quarter of a hundred years, they no longer come to busy themselves with the affairs of civilized Europe. In late July, the Russians similarly abandoned Vitebsk, setting fire to military stores and a bridge on their way out. Then in mid-August, they retreated from Smolensk and torched that city too. Many peasants, meanwhile, burned their crops to prevent them from falling into French hands. David A. Bell, a history professor at Princeton University and the author of the work entitled The World's First Total War, Napoleon's Europe and the Birth of Warfare as We Know It, is quoted as saying, Charles tried it. Napoleon tried it. Hitler tried it. He's referring, of course, to the King of Sweden, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte of the French, and Adolf Hitler of Großdeutschland, or Greater Germany. And he's saying, of course, they all failed uh, to take Russia. Uh, of course, when he's referring to the king of Sweden, that would be the 12th king in the Charles line. Charles the 12th tried it. Napoleon tried it. Hitler tried it. It never seems to work out invading Russia. Certainly, the scorched earth tactics were incredibly important in denying the French army sustenance. Let me tell you something. To these white boys, only white men count when it comes to trying to take Moscow. Well, the Mongols took Moscow. They took it from behind. In other words, they came from the east. Russian historians have traditionally treated their Alden enemy, the Mongol Empire, as an unmitigated catastrophe. The first wave of Mongol invaders smashed the European-like Kievan Rus state in present-day Ukraine, sending the survivors fleeing into the northern forests, where they congregated around small statelets like Moscow, that was the birth of the Russian capital. It took the Russians 200 years of hard struggle to unite themselves and throw off what they still refer to as the Mongol yoke. To this day, Russian school children learn that the Mongol occupiers, known as the Golden Horde, brought nothing but pain, devastation, and humiliating uh, subjugation. Well, sure, they brought all that. 
but they also brought the Russians civilization, which the Russians never had before. In the south of Brietia, near the present-day border with Mongolia, there is a mountain-sized rock outcropping known locally as the Murket Fortress, which looks out over the arid rolling steppe that gradually fades into the Gobi Desert a few hundred miles away. According to legend, this formidable natural fortification was stormed more than 800 years ago by the forces of a young Mongol warlord who claimed his bride had been stolen by the Murkit tribe and which had made its own base there. He seized the rock and went on to unite most of the nomadic Mongol tribes of Northeast Asia, including the ancestors of today's Bryats, of that particular uh, autonomous republic within the Russian Federation. It's actually part of Mongolia, divided between Russia and China. Taking the name of Genghis Khan, which means universal ruler, he flung his uh, vast army of highly disciplined horse-mounted shock troops to the south and west, conquering China, most of Central Asia, all the Middle East, present-day Russia, and parts of Eastern Europe. At its peak, the Mongol Empire was the largest continuous, contiguous land empire in all history. And it left its imprint everywhere. For the West, its impact was mainly positive because the Mongols secured land passage to China. The fabled Silk Road enabled travelers like Marco Polo to bring home Eastern wonders such as spices, silk, and gunpowder, the compass from which... The Age of Discovery was born because Europeans could finally navigate the way the ancient Vikings had. And the printing press, which was industrialized by the German Gutenberg. All of this, the Mongols enabling the Europeans to reach China, birthed the Renaissance. In fact, the historical reality is that the Mongol occupation was the impetus that shaped the enduring Russian state with its highly centralized form of government dependent on an indisputable leader, its constant military-led expansionism, and its collective forms of social organization. Indeed, the Mongol invasion was the very reason Russia formed. It is wrong to think that Mongol Tatars invaded Russia as a single state because the state actually formed as a response to the invasion to resist and overthrow it. It was Peter the Great, who formally ended Russia's tributes to the Khans. Kinyaz Yaroslav II of Vladimir was poisoned by Guya Khan's wife. At the age of 67, Kinyaz Mikhail of Chernigov was executed in the capital of the Golden Horde, the Mongol Khaganate, for refusing to worship the Mongolian idols. Kinyaz Mikhail of Tver had his heart ripped out in that same capital. All the chronicles record. The Russian population was forced to pay substantial tributes, and Russian princes were only allowed to rule their duchies by the permission of the Khan of the Golden Horde. That's how it was under the Mongol rule, or as we call it in the Russian, the Tatar Mongol ego, the yoke. It may be hard to believe that events such as these were instrumental in the formation of the Russian state. But it was opposition to these actions that united the Russian princess, unfortunately, not with friendship, but under the iron fist of the strongest among them. The great Russian historian Nikolai Karamzin, who lived from 1766 to 1826, so wrote, Moscow owes its greatness solely to the Khans. At the time of the Mongol invasion of Rus, the Mongols were advanced both in the military and in systems of governance. Only unity could help the Russians to ever overthrow Mongol rule. It all started when Genghis Khan, who lived from 1155 to 1227, the founder of the Mongol Empire, sent his son Jochi, who lived from 1182 to 1227, dying the same year as his father, to conquer the lands of what is now Siberia, Central Russia, or the Taiga and Eastern Europe. Giant armies of Mongol warriors, clearly over a hundred thousand, an enormous number in the 13th century, so massive as to turn the course of rivers that their horses stampeded over. 
easily defeated the weak and ill-numbered forces of the Russian princes who were at war with each other before the invasion. In 1237, the Mongols, led by Batu Khan, invaded Rus. They took, ravaged, and burned Ryazan, Kolomna, Moscow, Vladimir, Tver, all the main Russian cities. The invasion continued until 1242 and was a terrible blow for the Russian lands. It took almost a hundred years to fully recover from the damage the Mongol army did. Also, the lands and cities of the south, Kiev, Chernogov, Halik, were burned to the ground. The northeastern lands, most notably Tver, Moscow, Vladimir, and Suzdal, or Shazdal, became the main cities after the invasion. However, the Mongols didn't want to conquer the land completely. They just wanted stable tributes. This was the world's first forced welfare program. And they knew how to get what they wanted. In 1243, Yaroslav II of Vladimir, who lived from 1191 to 1246, was the first Russian prince to receive permission to rule. He was summoned to Batu Khan, swore his allegiance unto he, and was named the biggest Kinyaz of all the Russians. The ceremony of swearing allegiance to Mongols was very similar to the French ceremony of homage, where the liege kneeled on one knee at the feet of his seated sovereign. But in the horde's capital, Sare, Russian princes were sometimes forced to walk on their knees to the Khan's throne and overall treated like inferiors. It was this same Yaroslav II, by the way, who received the first Jarek and was later poisoned. Jarek! A shout out. An announcement in the ancient Mongol language was how Mongols called diplomatic credentials. Protective charters they wrote and handed over to the Russian princes and priests. The important part of the Mongols' policy was that they were, well, they protected the Russian Orthodox Christian churches, never ravaged them, and they kept the clergy safe. For protection, the church was obliged to preach allegiance to the Mongol Tatars, to their parishioners. The tributes were controlled and collected at first by the Baskaks, the Mongol taxmen, who lived in Russian cities with their suite and security guards. To collect the tributes, the Mongols performed a census of the population of the subdued duchies. The tributes went to the Mongol Empire, and after 1266, when the Tatar-Mongol state of Golden Horde divided itself from the Mongols, tributes went to the Gordon Ho well, the Golden Horde's capital of Sare. Later, after multiple local revolts and following the Russian princes, please, the tribute collection was handed over to the princes themselves. Otherwise, the Russians were left to live their lives. Indeed, the Russians used the Mongols to their benefit. There was never any constant military presence of the Mongols, but if the Russians revolted against their rule, they could send armies. Moreover, the cunning and politically sophisticated Mongol Khans manipulated white Russians, incited hatred and wars among them to better control the weak, divided Slavic states. Soon, the princess learned this tactic and started applying it against their Mongol rulers. For a century, there were innumerable military campaigns between Mongols and Russians. In 1328, Tver Duchy revolted against the Mongols, killing the Uzbek Khan's cousin. Tver was burned and destroyed by the Horde, and Moscow and Shozdal princess helped the Mongols. In a war between the duchies, the Moscow princes understood that somebody has to take a lead against the Mongols by subduing others to his rule. After Dver's demise, Ivan I, Kalita of Moscow, became the first prince to collect tributes from the Russian lands instead of the Bazkaks. That's what he got for helping the Mongols to murder his compatriots, and at the same time, his enemies. However, this helped bring the famous 40-year peace, when Mongols didn't attack the lands of Moscow, but ravaged other duchies. Meanwhile, Moscow used the defeats of the other princes for their own means. Russians also quickly learned from the Mongols how to use written contracts, sign acts, enact laws, 
Russians used the system of yams, road stations, employed first by Genghis Khan for multiple purposes, shelter for travelers, places to hold spare horses for army messengers, and so on. The system was installed in the Russian lands by the Mongols for their purposes, but eventually started being used by Russians for their own good to connect their lands. What Moscow princes learned from the ruthless Mongols was that you either kill your enemy or disable him so he can never take revenge. Simultaneously with the strengthening of Moscow princes, the Golden Horde fell into political crisis. In 1378, Dmitry of Moscow, known as Donskoy, who lived from 1350 to 1389, for the first time in a long while, crushed one of the Horde's armies. In 1380, Dmitry Donskoy, who had earlier stopped paying tributes to the Horde, defeated the 110,000-strong army of Khan Mame in the Battle of Kulikovo, a great moment of high spirits for all the Russian lands. However, in 1382, Moscow was burned by Tokhtamish, a Khan of another part of the dismantled horde. For the next hundred years or so, Russian lands on and off paid tributes to different Khans of the horde. But in 1472, Ivan the Great of Moscow, who lived from 1440 to 1505, refused again to pay tributes to the Tatar Mongols. This time, the Great Duchy of Moscow was really great. Ivan and his father, Vasily II, known as Vasily the Blind, had collected lands and princes and subdued them to Moscow. Ahmed bin Kuchok, Khan of the Golden Horde, tried to wage war against Ivan, but after the famous standoff at the Ugra River in 1480, he returned home. This battle marked the end of the Mongol rule and control, but not the tributes. Russia continued sending money and valuable goods to different parts of the horde just to make peace with militant Tatars. This was called Puminki. Appropriately, it translates as memorables in the Russian. So Russia paid Puminki to different former (laughs) horde dynasties until 1685, formerly These tributes were banned by Peter the Great only in 1700. According to the Treaty of Constantinople between the Russian Tsardom and the Ottoman Empire of the Turks, who ran the Islamic State. The Khan of Crimea, one of the last of the Khans at the time, and the Ottoman Empire's vassal, was also the last to whom Russia paid tribute. The treaty said, Because the state of Moscow is autonomous and free, the tribute that annually was given to the Crimean Khans until now, henceforward, shall not be given from his holy greatness of the Tsar of Moscow, nor from his descendants. It is very symbolic that Peter the last great Tsar of Moscow and the future first emperor of Russia, signed this treaty in 1700, the first year that began in Russia, not from the 1st of September, like in ancient Russia, but from January the 1st, just like in Europe. These were the heirs of the empire. Ultimately, Russia and modern China are both products of centuries of Mongol rule which took them in very different directions from Western development. In their 20th century efforts to modernize, both adopted forms of communism that might not be recognizable to Karl Marx, but would probably get a nod of approval from Genghis Khan. Despite the demise of communist ideology in the past quarter century and the wholesale adoption of capitalism by both Russia and Red China, Geopolitical tensions with the West have never gone away and, indeed, are even intensifying. But the Buryat scholars of Russified Mongolia say they can understand why this is happening. Since the collapse of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, Russia has embraced Western economic methods and also many other values, including a statement 
well, a stated commitment to build democracy, but it remains founded upon a political system that Western critics now call autocracy. In the same tone of voice, we used to say communism. Those differences are not imaginary. Red China recently amended its constitution to allow the dictatorial Xi Jinping to remain president for life. Mr. Putin, recently elected to his fourth official term in the Kremlin, claims to be under quite a bit of pressure from below to do something similar. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. That... I'm not even going to dignify that further. The Mongol influence is particularly resonant in Buryatia itself. Buryats are descendants of Genghis Khan's hordes who developed a separate identity after the Russian Empire conquered that territory and drew a border between them and the rest of Mongolia in the 17th century. Their lands were conquered by Russian Cossacks, the militarized colonists who spearheaded Tsarist expansion and was later settled by old believers, religious dissidents exiled from European Russia in the 18th century. Unlike American settlers who pushed westward across North America, the Russians tended to coexist with the native peoples they conquered, often intermarrying with them. Early Russian settlers to Buryatia brought agriculture to the river valleys and developed an economic symbiosis with the cattle-breeding nomadic Buryat tribes around them. That doesn't mean it was always peaceful. Alexei Gitabov, the author of several books about Genghis Khan and Buryat history, concludes that, to quote as he, I'll read from his Russian book here, Putin is a Khan. You heard me right. He wrote this in Russian, in a book published in Russia. He says, Putin, Vladimir Putin, is a Khan. Not, he's, he's a Khan as well as in C-O-N, yeah. But he's also a Khan as in K-H-A-N. You know, like Wrath of Khan for you Americans who are e-history, historically illiterate. Anyhow, reading therefrom, Putin is a Khan. What he says is done. This is in the Mongolian tradition, and it's not a European one at all. What I say must be controversial in Moscow, but we can see that quite clearly. We were taught in Soviet school that we joined Russia voluntarily. But in the 1990s, when we had more freedom, we were able to study more widely. We learned that Russia conquered the Buryats in a decades-long war, so Russian education lied to us. Oh, imagine that. <laughs> On the other hand, all the civilization we have is due to Russia, and the Russian language is our window on the world, so we have this strange ambivalence. But it does help to explain why you don't find any aggressive Buryat nationalism here. Well, at some point, hopefully, they'll be reunited with the Mongols. The growing controversy about Genghis Khan and the Mongol heritage in Russia is equally vexed. Scholars concur that the Mongol influence is still visible in Russian political culture and military organization, and also in the Russian language itself, though not many Russian words can be traced to the Mongol and Turkic tribes who made up the Golden Horde, those that do relate to administration, trade, and military organization. In other words, everything that fucking matters in Russia. They include the Russian words for money, horse, customs, tea, and treasury. Nikolai Kredin, acting director of the Institute of History, Archaeology, and Ethnography of the Far East, which is part of the Russian Academy of Sciences, has articulated that many historians now believe the technological, military, and political transformations Russia underwent in the 16th century, which put it on the path to becoming a global power, can only be traced to its two-century-long immersion in the Mongol Empire. To quote his T, in Soviet times, any mention of Genghis Khan was forbidden, even in Mongolia, then a Soviet satellite state, itself. Today, Mongolia is independent and Genghis Khan is their national hero. In Buryatia, it's a topic of discussion and even among Russian historians, new interpretations are gradually being considered. We're coming to a more complex view of the Mongol conquest and its historical ramifications. Yes, they overran and destroyed civilizations. They were ruthless, but they integrated Russia into a vast empire. Now, Timur Dugarjapov, the editor of Novaya Buryatia, or New Buryatia, an independent political journal, concludes that, and here I will quote his tea at length and verbatim, again translating for you from the Russian, Russia and China were both part of the great Mongol Empire, 
And we see the persistence of Mongol influence on the Russian state, military, and political culture to this day. When Vladimir Putin and Chinese leaders meet today and find common geopolitical language, and China talks of using its economic might to reestablish the old Silk Road, they are reaching back to that historical experience. It was totally different from the Western one, and it created societies that are very unlike the West, right down to our political DNA. Genghis Khan was always a folk hero here among the Buryat people. But in Buryatia, even today, children learn the same history that's taught in all Russian schools. I used to be a history teacher myself, and I would regale my pupils with tales of how terrible the Mongol yoke was, and how it set Russia back, and was responsible for all sorts of historic ills. Now we can explore the new view, new for us, of reality. Russia today is a greatly modernized place, and it has adapted a great deal from the West. You can't say that Russia is just the product of its Mongol heritage, because that's just one among many influences. Here in Buryatia, we don't see any future separate from Russia, but we do understand that we have a somewhat different identity. We all speak Russian, but we have our own language, culture, and history. Tradition is very much in demand among young Buryats these days. And it all leads back to Genghis Khan, meaning Buryatia, of course, will ultimately lead back to Mongolia. Regardless, by time of Napoleon's World War Zero, the summer heat had become as oppressive as the scorched earth tactics of the Slavic enemy, and the Grand Armée soldiers were coming down with insect-borne diseases such as typhus and water-related diseases like dysentery. Thousands of men died while fighting at Smolensk and elsewhere. But the Russians did not truly make a stand until the September 7th Battle of Borodino, wherein a fellow Georgian, the same ethnicity or nationality as Joseph Stalin, would die as a general fighting Napoleon on the field of battle which took place just 75 miles from Moscow. That day, the French and Russians pounded each other with artillery and launched a number of charges and countercharges. Roughly three cannon booms and seven musket shots rang out each and every second. The losses on both sides were enormous, with total casualties of at least 70,000 men. Rather than continue with the second day of fighting, the Russians withdrew and left the road to Moscow open. On September 14th, Le Grand Armée entered the ancient capital of Moscow, only to see it, too, become engulfed in flames. Most residents had already escaped the city, leaving behind vast quantities of hard liquor, but little food. And of course, for the Russians, it's kind of synonymous there with their liquid diet of alcohol. French troops drank and pillaged while Napoleon waited for Alexander to sue for peace. But no offer ever came. With snow flurries having already fallen, Napoleon led his army out of Moscow on October 19th, the, my birthday eve day, realizing that it could not survive the winter there. By this time, Napoleon was down to some 100,000 troops, the rest having died, deserted, or been critically injured, captured, or left along the supply line. Originally, he planned a southerly retreat, but his troops were forced back to the road they took in after the replenished Russian army engaged them at Melo Yaroslavets. All forage along that route had already been consumed, and when the army arrived at Smolensk, it found that stragglers had eaten the food left there. Horses were dying in droves, and Le Grand Armée's flanks and rear guard faced constant attacks. To top it all off, an unusually early winter set in, complete with high winds, sub-zero temperatures, and lots of snow. On particularly bad nights, thousands of men and horses succumbed to exposure. Stories abound of soldiers splitting open dead animals and crawling inside for warmth or stacking dead bodies in windows for insulation. Things got very bad very quickly. 
it was constant attrition. In late November, La Grande Armée narrowly escaped complete annihilation when it crossed the frigid Beregina River, but it had to leave behind thousands of injured. From then on, it was almost every man for himself. On December 5th, Napoleon left the army under the command of Joachim Murat and sped towards Paris amid rumors of a coup attempt in his absence. Nine days later, what little remained of Le Grand Armée's rear guard stumbled back across the Niemen River. Emboldened by the defeat, Austria, Prussia, and Sweden rejoined Russia and Great Britain in the fight against Napoleon. Although the French emperor was able to raise another massive army, this time it was short on both cavalry and experience. Napoleon won some initial victories against his enemies, but he suffered a crushing defeat in October 1813 at the Battle of Leipzig. By the following March, Paris had been captured and Napoleon was forced into exile on the island of Elba, even as freed black Africans burned the White House of his American allies. The war with England during 1812 through 1814 pushed the piratical Barbary terror network into the back of American concerns. In any event, retaliation against the Corsairs would have been impossible, for after 1812, the American Navy was swept from the seas by the British Empire. As soon as the American Navy was no longer a threat, the Day of Algiers announced a policy to increase the number of my American slaves, whereupon he captured the brig Edwin and its crew in August of 1812. The situation lasted until the end of the war with England. Donald Trump unjustly made headlines via ridicule, ridicule yet again, back in 2018 for what was misconstrued as his ignorance when he rightly recalled Canada as the culprit in the burning of the White House during the War of 1812, probably from listening to Douglas Dietrich, an accurate historical insight mistakenly mocked because most school children are mistaught in America that the British torched the White House during the attack on Washington, D.C. What they are never taught is that the president's residence was built mostly by slave labor. Nor are they ever taught that its destruction was carried out by freed slaves, known as the British Colonial Marines. On August 24th, in 1814, Admiral Sir George Cockburn of the Royal Navy and commander of the raid upon Washington entered the abandoned White House, accompanied by a few of his officers and a squad of black colonial marines. The occupiers ate the meal that Dolly Madison, the woman who had sewed the first American flag, had ordered laid out in the dining room in anticipation of her husband, James Madison's triumphant return after what she thought would be his defeating the British at Bladensburg, which lay on the city's outskirts. After their repast, the British forces piled furniture in one of the rooms and lit a fire that destroyed the executive mansion. American history books never tell us that the colonial marines who set fire to the White House were, each and every one down to the last man, all runaway slaves who Cockburn had personally trained to be soldiers. This account was written in July 2017 by Andrew Cockburn, an Irish-born journalist who is the Washington editor of Harper's Magazine and a relative of the 1814 emancipator, Admiral Sir George Cockburn, who has the family records to prove it. In May of 1814, Cockburn began spreading the word around the Chesapeake Bay region that any slaves who could make their way to a British ship or outpost would be freed to either fight under the British flag or be transported as free settlers to the British possessions in North America or the West Indies if they were too young, too old, 
or female, meaning if they were unqualified or unfit to fight. A training base was established for the able-bodied black men in the middle of the Chesapeake Bay on Tangier Island. And in late May, the Colonial Marines participated in a raid on Virginia's eastern shore where an American artillery battery was captured. By August, the former slaves had evolved into a well-disciplined fighting unit, and some accounts state that the Colonial Marines, black men in red coats, were in the vanguard of the British forces at the Battle of Bladensburg, where the Americans were rooted in defeat. Francis Scott Key witnessed the humiliating defeat of the American troops by black men at Bladensburg, which prompted him to express his hatred of black freemen in the third stanza of what was to become the American national anthem. No refuge could save the hireling and slave from the terror of flight or the gloom of the grave. He wished death on all the freed slaves who fought alongside the British for their own freedom. America was a country supported in large part by slave labor. Its president, James Madison, held African Americans in slavery for his own personal gain. The government, well, the governmental mansion, where he lived and worked, had been built with no concern for the misery of an enslaved people, so it made perfect sense for the colonial marines to burn down what they themselves had built. For there were men among them that had built the White House from its foundations, and they knew how to take it down. This was not the first time that enslaved Americans had struck a blow against their oppressors. In 1775, at the beginning of the Revolutionary War, the Royal Governor's Palace in Williamsburg, Virginia, fell into the hands of George Washington's forces. Thereafter, it was used by the Americans until it was burned to the ground soon after the battle at Yorktown in 1781. A contemporary account by a Charleston, South Carolina newspaper reported that the fire was started by some malicious person. But local accounts state that local slaves were hanged for the deed. The slaves hanged for destroying the governor's palace were not among the 6,500, the 6,500 enslaved Americans who were able to escape and fight against their oppression by joining the British military forces. That's an enormous army of black men at imperial disposal. In 1775, the royal governor of Virginia promised freedom to any slaves who took up arms against the rebellious white colonists. This led to the formation of the noted Ethiopian Regiment, as well as other African-American units fighting under the British flag. During the American Civil War between the states, it was reported that African-American Union soldiers under the command of General William A. Wilde raided and attempted to burn down the home of the slaveholder and former president of these United States, John Tyler. Many of the soldiers under Wilde's command had been enslaved in that region of Virginia where Tyler's plantation was located. The complete destruction of Tyler's home was prevented only after a Union naval officer intervened. None of these acts of destruction can possibly warrant condemnation given the context within which they all took place. All three structures were the result of the unjust enrichment of slaveholders through the evil of human bondage. All three attacks were during times of war, and the black African Americans were all fighting for a legitimate government, as well as against their own oppressors. Some white Americans experience a curious disconnect when it comes to balancing issues of loyalty against those of justice. They demand loyalty toward an unjust society encased in a national identity, even while that society literally murders those it requires to be loyal. 
This disconnect existed in centuries past, and it still exists today. Today, Colin Kaepernick and other black African-American athletes are expected to honor the flag as a sign of loyalty and respect to a nation that will not effectively prevent its law enforcement mechanism from harassing, humiliating, and even murdering people of color. We're dealing with that in the case of this morbid police woman. This police woman who killed Dante Wright. And I could go into detail of Dante Wright's last traffic stop. How seemingly minor traffic stops can turn into official murder. But what more do I need to say than the fact that the prosecution expert in the current trial testified on record that neither lethal force or even the taser that the cunt claimed she was reaching for were reasonable for Dante Wright's traffic stop. Kim Potter be the bitch's name. And we're faced today in her embodiment with what black men were fighting against when they burned the White House down. Just as Francis Scott Key wished death upon those black African Americans who stood up for their freedom and for their very lives, those Americans who today attack black African American athletes for their freedom and their lives have no sense of either history or justice. The Anglo-American conflict within World War Zero would continue into 1815, even though diplomats signed the Treaty of Ghent on December 23, 1814. Such continuity of conflict was prosecuted by the Americans in coordination with Napoleon Bonaparte himself making one more attempt to resume the mantle of continental power, but he was overcome at the Battle of Waterloo. On the second day in March of 1815, ten weeks after the end of the War of 1812, the United States formally declared hostilities against Algiers. Retribution, long delayed but richly deserved, was dispatched in the form of ten tall ships under the command of the Scourge of Barbary, Stephen Decatur himself. The punitive expedition arrived off Algiers in June. Decatur promptly shot up the flagship of the day's fleet, capturing it along with 486 prisoners, nearly half a thousand men. He then sent an ultimatum to the day, free every slave at once, pay an indemnity of $10,000 to the survivors of the Brig Edwin, and cease all demands for tribute forever. Numbed by Dacater's ferocity, the day whined that there had been a misunderstanding which he would like to correct with the amiable James Madison, the emperor of all the Americas. Tunis and Tripoli were next on Dacater's list. The day of Tunis groomed his beard with a diamond-encrusted comb and complained, Why do they send wild young men to treat for peace with the old powers? Still, he paid the Americans $46,000 to go away what would be billions of dollars today. In its turn, Tripoli felt Dacater's wrath, paying him $25,000 indemnity and freeing all its slaves. The old powers never again molested any American ships. Dacater's swift and firm action impelled the other European powers to follow the American example the degrading yoke of tribute, and the raiding of the Barbary Corsairs were over. 
America's involvement in the Tripolitan War suppressed pirate terrorism in the Mediterranean only after resolute action. It also saw the development of the U.S. Navy and Marine Corps with their proud traditions, and for the first time, America made its presence known not as a fat duck, but as an eagle in the world of the old empires. But we must turn towards how this connects with Nostradamus' predictions for the coming war in Europe and in France. Now, it's never been the Allies' finest hour. There was a strange victory of Operation Bigration, which was more important, D-Day or Operation Bigration, which you've never fucking heard of. You know what I'm going to tell you. Hitler's conquest of a defeated France in 1940 ranks as what the West considers one of the greatest military catastrophes of the 20th century. Certainly it was the most rapid and unexpected. Germany launched its Blitzkrieg offensive against the Low Countries on May 10, 1940, and within days its panzers had broken through French defenses in the Ardennes, which was the later source of the counteroffensive of the Battle of the Bulge I'll speak of in Arc of Narrative tonight. Barely seven weeks later, an exultant Hitler, visiting Paris for the first and only time in his life, posed like a tourist for cameras in front of the Eiffel Tower. And adding humiliation to injury, he forced France to sign a surrender on the same railway carriage at Compiègne, where Germany had capitulated 22 years before. By the way, it was also there that he had sex with a French prostitute and likely contracted syphilis, which may have affected him in later life. Now, Hitler's triumphant gamble in the West was a defining moment of the Second World War. Secure in victory, he began planning preemptive operations per Soviet aggression. France sought salvation in the Vichy regime in its first World War hero, Marshal Henry Philippe Pitain, and embarked on four dismal years of collaboration with Hitler's new order in Europe, an episode that still haunts its history. And in the finger-pointing that followed in occupied France, strident voices found deep and disturbing explanations for the deluge. Politicians assailed the military establishment for capitulating, generals berated the Third Republic, Vichyites denounced the left, while the left lambasted the bourgeois for preferring my father Hitler to social reform. Yet for all the clamor, one thing they shared was the belief that more was at stake than a simple military defeat. France had been rotten to the core, a sick and demoralized nation defeated before even it began. Historians later picked up the theme, paralyzed by a Defensive mentality, badly led, entrenched behind the Maginot Line, and overwhelmed by German strength, France had gone down like a lamb. Ernest R. May, a professor of history at Harvard, and the author of his work entitled Strange Victory, subtitled Hitler's Conquest of France, will have none of this. Panzerlike. He sweeps it all aside as myth. France and its allies, he proves, demonstrably, had more trained men, more guns, more and better tanks, and more bombers and fighters than did my father's Germany. The French military and political leaders, Generals Maurice Gimlin and Edouard Deladier were held in the highest regard of their professions. Neville Chamberlain, Britain's long maligned prime minister, was strong, not weak. The French went to war determined and confident. Hell, they initially invaded Germany. You can fucking look that up. France invaded Germany first in World War II. 
the book, uh, well, here, as in his title, the author Ernest May deliberately echoes the classic study of 1940 entitled Strange Defeat by the French historian Marc Bloch. That's why he called his work Strange Victory to counter the Marc Bloch myth. Even though Marc Bloch himself fought in the campaign and observed the gallantry of his fellow French soldiers and was later murdered by the Nazis for joining the resistance, if anyone feared the outcome of the battle, Ernest May proves it was Hitler's overcautious generals. Only my father had the balls. So what went wrong? For you Westerners, simply put, France misjudged German intentions. If the French had anticipated the Ardennes offensive, it is doubtful that they would have been defeated when and as they were. The whole affair, as Ernest May conclusively has proven, is a classic case of intelligence surprise. Two models exist for comparison, both from World War II. In the first, Hitler's sudden invasion of the Soviet Union in June of 1941 signals that any reasonable person would have taken seriously were ignored by Stalin, who was convinced they were all planted by British intelligence. In the second, the surprise attack by the Luftwaffe on the Italian port city of Bari revealed an Allied secret that almost changed the course of the war in Europe and remained top secret until 1959. On the evening of December 2nd, 1943, just after 7 p.m., a formation of 105 German Ju-88 twin-engine bombers was making last-minute adjustments in preparation for their surprise attack. The attack was to be on the Italian harbor of Bari, now full of Allied vessels that had been scouted earlier in the day. As they neared their final vector, much to their delight, the harbor was completely illuminated with spotlights shining on the unloading cargo ships. While some of the planes split off to drop duple or chaff, which is a radar uh, glitter to fuck up your radar systems, and flares to light up the night, others lined up targeting the ships along the breakwater and dock area. Over 30 Allied ships were sitting dockside without benefit of significant naval or land-based anti-aircraft support. In other words, they were... Sitting fat ducks! Bari itself is an ancient seaside town on the Adriatic Sea, settled first by the Greeks and later the Romans, which then grew to be a major seaport of strategic significance. Sitting in the center square is the Basilica di San Nicola, a major site of pilgrimage in the Middle Ages, housing the remains of St. Nicholas. The seaport was taken peacefully by British troops on September 11th, 1943 in alignment with the terms of the Italian armistice of Casabile. As a result, both the harbor and the old town escaped damage. It became a major offloading point of, for cargo to support the half a million Allied troops, including the British Eighth Army, as they battled German troops in the region of Monte Cassino, about 150 miles north. An agreement between Roosevelt and Churchill made this region of southern Italy the responsibility of the British. After taking over the port peacefully and being subjected to an occasional overflight by German reconnaissance planes, it was generally accepted by the Allied commanders that Bari was secure and the Luftwaffe was spread too thin to effort any attack in area. On the first day of December, in 1943, General Jimmy Doolittle of Tokyo Raid fame took over command of the American 15th Bomber Group, setting up his headquarters in the harbor area. This allowed him to be in close proximity to the men and material that were flooding in to support efforts to get the U.S. air base at Foggia established. Now, Jimmy Doolittle who headed the do-nothing raid over Tokyo, was supposed to end the war in Europe by gas-bombing 
the cities of Dusseldorf and Cologne, which were to become the Hiroshima and Nagasaki of Europe, destroy the civilian populations of both and force my father Hitler to sue for peace. But on the second day after his arrival, his taking command of the American 15th Bomber Group, which was supposed to be the 509th of Europa. On that fateful day of December 2nd, the British Air Marshal, Sir Arthur Coningham, happened to hold a news conference with reporters making the declaration, I would regard it as a personal affront and insult if the Luftwaffe should attempt any significant action in my area. Oh, and you Americans always make fun of Herman Gehring for saying, oh, if the Allies bomb Germany, you can call me mayor. The installation at Bari was felt to be so secure that all harbor spotlights were turned on at dusk to facilitate the unloading of ships with desperately needed aviation fuel, tanks, jeeps, ambulances, portable bridges, and artillery ammunition. According to one captain, the ships were so densely packed that they often bumped into one another while waiting at anchor. Loaded with barrels of 100 octane aviation fuel and jeeps alongside multiple munitions vessels, the ships created a density of targets not lost on the Luftwaffe scout plane that circled overhead at midday. The British gunners below had become so accustomed to the high-level flights that on this impending day either ignored them or fired one or two rounds as warning shots. Oberleutnant Werner Hahn, the Luftwaffe officer who piloted the scout mission, reported his results and a quick plan was drawn up for what was to be the most successful Luftwaffe bombing mission of World War II. So successful that it prevented the Americans from deploying weapons of mass destruction that they believed would end the war. Assignments were made for the group to head to Bari at wave top height, skirting the waves to the point where water was on their windshields. Vector in from the west rather than the northern approach to avoid the Allied radar installations and further aid in the element of surprise. At approximately 7.21 p.m., the first bombs fell short of the harbor in the Old Town area. The bombers slowly corrected their aim and proceeded to walk bombs progressively towards the harbor front and the many ships in a deliberate manner. That means that they dropped the bombs so that they skipped upon the water like skimming stones and bounced towards the ships and the people on the docks. The effects were devastating. Over a thousand people and 28 ships were lost immediately in the lightning raid lasting just 20 minutes. As for the harbor, as soon as the first bombs fell, there was general pandemonium in the harbor area as dock workers, naval personnel, and civilians all ran for cover. Among the over 30 ships docked were five U.S. Liberty ships, including the SS John Harvey. The John Harvey was a U.S. Liberty ship built in Wilmington, North Carolina, and originally commissioned in December of 1942. It had safely made the voyage from Baltimore, Maryland, through a gauntlet of German U-boats, stopping in Oran, Algeria. On its way to Italy, it loaded 100 tons of additional cargo labeled on the manifest as HS. High Security the crew grew suspicious when a seven-man detail was tasked with managing the special cargo. In addition, an unusual inspection by the 7th Chemical Ordnance Company in Sicily was performed before departing to Bari. Despite the crew's apprehension, it's not clear whether the captain was ever fully made aware of the nature of his new cargo. 100 tons of M47A1 mustard gas, artillery shells, and bombs. As for the aftermath, two munition ships immediately exploded with towering sheets of flame shooting over a thousand feet high. Windows were broken from the blast over seven miles away. The ships loaded with the 100 octane aviation fuel caught fire and exploded, pouring their contents onto the harbor and turning it into a cauldron of burning fuel, oil, and flotsams that set the sea itself on fire. The main oil line to fuel ships in the harbor soon ruptured. 
Flames and thousands of gallons of additional oil poured into the water. Some of the survivors recall the water being about a foot thick with oil, burning gasoline and debris, and, of course, chemical weaponry. As ammunition continued to explode, efforts began to rescue those on the burning vessels. Sailors who survived the initial attack abandoned ship and jumped into the burning waters to escape being burned aboard from the frying pan into the fire. Unbeknownst to the sailors, rescuers, and harbor personnel, the cargo on the John Harvey had caught a flame. A huge plume of mustard gas descended on the harbor, mixing into the water and coating all the sailors with caustic chemical burning film. Because the gas was widely dispersed and the air was filled with vapors of burning oil, gasoline, and cordite, the military personnel never identified the faint garlic smell indicative of mustard gas. Hell, they thought all Italy smelled like garlic. The gas drifted into the waterfront and the old town area before the wind direction changed, sending the bulk of the gas out towards the sea. Hundreds of Italian civilians were exposed and began suffering symptoms immediately. They, of course, were left untreated and to die. The local military and civilian hospitals were soon overrun with patients suffering from breathing difficulties and complaining of burns upon their bodies. Sailors who arrived at the hospital not suffering from traumatic injuries were simply wrapped in blankets to keep them warm after their time in the water. Six hours after their exposure, many of the sailors started developing enormous blisters on their bodies along with breathing difficulties. Initially, the medical staff attributed the blistering to burns acquired while in the water. Surprisingly, the injured had had no initial signs of burns, only later developed large fluid-filled blisters that covered large segments of their bodies. Many of the injured complained of burning eyes and that became swollen shut after 24 hours. After the raid, a vessel exiting the harbor and heading to Toronto had their entire crew stricken blind with swollen eyes. They were so seriously affected they had to summon assistance from the harbor military to guide the ship into port because not a man aboard could see. In Bari, previously healthy sailors started dying unexpectedly from respiratory symptoms. By day two, the number of fatalities began to climb precipitously, and the medical staff were struggling to find answers. A few mentioned the possibility of gas exposure. The Allies immediately considered the possibility that German planes had dropped some chemical agent in the harbor. The senior staff suggested they get a consult with a chemical exposure expert to nail down the agent and source of the exposure, a call was placed at headquarters in Algeria. Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Alexander, a United States Marine Corps commissioned cardiologist and second generation physician, answered that call. Alexander graduated top of his class at Dartmouth before finishing medical school and clinical training at Columbia University in New York. Along with his traditional medical training, Dr. Alexander had extensive experience working at the Edgewood Arsenal, where the U.S. kept its store of poison gas and chemical agents. He participated in experiments with toxic agents to discover effective treatments, even receiving a patent for his gas mask design that was protective for soldiers that wore glasses as he himself did. Dr. Alexander became the director of the Chemical Warfare Service Medical Division and was assigned to accompany U.S. troops as they faced off with the Axis in the African and Italian campaigns. When Dr. Alexander arrived in Bari, he immediately went to the wards to personally inspect and interview those with injuries possibly related to poison exposure. After reviewing charts and patients, he constructed a diagram of ship locations and sailors with serious injuries related to toxic agent exposure. He differentiated the burns on the sailors who were immersed in the water as opposed to those in lifeboats. He also noted a faint familiar garlic smell reminiscent of mustard gas in the hospital wards. After summarizing his thoughts, he formed a strong impression that mustard gas had been the chemical agent. It was also apparent from reports that it didn't emanate from the bombers, but rather from a cargo ship in harbor. 
He immediately confronted senior leadership from the British Army to ask if any mustard gas was present. He was told unequivocally, no, not possible. Alexander himself had a top secret clearance, and as the infield commander of the CWS, the Chemical Warfare Service, knew the Allies were secretly stockpiling chemical agents in the Mediterranean theater. This was in anticipation of bringing the war to an end once they got within bomber range, where their bombers could comfortably and safely, that is with minimal fatalities on a two-way trip, bomb continental Europe with weapons of mass destruction and annihilate the urban populations of Germania. Although he himself doubted that it had been shipped to a port like Bauri and left unprotected because that would simply be insane, Alexander persisted in his investigation and quickly found the lunatics were running the asylum. After seeing 45 men die by day five, he again had the harbor water tested. Divers were sent to search debris at the bottom of the harbor for clues. It was then that the breakthrough discovery was made. A diver had retrieved a fragment of an M47A1 mustard shell, clearly indicating the origin of the gas had been a U.S. Liberty ship. Still, the British authorities resisted acknowledging the source of contamination. The failure of the authorities to clearly identify the contamination delayed any effective treatment. This cost the lives of many sailors and countless Italian civilians who remain uncounted to this day, who died, all of them, horrible deaths due to their exposure to mustard gas. By day nine, Alexander had had enough. He filed his report reversing the cases diagnosed as dermatitis of unknown origin to a new determination, mustard gas exposure. Then, of course, came cover-up. Alexander sent his report to the U.S. President, Franklin Roosevelt, and the British Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, as well as the Allied commander, Dwight David Eisenhower. Roosevelt and Eisenhower accepted the results. However, Churchill insisted, and Eisenhower agreed, to have all records suppressed and the report rated most secret. No news of the gas exposure was ever officially acknowledged or reported. In fact, the British went so far as to reclassify Alexander's diagnosis as burns from enemy action. No British or American sailors were ever informed of their diagnosis or ever received compensation for their injuries until an official inquiry was opened the year after I myself was born, circa 1967. The reasons the Allies wanted to suppress the news are self-evident. The use of gas in war is illegal by international law, which the Allies were willing to break to deploy weapons of mass destruction to force my father Adolf Hitler to sue for peace. Churchill and Eisenhower were preparing for the D-Day invasion in England, scheduled for the next six months. If news were to leak that the Allies had already brought chemical weapons into the European theater. What was to stop my father Adolf Hitler from deploying chemical weapons in Normandy? Because of Churchill's paranoiac fear of this possibility, even though my father Adolf Hitler said he would never deploy gas voluntarily, having himself been a victim and temporarily blinded therefrom, a blindness he was told would be permanent. When he opened his eyes, the first thing he saw in the hospital was the interior architecture, which had the ancient Hockenkreutz, the hooked cross of Constantine, upon the walls. He swore at that point unto God in heaven he would never be the first to deploy gas. Now the Allies had done it. 
and he was free to counter-strike. Because of Churchill's fear of this, he was most adamant in suppressing the incident at Paris. There were long-term consequences. Alexander left the service in 1945. His prior work in 1940 at the Edgewood Arsenal with mustard agent effects on white blood cell production formed some of the foundational elements of chemotherapy today. This would later give rise to the first chemotherapeutic agents to treat leukemia. Alexander's former director at Edgewood would take his research further by funding, uh, well, with funding by Sloan and Kettering of General Motors. They would establish the world-renowned Sloan Kettering Cancer Institute in New York in August of 1945. The science of chemotherapy to treat cancer was born out of this catastrophic defeat 6,000 miles away in Bari, Italy. If you have relations saved by chemotherapy, you can thank my father Adolf Hitler. Chemical weapons were not used in Europe by either the Allies or the Germans against each other in the theater of war. Germany stockpiled 22,000 tons of nerve gas and mustard for potential use during the war and used poison gas in the Konzitzlagen, rather the Totenslagen, the death camps, to kill millions. When questioned at the Nuremberg trials, Hermann Goering, the head of the Luftwaffe, made it clear that Germany did not restrain its use of chemical weapons against the invasion force for humanitarian reasons. He was telling interviewers that it was because the Germans had never developed a gas mask that a horse would tolerate. He stated that if Germany had used chemical weapons in Normandy, the Allies would respond in kind. This, of course, was Hermann Goering. And at that point, he was in the hands of the enemy. And he was telling them anything they wanted to hear. At the same time, what he said was completely true. Due to a shortage of fuel resulting from the Allied bombing campaign, the German army was reliant on cavalry, horses, as the primary mode of transportation to move men, material, and munitions, and would have been entirely paralyzed by the loss of their horse transport. However, if the Americans had attacked Dusseldorf and Cologne, civilian cities, and mass-murdered their populations with their weapons of mass destruction, no doubt Hitler would have struck back in kind against the closest Allied enemy, England, and gas would have blanketed London. In final thoughts, after the war, it was discovered the Germans had known the Allies were storing chemical weapons in Italy. In fact, they had hired an Italian frogman, an underwater demolitions team, Scuba Seal, in Bari, to retrieve a mustard shell casing as evidence in case the Allies claimed their attack in Bari had been responsible for the gas release, the German attack, from the air. The Germans knew all along what the Allies were planning to do. This was an intelligence failure of monumental proportions. Imagine if, well, let me give you an example. The USS Indianapolis, which delivered the atomic bomb that devastated Hiroshima, was sunk by the Japanese submarine force. After it delivered that bomb, resulting in its sailors, its crew, being subjected to the wildest and most mass of the largest shark-feeding frenzy in human history. This was described so compellingly in the movie Jaws that was seriously considered a sequel would have been made conveying the horrors of the Indianapolis. What if that Japanese submarine had sunk the Indian Indianapolis en route to Hiroshima and the bomb was never dropped and the men subjected to their feeding frenzy without, like the character said in the movie Jaws, 
but we delivered the bomb without having accomplished that. That's what happened to the Americans at Paris. That was the first pronounced intelligence failure, or rather, the second, after the Hitlerian invasion of the Soviet Union of 1941, which was the first intelligence failure of the communist allies that my father took advantage of. Now, put those in perspective, all the surprises my father Adolf Hitler was able to achieve, and you'll understand the surprise suffered in May 1940 by France and Britain, that best fits the Soviet invasion model. While there was plenty of noise, alibari, there were also many clear signals of Germany's plans for France. Astonishingly, Allied leaders continually discounted the idea that Germany's main thrust might come through the Ardennes, the forest which my father would later use to conduct the Battle of the Bulge. Now, the author may, that uh, I've been um, referring to in terms from his book on the... Uh, Battle of France. Ernest May. Remember the name because his book is recommended reading. <sighs> Understand that uh, he's the editor of a groundbreaking volume on intelligence gathering entitled Knowing One's Enemy. So what he has to say about Hitler's blitzing France is definitively conclusive. Sometimes the principal Allied leaders qualify his evidence with words from their own mouths, as when Daladier complains that the people want him to lead, or when Chamberlain predicts in the summer of 1939 that Hitler would be happy to compromise. By looking at the campaign from both the French and German perspectives, and by shining a spotlight on intelligence, Ernest May has written an irrefutable and indispensable account of the events of 1940. May also draws relevant lessons for the present. What can Americans learn from this disaster that might be of use in the dangerous and unstable post-Cold War world? Well, throwing more money at intelligence agencies is obviously not the answer. There is little doubt that French intelligence had excellent sources with a remarkable agent network, a sophisticated signals intelligence bureau, and superb photo reconnaissance. But there were two main problems. First, as May reminds us, intelligence assessments are almost always a social construction that is created for and colored by a particular agenda. French intelligence in the 1930s exaggerated German strength in order to boost the campaign for rearmament, a tactic that ultimately backfired by weakening French confidence. Second, unlike the Germans, the French failed to assimilate their intelligence with operational planning and thus willfully blinded themselves to much that was going on. Their principal intelligence officer, Lieutenant Colonel Maurice Henry Gauche, was an amiable but ponderous man who peered at the world through a pince-nez and had an extraordinary affection for a tame parrot. Such birds, of course, only mimic and never challenge their masters. Paradoxically, the Germans had weaker intelligence sources, but through the Führer Adolf Hitler, who had fought in France through World War I, and had indeed developed a physically intimate relationship with a young lady there seduced by his paintings, who would later give birth to his son, a son directly seated from his loins, unlike myself, 
he knew the French quite well. And therefore, under their Führer, the Germans didn't need an intelligence network. Their leaders simply had a better understanding of their opponents. General Kurt von Tippelskirch, head of German army intelligence, drew shrewdly on his own personal knowledge of the French to highlight their slarotic procedures. Conclusively, Hitler sized up the caliber of his opponents better than they did his. In the end, the decisive factor was imagination. My father had it. The Allies never did. Imagination, that powerful human tool so dismally neglected in our technocratic age. Because the Germans, under guidance of my biological sire, had the imagination to think differently and daringly about their offensive, they were in a better position to respond to French and British decisions and to take risks. So, the author of this monumental magnum opus that I so highly recommend, Ernest May, he uh, concludes his book, closes with the injunction of the regicidal, the king killer Oliver Cromwell, in 1650 to the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland in which that man said, I beseech you, in the bowels of Christ, think it possible you may be mistaken. That quotation should sit on the desk of every director of central intelligence. There'd be another book, but it's written in the French, although they are currently preparing an English version. It may have come out by now. La guerre civile en France de 1958 à 1962, subtitled Du coup d'état gaulliste à la fin de l'AOIS. Of course, that would be the civil war in France from 1958 to 1962, in the English subtitled Le coup d'état of the gaullistes uh, à la the well, basically, the finish of the uh, Fourth French Republic. The origins of the Fifth Republic of France, which is the current republic, are repressed. The 1968 revolts in France live in popular memory as that country's most significant political moment in the 20th century. I urge us all to turn our attention instead a decade earlier to 1958 and the fall of the Fourth Republic. The Fourth Republic's demise was a coup that allowed de Gaulle to seize power and crush his opposition. He was the Vladimir Putin of France. Uh, understanding the foundation of the Fifth Republic requires studying in depth the historiographical context of the role of the French military institution in the period from the end of the Second World War. Americans interpret the Algerian War in light of the counterinsurgency carried out by the U.S. Army in Afghanistan and Iraq. However, this renewal of research on the Algerian conflict was not accompanied by a comparable interest in the political crisis that it triggered in France itself. Yet a change of regime is no small thing. The most common image presented is one of a peaceful and pacified continent, even somewhat bored. The main themes discussed were those of economic growth and the idea of a conservative restoration after the shock of two world wars. However, for anyone interested in the French case, it is clear how far this narrative is from reality, despite the omnipresent notion of the Trente Glorieuses, the glorious three decades, or 30 years, proposed by Jean Fourier in the late 1970s. 
Le Trent Gloriosis. <laughs> Gloriosis was the 30 years from 1945 to 1975, uh, during which time we experienced the fall of Saigon and the impeachment of a president following the end of the Second World War in France. The name was first used by the French demographer Jean Furachte. Furachte coined the term in 1979 with the publication of his book Le Trent Glorious Death Will la Revolution Invisible de 1946 on 1975 or the glorious 30 years The Invisible Revolution from 1946 to 1975. For a start, it does not make much sense to talk about post-war France before 1962, the year before my sister was born, at the earliest, given that the country was at war almost continuously from 1939 until the Avion Agreements. I well remember the publication of a comprehensive book on contemporary Europe by the American historian James Sheehan entitled, Where Have All the Soldiers Gone? The title is a reference to the famous song recorded by uh, my other relation, if I am truly born of the man who raised myself, George Dietrich's lines, I would be related to Marlena Dietrich. And her famous song, Where Have All the Soldiers Gone? Among others, is the source of the title of his book. For me, it was clear that the soldiers had never really left, and that they continued to play a very important role in France as elsewhere. Speaking of historiography, there is also a more internal French dimension to these debates. Since the 1980s, a form of revisionism has imposed itself on discussion of the Fourth Republic. For a long time, this was perceived in Gaullist terms, an irreparably dysfunctional regime, subservient to foreign powers and unsuited to the needs of a modern and technical society. Then a completely different reading developed, insisting on the continuities between the Fourth Republic and what followed it. Uh, this is the argument recently made uh, by Herrick Chapman, who speaks of a long reconstruction spanning the entire period from the Liberation to the end of the Algerian War. Uh, his book is entitled France's Long Reconstruction and subtitled In Search of the Modern Republic, published by Cambridge in Massachusetts uh, by Harvard University Press, no less, in 2018. On many points, such as economic and social policy, the quest for a certain autonomy in foreign relations or projects of state reform, this perspective is rather convincing. However, if you follow it to its conclusion, the 1958 crisis becomes rather enigmatic. Chapman's excellent book mentions it only in passing, and the birth of the Fifth Republic, however turbulent, is seen merely as uh, the culmination of a process in gestation. While not entirely wrong, this view does not, in my view, adequately capture the exceptional nature of the circumstances that led to the emergence of the Fifth Republic of France. To speak more specifically about the 13th day in May, 1958, there is certainly a literature on the subject and historians who have worked on it, but I remember being struck by the Manichaean character of this historiography. On the one hand, there is an orthodox consensual narrative according to which, despite certain shady aspects and the existence of various plots in the spring of 1958, Charles de Gaulle was the savior of the Republican order. In this vein, I have in mind a very rich book by Odile Rudel, published in 1988 with the support of the foundation Charles de Gaulle, his estate, which seeks to associate de Gaulle with a line of democratic and liberal thinkers of the 19th century, entitled My 1958 de Gaulle et la République. Uh, published in Paris, uh, anyhow, uh, it, it's in English, that's May 1958, with a period rather than a colon preceding the subtitle, De Gaulle and the Republic. However, the overall view is somewhat distorted by this insistence on the most inflammatory aspects, thus attributing to the actors an inordinate power and foresight. It is interesting, in fact, to read those two historiographic opposites in combination. Both currents make a useful contribution to the understanding of this crisis, but they both tend, here I generalize, to accept at face value the interpretations, concepts, and problematics offered by contemporaries themselves. Was it a coup d'etat? 
a velvet coup d'etat, a transition, or a simple change of government. The Fourth Republic died. Should we speak of murder, suicide, or even euthanasia? You know, mercy killing. Focus on the army, an institution at the center of the 1958 crisis and whose modernization, conceived as a means of depoliticizing it, was a central preoccupation for the Gaulis regime in its early years. André Siegfried, a correspondent from Daisit, uh, the uh, spirit, uh, that's a German magazine, wrote that uh, the 13th day in May of 1958 was a successful February 6th, 1934. In other words, just as we have January 6th, the French have February 6th from 1934, the year after my father Hitler came to power only in France. The Veterans Riot on February 6th of 1934, well, in that uh, insurrection, Nationalist Leagues and the Great War veterans, the veterans of World War I, rioted in Paris. For the French extreme right, the 6th day of February of 1934, fascist insurrection in Paris was a turning point after which hundreds of thousands of French joined anti-democratic movements that would later become the middle class of Vichy France. Thus, what Germans call the Kampfbegriff, the controversial terms that fueled the debates in 1958, were very often analogies. Just think of the vocabulary that has come down to us. Public salvation, putsch, civil war, the symbol of the events of February 1934, which most of the actors of the time had experienced, is particularly evocative. They were in everyone's mind from the 13th day in May onwards of 1958. First of all, for the far-right militants who, like the young Jean-Marie Le Pen, marched down the champs to the place de la Concorde, where they were pushed back before heading for the Palais Bourbon. If comparisons with 1934 more or less spontaneously imposed themselves on all political forces, it was the Communist Party that made the most intensive and consistent use of them. The failed coup of the 6th day in February 1934 and the demonstration by the left which followed on the 12th day of February occupied a central place in the memory of the party. It was the great moment of fraternization between communists and socialists, opening the way to the Popular Front. It was on this basis that the PCF, positioned itself in the last two weeks of May 1958 in terms of both its leadership and in its propaganda. The watchword was Republican Defense in the face of the fascist threat as, well, in a concerted effort with the SFIO. These are just various French political parties I'm bringing up. the French acronyms. There's no point in my expressing them for you. In the name of the old anti-Bonapartist tradition and the anti-fascism of the interwar period, the failure of this strategy, with the refusal of Guy Mollet's party to accept it, was undoubtedly a major cause of the fall of the Fourth Republic. The episode also had repercussions on the PCF's line in the following years, given that the communist leaders had seen in de Gaulle, if not a fascist, at least some a kind of slope towards fascism, their capacity to interpret the new regime and the ups and downs of its Algerian policy remained rather limited. So, if the 13th day in May could be considered a successful 6th day of February, a Febu successful February 6th, what we would have experienced if the insurrectionists had conquered Washington and reinstalled Donald Trump, it is first of all because in 1958, the conjunction of virulent anti-communism and the international context of the Cold War ruled out any possibility of a common front of the left. The formula of André Siegfried, Dean of Sciences, Poe, father of electoral sociology and a racist, distinguished by Vichy, says nothing different. What Siegfried basically meant is that you don't defend the republic with the communists. At the same time, subsequent events clearly thwarted the hopes or fears of those who saw in May of 1958 a revenge for the disappointments of 1934. Once installed in Matignon, and then in the uh, Elysee, de Gaulle worked firmly to bring his more excitable supporters back in line, some of whom would later embark on the bloody adventure of the OAS, which, of course, were 
the people in Vought with remaining in Algeria and maintaining it as integral onto France. Southern France across the Mediterranean. De Gaulle was initially appointed prime minister by the National Assembly, then voted president under the new constitution he himself proposed. Uh, imagine me writing a constitution and making myself leader. Well, let's hope we get the chance. On this point, I would like to return briefly to the career of Armin Moller, the correspondent of Daisit. He was an inflammatory character, Swiss by origin. He supposedly tried to join the Waffen-SS, the weaponized Schutzstaffel, or uh, security service of Adolf Hitler in 1942, but was rejected on physical grounds. After the war, he wrote a thesis on the conservative revolution under the Weimar Republic and worked for a time as Ernst Jünger's private secretary. Later, as a journalist, he became a connoisseur of the French far right, which he did not hesitate to describe as fascist. In the 1950s, he even expressed the idea that France had become the world capital of fascism. And it was in this light that he saw the events of the 13th day in May of 1958 as an attempt to repeat the failed coup d'etat of February 1934. Despite these affinities, Armin Moller soon realized that the ambitions of the quasi-fascist groupsicules in Algeria and metropolitan France were doomed to failure. Street battles were a thing of the past, as was the cause of French Algeria. While Moller admired the return of de Gaulle and the beginnings of an independent foreign policy, which he opposed to the submission of West Germany to its American protector, Moller placed his hopes on the revival under de Gaulle's leadership of an authoritarian nationalism, modernized and freed from outdated ideological labels. The birth of the Fifth Republic emanates from a Gaullist coup d'etat. What happened in May 1958? Firstly, a demonstration in Algiers turned into a quasi-insurrectional riot. The military took control and, under pressure from Gaullist militants on the ground, presented Paris with a fait accompli. It was the typical scenario for the pronunciamento, repeated ten days later in Corsica, well, birthplace, an island birthplace, of Napoleon Bonaparte. Corsica was Napoleon's Taiwan. In the meantime, the government noted alarming defections within the repressive apparatus of the state. Until the Parliament voted for the investiture of de Gaulle on the 1st of June, the specter of an intervention by armed forces from Corsica or North Africa constantly hovered over French national life. In case you don't know this, uh, the headquarters of the French Foreign Legion is on Corsica. And uh, that island was from where they would have attacked the French mainland if they were to aid a military coup d'etat. This really was a form of violent political action, with the real possibility of resorting to arms. There was a lot of discussion about General de Gaulle's personal involvement in this affair. People wondered whether he was aware of all the maneuvers carried out by his supporters in his name, whether he knew the broad outlines of Operation Resurrection, and so on. Operation Resurrection. This question seems to myself rather secondary. What really needs to be stressed is that de Gaulle, with the complicity of a majority of parliamentarians, uh, succeeded in giving his seizure of power a facade of legality. And it worked. One may wonder about the complicity of the leaders of the bourgeois parties of the time in the subversion of the legislature, what the Franco-American sociologist Ivan uh, Ermakov calls ruling oneself out, reminiscent, as some parliamentary voices maintained, of the vote of the 10th day in July of 1940, which is articulated in the work by Ivan Ermakov entitled Ruling Oneself Out, Subtitled, A Theory of Collective Abdications, published by Chapel Hill. That's Duke University Press uh, back in 2008. Oh, just getting in some uh, casual remarks and uh, checking them out and uh, giving myself a little break to breathe here. Uh, and uh, when you hear that little um, 
incoming of uh, the noise, you know, I usually fall to temptation and try to find out what it is. Now, I noticed Jameson Reese just hit Gabriella Ford. God bless him. Uh, the man must still be up. Uh, so there's a man to my wounding. Uh, he stands by me thick and thin. Uh, so uh, God bless him. Uh, so uh, let me try and get myself back onto track here. Let's check uh, the time we have remaining, of course, so I can try and pace my arc of narrative. We have one and a half hours left. God knows I probably won't be able to even get to the Battle of the Bulge tonight, as I should. Uh, but we at least know that I'm getting there. I mean, this is uh, like war un in, well, unto itself. You really have to... Uh... <sighs> There's so much in history that is so connected... There's no way I can evade doing what I'm doing now. And all of this connects to the wars of tomorrow. So, uh, when it comes to what I'm describing about the foundations of the Fifth Republic of uh, France today, let me... Try and breathe here. Return myself uh, back on track. Uh, in terms of... Let's see now. We were speaking of this theory of abdications, collective abdications, where a public surrenders itself to a dictator. This would be like Trump being installed in the White House by the insurrectionists. And we all just surrendered to it. That's what the French did to Charles de Gaulle. In any case, this democratic anointing does not detract from the exceptional character of the sequence. On the contrary, it was even the guarantee of its success. And if history has mainly remembered de Gaulle's skill as head of state in resolving the crisis... And if there is, strictly speaking, no black legend about the foundation of the Fifth Republic, it had nonetheless the flavor of a coup d'etat. The leaders of the Spanish Golpe of February 1981, one of whom, General Armada, was apparently an intern at the École Militaire in Paris, shortly after May 1958, took the French example as their model. They even christened their attempt Operation de Gaulle. The connection between the military subversion and the affirmation of the new Republican regime is clear enough. The seizure of power marked by the action of the military shaped the form of the Fifth Republic. For a long time, Germany was seen as the archetypal militaristic nation. Nowadays, it is probably the United States that embodies this tendency in the eyes of the world, but that fails to do any justice to France. Going back to the 19th century, the army played a key role in the repression of all the major popular uprisings that the country experienced, from the Knuts revolts to the Formis shootings. When, on the first day in May of 1891, the first celebration of International Workers' Day in France, troops fired on striking miners at Formis in the north, killing nine and injuring dozens. Karl Marx also proposed that the motto Liberté, Equalité, Fraternité should be, well, Liberty, Equality, Fraternity should be replaced by Infantry, Cavalry, Artillery in the 20th century, apart from the Gendarmerie, the Gendarmes being the police. The military distanced itself from the task of maintaining order, at least in metropolitan France, with a few exceptions. For example, Interior Minister Jules Mork's use of the parachute battalion to break the strike of the Lorraine miners in 1948. For all that, the relationship between the government and its army remained tense. The colonial events that mark the history of the Fourth Republic bear witness to this, and its downfall was in some ways the result. 
In any case, the subject is more complex than we often want to believe. In the series of crises that shook the last four years, well, the last years of the Fourth Republic, it was more often collusion than open disobedience that characterized civil-military relations. We would call that collaboration. The fact remains that Mock, back at the Interior Ministry at the time of the Algiers Putsch, could no longer count on the troops. For many of those who rallied, more or less enthusiastically, to de Gaulle, he was the only person capable of imposing his authority on the fractious soldiers. Uh, these fractious soldiers are similar to what Macron is facing today that wrote open letters that France would soon be in civil war. Yes, that's this year. This is what eventually happened, not without difficulty, in 1958. To do this, in terms of preempting civil war by assuming dictatorship, de Gaulle relied on two narratives, that of modernization and that of national independence. The acquisition of nuclear weapons initiated under the Fourth Republic combined the twain. The force de frappe was conceived both as a guarantee of a certain autonomy on the international scene and, incidentally, as a bonus for an army that was mourning its colonial glories. Force de frappe transliterates as a military strike force, especially the independent nuclear strike force of France, or force de dissuasion after 1961, which is the designation for what used to be a triad, of air, sea, and land-based nuclear weapons intended for dissuasion. That would be French for what we call deterrence. The French term for deterrence. On both counts, the results were mixed, to say the least. In any case, after a series of purges, amnesties, and adjustments, the new regime managed to regain control of its armed wing. Of course, Neither the end of the Algerian War nor the departure of General de Gaulle put an end to the interventionism of the French armed forces, which grew steadily since the early 1970s, especially under socialist governments. In view of the state of the political debate, it can be said that the sovereign prerogative in military matters, inaugurated by de Gaulle, has remained intact until today, if not actually strengthened. So understand France as a navy, excuse me, as a nation uh, that's almost ruled by its military. Or rather, its military is what makes or breaks its republics. And as far as the institutional aspects are concerned, we find a somewhat paradoxical situation. Although de Gaulle succeeded in reestablishing the preeminence of civilian authority over the army, he was only able to do so at the cost of a significant militarization of the state and modes of governance. Perhaps the most significant area is that of executive power. The Fifth Republic instituted a qualitative transformation of the presidential function, which would in the future be modeled on military command. De Gaulle's style, his habit of donning a uniform at decisive moments, his way of embodying and, so to speak, personalizing the presidency, clearly had something to do with this. A charismatic dictatorship, a la Donald Trump or Vladimir Putin. Mm. The French being the avant-garde, the vanguard, he pioneered for them both. The so-called credibility of the nuclear deterrent is a factor in the reasoning that led to the very controversial constitutional revision of 1962, which introduced the election of the president uh, by direct universal suffrage. We should also look at the functioning of the presidency, the ascendancy of its particular staff, and the fact that it chairs the defense consuls. I would like to mention here an article that appeared recently in Le Monde, The World, that's in French, a French magazine, on the initiative of Brigitte Gaïti and Delphine Dulon, stressing the increased importance of the defense consuls during the current pandemic period. In other words, the pandemic in France is what is leading, or is a factor in the military, saying that France will soon devolve into civil war with its Muslim population.
which is simply Islamophobia being exploited for a military takeover in time of plague. Macron, the president, has ordered all troops who signed those letters, those open letters signed by both the officers in one case and the troops in another, to resign. The late 1950s and early 1960s marked a profound transformation in the way national security was conceived in a context doubly marked by the counterinsurgency in Algeria for the French and the Cold War. That was their Vietnam. In 1960, a commission of jurists charged with revising the penal code proposed to eliminate the distinction between internal and external state security, a fundamental principle of Republican law for over a hundred years, an entire century. The previous year, the government had reformulated by decree the definition of national defense, recognizing intermediate degrees between war and peace. These tendencies already existed at the beginning of the Fifth Republic and were part of a wider movement in no way limited to France. At the same time, the advent of a strong government at a time of intense violence both in France and on the other side of the Mediterranean gave a new impetus to the changes underway. This climate also justified the increasing use of emergency measures. Article 16 of the Constitution applied for the only time so far during the General's Putsch of April 1961 is probably the best known illustration. But we can also mention the law on the state of emergency, which was certainly promulgated under the Fourth Republic, but was extended to metropolitan France for the first time in May of 1958, with a result familiar to activists of our own generation, this side of the Atlantic or on the side of the continent. The reason this new legislation was drafted, rather than using existing jurisprudence on the state of siege, was precisely because the military was not trusted to handle the situation. This mistrust continued long after the return of Charles de Gaulle. It would certainly be wrong to see 1958 as a clean break with the past. There have been other cases of the exercise of a strong executive power in the history of the French Republic, particularly in times of war. Clemenceau's control of the general staff is one example, and Oriol's management of the Indochina War is perhaps another. Uh, he was Francis McNamara. This history can be explained by linking it to a succession of attempts by political leaders to reassert their predominance over the high command, attempts to reintegrate the military and the political, if you like, which were only achieved with the arrival of the Fifth Republic. The French Republican model arose precisely from the rejection of personal power, whether monarchist or bonapartist. And although the difficulty of controlling the military was undoubtedly one of the weaknesses of the Fourth Republic, there was nothing inevitable about the form of solution finally adopted. This is a crucial point, because there are differences in people's appreciation of the collapse of the regime born in 1946. Some see this collapse as a historical necessity in the sense that old-style parliamentarism would have been incompatible with the demands of total war and the governance of a modern, globalized, technological economy. Others point to the contingent and chance nature of the solution offered by de Gaulle and his collaborators. Thus, it is possible to believe that the Fourth Republic was at the end of its tether on certain fronts, but that the new regime could have taken a completely different turn. In this respect, it is interesting to trace how several factions, well, fractions of the non-communist left, interpreted the advent of the Fifth Republic and the early accommodation of some of these to the new institutions at the very moment when Francois Mitterrand was fervently denouncing the permanent coup d'etat. If we follow the evolution of the new left, the modernizing left, often associated with the premiership of Mende France, we can say that the path of the socialists to power was prepared well in advance. If you leaf through magazines such as France Observateur and L'Express, at the time, The Observer and The Express, you will notice the omnipresence of this modernization imperative which was also central to the thinking of originally anti-Gaullist circles, such as the club Jean Moulin, which eventually rallied to the new regime. 
It should be remembered that the club Jean Molin, founded in May of 1958 by Daniel Cordier and others, was originally intended to organize armed resistance in the event of an attack by shock troops on the National Assembly. So it is impressive to see how, in a relatively short time, this network went from the paramilitary defense of the Republic and fierce anti-Gaullism to the much more peaceful mission of a kind of technocratic think tank. In the end, this constellation played a significant role in the left's conversion to presidentialism. Mm. And we have to distinguish between two varieties of anti-Americanism, what played a role in the birth of the Fifth Republic? On the one hand, a kind of chauvinistic attitude that goes back at least to the 1930s and has most often, well, has a right-wing connotation. On the other hand, a rejection of American imperialism. That is to say, U.S. interference in France, but also in the rest of the world. That said, some have interpreted the events of the 13th day in May of 1958 as an anti-American revolt. This interpretation was first put forward by the Russian-British journalist Alexander Wirth, then taken up by the American historian Matthew Connolly, whose book in the English is A Diplomatic Revolution. That's the title, subtitled Algeria's Fight for Independence and the Origin of the Post-Cold War Era, published by Oxford in 2002. Remember what I said, Algeria was France's Vietnam, even though the French were originally in Vietnam. They quickly pulled back their resources, gave Vietnam over to the Americans, and uh, basically uh, retreated to Algeria to conduct their war on what was the home front. Algeria was a département de France. The argument makes sense if you examine the foreign policy of the United States under the Eisenhower presidency from 1953 to 1961. The argument of France's formation of its Fifth Republic as an anti-American revolution. Mm. In other words, Charles de Gaulle conducted a military takeover of France to prevent France from becoming an industrial satellite of the United States. The, there was a tendency on the part of Washington to favor certain non-communist national liberation movements in the countries of the South with the idea, roughly speaking, of building ramparts against Bolshevism. It was on this basis and not, as has been claimed, from any kind of anti-colonialist tradition that the United States exerted a major influence on the independence struggle of the former French protectorates of Morocco and Tunisia. Through its diplomacy, but also through its intelligence services and vassal trade unions, this occurred in a context of strong economic dependence of France upon these United States. The U.S. Treasury had largely financed France's Indochina War, and despite the impressive growth rate of the French economy, the deficit in the balance of external payments required the French to seek loans from the Americans throughout the 1950s. The story of the terminal crisis of the Fourth Republic can therefore be dated from the start of 1958 when Jean Monnet went to Washington to request yet another loan from the U.S. government and the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. In return, the Americans asked him to commit France to major budget cuts, including to its own military budget, and the redeployment of about 100,000 soldiers stationed in Algeria. Matthew Connolly considers this episode one of the first structural adjustment programs imposed by the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, on a debtor country. It was in this tense climate that the Sakiet City Yosif affair occurred, the bombing of a Tunisian village by the French army, on the eighth day 
in February of 1958, targeting FLN, or Algerian Viet Cong, which caused over 70 civilian victims and around 150 injured. That affair gave rise to a complaint brought by Tunisia to the United Nations, following which the Security Council entrusted good offices mission, a good offices mission, to two diplomats, one British and the other American. Because hell, France, Britain, America, you know, these were all the allies of World War II on the UN Security Council. This new Anglo-American interference in French politics intolerable for the most elected, well, for most elected representatives, led to the fall of the government of Felix Gillard and triggered the terminal crisis of the fourth French Republican regime. Significantly, before storming the government headquarters in Algiers on the 13th day in May, demonstrators ransacked an American cultural center in the city. Now, I can't even fucking imagine what was inside an American cultural center but I would assume a bunch of guns and porn, <laughs> Big Macs and shit. What the fuck would be in an American culture center is beyond me. Like what? Uh, simulacrum of George Washington's wooden teeth. Uh, nevertheless, the Noir community and the French right more generally we're not inherently anti-American in the anti-imperialist sense, or at least they were only marginally so. Indeed, most of the fervent supporters of French Algeria were also fervent supporters of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. They wanted to convince the American leadership that their struggle was that of the free world. They were not entirely wrong, given that the departments of French Algeria were part of both NATO and the European Economic Community. Moreover, when de Gaulle began to speak out increasingly clearly in favor of a solution of self-determination in Algeria, the Atlanticism of his right-wing opponents became as ever more fierce. These positions were expressed in particular during the parliamentary debates on the force de frappe, the nu French nuclear force, the French nuclear strike force. The zealous defenders of the Atlantic Alliance were to be found not only among the socialists, radicals, and Christian Democrats, but also on the far right of Francois Valentin and Jean-Marie Le Pen. The Atlanticism, well, this Atlanticism was also evident in the failed putsch of April 1961, during which the factious generals, the handful, as de Gaulle called them, seemed sincerely to believe that Washington would help them. Washington, D.C., not George Washington, who was long dead by that time, mind ye. At the time, there was talk of possible links with the CIA, which were, of course, formally denied by the Kennedy administration. But we'll never know. The whole episode seems nebulous. It is difficult to believe that John Fitzgerald Kennedy, who had consistently supported Algerian independence in the U.S. Senate, would have made a pact with the mutinous generals of France to retain it as integral to French territory, although it is possible to imagine more or less unofficial contacts with American intelligence agents or officers. Charles de Gaulle himself said he did not believe in this hypothesis, which did not prevent him from seeing the integrated command of NATO, which France would leave five years later as a factor of military insubordination. This brings us back to another subject, national independence as de Gaulle conceived it, and his denunciation of the excessive power of the United States. Despite the stormy relations they had with de Gaulle during the Second World War, the Americans did not speak out against his return to office in 1958. On the contrary, they actively supported the de Gaulle solution, seeing it as the only way to avoid a popular front and a government with the communists. Despite considerable frustration, the differences within the various American administrations, this has always been their position. In the end, it is better to have a cantankerous but secure ally at the heart of the Western European security system than a more compliant regime prone to serial ministerial crises. For all that, I myself do not accept the opinion of certain Anglophone or English-speaking historians initially articulated by Henry Kissinger 
and conveyed in France by Raymond Elron and other representatives of the American services that de Gaulle's foreign policy was mere posturing. It may well be uh, right to qualify the actual autonomy that de Gaulle had on the world stage, but the fact remains that he went further in his criticism of American hegemony than any other European head of state. In this respect, the contrast with his successors is staggering. At the risk of an abusive generalization, it is tempting to say that the current Fifth Republic combines the worst aspects of the Gaullist legacy, retaining its authoritarianism while abandoning what was supposed to make for its greatness, a presidency with hypertrophied powers on the domestic front, but manifest impotence on the international scene. Our last question concerns memory. People hardly ever speak of that 13th day in May of 1958. How do you explain this obscuring of a date that was so central to the advent of the Fifth Republic? Is it actually a retrospective effect of May in 1968, whose spirit is more representative of what France is today? Well, obscuring... Forgetting, silence, and repression are key concepts in the historiography of 20th century France, particularly the historiography of the French right. We may think of a scandal that rocked France in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the Dreyfus Affair, a watershed event in the history of European Judeophobia. Alfred Dreyfus, who lived from 1859 to 1935, was a French military artillery captain of Jewish ethnicity in the French army who was wrongfully accused and convicted of sending military secrets to the Germans, tried and convicted of treason against France in 1894. The military excluded the press and public from his trial. By the time the, of the court-martial, most of the public believed Dreyfus was a traitor, then, too, recall the threat of communism in the 1920s and 1930s, the Vichy Syndrome, and the Dirty War in Indochina, Algeria, and so on. What I can say is that instead of seeing this <clears throat> as simple concealment, negation, <clears throat> or forgetting, It should, perhaps, be understood more in the Lacanian sense as a mechanism <coughs> characterized by the, re the return of the repressed in the sense that a trauma is not recognized as such at the moment that it happens. The repression appears after the fact, if you like, in the memory of the traumatic experience. Of course, this is only an analogy with the clinical situation and probably a dubious one. However, it is clear that memory itself, and even more so commemoration, sometimes manages to repress episodes that are not very glorious or even disturbing. This is how some people have interpreted the echoes of July 1940 and May of 1958. In 1962, at the time of the Salon trial, and especially during the constitutional referendum, a decisive moment in the political history of France, there were already efforts to undermine the significance of May 13th, to make it disappear. I refer here to General de Gaulle's autumn 1962 speeches, in which he defined the regime contrary to its actual origins, stating that he, de Gaulle, had returned to the forefront of the stage precisely to foil a coup d'etat. <laughs> it seems to me that it is in this same context that we should understand what happened in 1968 a decade later. In the now monumental historiography on May 1968, 
an object of commemoration par excellence, very little is said about the fact that this month also marked the 10th anniversary of the birth of the Fifth Republic. In other words, of the current regime. It is enough to look at photos of the demonstrations, the banners and placards that read, Ten years already, mon général, etc. And the government was extremely conscious of this remembered historical link. What I want to say is that this crisis was also the occasion for a return of the repressed memories of 1958, a return that culminated in a new repression, the so-called flight to Baden-Baden, and the great Gauliest demonstration of May 30th on the Champs-Élysées, marking the coming together of the right after the fractures and fratricidal struggles of the Algerian years. With the end of this sequence and the amnesties that were soon to follow, we see once again the mechanics of a neutralization whose, uh, whose effects in a way persist to this day. And by neutralization, I mean a neutralization of the memories uh, in the Lacanian sense. For those of you who don't know what I'm referencing to, remember my degree was in criminal psychology as an associate of science degree, the first degree that I attained of any worth. Jacques Lacan was a French psychoanalyst and psychiatrist who has been called the most controversial psychoanalyst since Freud. Jacques-Marie Emile Lacan. And um, Lacanianism, or Lacanian psychoanalysis, is a theoretical system that explains the mind, behavior, and culture through a structuralist and post-structuralist paradigm. Uh, so... If there's anything else I can think of, obviously he was a major figure in Parisian intellectual life for much of the 20th century. Uh, born in 1901, died in 1981, uh, and um, his original approach to language expands the reaches of psychoanalysis. Uh, and thanks to ego psychology, Lacan believed that the unassimilable, the unassimilable kernel of truth, Freud's good news, was in danger of having its future eclipsed. Uh, so the central pillar of Lacan's psychoanalytic theory is that the unconscious is structured like a language, a language he endeavored to learn to speak and serve as the interpreter thereof. Well, in the hour we have remaining, um, in June of 1944, the decisive battle in the fight of the Allies against the Third Reich began, not in Normandy, but thousands of kilometers to the east in Belorussia, which is today a decisive battleground where Russia through Belarus or White Russia, is trying to flood immigrants from the Middle East into Eastern Europe. To state this is in no way to disparage the achievement of the Allied soldiers who stormed ashore on D-Day and fought in the grueling Normandy campaign that followed, but the simple fact is that the Eastern Front mattered far more, certainly to my biological father. Given the revival of interest in the political and military history of Eastern Europe, because of the coming war in the Ukraine, it is no longer, well, it's no longer possible to write set-piece histories about the Western Front without the Eastern backdrop. The shadow of the East hangs over this entire spoken study tonight. Operation Bagration which you would never know was pronounced that way by its spelling, B-A-G-R-A-T-I-O-N. Most people who look at my name, Dietrich, would assume D-I-E-T-R-I-C-H. They'd think that was pronounced Diet Rich. Well, most people would look at that name and they would think it was pronounced Bag Ration, as in a bag of rations. Don't ever pronounce it that way. <laughs> 
Bagration, or the Battle of Army Group Center, the Central Army Group of Germany, was a decisive victory for the Red Army. Krasnaya, uh, the uh, forces of the Soviets, the strategic objectives were accomplished in full and the Red Army was left well placed for the final assault on Germany itself. In just 23 days, the Red Army advanced between 400 kilometers and half a thousand kilometers, an average of 20 kilometers a day. The German losses were 381,000 killed, 158,480 captured, far greater than the losses at Stalingrad. Yet that victory came at a steep price for the communists. 180,040 Soviet soldiers killed or missing, 590,848 sick or critically injured, disabled for life, and 2,957 tanks and 822 aircraft destroyed. Operation Bagration, June through August of 1944, the greatest offensive in world history. It eventually involved three and a half million men, 7,000 tanks, and 9,000 aircraft. It was an overwhelming Soviet victory and set the stage for the final assault on the German Reich. By June of 1944, Germany had lost 3.3 million men, and the Wehrmacht was under strength by an estimated 20% of the million men lost in the winter fighting in Russia. Only 100,000 had been replaced. Experienced units could outmatch the Red Army easily, but there were far too few of them. Geographically, it dwarfed the campaign for Normandy. In four weeks, it inflicted greater losses on the German army than the Wehrmacht had suffered in five months at Stalingrad. With more than 2.3 million men, six times the artillery and twice the number of tanks that launched the Battle of the Bulge, which all of this comes back to, it was the largest Allied operation of World War II. It demolished three Axis armies, that of Germany and its Allied nations in Europe, and it tore open the Eastern Front. Operation Bagration, the Red Army's Spring 1944 Blitzkrieg, was designed to support Allied operations in France, liberate Russian territory, and break the back of the Wehrmacht once and for all. In the south, Germany and its allies, mostly Hungarians and Romanians, held the line near the Ukraine's western borders, south of the impassable Pripyat marshes, with two army groups. To the north, in the Baltic republics, three Red Army groups faced Germany's army group north. It was in the center, in Belorussia, so-called White Russia, where we see the immigrants being weaponized as a demographic weapon against Europe today by Vladimir Putin and his puppet dictator, where the main Soviet blow would fall. There, Adolf Hitler fielded 38 infantry divisions, two Luftwaffe field divisions, seven security divisions, two Panzer Grenadier divisions, and one Panzer division, all grouped into four armies and led by Field Marshal Ernst Büch, a commander whose promotion was mainly due to his unquestioning loyalty to my father, the Führer. While Bielorussia was the center of gravity for Germany's eastern forces, it had by no means come fully under Wehrmacht control. Partisan activity, guerrilla warriors, was more pronounced there than in other sectors, where Nazi reprisals since 1941 had been brutal even by Eastern Front standards. Punitive operations by the Germans in January, February, and April of 1944 had left entire villages leveled, their inhabitants lined up and executed. All told, an estimated one million people, including the region's entire Jewish population, had been exterminated. In response to this terror, by mid-1944, partisan numbers had swelled to something between 143,000 and 374,000, depending on who was counting. What was worse for the occupiers? Those partisan forces were becoming increasingly well-organized and in better touch with Soviet authorities who could direct their activities to maximum advantage. Mm. The Red Army's 
Earlier progress in the Baltic region and Ukraine left a Belarusian bulge, the original Battle of the Bulge here in the center, from which Field Marshal Busch requested permission to withdraw in order to shorten his line and relieve the danger of a pincer movement against the salient. Hitler, concerned with wavering support among his Finnish, Hungarian, and Romanian allies, was determined to cling to his defenses at the eastern edge of the Bulge, and the Army High Command, Dai Oberkommando de Hirth, or OKH, denied Bush's request. Hitler's no-retreat policy in the east left Bush in a vulnerable position. His sector was attempting target for the Red Army, since the eastern end of the bulge included the half a hundred mile wide land bridge between the Dnieper River and the Dvina River, these two rivers that guarded Russia from the Baltic to the Black Sea. Control of that gap would allow armies to pass overland to Moscow or Berlin. So where to strike? The Germans had expected a major Russian offensive that summer. The question was, where? The Soviet Commission of State Defense Committee began meeting in April of 1944 to decide this, and they considered three options. One was to continue with the success they had enjoyed in the Ukraine, ideal tank country, with an offensive which would carry the Red Army into the Balkans, where Romania and Bulgaria were already looking fragile allies of Hitler, Yet this would have directed the main advance away from Germany. The second option was to attack in the north into the Baltic states, cutting off sizable German armies as the Red Army advanced on East Prussia and potentially Berlin. But the meeting thought this too ambitious. The third option was chosen, an offensive in Belarusia, White Russia, against Germany's Army Group Center, which was holding the Belarusian balcony, a salient jutting eastwards into Soviet territory. Success here would carry the Red Army into Poland and, in the future, open a direct road to Berlin. And Hitler's wolf slayer, the Führer Bunker. Stalin and the Stavka, the State Defense Council, approved the decision, ruling out a simultaneous offensive along the whole Russian line, agreeing instead to sequential offensives, with forces to the north and south of Belarusia advancing after the blow against Army Group Center. The Stavka also set strategic objectives for the offensive. One, to liberate Belarusia. Two, to destroy Army Group Center. And three, to expropriate, uh, liberate in Allied propaganda terms, European countries under German occupation. Now, almost in passing, Stalin was asked to give a name to this offensive, and he chose that of Bagration after a fellow Georgian, a fellow Caucasian, a uh, member of the nationality of his nation of Georgia, the Tsarist General Pyotr Bagration, who had been killed fighting Napoleon's invasion at the Battle of Borodino in 1812. Where, as I said, so many cannons and musket shots were going off every second. In terms of German strategy, by the summer, the Wehrmacht was fighting a war on three fronts, actually four, in Italy, in northern France, and on an eastern front that extended from the Baltic to the Balkans, as well, of course, in the Scandinavian nations. So by contrast, German strategy now centered on, one, defeating the expected Allied landing in France, two, winning time until the unnatural Allied coalition broke up, Three, defending occupied territory in the east by defeating the Russian summer offensive, expected on the southern front. And four, holding the Allied advance in Italy, which they did with the bombing of Bari and gassing the Allies in their own toxic soup. This was a tall order to accomplish all four objectives. And furthermore, Hitler had observed that the expected Allied landings in northern France would place them less than... Uh, half a thousand kilometers from the German border, whereas the Red Army was still a thousand kilometers away. So defense in the West seemed the priority to my father. The buildup of Wehrmacht forces in France and Belgium left nothing more for the Eastern Front. The German generals facing the Soviets would have to fight with what they had. Yet 
Hitler also issued orders forbidding any withdrawals. The Wehrmacht was to fight where it stood, come what may. In particular, he forbade building a new defense line in the rear, stating that Vitebsk, Orsha, Moglev, Bobnitsk, Bodizhov, and Minsk were to be defended at all costs. And that led to a June 22nd Hitler had not bargained for. Operation Begration kicked off in the third anniversary of Operation Barbarossa, and it marked the beginning of the end for the Third Reich's extensive military occupation of Europe. Stalin had long been asking that his Western allies open the Second Front in Europe so that the uh, enormous pressures on the Red Army slackened somewhat. Finally, with the Allies landing in Normandy on the 6th of June, 6 1944, the European Front materialized. Scarcely any episode of the Second World War has received as much attention and adoration in the West as Operation Overlord. After all, it marked the Allies' getting a foothold on the continental mainland, and Berlin, the capital of Hitler's Third Reich, was just about 1,200 kilometers from the beachhead via a road that ran through Paris. And the mystique surrounding the largest seaborne invasion in history gives Overlord the heft to be called D-Day, the day on which the uh, enormous Nazi war machine apparently began to unravel. But barely two weeks later, on June 22, 1944, began what turned out to be the largest Allied operation of World War II, a campaign that dwarfed not only Overlord, but even the epic battle of Stalingrad, widely misbelieved in the West uh, to have been the war's turning point, which I can tell you is all total bullshit, and everybody uh, fetishizes that war because von Paulus surrendered his army. Indeed, in the scale of its operations, Begration, the Red Army's counteroffensive through Belarus, towers over every other engagement of World War II, with the only exception being my father's invasion of Russia itself, Barbarossa, named after the ancient German Emperor Frederick Barbarossa, or Redbeard, uh, the German invasion of the Soviet Union on the 22nd day in June of 1941 including those operations in Moscow, Leningrad, the tank battle of Kursk, the largest armored engagement in all history, the Ardennes counteroffensive, or the Battle of the Bulge, and the Battle of Berlin itself, mm. where a million Soviet soldiers died in the maelstrom of attacking my father's capital, covering his retreat from the surface world. In under two months, Operation Begration wiped out about a quarter, roughly half a million troops, of Germany's Eastern Front manpower. Of the four armies comprising the vaunted Army Group Center, one, the fourth, was decimated, and two others, the ninth and third Panzer, very nearly so. 31 of the 47 German divisional or corps commanders of the rank of general involved in the battle were either killed or captured. The Wehrmacht's back was broken in the sense of an offensive machinery of war. Begration also restored the Soviet Union to her pre-1939 borders by throwing the Germans out of Soviet territory and launched the Red Army on a crushing offensive that was to culminate in the Battle of Berlin and basically the destruction of all their manpower, leaving them an enervated, eviscerated, hollow legion, and the disillusion, ultimately, of the Third Reich on the surface world. In comparison, D-Day is but a sideshow. German deployment there added up to only 11 divisions. The Eastern Front had 228, and Germany lost no more than 9,000 troops. In the Western Front, the Allied forces were mired on the beachhead far longer than they had anticipated. Progress inland was painfully slow, 
and the port city of Kane, a major objective only about half a hundred kilometers from the Omaha beach, was not captured before Ju July 31st. No, wasn't captured until before the 21st day in July, or a full 45 fucking days after D-Day. Begration, on the other hand, took a little over 10 days to punch a hole 400 kilometers wide and 160 kilometers deep in the German front line. By the middle of August, the Red Army was knocking at Warsaw's doors, the capital of Poland, less than 600 kilometers shy of Berlin. And yet, in all Western histories of the Second World War, Operation Bagration gets mentioned only in passing, if at all. It is only in recent years that the critical attention has begun to be directed at this most important episode of the European War, thanks to my leaking information about it from the Department of Defense years ago. Otherwise, Americans would never have known about it until the collapse of the Soviet Union, you dumb fucks. The 76th anniversary? No, at this point in history? Uh, fuck. Yeah, 76, 70, no, 78th. The 78th anniversary of Bagration was this year. It's as good a time now covering the counteroffensive in the Ardennes because Adolf Hitler learned everything he could from what the Russians did and turned it against the Allies in the West to affect the Battle of the Bulge. So it's as good a time as any to go over the ground he covered and recapitulate how it panned out in those two crucial months. In Yalta, in December of 1943, Britain, the United States, and the Soviet Union had agreed to orchestrate the Allies' future campaigns against the Axis. Churchill and Roosevelt informed Stalin that the Allies planned to open the Second Front by landing in France in May the following year. In turn, Stalin promised to support that operation by launching a massive strategic offensive around the same time. Bagration, named after the Georgian general of the Tsarist army who died fighting Napoleon's troops in Borodino near Moscow in 1812, was the result of that commitment. The Soviet armies involved in bloody fighting in the winter and early spring of 1943 through 1944 had made spectacular advances, particularly in the south, in Ukraine and the Caucasus. They had also managed to finally lift the crippling siege of Leningrad, now St. Petersburg again, uh, the former capital of the Tsars, that had lasted nearly a thousand days. 900, to be precise. At that point in the war's eastern theater, the Soviets had over 6.5 million troops spread over 12 fronts, or army groups, aligned along a 3,200-kilometer front facing four German army groups and an independent army, which together numbered 2.25 uh, million men, two and a quarter million men. Of the 12 Soviet army groups, four, namely the 1st Baltic and the 3rd, the 2nd and the 1st Bielorussian or White Russian, would come into play in this operation. Of the four German army groups, the one directly in front of these Red Army formations was the famed Army Group Center, commanded by Field Marshal Ernst Büschk. Not a particularly capable commander, but a favorite of my father's because of Büschk's obsequiousness to the Führer. And numerically, the strongest army group on the Eastern Front. It had around 700,000 troops in 51 divisions, Busch's group had two major weaknesses, other than being led by an unenterprising leader. Uh, spread over a 780-kilometer front, it was a thinly held line, and its forces occupied a somewhat awkward salient, a bulge extending substantially eastwards, north of the inaccessible Pripyat marshes, close to the headwaters of the Dvina and Dnieper rivers east of Vitebsk, making the flanks vulnerable to spirited enemy attacks. Stavka, the Soviet high command, now settled on striking at Army Group Center in a series of surprise deep operations, maneuvers, that would destroy this jewel in Hitler's crown. But the Soviet decision had not been made with an eye on Marshal Busch's vulnerabilities, personal or strategic. Stavka had determined that the demolition of Army Group Center would bring the Red Army to the borders of Poland and East Prussia and facilitate future operations enormously. Uh, equally importantly, uh, the best and perhaps shortest road to Berlin from the east ran through Warsaw, the capital of Poland, which sat on a straight line from General Rokosovsky's 1st Bielorussian Front through the deep defenses of Army Group Center. 
Besides, other options open to the Red Army at that point had been considered and dropped. For example, a strike into the Balkans by one or more of the northern spearheads, uh, the Third Baltic and Leningrad fronts specifically, rejected because it would still leave much of Western Russia in German hands. Or the option of a Northwest strike from northern Ukraine cross Poland to the Baltic Sea, not pursued because it would mean a long and perilous drive with dangerously open flanks. Having thus decided on the broad contours of the offensive, the Red Army set about filing in, well, filling in the tactical and operational details, a project of astonishing ingenuity and skill, the like of which has been seen only rarely in the history of modern warfare. First, the Soviets launched an elaborate tactical program of deception, Maskorovka, or the masking in the Russian. In April, the entire Soviet army assumed a defensive posture and kept up the appearances with great valve, so that German intelligence was inclined to discount the possibility of an imminent large-scale operation. But more importantly, the Red Army buildup managed to deflect attention to the southwestern part of the front, to Ukraine, giving out clever and seemingly bona fide signals, which the Germans picked up with alacrity, of an impending operation against Field Marshal Walter Model's Army Group North, Ukraine. Somehow the Germans had also persuaded themselves that a Ukrainian offensive would best serve the Red Army's operational objectives. And when reports of a large Soviet buildup in the front opposite Army Group Center started to come in beginning early June, the German High Command viewed that buildup as a deception, thus playing fully into Soviet hands. The deception was so complete that the Germans, incredibly, started shifting a lot of their firepower and a whole panzer corps from Bursk's command to Models. Thus, as the Red Army was rearing to go, Army Group Center lost 15% of its divisions, 23% of its assault guns, and a staggering 88%, well, 50% of its artillery and 88% of its armored tank strength. And... The Soviet buildup on the eve of Bagration was the war's most massive. 4,000 tanks, 5,300 aircraft, and over 25,000 pieces of mortars, assault guns, and other indirect fire weapons gave the Red Army armor, artillery, and air superiority of a 10 to 1 ratio at the assault point. Even as 2 million troops faced off with about half a million German combatants. This buildup necessitated reinforcements to the extents of 300%, 85%, and 62% respectively in tank, artillery, and aircraft strengths. Marshal Zhukov, one of Bagration's heroes, recalled that the front needed to be supplied with 400,000 tons of ammunition, 300,000 tons of fuel and lubricants, and half a million tons of food and fodder before the battle. It is a tribute to the Red Army's organizational virtuosity that it managed to amass these enormous quantities of firepower, accessories, and provisions without giving their game away. Battle-hardened veterans Marshal Georgi Zhukov and Marshal Alexander Velilevsky were made responsible for planning, coordinating, and directing two fronts each, Zhukov for the two southern fronts, 2nd and 1st Belarusian, and uh, Velilevsky for the two northern fronts, 1st Baltic and 3rd Belarusian. The front commanders were Generals uh, Bagremian of, of the 1st Baltic, uh, Cherniak, uh, Cherniakovsky of the 3rd Belarusian, Zakharov of the 2nd Belarusian, and Rokozovsky of the 1st Belarusian, the largest formation also tasked with covering the most ground. A vital component of the Soviet plan was parallel partisan warfare. By this phase of the war, Belarusian partisans, numbering close to 150,000, were a formidable force capable of paralyzing German supply lines virtually at will and demolishing bridges, highways, and railway installations whenever required. The wooded and often boggy terrain made parts of Belarusia ideal partisan country. Now well-armed and well-provisioned by the Soviets, partisans set and carried out their operational objectives in coordination with the Red Army. In the days leading up to Bagration, they stepped up sabotage and demol well, the demolitions 
very significantly, waylaying all supplies meant for Army Group Center, but taking care to let supplies in the reverse direction pass unmolested. The Soviets' deep operations, a concept borrowed from the deep battle military theory first formulated by Mikhail Tukhevsky, or Tukhachevsky, and Alexander Svekin worked with deadly effect in Bagration. Breakthroughs, well, the breakthroughs were achieved at several points in the enemy line by massive infantry-led attacks with heavy artillery and air support. When holes had been punched in the German lines, armored spearheads rushed through them and encircled the communications and supply centers by double envelopment. Waves of such attacks would follow in rapid succession, each spearhead delving deeper than the one before it, overtaking, overwhelming, and encircling enemy formations at blinding speed and keeping the enemy continually guessing which direction the next attack would come from. Another problem for Bushk was that his army, while strong in raw numbers, included a large proportion of Luftwaffe field units, security troops, Hungarian and Slovak divisions, and Volksdeutsch, ethnic Germans from the occupied territories whose desire to lay down their lives for the Führer was, well, suspect in degree. By 1944, the German army, still dependent on horse-drawn wagons for supply and movement, was an old-fashioned slow force compared to its communist opponents, who had been liberally supplied with the ubiquitous two-and-a-half-ton Studebaker truck manufactured in capitalism's heartland, the United States, supplied to them free for lend -lease. Worse yet was the lack of air cover. Germany's sixth air fleet was vastly outnumbered along Army Group Center's front. The offensive would be a characteristically Soviet enterprise, a massive push along a 450-mile-long axis of advance. Four Army Group fronts would launch artillery barrages and attacks simultaneously. To the north, the First Baltic Front under General Ivan uh, Bagramyan. Ultimately fielding 359,500 men would push into Latvia to screen the right flank of the main assault and support forces further south. Below him, the 3rd Belarusian Front under General Ivan Chernakovsky with 579,300 men would capture heavily defended Vitebsk and the area north of Orsha and then push southwest toward Minsk, the Belarusian capital, and Vilnius, the Lithuanian capital, crushing or encircling Bursk's 3rd Panzer Army at Vitebsk and his 4th Army centered around Orsha. South of Orsha, General Georgi Zakharov's 2nd Belarusian Front with 319,500 men would help complete the encirclement of Minsk and push west towards Grodno on the Niemen River as part of a mopping up operation in the wake of the other fronts. Farthest south, the 1st Belarusian Front, 1,071,000 and a 100 men, commanded by General Konstantin Rokosovsky, would assault Pusk's 9th Army, skirting the Pripyat marshes and pushing due west toward Bobrysk and the Berezina River, and then in the general direction of Minsk, the capital of White Russia. The 1st and 3rd Belarusian fronts, which held the bulk of the armor and firepower, would attack along converging lines with the aim of encircling the German armies east of Minsk, not simply pushing them back into Poland, but surrounding them and annihilating them. To aid the attackers, partisan units coordinated by Stavka, the Red Army High Command, would launch demolition attacks against Belarusian railways to prevent reinforcements from ever reaching the threatened zone. Because the undertaking was so extensive and complex, the four army group fronts would fall under the overall command of two trusted Ska Stavka representatives, Marshal Alexander Vazilevsky, the organizer of victory at Stalingrad, would direct the two northern fronts, while the southern fronts would be supervised by Marshal Georgi Zhukov, who directed the defenses of Leningrad, Moscow, uh, with Vazilevsky, well, Vazilevsky, Stalingrad. Uh, all of these men, of course, were experienced from their direction of the various battles um, that I've just articulated. Now, drawing all that much from out of my head alone leaves me rather nauseous. For an ex <laughs> Let's just put it this way. For an offensive of, of this scope, the Red Army assembled 118 rifle divisions, 8 tank and mechanized corps, 
13 artillery divisions and six cavalry horse divisions, a total of approximately 2.3 million frontline and support troops. The attack would be led by the rifle and tank divisions, which collectively fielded 2,715 tanks and 1,355 assault guns. To feed the offensive, the Red Army stockpiled 1.2 million tons of ammunition, rations, and supplies behind the front lines. The assaulting troops would be supported on the ground by 10,563 heavy artillery pieces and 2,306 Katyusha multiple rocket launchers, nicknamed Stalin's organs because of their pipe organ appearance. Air cover would be provided by the 2,318 fighters of various types, 1,744 Ilyushin uh, Iltu uh, Sturmovic ground attack planes, 655 medium bombers and 431 night bombers. Another 1,007 medium bombers would be drawn from the Soviet Strategic Bomber Reserve. The codename selected for the operation, again, referred to General Pyotr Bagration, the fiery Russian prince who died fighting Napoleon Bonaparte at Borodino in 1812. If successful... Operation Bagration promised huge rewards for Stalin. Minsk and other major Belarusian cities would fall back into Soviet hands, and a successful push would isolate Army Group North, which would then be dispatched more or less at Stalin's leisure. To capitalize on the anticipated success, as Bagration achieved its objectives and the Nazis fed troops from northern Ukraine into Belarusia to stop the onslaught, a secondary Red Army attack would thrust toward Vyao in northern Ukraine, driving Axis troops out of Soviet territory. Romania, Hungary, Warsaw, and East Prussia would become the new front lines of the war. In the last days, well, in the days preceding Bagration, Stavka executed a massive deception plan, as I had said, designed to convince its German counterpart, the OKH, the German high command, that the main attack would come as farther south. Forces in the Ukraine were ordered to prepare deceptive concentrations similar to the Phantom Army that had assembled under Lieutenant General George S. Patton opposite the Pas de Calais prior to the landings at Normandy. The Red Army Air Force clamped down on Luftwaffe reconnaissance missions along the front, allowing only occasional flights that would spot the phony troop concentrations, while headquarter units made greater use of more secure telephone lines in lieu of radio communications. In other words, radio communications could be intercepted, telephone lines could only be cut. For its part, the German high command, the OKH, concluded that the presence of oil-rich Romania and the more maneuverable terrain of the Ukrainian steppe made that sector the most likely target, particularly since the Red Army had just concluded an offensive in that region during the late winter. Mm. So Hitler and the OKH, his Oberkommando, were convinced <coughs> that the next attack would be launched in the northern Ukraine. And reinforcements to the east, including the potent 56th Panzer Corps, were diverted to Field Marshal Walter Model's Army Group North Ukraine, leaving Bush's Army Group Center with only about 11% of the tanks and assault guns allocated to the entire Eastern Front. While some members of Bush's Intelligence staff predicted a major Belarusian offensive in mid to late June. Bushk himself was evidently persuaded to accept the Oberkommando assessment of the high command as more accurate than what his own frontline spies were feeding him. And following Hitler's policy to the letter, he refused to let his army commanders pull back to shorten their fronts and pack their defensive lines more tightly. Operation Bagration, as I had said, was preceded by coordinated partisan attacks on German supply lines, codenamed Rail War and Concert. And uh, between June 19th and the 23rd, Belarusian guerrillas sabotaged rail networks and bridges, detonating some 10,000 
500 demolition charges during the night of June 19th into the dawn of the 20th alone, impeding the movement of ammunition, food, and reinforcements to the front. Originally timed for June 14th of 1944, the operation start was delayed by Soviet rail congestion until June 22nd that year, three years to the day from the Nazi invasion of Soviet territory. As Soviets were pouring across the Belarusian border, Hitler and the Oberkommando were slow to grasp the danger Army Group Center faced. On June 26th, Busch and 9th Army's General Jordan flew to Hitler's headquarters to convince the Führer to relent on the no-retreat policy that was destroying armies a division at a time. Furious with the near collapse of the 9th Army, my father relieved both Jordan and Busch replacing the latter with Field Marshal Walter Model, commander of Army Group North Ukraine and Der Fuhrer's top troubleshooter. At the end of June, Model arrived at Minsk, the capital of Belarus, to find the Red Army across the Berezina, only eight miles from his new headquarters, an Army Group center without reserves left to counterattack Soviet bridgeheads. The city of Borizhov, the Berezina crossing point for the Moscow-Minsk highway, fell the day after Model's arrival, and some 40,000 Germans were trapped east of Bobryusk. Uh, Soviet artillery and the Red Air Force turned a 15-mile German pocket east of the Berezina into a slaughter pen, and about 10,000 troops were killed and another 6,000 captured. Many of those who escaped the slaughter east of the river became trapped a second time at Bobryusk as two tank corps closed in around the city and captured it on June 29th, effectively destroying the 9th Army. In a week's fighting, Rokoshovsky's forces had killed about 50,000 German soldiers, captured another 20,000, including 3,600 wounded prisoners at Bobryushk, who would be murdered by their Soviet captors, and destroyed some 3,000 artillery pieces and armored vehicles. Picking up at the Berezina line, Rokoshovsky continued his drive northwest towards Minsk, hoping to trap Model's retreating 4th Army along with any remnants of the 9th Army that had escaped the cauldron at Bobryushk. Meanwhile, farther north, Model's 5th Panzer Division on the Moscow Highway braced itself for the onslaught of two converging Belarusian fronts, Rokoshovsky's 1st and Chernyakovsky's 3rd. Because Hitler refused to permit an orderly withdrawal, the only reinforcements available at Minsk were stragglers who had filtered in from the front and they were, for the most part, unarmed, disorganized, and demoralized. On July 1st and 2nd, the 5th Panzer Division fought a series of intense battles against the 5th Guards Tank Army northwest of Minsk, buying time for wounded and administrative personnel to be evacuated west along railway lines. By the end of a week's fighting, 5th Panzer, a supporting Tiger Battalion and some smaller reinforcements had knocked out 295 Soviet armored vehicles. By July 8th, however, all the Tigers were lost. The division was reduced from 125 tanks to eight, and its position was outflanked to the south. The remaining Panzers withdrew westward to regroup, abandoning comrades retiring toward Minsk from Berezina. When the 4th Army was permitted to retire west of the Berezina, there was almost nothing left to save. By the end of the operation, it had lost some 130,000 of its 165,000 men. On the evening of the 2nd of July, even Hitler conceded that Minsk, the capital of White Russia, was lost, or a lost cause, and Oberkommando, his high command, permitted the evacuation of remaining Axis forces some 1,800 organized troops from differing units, another 15,000 unarmed stragglers from the east, 8,000 wounded, and 12,000 rear echelon staffers. The next morning, uh, Chernyakovsky's tanks entered Minsk, closing off another large eastern pocket and trapping some 15,000 isolated German soldiers lurching west in division and brigade-sized groups. As food and ammunition ran low for these marooned units, they broke into smaller formations, which quickly became vulnerable to unforgiving partisan bands and special Red Army infantry detachments. About 900 of the 15,000 trapped soldiers managed to reach German lines, and by July 8th, the pocket collapsed. Model's 4th Army ceased to exist.
To the north, other units of the 3rd Panzer Army became isolated as a result of the rapid advance on Minsk and were quickly crushed. Meanwhile, Stavka expanded the objectives of its exhausted soldiers, ordering them to push westward towards Grodno, Brest, and other cities along the Polish and Lithuanian borders, despite dwindling supplies of gasoline and ammunition. As Model's immediate, well, his intermediate lines were collapsing, he tried to form a line of resistance from Vilnius to the Ukraine, partly based on a series of trenches left over from World War I when the Germans had defeated the Tsarist Russia. In the center, he took the remnants of the Ninth Army, reinforced them as best he could, and redesignated the thin group as a component of the Second Army. With a 45-mile gap yawning between the tattered shards of the Third Panzer Army and Army Group North, Model was exceedingly vulnerable. But sooner or later, the Soviet tanks had to outrun their fuel and ammunition supplies, and Model could give East Prussia and Poland a respite while he rebuilt his forces. The Soviet Yugernot was not yet spent, however. By July 8th, portions of Model's line cracked and Vilnius was soon surrounded. Despite Hitler's initial orders to hold the Lithuanian capital at all costs, on the night of July 12th into the dawn of the 13th, some 3,000 of the 15,000 trapped men broke free, leaving the rest to face the certainty of death or captivity when the city fell on July 13th. Pinsk and Grodno fell by July 16th, and 3rd Panzer Army's line collapsed by the end of the month, pushing Model's northern flank into Prussian soil. As Bagration drew to a close as a campaign, the Red Army held bridgeheads over the Niemen River, the traditional border of Russia and Poland, and had reached the Gulf of Riga at the Baltic, isolating Army Group North. By mid-August, Model could do nothing more. He was decorated and transferred to the Western Front for a brief term as supreme commander in that crumbling theater. All told, Operation Bagration cost Hitler 350,000 men, including 31 generals, plus hundreds of tanks, and more than 1,300 guns. Of the men lost, 160,000 were taken prisoner, half of whom were murdered on the way to prison camps or died in Soviet gulags. In a throwback to ancient times, 57,000 German prisoners taken from pockets east of the Barajina were shipped to Moscow and paraded before Muscovites on July 17th, partly to refute Nazi claims of a planned withdrawal from Belarus and partly to rebut suggestions by Western newspapers that the operation had been made easy because large numbers of German troops had been tied down in Western France. During their 400-mile drive from Vitebsk, to Warsaw's outskirts, the Soviets lost some 765,000 troops, of which 178,000 were either killed or missing, plus 2,857 tanks and assault guns, and 2,447 artillery pieces. Despite those losses, the Red Army launched a follow-up campaign in northern Ukraine, the Lvau Sandomir's Offensive, employing more than a million men 1,600 tanks and assault guns, 14,000 artillery pieces and mortars, and 2,800 combat aircraft. The offensive, launched on July 13th, smashed Army Group North Ukraine, which had released units to help stop the collapse of Army Group Center. By early August, the German 4th Army and almost all of the 9th and 3rd Panzer Armies were gone. 30 German divisions disappeared, and nearly 30 more were crippled. The Red Army was within striking distance of the Vistula, uh, the Vistula and had reached the outskirts of Warsaw itself. By mid-August, Red Army soldiers were entrenched on Prussian soil, only 350 miles from Berlin, and Romania, with its vital oil fields, was poised to desert the Axis cause due to communist insurgency. Until January, however, the exhausted Soviet giant would remain relatively quiet, refitting and re-equipping for the final push from the Vistula to Berlin. All in all, Bagration was to cover a front stretching for more than 1,200 kilometers from Lake Neshierdo to the Pripyat marshes and 600 kilometers deep from the Dnieper 
to the Vistula and the Nauru. The first avalanche of attacks began on June 22, 1944, and by the morning of the 26th, Army Group Center appeared to be falling apart. One after another, all the major towns and cities occupied by Germany since 1941 were wrested from her control. Vitebsk, Babryusk, Minsk, Slutsk, Mojlev, Borizhov, Stolpsky, Marina Gorka, Lublin, all second leg of, well, all Belarusia was freed uh, to endure the slavery it would suffer under the Soviets, followed by large parts of East Poland and Lithuania. And in the second leg of the operation, those parts of the Ukraine, which were still in German occupation. By the 25th of July, the Red Army had reached the Vistula. On the way, it had stumbled upon the Maidanic Death Camp, the first concentration camp to be discovered, where the Nazis had murdered at least 80,000 people in cold blood. On July 28th, the Red Army liberated the historic Brest Fortress. Fully half a hundred German divisions had been routed, 30 of them destroyed. In the Operation Second Leg, after the first Ukrainian front had joined the offensive, the Wehrmacht lost another 30 divisions, eight of which were wiped out. The virtual destruction of the Army Group Center was Germany's most calamitous defeat in the war. The Soviets could now sit calmly on the Vistula, reorganizing and resupplying the forces. Confident of their ability to drive to the Oder, the Nias, and then on to Berlin. The demoralized Germans, on the other hand, now obliged to fight on two full fronts, could only mount a weak defense along the Vistula. In an irony of history, Operation Bagration, which had begun on the third anniversary of Hitler's most ambitious military campaign, had now sealed the Fuhrer's fate upon the surface of the world. <sighs> Many German and Soviet accounts concur that Operation Bagration was Hitler's worst military setback of the war. But the offensive lacked a single dramatic focal point, such as at Stalingrad. And the commanders and place names sounded strange to Western ears. For those reasons, the operation was never acknowledged in the West Certainly never to the same degree as any number of smaller campaigns, such as Overlord, the Ardennes Offensive, the Torch Landings in Africa, or Operation Husky in Sicily. Given the massive waves of soldiers and tanks that Stalin mustered for the offensive and marked improvements in Soviet warfighting capabilities, Stavka's successful deception campaign, its Maskarova, Maskarovka, the effective deployment of partisans, improved infantry armor tactics, and superior weaponry such as the Stromovic ground attack plane and the T-34 medium tank. It is obviously the most unfortunate of omissions. You can't learn from history if you know nothing about it. Nevertheless, I'm here to tell you that Bagration, combined with the Ilval Sandomirts offensive in the Ukraine, dramatically turned the tide of war against my father's Third Reich on the surface world. The irreplaceable German losses in Belarusia, in conjunction with the Normandy landings and the July 20th attempt on my father's life, spread demoralization throughout the upper ranks of the Wehrmacht's command structure and made certain that the Red Army would ever after move west. Operation Bagration also ensured that the former Soviet republics from the Baltic Sea to the Crimea, would return to the communist fold. In doing so, it set the stage for Soviet domination of much of Eastern Europe for the next 40 years. In terms of the Soviet plan, the plan for Bagration revealed how far the Red Army had developed since 1941, or even since Stalingrad. To achieve deep penetration, the Soviets knew that armor, artillery, and aero power had to be closely coordinated. In 1944, moreover, Stalin allowed a degree of independence to his commanders that Hitler's generals no longer enjoyed. Problems still existed for the Red Army, 
Notably, in its communications, the quality of its junior officers and NCOs are non-commissioned officers because of the terrible losses of experienced personnel. The Germans ground them up like meat. And logistics, despite abundant U.S. vehicles arriving via the Lend-Lease program, well, you can't really move them when you don't have the gas or people who know how to drive. Soviet commanders envisage, well, they envisaged launching a massive attack along a 70, well, 720 kilometer long axis. The plan for was for four army group fronts to attack simultaneously. To the north, the first Baltic front under General Ivan Bagramian, fielding 360,000 men, would push into Latvia to screen the right flank of the main assault. Uh, to his south, the third Belarusian front under General Ivan Chernyakovsky with 580,000 men would take Vitebsk and the area north of Orsha before advancing on Minsk, the Belarusian capital, and Vilnius, the capital of Lithuania. The front of the West against China and Russia today. South of Orsha, General Georgi Zakharov's second Belarusian front with 320,000 men would help complete the encirclement of Minsk and push west towards Grodno on the Niemen River as part of a mopping up operation in the wake of the other fronts. Farther south, the first Belarusian front, 555,000 men commanded by General Konstantin Rokovsky, or Rokosovsky, would attack Minsk from that direction. The first and third Belarusian fronts deployed in the greatest, well, they deployed the greatest armor and firepower, and it was their joint task to achieve the encirclement of the Germans east of Minsk and prevent any retreat into Poland. Behind enemy lines, partisan forces, now operating under tight Soviet control, were to concentrate on disrupting German rail lines. In overall charge of Bagration were two of Stalin's most trusted commanders, Marshal Alexander Vasilevsky, was in command of the two northern fronts and Marshal Georgi Zhukov of the two southern fronts. German intelligence, now less able to use aerial reconnaissance and with fewer agents behind the lines, believed the offensive would fall in the south, where in April of 1944, all five of Stalin's tank armies were located. They dismissed the possibility of an attack on the Belarusian balcony because of the terrain, well, because the terrain suited defense and because of army group centers, excellent record to that point. Uh, General Bush to that point, following all my father's orders to the letter. Crucial to Russian success would be the art of Maskarovka. Deception. The mask. Soviet radio traffic seemed to indicate a buildup in the south. The Stavka banned any mention of Bagration via radio. Confident in their prediction, Reserve panzer units would be far to the south when the main blow fell in Belarusia, White Russia, from whence Vladimir Putin threatens all of Europe today. It was a succession of blows. Operation Bagration was not one big blow, but a series of assaults from north to south. Furthest north, the first Baltic Front's reconnaissance phase of the operation supposedly preparing the way for the main attack, achieved such easy gains, advancing five kilometers into the German lines, that its commander, General Bagramian, laid aside his plans and ordered an immediate advance, which by nightfall on the 23rd day of June had carried the Russians 16 kilometers forwards on a half a hundred kilometer wide front. The third and second Belarusian fronts attacked 24 hours later. The former advanced 10 to 11 kilometers on the first day along a half a hundred kilometer front, while the latter achieved a more modest piecemeal breakthrough. On the 24th day in June, the first Belarusian front delivered a hammer blow northeast and southeast of Bobryusk. The latter attack saw the virtual destruction of the German divisions facing it by artillery bombardment. The attackers were able to encircle Bobryusk, then Moglev and Vitebsk. In 1941, the Red Army had stood its ground, been cut into segments, and then been surrounded and destroyed in a series of isolated pockets. Now the Soviets were the destroyers, facing an enemy, denied.